from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. The count's three to two and the bases are loaded. And Ted Williams is at bat, huh, McGraw? Oh, Johnny, how'd you know it was me? Oh, just psychic, I guess. What's on your mind, Bert? Fellow named Henry Sampson. Ever hear of him? Mm, name's familiar. Well, it should be. He owns about half the newspapers in the South. Which means he isn't exactly struggling for money, huh? Right. In fact, he collects it. Figures. Especially Confederate money. Well, anybody can... What? Yes, sir, Johnny. He has one of the largest collections of old coins in this country. Oh? And a Confederate half dollar he owns has disappeared. Bert, Confederate money isn't worth its weight in salt. That's where you're all wrong, Johnny. Huh? This particular half buck is insured for $20,000. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Providential Assurance Company, 393 Dewey Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Confederate coinage matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and twenty cents taxi from my apartment to Bert McGraw's office. He was seated behind a haze of cigar smoke, reading a magazine. Oh, Johnny, come in, come in. Hey, morning, Bert. Sit down. I was just reading about an old teammate of mine. Oh, who's that? Bob Feller. Feller? Yeah, he was a pretty fair country pitcher. Of course, he wasn't in my class. Of course. Yeah. Many's the time I had to help old Bob out of a spot. Yes, sirree, Bob. That boy could get himself into more jams. Well, I remember... I wh- didn't know you played with the Cleveland Indians, Bert. What? Well, I... <coughs> blasted cigar. <coughs> <coughs> You've been reading up on baseball, Johnny? No, but I remember Bob Feller, who doesn't. In 1940, I saw him pitch a no-hit, no-run game for the Indians. Oh. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. You and me, we must be talking about two different fellers. Yes, sir. That's so? Well, sure. This Bob Feller that was my teammate, he played ball for the Apalachicola Alligators. Yes, sir. Good old Bob Feller. Spelled it F-A-L-L-E-R. Feller. Yeah. 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 Now, Johnny, about this Henry Sampson thing. His secretary called here just before I talked to you. Told me the coin had been stolen. Well, now, what makes that particular coin worth 20000 for? Well, like I said, it's Confederate money, a silver half dollar, and where it was minted or something, that's what does it, I guess. Where was it minted? New Orleans. Now, during the whole time of the Civil War, that mint only turned out four half dollars. How come? Well, how should I know? I'm only going by what's on Sampson's original policy application. But you're sure about there being only four of those half dollars? Well, no, I'm not sure. You mean you've never checked? You insured the thing on Samson's say-so? Well, Johnny, uh, look, we were glad to get his business. Well, you must have been out of your Oh, mind. now, stop balking, Johnny. You want to know how come that mint didn't make any more of them? You go ask him. I plan to. Where'd you say he lived? Right outside Birmingham, a place called Shade Mountain. Expense account item two, $107, air transportation, Hartford to Birmingham, Alabama. I claimed my luggage and was about to step into a cab when I was approached by a man of about 30. Crew cut, Brooks Brothers suit. Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. My name is Kopeck. Michael Kopeck. I'm Mr. Sampson's secretary. Oh. Your Mr. McGraw was good enough to tell me the time of your arrival. Are you all ready to go to Zora? Zora? According to the Bible, it was the village of Sampson. Oh. Oh, yes. Only I'd like to check into a hotel and freshen up a bit first. That is, if you don't mind. Mr. Sampson would mind, sir. But look, I've been... He instructed me to assign you a room in the guest house. I'm sure you will find it more than comfortable, Mr. Dollar. This way, please. Just outside, standing in a no-parking zone, was the Sampson limousine. A uniformed chauffeur took my bag, and about 40 minutes later, we passed through the gates of Zora, Sampson's private domain. Beside the main house, there were two guest houses, two swimming pools, a private zoo, stock farm, turkey ranch, and a number of cottages for the servants and maintenance people. Inside the main house, Kopeck led me down a long hall lined with statues and oil paintings and other art objects. Finally, he stopped and opened a heavy door. Henry Sampson was seated behind a large desk, and standing near him was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. <laughs> 
Mr. Dollar, sir. Thank you, Michael. I'll call when I need you. Yes, sir. Well, Johnny, come in. Come in, sir. You had a pleasant journey down, I hope. Yes, fine, thanks. Good, good. Would you like a sample of our southern hospitality, Mr. Dollar? Well, I, uh... Uh, Forgive me, my dear. Johnny, this is Mrs. Sampson. Delilah, Mr. Dollar. Mrs. Sampson? In case my question confused you, Johnny, I meant, would you like a drink? Uh, no thanks. Not just now. Let the man catch his breath, Delilah. Now, Johnny, uh, let me get on my feet. I, I can't give you more than ten minutes of my time. So, let's get right down to business. This here's a display case that was broke into. Mm-hmm. None of your other coins were taken, huh? No, no. Whoever did it knew what they wanted. They got the most valuable one. What about this lock? Was it tampered with? Wouldn't have done them no good to tamper with it. It's the biggest and strongest that Yale makes. Reckon he knew that. That's why he broke the glass. Then you think someone familiar with this room and your collection took the coin? If you want to know the truth, he suspects me. Lila. Um, Mr. Sampson, did anything unusual happen that evening? Did you have any visitors? None. Delilah and I ate our supper. I worked for a couple of hours, same as always. Then we played casino till 10.30. We always play casino until 10.30, John. The only thing that relaxes my husband. I see. There were only four people beside myself in the house. Mrs. Sampson, Mary, her maid, Digger, my manservant... And Michael, my secretary. Good old Michael, the trusty troubleshooter. Mr. Sampson, according to your policy application, only four of those Confederate half dollars were ever made. Is that right? Yes, it is. Confederate states didn't have any silver bullion to make more. Dirty Yankee blockade. Yeah. Uh, Could you give me a description of the coin, sir? Sure. Originally, it was a regular Union 1861 piece. At the New Orleans Mint, they ground off the reverse side and and stamped on the shield of the glorious Confederacy in the words, Confederate States of America. Hallelujah. May the South rise again. Now, that's not funny, Delilah. I think it is. Don't you, Johnny? Well, I'm just... uh... You just give me your answer later. Right now, I'm going to have another drink. You ready? Not yet, thanks. No, you don't know what you're missing. You'll have to forgive my wife, Johnny. She isn't herself this evening. I haven't been myself in several years. Not since I married this You shut up, woman. Michael. Michael. Yes, sir? Mrs. Sampson is tired. Very tired. She wants you to take her to her room. Yes, sir. Hmm. Why, well. See you at supper, Johnny. I'll have your supper sent up to Don't you. Don't do me any favors, fat man. Get her out of here, Michael. Get her out before I... I'm sorry. But she... Sometimes... It's all right, she... sir. I understand. Do you? Good. Good man. Now then. Oh, that's better. Now, about the coin. President Jefferson Davis gave it to my great-grandpappy for his service to the cause. Are you sure of its value? Sure it's worth 20000 Why, shoot, boy. My grandpappy turned down 10000 for it back in 1879. The way things are now, <laughs> it's got to be worth four times that. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Well, I didn't say that. Well, then what are you looking at me so suspicious for? Well, Mr. Sampson, I have a hunch you're holding out on me. Johnny, you're getting paid money to find the person that took it. Now, you earn your pay. I'll try to. Only I'd appreciate some help. I'll give you help. In fact, I already have. Like how? Like the gates to Zora. 
I've kept them locked ever since it happened. And until you find that coin, nobody leaves here. Those gates stay closed. A few moments later, Kopeck returned and escorted me across the magnolia-scented grounds to my rooms in one of the luxurious guest cottages. I unpacked, took a shower, then called Bert McGraw in Hartford. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It is not. Oh, come on now, boy. Sorry, Bert, but it looks like a real toughie. You don't want me to send in a pinch hitter, do you? Nope. But how about getting the dust off your pants and doing some legwork? All right, what kind of work? Find out for sure how many of those 1861 half dollars were ever made and what their value is today. Wait a minute. What'd you say, John? Not you, Bert. Somebody at the door. You check on that coin, got it? Like the Yankees have the pennant. Good luck, boy. Okay, I'm coming. Yeah? Miss Dobbs. Yeah, that's right. I'm Mary Williams, Miss Samson's maid. And I'm Digger. Everybody just calls me old Digger. Uh, he's Mr. Samson's man. We, we snuck off and come over here to see you. Oh, well, come in, please. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sure hope nobody saw us come in here. Well, uh, what's this all about, Mary? Mr. Dollar, being an insurance investigator, you work for a company instead of the police, is that it? Yes, the company I'm working for now is in Hartford, Connecticut. Way up north. Oh, that's good. Mr. Dollar, Digger here, he's just scared to death. Scared? Of what? If you'd be here a while, you'd know. Cause you sure would. Well, can't you tell me? Mr. Sampson's got a big place here. He he needs lots of folks to keep it up for him, and, and he gets them cheap from the prisons. What? Yes, sir. Somebody finds out who's going out on parole, the next thing a man knows, instead of being all the way free, he's here, working for Mr. Sampson. Yes, sir, and, and if and he don't like it, Mr. Sampson has him sent back. So. Oh, come on now. Look, this is 1957. Things like that just don't happen anymore. Tell him, Digger. Well, Mr. Dollar, sir, I don't want to go back to that place. No, sir, I don't ever want to go back. Oh, it's all right, Digger. Mr. Dollar, we wouldn't have bothered you at all, except that we, Digger and me, that is, we want to get married. That's right, yes. But if he's sent back to prison, well... Well, he's already spent 15 years there. And you're afraid that Mr. Sampson is going to send him back? Yes, sir. Mr. Sampson or, or somebody else around here. But why? Well, come on. One of you say something. Well, sir, I, I ain't going to tell you. Nobody else, Mr. Dollar. No, sir. I won't tell no matter what they do to me. I won't tell unless you give me your word. Unless you promise me. Promise you What? That you won't let Mr. Sampson or nobody send me back. You give me your word on the Bible, I'll tell. Yes. Well, come on. Tell me what. Well, sir, I... Mr. Dollar, Digger knows who took that half dollar piece. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. The American writer Christopher Morley once wrote, When you sell a man a book, you don't sell him just 12 ounces of paper, ink, and glue. You sell him a whole new way of life, unquote. Now that goes double when you give, not sell, a book. But the gift of 550 books to little children increases the legacy tenfold. Near the end of 1960, the employees of the Chase Manhattan Bank started a people-to-people -people program with such a gift to school children of a town in Tanganyika. That's on the southeast coast of Africa. And to give you an idea how the books were received by the children, let me first quote from Francis Bacon. He's an English writer of a few centuries back. He said... Some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. In the past, children in Tanganyika may have done a little tasting and chewing and a little swallowing and digesting, but there's one certain thing. They wound up devouring the books they received from the United States. And they did so much of it that they, the ones in high school anyway 
were able to reach the level of English children their age and pass the exams at the same time. That takes a lot of book learning, as they say. Now, the gift of these books from the United States of America may have seemed a small thing to the senders, but the boys in Tanganyika who received them know that they've opened a whole new way of life. They've greatly increased understanding in the classroom of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Confederate coinage matter. I wanted to help Digger, the Samson servant who claimed to have information concerning the missing Confederate half dollar. But I couldn't promise him anything without first knowing more about the part he had played, if any, in the theft of the coin. I did promise to think over his offer and let him know if I was interested by the next afternoon. Anyway, at eight that evening, I joined Mr. Sampson and Kopeck for dinner in the large dining room. After we'd finished our coffee, Sampson rose and excused himself. When you're ready, we got work to do, Michael. Yes, sir. Huh? See you in the morning, Johnny. Well, how is the investigation coming, Mr. Dollar? Have you found any valuable clues? No, nope, not a thing. Oh, that's too bad. But you you haven't given up. Kopeck, I haven't started. Uh-huh. Well, would you care for something else? If not... No, no, I'm fine. Then shall we... Yeah, sure. Say, uh, tell me something, Kopeck. Anything I can. What about the servants who were in the house the night of the theft? Digger and Mary? Yeah. What do you know about them? Everything that there is to know. I have a file containing the record on every one of Mr. Sampson's employees. If you like, I shall have the information on these two sent to your rooms. I'd appreciate it. Now, if you will excuse me, Mr. Sampson is waiting in the den. Uh, you can find your way back to the guest house? Hmm? Sure. Good night. Good night, Mr. Dahl. Johnny. Johnny. Hmm? Oh, Delilah. Oh, where are you? Up <laughs> here. On the stairs. No, don't come up. Oh. Johnny, do you like to ride? Well, sure, only it's been a long time since I've had a chance to, and uh, I didn't bring any riding clothes. Well, that doesn't matter. Meet me at the stables before breakfast. You will, won't you, Johnny? What do you think? I went back to the guest house, and about half an hour later, Kopeck delivered the files on Mary Williams and Digger. Everything Digger had told me was true. He had spent 15 years in prison on a manslaughter charge. So early the next morning, I crossed the green lawns of Zora and met Delilah at the stables. And a few minutes later, we were riding our horses away from the main house. Where shall we ride, Johnny? You want the cook's tour? Oh, I don't know. What's it include? Oh, the turkey farm, dairy, and zoo. Or would you rather go down to the river? Hey, you know, it's a funny thing, Delilah. What is? I've never seen a river. <laughs> you fool. Come on, I'll race. Come on, boy. Come on. Finally, when we reached the river, we dismounted. And she just stood there for a long moment, looking down into the water. Well? I guess I'm just reaching for something I can't have. Yes. You understand, Johnny? Why did you marry him, Delilah? His money. Only I was fooled. Or made a fool of. How do you mean? Well, he's a collector, Johnny. Of coins and paintings and people. Well, hadn't you noticed? I'm just another one of his possessions with all the rights and privileges of a statue. And you know why Samson married me? Because my parents named me Delilah. Well, why don't you leave him? Oh, I'd need money, a lot of it. And I thought I was going to get some. But now... But now? Maybe I'll get another chance. And when I do... Johnny... Johnny, you keep in touch, huh? We rode on back, had breakfast... And I returned to my rooms in the guest cottage. Around 11 o'clock, I picked up the phone and called Bert McGraw again. 
Johnny, about time you called. Yeah, what'd you find out, Bert? Enough to know that I'm in trouble and you got to get me out of it. Trouble? What kind of trouble? That Confederate half dollar. Do you know what it's worth? Five thousand. What? But you insured it for twenty. I know it, but look, Johnny, it wasn't all my fault. I mean, well, how did Samson know about the dyes? What dyes? The dyes a man named Scott made five hundred of those half dollars from back in 1879. That's what lowered the price of the original half dollar. You mean there are 500 of those half dollars in existence instead of four? 504. The four original ones made in 1861, the rest were made later. Well, looks like you're out 20 grand, Bert. Oh, don't say that. Unless. Yeah? Unless you're willing to let me try something down here. Anything, Johnny boy, anything. Even if it costs five grand? Well, you know what'll happen to me if the company has to take a loss of 20,000 for something worth only five. Johnny, please go ahead. Thanks, pal. I'll call you later. As soon as I could, I sent word to Digger and Mary, the two servants, asking them to come to the guest house. It was almost three o'clock before they arrived. Miss Dollar, have you decided on what you're going to do? Yes, Mary, I have. Digger. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, sir? I can't promise that you won't be sent back to prison. Well, then I ain't going to tell you nothing. Now, wait, Dollar, wait. Sir. Let me finish. But I can promise that I'll do everything possible to help you. Well, sir, I have to ask Miss Mary... You know, she's the one who talked me into coming to you in the first place. I did it as soon as he told me what he'd done. I didn't know about it till afterward, Mr. Dahl. All right. Just what did he do, Mary? Well, it wasn't his fault. He just had to break into that case and, and take that half dollar. Yeah, so that's right. I had to. Why? Because she said that she'd tell Mr. Sampson something real bad about me. Something that would cause him to send me back to prison. She? Mrs. Sampson? Yes, sir. That's the truth, Miss Dollar. I swear it. I... All right, Digger, go on. What happened after you took the coin? Well, sir, it all went like she said it would. I got hold of the half dollar and ran on down to the river. Late that night, I was on my way back to where I was supposed to meet Miss Sampson and give it to her. Well, sir, then I tripped over something and... Doggone if I didn't lose Oh, wait a minute. Come on now, Digger. You don't expect me to believe that. But it's the truth. Yes, sir. I had it in my hand, and when I fell, it flew out. And you can't find it? No, sir. No, sir. And I, and I looked and looked. There's a good reason why he can't find it, Mr. Dahl. Oh? Yes, sir. And you come with us. We'll show you. They showed me, and I had to agree there was a good reason. I told Kopeck I wanted to see Mr. Sampson. While I was waiting for him, Delilah came down the stairs from her room. Johnny, I saw Digger take your suitcase out to the car. You aren't leaving. I will be in a few minutes. Well, I... Johnny, have you found the coin? No, not quite. But I know where it is. And I know how it got there. You do? Why did you do it, Delilah? Why did you make him do it? You ought to know by now, Johnny. I did it for the same reason I've done everything else in my life, for money. I thought I could use the money to get away from here. What do you do now? I don't know. It's up to him. You do have to tell him, don't you? Yes, Delilah. I'm afraid I do. There's no other way. I mean, well... Couldn't you say one of the servants... No, Delilah, don't you say it either. Okay, John. See you around, huh? Sure. See you around. Huh. Come in, Johnny. Come in. Honey, here you have news for me. Well, boy, start in. Tell me. I told him as simply as I could. When it was over, he got to his feet and stared out the window for several minutes. When he turned back, he ordered Kopeck to find Digger and take him to the place where the coin had been lost. A few minutes later, we joined him there. I, I, I can't believe it. This where you lost the half dollar, Digger? On the turkey farm? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Sampson, sir. 
Uh, right, right over there. Well, why didn't you get in there and find it? Well, I told Mr. Dollar how come I couldn't, sir. Will Dollar? He couldn't find it because when he dropped the coin, one of those turkeys swallowed it. Dollar, what do you mean, one of those turkeys swallowed it? Well, sir, just what I said. Turkeys will eat anything that glistens or shines that's dropped near them. And since Digger was cutting across this field when he dropped the coin... But, but boy, do you realize there are 2,000 turkeys in there? And any one of them could have my half dollar. The half dollar Jefferson Davis, president of the glorious confederacy, gave my grandpappy. Any one of them could have it stuck in his skinny redneck. Yes, sir. It certainly could. Well, good. Good. Now, you just tell me, how do you propose to get me my half dollar back? You can't do it. You'll have to give me my insurance money. Yes, we know. That's why we're willing to buy the turkeys from you. What? Yes, sir. I'll give you $5,000 for the turkeys and guarantee to return the coin within 90 days, providing... Go on. Providing you allow Mary Williams and Digger to leave here and be responsible for the recovery of the coin. You mean you're going to let them tin the turkeys? I'm going to give them the turkey. What? Oh, Mr. Donner, you're a good man. Digger, you're you real... miser... You hush up. Where? Well... Well, darling, you sly fox. Doggone. Doggone, boy. You just got yourself 2,000 turkeys. A couple of weeks after I left Birmingham, I received a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Digger telling me that they'd found the coin in the craw of the bird they'd killed for their first Sunday dinner together. Which proves once again... Miracles do happen. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $405.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the story of a tragedy that befell a sweet old widow... And the very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Eleanor Audley, Herb Ellis, Herb Bygren, Horace Lewis, and Vic Perrin. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now for that pleasant moment when we pay our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' celebrated friend, the eminent Dr. John H. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Come in and sit down. Oh, I thought you might have forgotten your date, Dr. Watson, when I saw that your door was closed. <laughs> Not at all, my dear fellow. Rather the opposite. I'm afraid I neglected to keep an eye on the time. I was so deeply engrossed in searching through my files. With satisfactory results, I trust? <laughs> well, I hope you will find them, sir. You may remember after I told you the story of the lion's mane the week before last that you asked if Holmes had any other adventures in his beekeeping days. I do indeed, Dr. Watson. Well, I've been running through my notes concerning the remarkable affair of the pointless robbery. And I think you'll find it thrilling enough to keep you on the edge of your chair. I'm sure we all will, Dr. Watson. But first, men... I'm sure you'll be interested to hear why Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's most prosperous and successful men. Kremel keeps hair handsomely groomed from morning until night, just the way you combed it in the morning. Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Kremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what's the story of the pointless robbery? Well, it all began, Mr. Bell, on a delightful summer morning in August 1913. I was spending the first day of a week's holiday visiting Holmes at the small farm on the South Downs to which he'd retired and where he was devoting himself to nothing more serious than the raising of bees. I must say, Holmes, that the quality of breakfast here convinces me that I've discovered the real reason for your devotion to rustic life. A very sound deduction, Watson. And there's much to be said for the peaceful atmosphere of the countryside after the noisy hubbub of London. A peace which I fear may be only too transient, Watson. I suggest that you omit reading the morning paper during oh, your stay. Oh, that talk of war in Europe, you mean? Nonsense, Holmes. In this year of our Lord, 1913, no civilized nation would dream of resorting to the outmoded fallacies of armed force. I trust you're right, Watson. I trust you're right. But, uh... uh I say, Holmes, you, you've got a visitor. Somebody's coming up the path. It's Mr. Kenmore, the rector of our local church. Another donation is indicated, no doubt. It would take the national budget to keep the church's ancient organ in good repair. Be a good fellow, Watson, and open the door while I refill the teapot. Uh, that's you are, Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Kenmore. This is my good friend, Dr. Watson. How, How do you do, do, do sir? Doctor? A cup of tea? Uh, no, 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 thank you. No tea. And I must apologize for this unwarranted intrusion at such an early hour. Uh, some pressing matter in connection with the church? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. The cause of my visit is a most mysterious and disturbing occurrence which took place at my residence last night. Oh, really? I suppose you give me the facts. Uh, no doubt it will seem a minor matter to you, but I feel considerable agitation over it. Briefly, at some time last night, the rectory was broken into by thieves who ransacked the entire house, with the exception of the rooms in which my daughter Alice and I were sleeping. Oh, gracious me. And what was stolen? Uh, nothing. Nothing whatever. Was the thief frightened off? No, Mr. Holmes. We knew nothing of it until Alice came downstairs this morning to prepare my breakfast. She found the house in a state of the utmost confusion, obvious signs of forcible entry, and not a single thing missing. Odd. Very odd. I... I hesitate to ask you, Mr. Holmes, to concern yourself with such a trifle, but... You know our worthy constable, Tom Wilson. Yes, an excellent man when it comes to unlighted bicycle lamps, but beyond that... Well, come, Watson, let's accompany Mr. Kenmore to the rectory and see what we can discover. So you see, Mr. Holmes, as Father told you, absolutely nothing seems to be missing. 
Not that the possessions of a country rector are of such great value. Nevertheless, that silver service on the sideboard would undoubtedly attract any thief's eye. A family inheritance, Mr. Holmes, one of my few valuables. I see that you've got rather quite a large library, Mr. Kenmore. Any books of great value there? Not at all, Dr. Watson. Sound suggestion, though, Watson. Oh, <laughs> this uh, French window which gives on to the garden seems to be where the thief made his entry. Quite. A circle of glass cut out of one of the panes, then a gloved hand reaching in to turn the key. A gloved hand, Mr. Holmes? Undoubtedly, my dear. The blurred impressions are quite characteristic. And uh, now that you've seen everything, Mr. Holmes, what do you make of it? It presents a most interesting problem, Mr. Kenmore. The disorder of the rooms would indicate a search for some definite object, even though you assure me that you know of nothing of value in your possession. And we must wait for developments. I think you and your daughter should most certainly be on your guard against the thief's return. You really think uh, there is... Mr. Kenmore, a... my friend is apt to see criminals behind every bush. The natural result of a, a lifelong career. Oh, perhaps, <laughs> Watson, perhaps. Well, we must be getting along. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Holmes, if you and Dr. Watson would do me a great favor before oh, you go. Of course, if it's in our power. Well, what is it? Would you think me too bold... If I asked you to let me take a snapshot of you both? Oh, really, Alice. Uh, I gave Alice a camera for her birthday last week, Mr. Holmes, and ever since then she's been making life miserable for everyone. I'm sure you could find two handsomer subjects, my dear. But Watson and I will be glad to have you immortalize our creatures. Yes, of course, naturally. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I brought my camera down from my room, hoping you'd say yes. Well, I'm very sorry I was just wearing this old Norfolk jacket. <laughs> if you stand here, right beside the front door... Uh, oh, just a moment. The wind's blowing my hair about a bit. Ah, there we are. <laughs> All right. Just look this way. Fine. Thank you so much. I hope you'll spare me a print or two if they turn out, my dear. I'll be very glad to. As a matter of fact, that was the last picture in the roll. Now I can take it down to the village and have Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist, develop it for me. I him. say, well, we're, we're passing by the chemist's shop. Uh, can't I drop it off for you? Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. That's very kind. Here it is. And thank you again, Mr. Holmes, for your kindness in troubling yourself with my problem. Not at all. And remember, Mr. Kenmore, be on your guard against a return visit. Looks to me as though you're falling asleep over your book, Watson. Uh, what's it? Uh. Well, I must admit, Holmes, that the combination of country air and that excellent dinner had a very soporific effect on me. Oh, don't apologize. We country dwellers keep early hours. <laughs> Certainly different from the old days in Baker Street. I'm surprised that you don't miss the excitement of the chase, Holmes. And Professor Moriarty was the spice who kept the daily routine from becoming monotonous. But apparently he, too, seems to be in retirement. Oh, have you any news of him, Holmes? The last I heard, Scotland Yard had him fairly definitely located in South America. South America, eh? Huh? Which would indicate to anyone knowing the professor as well as I do that he may be anywhere on the face of the globe with the exception of South America. <laughs> well, old fella, I'm going upstairs to sleep to sleep. What the devil's that? The church bell. Come on, Watson. There must be something wrong at the rectory. <laughs> And I thought the quickest way of raising the alarm, Mr. Holmes, was to sound the church bell. Very wise. Uh, tell me, Mr. Kenmore, what was the first thing you heard? A sharp cry from my daughter awakened me, followed by a thud. I rushed into her room and found her. Well, she'll be all right, don't you worry, Mr. Kenmore. I've had to take several stitches, but she'll have a slight concussion for the next few days. But there's no cause for alarm. Oh, thank heaven, Doctor. When I rushed in and saw her lying on the floor... Her assailant had fled by the time you entered? The open window showed only too clearly the miscreant's path. Well, you keep her in bed for a few days, give her a light diet, and she'll be right as rain. Oh, oh that face, the window... Oh, she's silly conscious, oh. poor girl, to be quite expected after oh. such a blow. No, don't touch me. Please, it's there, there on the shelf. No... No. The sleeping draft that I gave her will take effect soon. I blame myself, Mr. Holmes, for not having paid more attention to your warning. But I... That's thought... of no importance now, Mr. Kenmore. Uh, what's that? Uh, someone at the door. Pardon me. Wilson, high time you got here. 
You received my message? Oh, take your message as it brought me here, Mr. Kenmore. Ah, where the constable, Watson? There's been worse things happening in the village. What is it, Wilson? Oh. Oh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there's fair devil's work afoot tonight. Oh, come, come, my man. What's up? Well, it's Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist. Well, what about him? In his rooms where he lives. Back of his shop. Dead. Oh. Lying there on the floor with his head crushed in something savage. Deal with it. Oh, horrible. Some prowling thief. No. Oh, no, sir. With the cash box sitting there in plain sight. With four pound and some odd shillings plain to see and not a penny touched. Dilworthy, wait a moment. The ransacking of this house, the attack on Miss Alice, and now this. There's only one common denominator which applies to all three. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. That film from Alice's camera, Watson... After we left here this morning and went to the village, you left it at Dilworthy's? Of course, I... Oh, it's got a... Well, a matter of fact, Holmes, I'm, I'm afraid I, I forgot all about it. Here's the roll in, in my pocket. I must apologize to Miss Alice. Not a bit of it, Watson. What do you mean, not a bit of it, Watson? I'm convinced that roll of film holds the solution of the mysterious events of the past 24 hours. And due to your convenient lapse of memory, we are in possession of the prize. But what prize are we in possession of? That, Watson, remains to be seen. Come, we just have time to catch the late train for London. A vis visit to Scotland Yard's laboratory will reveal the precious secret which that film is evidently concealing. In just a moment, we'll find out what that precious secret is. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kreml hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. In addition, Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily. For better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what did you discover on that precious roll of film which had already caused the death of one person and a murderous assault upon another? Well, as soon as we reached Scotland Yard's laboratory, Holmes wasted no time in getting permission to develop the photographs. Just hand me that second tray, will you, Watson? The one this side of the red lamp. There you are. There. That does it. Look, Watson. The images are starting to appear. Oh, I'll take your word for it. That red lamp gives about as much light as a glowworm. Sorry, but that's all we can use until we finish the development. Look, Watson. They're coming much, much, much more strongly now. Yes. I see. That seems to be a picture of the rector. Doesn't look to me as though that were worth committing murder for. There are 12 pictures on the roll, Watson. This next one seems to be a somewhat out-of-focus picture of the directory. Uh, that third one, Sharper, haven't a croaky match. I'm quite sure that we haven't gone tearing off on a wild goose chase, Holmes. Impossible, Watson. All the evidence indicates that this film must have been the objective. Ah, well, that looks more interesting. Two girls on the beach in bathing suits. I say, Holmes. What? That girl on the left's got a fine figure, eh? Undoubtedly. <laughs> but the composition is not improved by those other people in the middle background. I think that... Watson, hand me that lens. The large magnifier there. Ah, I thought you were displaying a cavalier lack of interest in such a shapely young lady. Well, I trust it's repaying your intense study. Look, Watson. Look here. Examine it closely through the lens. Oh, a daring bathing suit, I must say. Hm. Has no sleeves. Not the girl, you idiot. What? The girl? The two men in the background. Oh. Take a good look at that one on the right. Oh, there's certainly something familiar about him. Holmes. Holmes, it, it can't be. But it is, Watson. Beyond any shadow of doubt, Professor Moriarty himself, and no nearer to South America than the beaches of England. But I... I don't see why Moriarty should have been so anxious to secure this film. After all, Holmes, there's nothing particularly damning in, in a photograph of two men seated on a beach. When one of them is the world's most notorious criminal, and when he's quite ready to commit murder to regain the film. Watson, 
Ask the inspector to call us a car. Where are we going? You and I and this precious film are paying a visit to Sir Edward at the foreign office at once. <laughs> Your deduction was absolutely sound, Holmes. You recognize Moriarty's companion then, Sir Edward? Beyond any question. He goes by many names, but our files would indicate that the real one is von Schelling, probably the cleverest among the senior members of the Imperial German Secret Service. Good heavens, a spy. Yes, precisely, Dr. Watson. I should imagine, Sir Edward, that his dealings with Moriarty must be of great importance since they required him to come to England in person. I'm quite sure of it. But the peaceful surroundings of the South Downs and the quiet beaches, what would a spy be doing there? With Portsmouth, England's greatest naval base only a few miles away, and the present situation in Europe, Professor Moriarty does not concern himself with trifles. Under the circumstances, I have no hesitation in telling you two gentlemen that the first trials of our new battle cruisers have been taking place off Portsmouth these last few days. Great Scott! Yes, Doctor in what we thought was the utmost secrecy. There's still a ray of hope, Sir Edward. Moriarty would not have gone to such lengths to suppress this photograph had his transactions with von Schelling been completed. Do you mean, Holmes, that there may still be time to forestall him? Dr. Watson and I will do whatever is in our power, Sir Edward. Judging from the sudden change in your expression after your silence this past hour, you've evidently had an inspiration. We must bait a trap, Watson. And that film must be our bait. Professor Moriarty must be in a fury at his bungling subordinates, who have twice failed to recover it. If I know the professor, he'll make the next attempt himself. Well, you can't take an advertisement in the newspaper, Holmes, to lure Moriarty into a trap. If Alice and her father will cooperate, I have a method that is better than any advertisement. Oh? And what's that? Evidently, Watson, you're not acquainted with the post office and the postmistress of the average village, to which Fallworth is no exception. She fills the function of a town crier with the utmost efficiency. She will be our advertisement. Morning, Mr. Kenmore. And how are you this fine morning? And how is poor Miss Alice coming along? Very well indeed, thank you, Mrs. Roberts. Ah, that's a blessing. And what can I do for you today? A shilling's worth of penny stamps, please. I do hope the young lady will be up and about again soon. We miss her cheery face. You know, Mrs. Roberts, there was an odd thing about that robbery at the rectory. What was that? All the intruder took was Alice's camera. Fancy that. After he struck her down. Not a very valuable bit of loot. No, indeed. Alice is glad she happened to remove the film that very afternoon. It's still on the library desk. Is it really now? I must remember to have it developed. Well, it's a mercy that nothing worse happened. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's your stamps, Mr. Kenmore. <laughs> And I think I can assure you, Mr. Holmes, uh, knowing our worthy postmistress, as I do, that the misinformation I gave her has by now been widely disseminated. Excellent, Mr. Kenmore. And uh, I appreciate what you and Alice have been willing to risk on behalf of your country. At least the falsehood I told was in a worthy cause. I only wish Dr. Watson would let me get out of bed and come downstairs into the library with you when you take up your vigil tonight. I'd like to see that those horrible men get their just desserts. Really, my dear? You sound almost bloodthirsty. Well, I can't say that I blame Miss Ellis for that. If someone had given me a crack on the head, I'd look forward to that downfall. Mr. Kenmore, I would have felt happier if you and Alice were not in the house. But with my knowledge of Moriarty, I fear that he may have the place under observation. And the departure of you and your daughter might make him suspicious. Is that why you and Dr. Watson are wearing those filthy farmer's clothes, Mr. Holmes? Precisely, my dear. Hmm. Eight o'clock. Time we were beginning our vigil. 
Mr. Kenmore, you will remain on guard with Alice here in her room. No matter what happens in the library, this is your post of duty. Very well, Mr. Holmes. You have your service, Revolver Watson? Certainly. Come then. We must be concealed and in readiness for our visitor at whatever hour he may arrive. Hmm. Only two o'clock. I'm so cramped from standing behind these curtains that I thought it must be the morning. What price the peaceful countryside now, Watson? Well, I must say that... What? What is it? A faint sound on the gravel path. It might be a nocturnal animal or... No. There it is again. Footsteps. Is your gun ready, Watson? Ready, Holmes. It'll probably come through the French windows. It's the most inviting entrance. On your guard... Don't move. We've got you covered. The light switch, Watson, with your left hand. There. Well, Professor Moriarty, we meet again. If it isn't Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Keep that gun on him, Watson, while I see if he's carrying a weapon. And render myself liable to a long prison sentence. My dear Holmes, your retirement to pastoral pursuits must have impaired your reasoning powers. It's all right, Watson. He's unarmed. You can lower your hands now, Professor. But I'd strongly advise against making any sudden move. I wish he would, the dirty traitor. I'm inclined to agree with your sentiments, Watson. Moriarty, for once I intend to take the law into my own hands. I can forgive a criminal, or a forger, or a thief, or even a murderer. But a traitor is something else. I don't understand what you're driving at. Certain backward Balkan countries, Moriarty, have an extremely convenient system of disposing of unwanted prisoners. They are invariably shot while attempting to escape you. You wouldn't dare. You who have always stood on the side of the law. Have you ever known me to break my word? I assure you, Moriarty, that unless you consent to turn over von Schelling to us, together with any information you have for him, you will be dead by the time I count ten. And I promise you that Watson won't hesitate either. No, you bet I won't, Holmes. Take your choice, Moriarty. One, two, three, four. All right, Holmes. You win. This time. Hmm. A wise decision. Where were you to meet von Schelling? And what were you to deliver to him? At midnight, tomorrow, on a beach six miles south of here. He has a rendezvous there with a submarine that is to take him back to Germany. And the figures on the new cruisers are hidden at my lodgings in Portsmouth. We'll keep that appointment with von Schelling tomorrow night. And to make sure that you have no chance for further treachery, you'll remain with us until he's in our hands. This is the spot, Professor Moriarty? 500 yards south of the abandoned dock, yes. Very well. Watson and I will remain here behind these bushes. You, Professor, will walk out alone onto the sands. I intend to take no chances of scaring off our current quarry. I haven't much choice in the matter. Just a moment. Yes? Remember that we have you in plain sight, that the moonlight is strong, and that the slightest sign of treachery will be the signal for your well-deserved execution. I won't forget, Mr. Holmes. I hate to think of his going scot-free, Holmes. You cannot hate it more than I do, Watson. But letting him go free is a cheap price to pay for the scotching of his plans and the capture of von Schelling. Here comes a car. This must be von Schelling. No one else would be on this deserted road at this hour of night. Oh, the, the car's stopping. There's only one man in it. He's getting out. It is von Schelling. Ah, yeah, Professor. I knew I could depend on you. Right, Watson. But put up your hands, you. The devil... Look out, Watson. <coughs> Quick work, Watson. Oh, curse you, Moriarty. You have betrayed me. Precisely, Herr von Schelling. But why should the fact that a traitor will engage in a double betrayal surprise you? He'll be all right, Holmes. Barring a nasty flesh wound in his leg. Well, Mr. Holmes, you have the papers and the spy. I've kept my part of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Don't worry, Moriarty, I shall. 
But you can count yourself lucky that the stakes for which we were playing were far more value than your traitorous life. I promise you that next time we meet, you will pay your long overdue reckoning. <laughs> I shall look forward to it. Au revoir. Till our next meeting. What infernal cheek. I hate to see him go free. No more than I do, Watson. Well, at least we've had the best of the bargain. Now let's load our prisoner into the car. And, and who are you, anyway? Sir Devil? Oh, hardly so eminent a personage, von Schelling. My name is Sherlock Holmes. So, I might have guessed. Oh, he's fainted. Oh, just as well, perhaps. Here, Holmes, we'll, we'll put him in the back seat of the, of the, of the car. Well, you've got the spy. And that finishes that. I wonder. There's an east wind coming, Watson. East wind? Oh, I don't think so, Holmes. It's particularly warm. <laughs> Good old Watson. You're the one fixed point in a changing age. There's an east wind coming all the same. Such a wind as never blew on England yet. It will be cold and bitter. And a good many of us may wither before its blast. But it's God's own wind nonetheless. And a cleaner, better, stronger land will lie in the sunshine when the storm has cleared. Start the car up, Watson. It's time we're on our way. And now may I introduce one of the outstanding authorities on feminine beauty. He is John Robert Powers, who has received hundreds of thousands of requests from girls all over the country. Girls wishing to join his exclusive Powers Girls. And now, especially transcribed, Mr. John Robert Powers. Good evening, friends. I'm very happy tonight to bring along one of my very attractive Powers girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And maybe we can coax Pat to tell us what she considers one of the most important requirements of a Powers girl. How about it, Pat? Well, I think one of the most important requisites is lovely, shining, bright hair. Hair that reflects natural, glossy luster and highlights. I certainly agree, Pat. And I heartily agree with you about using cremel shampoo. Yes, Pat. I advise all my Powers girls to use cremel shampoo. In my opinion, no other shampoo leaves the hair more radiant with such natural gloss and highlights. Why, I've interviewed hundreds of girls with beautiful faces, but with such dull, lifeless-looking hair. Then, after using cremel shampoo, what a difference. Their hair emerges a vision of shining beauty. I love its rich, velvety oil base, too. A very good point, Pat. Because this oil base actually helps hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel shampoo also whips up a wonderful, luxurious, active foam, even in the hardest water. Yes, Pat, to glamour bathe the hair, you simply can't beat cremel shampoo. And I sincerely recommend it to every girl who is discouraged about the way her hair looks. To every girl... Who wants her hair to look its shining best? Thank you, Mr. Powers, and also your very, very beautiful Powers girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week, I think I shall tell you a weird story about the strange experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles, wherein Holmes solves the murder of a certain Aloysius, or as you say, Aloysius Garcia, and finds a kitchen full of voodoo fetishes. I call the story The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, His Last Bow. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to listen next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Wisteria Lodge. ABC, the American...
This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I sure wish you could listen to this story with a glass of Petri California port right at your elbow. Petri port. That's the wine that's perfect after dinner when you're just taking things easy. And say, if you've never tried Petri port, if you've never tasted that wonderful rich red wine... Well, this is the week to do it. I'll tell you why. This is National Wine Week, sort of a celebration we're having to mark the return to good living. Your wine merchant is kind of rolling out the red plush carpet this week, and among other things, he wants to prove to you that you just couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri wine. Why don't you take him up on it? And begin by becoming acquainted with Petri Port. You'll really love it, and so will your guests. And say, you can serve Petri Port proudly. Because, after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. That's a fact. Well, here's the patio of Dr. Watson's Northern California bungalow, but where's the doctor? Here I am, Mr. Bartow, out in the garden. Okay, I'll be right there. Oh, sitting by the fish pond, huh, Doctor? Yes, my boy. It's rather pleasant out here for a change. Has it ever occurred to you how stupid the expression of a goldfish is, Mr. Bartow? <laughs> well, I can't say I've ever given it much thought, Doctor. Why? You see this foolish little fellow here with his silly little mouth opening and closing as though he were constantly astonished? <laughs> what is this? I thought you were a fish lover. Yes, I am. But as I was brooding over tonight's story... That goldfish seemed to be making faces at me as though it were trying to remind me of how my face must have looked on a certain June evening in 1890. (laughs) Sounds to me as if you're going to tell a story against yourself, Doctor. I am, young fellow, my lad. What happened? One Sunday morning in 1890, I dropped round to visit my friend in Baker Street. Mrs. Hudson told me that he was out, but suggested that I wait in our old rooms for his return and promised me a pot of strong tea... Some buttered scones as an inducement. As I walked into the sitting room, I was astonished to see Holmes standing there, a bag in one hand and a coat in the other. My dear chap, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, Holmes. I'm surprised to see you, though. Mrs. Hudson told me that you were out. I have been, Watson, on a case. I just returned by my private entrance for some, uh, some necessary apparatus. Oh, good. Could I come with you? My wife's away, you know, but my... My practice is quite slack at the moment. Not even my trusty old friend Watson can accompany me on this case. It's a ticklish business. The fate of two nations hangs in the balance. I must work alone. Sorry to leave you like this, old fellow. Goodbye. Oh, uh, well, Miss Mrs. Hudson's making me some tea and some buttered scones. Can't you wait and, and share them with me? Ha, <laughs> huh? ha. Good old Watson. You're the one fixed point in a changing age. Empires are tottering and you talk of tea and buttered scones. Oh, I'm sorry, you must be awful. G- goodbye, old fellow. Oh, don't look so sad, old fellow. Hmm? The time is ripe. I'll tell you all about the case and you can write it up in your memoirs. Goodbye, old boy. Buttered scones. I haven't got any appetite for them now. Did you enjoy the scones, Dr. Watson? Oh, I'm afraid my appetite disappeared when Mr. Holmes left. It did, did it? <laughs> I see you've eaten them all just the same. What? Oh, oh yes. so I did. <laughs> I've got a surprise for you, Doctor. Inspector Lestrade is downstairs. Oh, is he? He came to see Mr. Holmes, but when I told him he was out, the inspector said he'd like to see you. Oh, he did? Oh, splendid. I'll ask him to come up, uh, please, will you, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Will you come up, please, Inspector? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Can I butter you up a few more scones, No, Doctor? no, 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 thank you. I, I really couldn't eat them. I'll just go and make some more the same. He'll eat them if I fix them, Doctor. No, 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 really, thank you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there you are, Lestrade. Well, hello, Dr. Watson. Here's a pretty kettle of fish and no mistake. Huh? What's the trouble? Well, I want Mr. Holmes' help on a most important case. Uh, where's he gone? Well, he's out on a very, uh, 
secret matter. You know where he is, Doctor? Well, naturally, I know where he is, Lestrade. My old friend never keeps me in the dark, but I'm not at liberty to tell you. Uh, perhaps an, I could help you a bit. After all, I'm not exactly unfamiliar with, with my friend's methods. That's true, but uh, just the same. <laughs> oh, well, Doctor, two heads are always better than one. Even if one is a sheep's head, as my old mother used to say. Are you suggesting that I'm a sheep's head? No, I'm not suggesting anything, Doctor. I'm just telling you what my old mother used to say. I'm really not very interested in what your old mother used to say. Oh. And, um, and now, Lestrade, your problem, please. Well, it's simple enough, Doctor. A German diplomat, Graf Otto von Eldenstein is his name, is in England on a very secret mission. Graf Otto von Handelstein? Hmm. Yes, I've... I've heard of him. Pray continue. Well, this von Eldenstein staying at the manor house at Ampton Wick, not far out of London. Now, this morning, somebody slipped past his guards and threw a bomb into his study. His secretary was killed, and he would have been too, if it hadn't been that he'd left the room a few minutes earlier. All well, these second-hand investigations are very little useless, Todd. We must both go down to the manor house at Hampton Wick and examine the situation on the spot. All right. Uh, get out the timetable and look up the next train, will you? Yes. Yeah. And while you're doing that, I'll... I'll go and tell Mrs. Hudson where I'm going. Oh, all right, you are, Doctor. Here are the scones, Doctor. I was just bringing them up to you. Scones? Well, who can think of scones when an empire is tottering? You're sure you're feeling quite well, of Doctor? Of course I am. Now, listen to me, Mrs. Hudson. If Mr. Holmes should return, please tell him that I've gone to Hampton Wick with Inspector Lestrade to investigate the von Heldenstein business. The von Heldenstein business? Aye, Doctor, I'll tell him that. Uh, uh, did, uh, Mr. Holmes didn't, uh, didn't tell you where he was going, did he? No, Doctor, he didn't. Oh, I see. All right, well, uh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Thank Are you. you sure you don't want the scones, Doctor? Uh, oh, no, no, uh, well, uh, well... Uh, I might as well take him along. I just say Lestrade could eat him. Ah, you're the one, Doctor. <laughs> yes, I suppose this is rather exciting. Just the same, I wish I knew what Holmes was doing at this moment. You are Herr Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I presume Graf Otto von Heldenstein is expecting me. Yeah, Herr Holmes. He was so anxious that you would come here to the manor house. I left immediately after I got his summons. He's very weak. He has lost much blood from the injuries he received this morning. Injuries that no one knows about, eh? Nein, Herr Holmes. Mm -hmm. Only I, his old and faithful servant, knows. Uh, follow me, please. I will take you to him. France, is that you, Franz? Yeah, Herr Graf. And with me is Herr Sherlock Holmes. Oh. Thank heaven you are here, Holmes. I hope I can be of service to you, sir. You can. You can be of great service. Sit close to my bed, Holmes. I have not much strength to speak. I'm listening, Herr Graf. You... You must impersonate me. Yes, so I gathered when I received your message. I am in England on a most delicate and important mission for the German government. Within a few weeks, uh, your government and mine will conclude a treaty outlining the German and British spheres of interest in Africa. I see. Obviously, that bomb was thrown this morning by someone who does not wish the treaty to be concluded. Yeah, exactly, Herr Holmes. That is why you must impersonate me. In 24 hours' time, I shall be well enough to resume my work. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, you can keep the secret of my injuries and also have the opportunity of finding the assassin. I'm quite prepared to undertake the impersonation, sir, but how can I possibly hope to deceive the members of your personal staff? Uh, with the exception of Franz here and poor Fräulein Ullmeyer, who was killed in the explosion that injured me, uh, my staff is new. Uh, they have joined me here from the German consulate in London. Uh, they will believe that you are me. Very well, sir. I'll try it. Uh, I have heard of your skill in the art of uh, disguises. Uh, and also, it seems to me uh, we are not so uh, 
unlike each other. I was about to comment on that fact myself, sir. Yes, and I think that a moustache and side whiskers will work wonders. If I can make the accent reasonably convincing... I will coach you, my friend. <clears throat> the splendid. Help me off with my coat. Will you, Franz, get me towels and a mirror? Jawohl, Herr Holmes. And while I'm applying my makeup, Herr Graf, uh, perhaps you will be so good as to give me the complete circumstances regarding this morning's attempt on your life. If I'm to impersonate you successfully, I must have all the facts at my fingertips. <laughs> Wunderbar. It is amazing, Herr Holmes. Even I can hardly tell you from my master. Yes, I think it's the wig that puts the fini finishing touch in to my disguise. How, how did it look to you, Herr Graf? Mm -hmm. Colossal. I feel as if I were looking into a mirror. <laughs> and my accent, you uh, find it reasonably convincing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Extremely so. Try it once again, Herr Holmes. Yeah, Herr Graf. It gives me the greatest pleasure to do what you ask of me. <laughs> Prächtig, splendid, Herr Holmes, splendid. Uh, a cab is drawn up at the gate. Two men are getting out. You can see them from the window here. Oh, no, it's the police, possibly, or... Uh... Wait, Scott. It's Watson and Lestrade. Friends of yours, Herr Holmes. Uh, one of them is my uh, close colleague, and the other is a detective inspector from Scotland Yard. Oh, you must keep up the deception, even with your friends. As a matter of fact, my friend's investigations will prove an excellent mask for my own search for the assassin. But... Uh... Well, this is a delicious situation. I, I hope they won't recognize me. I am Graf Otto von Hildenstein, gentlemen. You wish to see me? Uh, how do you do, sir? My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and this is Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Uh, how do you do, sir? Inspector. Uh, Dr. Watson, may I ask if I have the great distinction of addressing the Dr. Watson, friend of Sherlock Holmes? Oh, I'm very flattered that you know me, Herr Graf. <laughs> but who does not know the great Dr. Watson? In my country, many people think that you are the real brains of the combination. <laughs> Tell me, Herr Doctor, is that true? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that, sir. Uh, of <laughs> course, you have both come here to investigate what occurred this morning. Yes, we have, sir. Uh, sit and see, uh, please sit down. Uh, if you can find any furniture that is unbroken. Oh, thank you, sir. I must say the place is a bit of a mess. And now, Herr Graf, uh, please tell us exactly what happened. Yeah. I will tell you everything, Herr Doctor. This morning I was working in here with my secretary, poor Fräulein Ulmer. I had occasion to go upstairs to my room to get some necessary papers. As I came down the staircase into return here, I heard a scream from Fräulein Ulmer. Uh, a moment later, there was a most frightful explosion. The concussion stunned me. When I came to, my poor secretary was dead. Yeah, well, what people were inside the house at the uh, time of the explosion? The servants were all at the church. The only people here was my secretary who was killed, my servant Franz. I can vouch for him because he was upstairs when I went for my documents. There were three other people in the house, however. Madame Lisa Barona, my hostess and the owner of this house. A young Englishman from the home office. His name is Hilary Adams. And the third person in the house was a member of the German embassy, Colonel Schweiger. Oh, then it's just a matter of cross-questioning the three of them as to their alibis at the time of the explosion. Uh, I'll take them one at a time, Lestard. Ring for that servant fellow. What was his name? Uh, Franz. Yeah, uh, Franz. That's what I uh, This is a rare privilege to watch a master detective at work. Yes, Herr Graf, I... I shouldn't be surprised if my methods teach you quite a bit about the... the art of detection. Herr Dr. Watson, this is Colonel Schweiger of the German Embassy. Uh, where were you, Colonel Schweiger, when the explosion occurred this morning? I was discussing the military tactics of Clausewitz with one of the guards near the front gates. Yeah, well, what was the name of the guard, sir? Carter. Mr. Arthur Carter. Yeah, I'll, I'll check on that. Uh, thank you, Colonel Schweiger. Please ask Madame Lissa Verona to come in, will you? Questions, questions, nothing but questions. Leave me alone. Uh, well, uh, uh, well, sorry, madam. Uh, all I want to know is where were you when the explosion occurred this morning? Where was I? In my boudoir, listening to that stupid dabbling of the young Englishman, Hilary Adams. Herr Graf, when I offered you my house, I did not know that I would have to put up with the love-making of your staff. Everywhere he followed... No, 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 no. Please don't get so excited, Madame Verona. Questions, questions. 
stupid young English puppies making calf eyes at me. My beautiful house blown to pieces, and all you do it. Mr. Adams, where were you when the explosion occurred? In Madame Verona's suite. You swear to that? Of course I do. You may ask her. I've already done so, sir. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Thank you. That's all. You, you, you may go. Well, Lestrade, did you check on Colonel Schweiger's alibi? Yes, Doctor. He was telling the truth. He was talking to the Colonel when the explosion happened. Dear me, Herr Doctor, your examination has not been very successful, has it, sir? Everyone has an alibi. Yes, but the alibis of Madame Verona and the young Englishman, Hilary Adams, depend on each other's words. They might be lying. When you've been dealing with criminals as long as I have, Herr Graf, you learn to look far deeper than the obvious. Yes, the Strad and I shall return to London now and make some inquiries. You will hear from me, sir, before the day is over. <laughs> Well, I'm oh, much obliged to you, Doctor, for a very nice meal. Hmm. Although we've been talking in circles... Not entirely. Anyway, I have come to one important decision. Oh, and what's that, Doctor? Madame Verona is addicted to the use of drugs. The pupils of her eyes were contracted to pinpoints. It's an invariable indication of drug addiction. Lestrade, you go to Scotland Yard and see what you can find out about her, and I'll go back to my house. You can meet me there later. Yes, I wish Mary wasn't away. It's the cook's side out, confound it. I can't see a thing. I'll strike a match. That's better. Hello? Who's that in the drawing room? Who is it? Watson! I thought you'd never come. Holmes, where on earth do you spring from? Never mind that, old chap. I've come to warn you. Keep out of the von Hildenstein business if you value your life. Well, how did you know that I was working on the case? I'm time to tell you now, but I implore you. Keep out of it. There are dangerous forces at work. Horses that would snuff out your life without a thought. Please believe me, old chap. And do as I... Quick, Watson! Under the lightning... Bomb! 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 You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. All the time I need to remind you that, what with this being National Wine Week, if you want to take a gift to a young lady... Why not take her a bottle of Petri California Muscatel? Petri Muscatel is the kind of wine you'd serve a queen. That Petri Muscatel has the flavor of plump, sun-ripened muscat grapes, and is it ever good? You couldn't ask for a more delicious after-dinner wine, or a more delicious wine to serve when company comes. Remember, it's Muscatel, but the important thing is, it's Petri. Petri Muscatel. <laughs> And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's adventure, the Manor House case. Well, that was a fine place to break off your story, Doctor, I must say. <laughs> well, Jill, I, I thought I'd keep you in as much suspense as possible. Well, what happened next? Were you and Holmes injured when that bomb exploded? No, no, my boy. Well, the concussion of the explosion knocked me out for a few minutes. When I came to, Holmes had disappeared. And I can imagine where he'd gone. Go on, Doctor. Soon after that, Lestrade arrived on the scene, and after a quick and fruitless examination of the premises, we decided to return... Once more to the manor house. And so, an hour later, I was telling my story to the man I still thought to be the Graf Otto von Heldenstein. What? This is dreadful, Herr Doctor. The bomb might easily have killed you. Oh, I was ready for it, sir. Quick thinking and presence of mind of my stock in trade, you know. When I heard the glass crash, I, I found myself under the dining room oh, table. I'm most distressed that you yourself should be exposed to such oh. danger. Oh, not at all, Herr Graf. As a matter of fact, I exposed myself deliberately to the attack. It's an old army trick, you know, what we call drawing the enemy's fire. Come now, Doctor. 
You don't mean to tell us that you expected to have that bomb chucked through the window at you? Of course I did, Lestrade. The assassin knew that I was in working on the case. He followed me to London and fell into my trap, just as I intended him to, by uh, showing his hand. Well, I don't see what he's got you, Doctor. I myself must admit I cannot see that you are any nearer to finding the murderer. On the contrary, sir, the case is nearly solved. Well, I don't see how you figure that one out, Doctor. An elementary, my dear Lestrade, elementary. One of the three people under suspicion followed me to my house tonight. The second bomb was thrown at approximately seven o'clock. Now, it's only a question of finding which one of the three cannot account for his movements at that time... Then we shall know the murderer. You want to cross-examine them again, Doctor? Yes, the star. Bring them in, please. One at a time. Oh, Colonel Schweiger, where were you at uh, seven o'clock tonight? Discussing the military tactics of Clausewitz with Mr. Carter, the home office guard. Great Scott, that's what were you doing at eleven o'clock this morning, too. It would take many days of discussion for two students to appreciate all the subtleties of Clausewitz. Yeah, I'll check on that again, Doctor. Oh, thank you, Mr. And uh, please ask Madame Verona to come in, will you? Questions, questions, and still more questions. Where was I seven tonight, you asked me? I was listening to more babblings from that stupid young Englishman. Ask him for yourself. Mr. Adams, where were you at seven tonight? With Madame Verona in her boudoir. There is a curious sameness about the pattern of life in this house. Is there not here, Doctor? Well, I checked on Colonel Schweiger's statement. It was true. He was talking to Carter at seven o'clock, all right. Uh, well, could the uh, other two account for themselves, Doctor? Well, once again, they alibi for each other, but this time I begin to doubt them. Oh, why, why do you say that, Herr Doctor? Oh, I would accept Madame uh, Verona's alibi for young Adams. Obviously, she loathes the boy and wouldn't perjure herself for him. On the other hand, he worships her, and I'm certain that he wouldn't have any scruples about lying to provide an alibi for her. Well, you've got a point there, Doctor. Yes, I regard her with great suspicion. Here, yeah, come in. Uh, yes, Mr. Adam? Dr. Watson, I've been worrying about Madame Verona. I, I was afraid you wouldn't believe my alibi for her. Indeed? I have another, an, an unbiased witness, who can testify that Madame Verona was in this house at seven tonight. Come in, Franz. Jawohl, gnädiger Herr. Franz, did you see Madame Verona at seven tonight? Yeah. I take up uh, two glasses of sherry to her. Uh, it was a few minutes before seven. Uh, thank you, Franz. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Adams. I appreciate your concern. You may go. Yeah. Seems to me we're still traveling in circles, Doctor. On the contrary, my dear Lestrade, the case is solved. Indeed. You astonish me, Herr Doctor. Who is the guilty party? We will know in a minute, sir. Lestrade, bring the three suspects in here, please. All right, sir. When they are assembled, I will give you the solution to the mystery. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the mystery is solved, and I must apologize for any little convenience, inconvenience that you've undergone. You, Madame Verona, you, Colonel Schweiger, and you, Mr. Adams, have all unshakable alibis. Therefore, the solution's obvious. As my dear friend Sherlock Holmes has often said, eliminate the impossible, and whatever remains, no matter how improbable, is the truth. Therefore, the only person that could have thrown both bombs is you or so, yourself, Graf Otto von Heldenstein. Oh, George, I believe you're right, Doctor. Uh, what have you got to say for yourself, sir? Uh, that I, too, Herr Doctor, have an unshakable alibi. Oh, what is it? I was with you, Herr Doctor, when the second bomb was thrown What tonight. on earth are you talking about? I was alone, sir. Oh, come now, old fellow. That's not true. What? <laughs> oh, Holmes. What? Holmes, how, how could you? Mr. Holmes. Well, strike oh, me. Don't me. be angry with me, old chap. Oh, you made a complete... No, not at all, my dear fellow. Not at all. I've never I suppose you've got the real solution to the case, as usual, Mr. Adams. Yes, Mr. Adams, I have. Well, let's hear it, then. Might as well show me up Oh, my dear Watson, being, stop huh? berating yourself. You really handled the case very well. You made only one mistake. Huh? May I revise that dictum of mine which you uh, just quoted? Eliminate the possible, and then if nothing remains, some part of the impossible must be possible. Which part? Colonel Schmeichel's alibi was valid. So was Madame Verona's, since it was corroborated by the trusty France. But what does your alibi rest on, Mr. Adams? Madame Verona's told you I was here at seven. Yes, but Madame Verona is addicted to the use of drugs. 
I'm sure that you spotted that fact, Watson. Yes, yes, my dear, I did. Your mistake, old chap, was in not drawing the correct conclusion. Mr. Adams' alibi depends on the unsupported word of a drug addict. Now, the use of drugs notoriously destroys, first of all, the sense of time. Any trick such as the resetting of clocks could be worked on her without her noticing. Her word on a time alibi is completely valueless. Then Adams is the man who... Fools! Meddlers! Why don't you... He's a murderer and a traitor. Well, now that we're back in Baker Street, Watson, I may as well tell you that I had my uh, suspicions of Adams from the first. Well, you did? Why? Well, my brother Mycroft had told me that he was suspected of being a traitor at heart. He's been under observation for some years. He was purposely given this assignment as a definite test of his integrity. Well, I understand it all now, Holmes. It's the same. I did make an ass of myself in front of Lestrade, too. Oh, don't worry about it, old chap. Please don't worry. You you always uh, can correct that impression, you know. Yours will be the last word. Huh? How do you mean? Well, when you come to write this story in your memoirs, my dear fellow, you can always do a little, uh, what should we say, uh, re-editing of your own part. Posterity never need know. Doctor, that was really a swell story. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Sort of made me out of a bit of a fool, though. Oh, nothing of the kind, Doctor. I agree with Holmes. You did a splendid job. Oh, you really think After you? all, you, you did line up his suspects for him, didn't you? Well, uh, well come to think of it, yes, 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 of course I did. And you did make the point that Madame Verona was a drug addict. Yes, yes, by Joe, so I did. And you did say that Mr. Adams' alibi could be a lie. I tell you, you're right. I did solve that case for Holmes, after all. Mr. Bartell, did anyone ever tell you that you... You're really a very smart young man. I I wish you and I could work on a case together. We can, starting tonight. No. Uh, really? Sure. In celebration of National Wine Week, I brought you a case of Petri wine. And I suggest we start on it right now with a glass of port. Oh, what a fellow. <laughs> what a wine. <laughs> Petri wine. Mm-hmm. We know that's really good because the Petri family has been making fine wine since the 1800s. <laughs> for generations, ever since they started the Petri business... The Petri family has been turning luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And during all that time, they've been handing on down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. The Petri wine you buy today is the result of all that skill and knowledge and experience. That's why you can't go wrong when you choose a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what's the prescription for next week's story? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I think I can promise you a most entertaining adventure. It concerns a famous magician, a female spy of unusual beauty, and a man even more brilliant than Holmes himself, his older brother, Mycroft. Sounds terrific, Doctor. And before we say goodnight to our friends, I want to remind them that our men overseas need the Merchant Marine to bring them back home. The Merchant Marine got them there, and it'll bring them back. If you help. Right now, the Merchant Marine needs experienced mates, engineers, ABs, firemen, oiler, water tenders, and chief cooks. If you qualify, write or wire collect at once to Merchant Marine, Washington 25, D.C. Bring the boys home. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Greek Interpreter. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The thick fog that clung to Los Angeles made searching for the girl who was going to kill herself slow and uneasy. But in the end, I'd have settled for that and more. Because murder happened twice before I found the lady in Mink. 
from the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lady in Mink. By Pacific Coast time, it was only five o'clock in the afternoon. But the dense, billowing fog that was heavy over everything, like a huge, thick hand, said it could be midnight. And Los Angeles could be London in May, December. So when I got out of my car and walked toward the fuzz of red neon that marked the hotel cocktail lounge where I was to meet my new client, Grace Tyler, I felt all alone and a little sorry that I wasn't in some nice, cozy nine-to-five business that would leave me heading for home now. And maybe an evening with people who like to laugh. But when I was inside the lounge, which was imitation hunting lodge and friendly, I perked up some. My client was young and almost pretty, with dark shingled hair dressed in somber gray, and wore not enough makeup. Her eyes were swollen and red from crying. When I introduced myself, she tried to come right to the point. Mr. Marlowe, I, I have to find my sister. She... <laughs> oh, take it easy, honey. That won't do it. Who is your sister? I'm sorry. It's all right. Her name is June Drake, Mr. Marlowe, and she's in trouble. Mm -hmm. I got this letter from her. Here. Oh. Trapped. No way out. Take my own life. Hateful people. This is to say goodbye. (laughs) Who's this Melnick she mentions? Do you know him, Mrs. Tyler? No, I I never heard the name Melnick before. I'm Miss Tyler. Oh. My sister was the married one, Mr. Marlowe. Her husband was Stu Drake. He died a few years ago. I see. Have you been to the police with this? No, because... Well, you see, Mr. Marlowe, June is... She's different. More full of fun than I am. And, well, she gets around and sometimes with strange people. Dangerous ones. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Grace, what does your sister look like? Well, she's about my height. Has long red hair and she's pretty, Mr. Marlowe. Very pretty. Mm. Aside from her looks, anything else? Car, clothes? Clothes, yes, definitely. She always dresses well. Except that she's overly fond of furs. Most of the time she wears a mink stole. Stole, huh? Kind of a cape? Yes, it is. I see. June has an apartment in Beverly Hills, Mr. Marlowe. 3,300 wrecks for drive. Mm-hmm. I went there, but it was locked. The neighbors say she left for New York a week ago, and yet I... I... Yet she couldn't have because this letter was mailed here in town only yesterday. Is that it? Yes. Oh, please, Mr. Marlowe, do something. Here. Here's $50. I'll pay more if only you'll hurry. No, that'll do it. Why can I get in touch with you, Grace? I'm staying here at the Beverly Crest Hotel. I don't live in Los Angeles. Well, as a starter, I think I'll try number 3,300, Rex, for drive. I'll call you later. Goodbye, Grace. Outside, the fog felt about the same. But there was more of it, so I was 15 minutes getting to June Drake's apartment, which was a ground floor arrangement. Arty and about the size and shape of the Yale Bowl. I was only half that time outsmarting the cheap lock on the back door, drawing all the blinds shut inside and turning on a single light. But then I was no place. There were clothes in the closets, prettier ones in the bureau drawers, and it went on like that for 45 more minutes. Everything just as it should be and no lead. Until I was ready to leave. Then on a coffee table, I saw something that stood out in that nest for the idle rich like an ear-to-ear grin on an undertaker. It was a book of matches advertising Duke Gray's Billiard Academy, third in Maine, where particular pool players congregate. (laughs) That and the name Melnick had to dovetail or I was licked. The next hour was a lucky one. I found the Duke himself for both new and despised Melnick, whom he described as a hardly ever sober dirty word, front name Frank, who lived third floor rear at the Palace Arms. A tired walk-up, also on Main Street. So at exactly nine o'clock, I walked the length of a filthy corridor, stopped and knocked the knuckles on my right hand almost raw before the door inched open. And a pair of shifty eyes and a puffy, pasty face blinked out at me. Yeah? What do you want? If you're Frank Melnick, conversation. I'm not dressed for it, honest. This isn't a social call, Mr. Melnick. Hey, what do you think you're doing, shoving your way into my room? Who do you think you are? Name's Marlowe. I'm looking for June Drake. June Drake? I don't know any June Drake. Honest. You don't convince me, Melnick. Now shake the fuzz off your brain and start remembering or you'll find yourself in trouble up to your eyebrows. Okay, okay, I know her. When'd you last see her? 
Three weeks ago? Maybe a month ago. But she's an acquaintance from my hometown, that's all. Honest. You're a liar. June Drake would brush you off like a piece of lint and you know it. Listen, I'm as good as she is any day. Don't, don't forget that. Get your hands off me, Melnick. Now, get out of here. Go on. I told you it. once, Melnick. Let go! <laughs> okay, now start talking. Give it to me straight the first time or I'll get real mad. Come on, get up! Okay. There's a guy named Jaffe. Hugh Jaffe. He's June's boyfriend. That's all I know. Honest. All right. What's this stuff? These clippings and these pictures here. I used to be a photographer. Honest. Until your lens got bloodshot, huh? Yeah, on the Salinas Herald Star. All right, Melnick. What's Hugh Jaffe's address? It's 2001 North Beachwood Drive. Thanks, I'll try it. But if you're not telling me the truth, Melnick, I'll be back. Honest. <laughs> Yes. You want what, senor? I, uh, Mr. Hugh Jaffe. He is not here. I am Margarita Jaffe, his wife. What do you want with him? A few words, Mrs. Jaffe. Do you expect him soon? Since he does not live here anymore, no. Oh. You and Hugh are divorced, then. Eh? I didn't know that. And I did not say that. Now, what are you looking for? June Drake. You... What do you want to know about that? I want to know where that is. Can you help me? No, I cannot. I do not know and I do not care. But when you find her, senor, I hope you find her dead. If I'd have followed the approved technique, I'd have lost a leg on the lady's threshold. And I was about to lean on a doorbell again to try once more for an address on Mr. Hugh Jaffe. When I saw I didn't need to, because stuck over the mailbox was a letter forwarded to him at 41 Peacock Lane, Brentwood, California which was a half-hour drive due west of Hollywood. Thirty fog-filled minutes later, Hugh Jaffe and I exchanged introductions, and I stated my purpose. And I stumbled behind him through a two-inch thick rug that ended in an oak panel library, where he cigared me, then settled back and waited. We looked at each other until it became embarrassing. Then he opened. Marlowe, I wish I could help you, but I haven't seen or heard of June Drake in over three weeks. Well, I was under the impression that you two were on closer terms, Mr. Jaffe, if you don't mind my mentioning it. Not at all. He used to be, but all that's changed now. She was too expensive for me. A lovely creature, but terribly vain. Now that she's out of the picture, you're going back to your wife. No, huh? I'm not. Frankly, Marlowe, uh, my, shall I say, infatuation for June has completely destroyed everything Margarita and I ever had. Which I suppose makes divorce the next step? <laughs> sure, I wish it were that easy. She refuses to give me a divorce, Marlowe. Her way of striking back. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. I had a brief chat with Mrs. Jaffe myself. Well, if you uh, hear from June, get in touch with me, will you? I'll appreciate it. Of course. I'll be happy to help in any way I can. And please, Marlowe, uh, call me if you find her, hmm? The number here is Crestview 89122. Yeah, I'll remember it. Even if I find her dead. Dead? What do you mean? Why that? Well, from where I stand, Mr. Jaffe, June Drake is dynamite. And that stuff can blow up right in your face, huh? When you least expect it. Good night. Sure, it was double talk, but sometimes swinging wide and praying for a lucky punch beats waiting in your corner. Besides, that was as far as I could go on the book of matches. So after slowly walking a block through the chilling fog, I found a phone, called my client, and brought her up to date on the Jaffe Triangle and my own contention that if June Drake didn't try actually to kill herself, Senora Margarita Jaffe might. That grace wouldn't buy. No, no, Mr. Marlowe, I, I, I can't believe that. Well, maybe you just don't want to. But either way, there's still Frank Melnick. <laughs> We've already met Grayson. Believe me, he's got all the charm of a black widow spider. What does this Melnick do, Mr. Marlowe? I mean, what work? Yeah, he's a drunk. He used to be a photographer for some paper, the uh, Salinas Herald Star. Salinas? Yeah. Why, Mr. Marlowe June used to live in Salinas when she was married to Stu Drake. You sure, Grace? Positive. Grace, how did June's husband die? Stu? Yeah. He was killed in a car wreck. Drove it over a cliff. Mm -hmm. June just got out in time. Nobody knew exactly how it happened. It was a terrible accident. Maybe. What do you mean, maybe, Phil? Well, you might as well face it, honey, because the chances are slim that that's the whole story. What? Look, Grace, suppose... Well, suppose something else happened, like... Like June being responsible for Stu's death. Oh, no. Yeah, and Melnick, the photographer, with a picture to prove it. You know, a small case of blackmail. Oh, no. No, Phil, you're wrong. 
she wouldn't kill. I know that okay, she would Okay, okay. She's your sister, honey. I'll, I'll do the dirty guesswork for both of us until we get some proof. And right now, that makes back to the hacienda of one Senora Jaffe my best bet. Because the lady there is both jealous and hot-tempered. A daily double that always runs in the money. So long, baby. I got back to my car and pointed to the 2001 North Beachwood Drive again. I was feeling pretty low because no matter which way I added things, June Drake always came out a minus, which wasn't good. The sometimes lady had a real sweet sister. But then I told myself it was still the fog making the good look better and the bad worse. And to concentrate on my driving and the facts I had to go on. When I did just that, I took my foot off the accelerator and slammed it down onto the brake hard. But it suddenly occurred to me that I was going the wrong way. Because if I was right about Frank Melnick being a blackmailer and June Drake a killer, the senora would keep a lot longer than the drinking man in the Palace Arms third floor rear. I was only three quarters of an hour getting back down to Main Street, but even as I started up the foul-smelling rickety stairs, a small voice inside kept telling me that I was too late. But a second later, as I moved quietly toward Melnick's door, two other voices, not so small, and coming from the room in question, said otherwise. Said that Melnick was still around and as healthy as ever. But better than that, that his guest was the lady my client was paying me to find. A lady named June Drake. All of which made this a good time for my right hand and the thirty-eight in my pocket to get together while I listened carefully. Then moved closer until I was next to the door. Oh, an empty gin bottle. What was that? I don't know. Outside in the hall. Open up, Melnick, before I blast my way in. Come on. Marlowe, get out of here, Joe. Okay. okay, wise guy, wait a minute. For what? The ladies' exodus? I warned you, Melnick, get back. Hey! Hey, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? Looking for June Drake, remember? Now, where is she? What are you talking about? I'm alone in here. Yeah? You always talk to yourself in a high voice, don't you? That window to the fire escape there is always open on foggy nights, too, isn't it? Listen, smart guy, I want to know where she... Hey, Ralph. Wait a minute, this mink stole here. Maybe it doesn't matter where she went. Maybe she'll be back after she thinks I'm gone. I don't think so. You see, Mr. June Drake never left. She's right behind you, stupid. Yes. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... You'll find both pleasure and a chance for profit when you listen to Sing It Again, CBS's hour-long Saturday night cavalcade of melody, riddles, and prizes. Your chance for the greatest prize in radio, $53,000. When Sing It Again comes your way over most of these same CBS network stations later tonight, be sure you're listening. 53000 It might be yours. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Lady in Mink. Maybe Joan Drake could use the spiked heel of a shoe, maybe the butt of a pistol, but either way, it didn't matter because on the way to the floor, I'd bounced once off the sharp corner of an end table, and this was why all the lights in the world had gone out for me at once. Now, as they blinked on again one at a time, and I dragged myself hand over hand along the length of an iron bedpost until I was standing, I saw there was blood oozing from a cut on the right side of my face. But as the two rooms focused into one again... I forgot about the slightly battered Marlowe and concentrated instead on an open newspaper lying at my feet. Because written across it with an eyebrow pencil and firm but feminine hand were the words, Grace, call off your private detective. It's too late to help me. I'm near the end. But before I go, I'm going to take the two people with me who have wrecked my life. Goodbye, June. At that, I started for the door in a hall phone to call the police. But then I stopped. Conscious for the first time of the half circle of hushed, gaping faces in bathrobes that stood in the doorway. The gaping faces that weren't turned toward me, but over to a shadowed corner where, face down in a pool of his own blood, was the dead form of Frank Melnick. In the middle of his back, an ice pick, red to the hilt. <laughs> Barra's office. Sergeant Mooney speaking. Marlo Mooney, where's he Barra? He had to go out of town. Oh. Well, look, Mooney, I'm at a place called the Palace Arms on Main near 4th. Third floor rear, there's a man named Frank Melnick with an ice pick in his back. 
very dead. Know who he is, Marlowe? Yeah, an ex-newspaper photographer, drunk and, I think, a blackmailer in reverse order. Any idea who did it? Uh-huh. One June Drake, a red-headed lady in mink. Was out to kill herself just as soon as she tidies up her affairs a bit, which I think includes killing again. So if you'll put out a call for her, the mink, by the way, is a cape. The lady, young and about 5'6", I'll try to get to what I think is her next stop before she does. Call you later. When I got through to my client and broke the news, she gasped and kept repeating no in a small, strained voice that kicked at the lining of my insides no matter how fast I talked. So in one breath, I told her that I was going first for Margarita Jaffe, then her husband, either of whom could be next on June Drake's final agenda. Then I gave her the Crestview phone number that Hugh Jaffe had given me. Told her to call me there in an hour, hung up and ran for my car in 2001, North Beachwood Drive. Feeling punk. It was a minute better than midnight when I got there, and it was ten wet, dripping minutes more before the door finally opened. A hatchet-faced housekeeper with a stocking on her head said that Mrs. Jaffe had left a half hour ago, saying something about meeting a woman. And the housekeeper would have said more, but I was already back in my car heading for Brentwood in number 41, Peacock Lane. There, the Oriental houseboy said the boss man was busy playing poker in the den. In something stronger than Esperanto, I made it clear that my business was more important. A minute later, a door opened on the far side of the room. Excuse me, gentlemen. Yes. Oh, God, go ahead. <clears throat> Well, aren't you working a little late tonight, Marlowe? Murder isn't always done during office hours, Mr. Jaffe. Murder? Yeah, with an ice pick at that. Tell me, have you heard from your wife or June Drake tonight? No, of course not. Why do you ask? Because June Drake just killed a man named Melnick. Killed a man? Why, that... That's what, Mr. Jaffe? That's hard to believe. Why? Because it was a man? What were you expecting? Don't be absurd, Marlowe. I was expecting nothing like this at all. It's a shock to me, and... Yeah, excuse me. I'll take it myself, Jung, in the dining room. Be with you in a minute, Marlowe. All right, Mr. Jaffe. Make it fast, will you? Love to listen on telephone. June, listen to me. You don't know what you... Wait a minute. There's a private detective here. I think he's listening in on the extension. It doesn't matter anymore. Nobody can stop me now, Hugh. I... I'm leaving tonight. I only call to let you know that you don't have to worry anymore, that I won't be any... Never mind with... that. Where are you, June? Tell me. I'm out in Santa Monica, the Ocean Way Hotel. But don't try to do anything, Hugh. It's too late. Much too late. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. Pretty talkative. Well, you heard that, didn't you? Yeah, I heard it all right. You heard that too, didn't you? And I didn't like it, Jeffy, so... Oh, don't bother. This one's mine. I'm expecting it. Hello? Hello, I wanted... Oh, is that you, Marlo? Yeah. Look, Grace, your sister just called and... Oh, well, it doesn't look too good, honey. Oh, Grace called there. Oh, but Phil, where is she? Do you know? Is she all right? No, no, she but... isn't, Grace. What? Any way you look at it. Now, tell me, where are you? At my place, the Beverly Crest Hotel. All right, now stay there. I'll talk to you as soon as I can, Grace. Goodbye. But, but where are you going? Thanks for your cooperation, Jeffy. It's been a lot of help. I'll also talk to you as soon as I can. Believe me. When I got outside, piled into my car and took off, I didn't know if I was racing to keep a mixed-up girl from committing suicide or going after a murderer who was scheduled to kill again. I was 20 precious minutes following the wriggle at Sunset Boulevard from Brentwood to Santa Monica, where it hits into US-101 that parallels the Pacific. And out there with the fog even thicker, I was 20 minutes again finding the Ocean Way Hotel. The landlady there was a fat henna blonde with a mouthful of gold and foul language. She said that she never heard of a June Drake until I lied that I was an L.A. cop described the girl as a lot of red hair flowing over a mink stole who could be using any name. Then she told me that what I called June had just been a woman visitor a little while ago. At that, we started down a short corridor to a rented room, fast. I, I wouldn't do this for no one but a cop. Brother, believe me, we both better be talking about the same girl. Raising a fuss at this hour of the night. It's a room there. No light on. I thought you said she had a visitor. Maybe the visitor went home. What do you expect? Two o'clock in the morning. Mm, not a peep. Come on, open it up. Open it up. Now he tells me. He's got my keys are over on the other side in my room. Okay, and then we'll get in the hard way. You cut it out, you'll bust my door. Take it easy, Blondie. You're in for a shock. Oh, dear. Okay, turn the lights on. Oh. That, that's the woman that visited her. Yeah. Spanish woman known as Margarita Jaffe. 
Ice pick and all. I better get a little air over here by the window. I don't feel so good. Yeah, and I better get to a phone and... It is a cigarette over there. It's still smoldering. She may not be very far away. Brother, you said a mouthful. Come here and look. What is it? What do you see? Right there. Near the pier under that street lamp. Ain't that the one you're after? Where? Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Red hair and mink stolen She's seen us. Right out to the end of the pier. Yeah, she's running. Call the cops. Blondie, sit tight. Yeah. I'll see you later. <laughs> By the time I got out to the street and across the way we'd seen her, she was already out onto the pier. I caught one glimpse of her red hair and then nothing but the fog that swallowed her up like she was made of smoke. I ran toward the spot where she had disappeared and tried to yell over the crash of the waves for her to come back when I heard it. <laughs> After that, things happened fast. From somewhere, the cop on the beat, then Blondie, then a couple of scared kids who'd been necking in a car, and then more. Uh, I knew it. Oh, I knew it. I saw her pass me a couple of minutes ago. Dressed too nice. I should have stopped her. Mr. Mr. Cheejump? Yeah. Officer, oh. shine your light over there, will you? I thought I saw something move. Oh, okay, but in this fog, we won't be able to see much. Besides, for those waves in the undertow around here, she hasn't got a chance. Maybe not. You never can tell. Huh? Hey, hey, move the light over a little. To your left. Yeah, oh. that's it. There on the piling. I don't see nothing there. Just a greasy pole. And... Now, here, look. On that cross piece near the water line on the piling. Was that hers? Yeah, that was hers, all right. What is it, mister? That blondie is a very valuable fur. A stole made of mink. I never could figure where people came from at three o'clock in the morning when something nasty happened. But they always do. Some come to help, some just to stare, and others maybe to see if they can take it. An hour after I'd heard June Drake scream, we'd found nothing but the stole. I couldn't take any more. Maybe it was still the fog. Maybe... Maybe it was the thought that in the hotel room up in Beverly Hills, a sweet kid named Grace Tyler was waiting to hear from me. And I knew that sooner or later I had to call her. I lit a cigarette and started to walk across the ocean way in the nearest phone. But then, just as I was about to enter the hotel lobby, I stopped. And slowly turned back toward the pier in the swirling cloak of ocean-covering fog. A crazy thought seeping into my mind like an ever-widening circle of ink into a white blotter. Until finally there was nothing but dark. I made my call to Grace and told her to get downstairs into a taxi and over to police headquarters where we had a long story to tell. An hour later, we were sitting in Ibarra's office and Sergeant Mooney knew what had happened from the time I had first met Grace at five o'clock that afternoon. Well, Marlowe... Looks like June Drake meant what she said in that note. She took care of Melnick, Mrs. Jaffe, and then herself. Did they recover the body before you left? No, Sergeant, they didn't. And I don't think they will. You mean the undertow? No, I don't. I mean something a little more treacherous. What are you saying, Phil? That this whole thing was a frame, Grace. The interested parties, Hugh Jaffe and your sister, June. The object, get rid of the difficult Mrs. Jaffe. The means, have June Drake kill her without keeping her intentions much of a secret and then... Have June Drake pretend to kill herself. The result? The police never bother looking for June Drake, and when all is forgotten, June and Hugh Jaffe get together in some other city under some other name. Oh, no. No, Phil, I don't believe that. I don't believe any of this. I can't. I won't. I don't believe... Hold it, please, Miss Tyler. I'm sorry. Go on, Phil. Well, this part's a guess at the moment, but I think it'll hang together. Mrs. Jaffe wouldn't give Hugh a divorce. Jealousy? Yeah, that and one idiosyncrasy. The senora was crazy about money. And since he was doing the running around, a divorce would cost him much more than he was willing to pay. Which means that although Miss Tyler here hired you, you fell into the stellar role of the patsy, the Mm. star witness. Would always be close enough to later tell a story they wanted told, but never close enough to actually catch June Drake, who has already murdered twice tonight. Right. Then, Marlowe, big question. Where is June Drake now? That is something I worked on all night. I almost had the answer once. I almost caught June at Melnick's flat in the Palace Arms because I surprised her. She thought I was going to Mrs. Jaffe's house at the time, but I changed my mind. Remember, Grace? What? Oh, you must remember, baby. You were there. You're June Drake. Well, Phil... Now that we've picked up Hugh Jaffe and it's all over, I still don't see how you actually knew that Grace Tyler and June Drake were one and the same. I was lucky, Mooney. 
When Grace called me at Hugh Jaffe's house right after she called as June, I heard a bell buoy in the background over the phone. But I didn't think much about it at the time. Yet Grace claimed to be at her hotel in Beverly Hills. It wasn't until I began to think of the whole thing as a frame that everything fell into place. The clues planted so I couldn't miss them all the way down the line. The book of matches, the mink, the red hair was a fall. And another thing, Mooney. Hugh Jaffe was much too surprised when I told him that June Drake had killed Melnick, a man. He expected the murder of his wife, Margarita. Well, why did June kill Frank Melnick? Because he was blackmailing her. You see, Melnick knew that June had murdered her first husband. June was stuck. She couldn't let her future husband know what had happened to her past one. So she included him in as victim number two. <laughs> Besides, that's the only final payment she can ever make to a blackmailer. Mm-hmm. Then, Marlowe, June Drake is the real person that never actually was a sister named Grace Tyler, was it? No. No, I guess there never was a Grace Tyler. Ever. Good night, Sergeant. Outside, it was that strange time between the end of one night and the beginning of the day that follows. When I looked up, I could see that the thick, heavy fog that had been with me ever since I first met the woman called Grace Tyler was lifting, breaking apart, so that here and there it was only thin, spiraling wisps above which there was the pale, gray promise of a nice tomorrow. As I walked along, it seemed to me that there was less and less fog. Until by the time I'd gone a few blocks, I was sure that I could feel fresh air, cold against my face, and clean. I figured I might walk until the sun came up. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Lillian Bayef, Edgar Barrier, Whitfield Connor, Ann Morrison, Lou Krugman, and Jimmy Eagles. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... An iron skull was their trademark. Their business was climbing walls, and it was all done on wheels at 70 miles an hour. But that was a cinch for the death cheaters until they felt murder with a feminine touch. Sunday is a day when CBS brings you the tops in comedy, but it's also a day when you'll find big-hearted Danny Clover patrolling the Great White Way. Broadway is my beat, says Danny Clover, and every Sunday he brings you a new adventure along the main stem. On CBS Sundays, you'll also find Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade cutting another of his famous capers. Broadway is my beat, and the adventures of Sam Spade are regular Sunday features on most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse in every plot. Oh, Rick, that's awful. I know, Helen, but my sense of humor is out of gas. Oh, what's the matter? No business? Not for a week. 
If a client walked in now, I'd probably swear it was an hallucination and referred to Bellevue. Walk's been trying to get you. He called here about five minutes ago, said it was important. I just got in the office. I'll give him a call. Am I going to see you tonight? You know it. Me and my empty wallet will be glad to stop over for dinner. Well, I'll have Francis fix something healthy. Tell him to cook some money. <laughs> I'll see you around seven, then. Don't forget to call Walt. Bye. Bye. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's by a morning Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Oh, you want to talk to me, Fatty? Rick? How many people called you Fatty? Where the devil have you been? I called you at your apartment all morning. Uh, Helen just told me I slept late. Well, why didn't you answer your phone? Rent was due. Could have been a trap. Can you come down here? Well, if it's important, I can come down. But if a potential client gives up because he can't find me, I may have a crying jag all over your office. I'll stock up on hankies. I wouldn't ask you, Rick, but it is important, very. Well, don't sound like the last course of gloomy Sunday. I'll be there. Relax. I knew Walt was on the level because every time he thought something was important, he came on in a higher register and began to sound like a harp. Well, I closed the office, set the bear trap in front of the door in case of a client, and left a box lunch. I might be gone for a good while this time, and if I caught something, there was no sense to let it starve. The fifth precinct was 20 blocks away, so being a practical man who always regards that lonely feeling in his pocket as the sure makings of a pedestrian, I insulted a few well-meaning cab drivers, and 30 minutes later, I limped into the squad room of the fifth precinct police station. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? In my business, you have to be conditioned to anything. Nothing should surprise you. But in my business, like any other, there's always a first time for everything. And it looked like this was it. For over a year, I had been walking leisurely into the squad room of the 5th Precinct and smiling inside when I spotted the cop with a battering ram for a head and landing barges for feet. He was always the best straight man I'd ever run across, and his name was Sergeant Otis Lovelorn. But this day, dear old Otis was not to be found. Instead, sitting at his desk, looking up at me through a pair of thick horn-rimmed glasses, was something else. It pulled out a clean white handkerchief, removed the glasses, clouded them up with a quick breath that filled the room with the essence of Sen Sen, and said, Well, where's Otis? You mean Sergeant Loveloon? He's been transferred. He's been what? Transferred. Who are you? Sergeant Andre Klum. Is there something I can do for you? Andre Klum? Sergeant Andre Klum. Sergeant Andre Klum. Uh, just one moment. Yeah? Where do you think you're going? Uh, look, uh, uh, Sonny, I'm going in to see the lieutenant. You'll have to wait until I find out if he can see you. Oh, he'll see me. He just called me. May I have your name, please? What? Citation. Mr. or Mrs. Hey, this may not be so bad after all. No? No. We're going to have fun, Andre. Are we? Yes, indeed. Now, call in to the lieutenant and tell him Mr. Diamond is coming in to see him. Yeah? The gentleman you were expecting, Mr. Diamond. He's getting introductions now? Send him in. Yes, sir. The lieutenant will see you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Sergeant Klum. And uh, something else, Mr. Diamond. Yes? Sergeant Loveloon warned me about you. And I can assure you right now that I have no intention of becoming the brunt of your obvious crude comedy. Sergeant Klum, I don't think there's much you can do about it. Oh, Walt, I want to go on record right now as saying don't. that I... Don't. I know. Well, what is that out there? The commissioner says he's one of the most valuable men on the force. But how can you put him in a cop's uniform? It's like dressing Rasputin and the Mother Hubbard. I miss Otis as much as you do, but strictly off the record, Sergeant Klum has relatives. Oh, I thought so. And scratching all the way in here. Otis moved over to the 11th precinct. Who's he working for now? Lieutenant Crawford. They've had a suicide watch on him all night. What's this Andre Klum supposed to be so good at? He's only been with us for a couple of days. I don't know. Well, if I keep thinking about him, I may have to be dipped in hot tar. You better tell me what you want to see me about. You may not like it, Rick. Oh? This is new? Remember Ralph Baxter? Sure. I sent him up while I was still on the force. Yeah. Well, you worked on that case for over a year, didn't you? You were in charge of the department. You know darn well I did. Rick, 
You knew Baxter's habits better than anyone on the force. Oh, now, Walt, Walt, what's it all, what's it all about? Is uh, Baxter loose? Very loose. Busted out at 8 o'clock this morning along with seven other guys. Oh, all got away clean? Every one of them. One of the best planned breaks I've ever heard about. Well, if Baxter was in on it, it had to be. He's a smart boy, Walt. One of the smartest. Yeah, well, the commissioner says we've got to pick him up before he does any damage. Just like that, huh? Just like that. I need someone who knows him so well he might have a chance of nailing him before the trouble breaks loose. And you know Baxter and trouble. How come you're in on this, Walt? Somebody already get killed? Truck driver. Oh. Baxter's an unhappy boy. He kills to make up for it. Really does a fancy job. You want to help me out? You're in trouble if they don't nail Baxter in a hurry? The commissioner is uh, relying on me. Okay, then. Now, it's got to be official in case you have to make an arrest. Oh, now, wait a minute. Got to swear you in as a deputy. Uh-uh. Look, Rick, we've got to. I don't really care how you bring Baxter in and who gets the credit, but, but what, what would the, the commissioner, commissioner say, say if... Uh... Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry, Walt. Every time I used to put on that badge, a book of rules and regulations went with it. I do it my way or not at all. But, but... Now, but... don't start running your motor. I don't want the credit. The department can have it. Besides, it's 20 to 1 in any man's book that I'll never even get close to Baxter. Well, you stand more chance than anyone else. Okay, then. You still don't have to worry about the credit. It's 50 to 1 that the newspapers will read. Private detective found with his head missing. Okay, Rick. Your way. Andre. Yes, Lieutenant? Andre. Yeah, some name. I beg your pardon? Uh, bring in all the information on Baxter and the seven other men who were in on the break. Yes, sir. Andre. Andre Klum. Yeah. Yeah, you are, Lieutenant. You want to look over this stuff, Rick? Yeah. I want to know how, how the brake was pulled off. Maybe if we can get a line on who helped them, we can get it back to that way. A truck was used. Hmm. A Ford pickup that hauled garbage regularly. The large garbage cans were placed on the truck and taken off to a dump. The seven men in Baxter hid in the cans and were covered up with garbage. Oh. The men in the prison kitchen have all been questioned, but none will admit a thing. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Maybe you can tell us what happened after that, Sergeant. Several miles outside of the prison, the men got out of the cans. One man climbed up into the cab of the truck and ordered the driver to stop. He shot the driver, and the men climbed off the truck, rolled it over a 44-foot hill. 44 feet? 44 feet, 9 inches, at the first point of impact where the truck went over. The hill, of course, varies at other spots. Of course. Two cars were waiting for the eight men. Tire tracks were found and casts made. A report on these casts should be in at any minute. Synchronize your watches, then, Rick. Tell me, Sergeant Klum, have you any idea who might have been driving the two cars? No. Turning your MIGs and your ray gun, you're through. Very amusing. Now, please, Rick, for the sake of my psychiatrist, don't start on Klum like you did on Otis. Might be a woman. Klum? Driving one of the cars. Oh. Baxter was a known woman hater. You don't say. I suppose the other seven guys got together with him and formed a club. Four of the seven men were known to have had women friends at one time or another. But only one woman remained loyal after the men were sent to prison. How do you know that? I remember things. He remembers things. Oh. She visited the prison many times to see Tony Leggetti, one of the escapees. Maybe you can remember the dates? The first time was right after Tony was sent up. Uh, November... All right, all right, Sergeant. Uh, what's the girl's name and uh, where does she live? Jean Lawrence, 1782 East 12th Street, Apartment C. Uh, no, B. Butterfingers. I'll take this list of histories on the seven guys. You going to check on the girl? Yes, and... Uh... Thank you, Sergeant Andre Klum. You've been a brick. I left Klum polishing his glasses with Walt looking sick. Dean Lawrence did live at 1782 East 12th, Apartment B. So I looked up the landlady, a nice old reproduction of Worcester's mother with a hangover, Mrs. Shook by name. She was a little unhappy that I'd bothered her, but I finally sold her on the idea that she could shave any time, and aided by my best smile and the promise of a fast fifth, I finally got her to open the door to apartment B. There you are, lover. But I can tell you right now, Jeannie ain't in. Mm. Well, what's in this room? Bedroom. She didn't come home all day yesterday or last night. She didn't, huh? You know, I shouldn't be showing you around like this. <laughs> Except that you look like a real nice fella. And you're thirsty. Oh, go on. You see anyone else hanging around, say, in the last week? Yeah. Come to think of it... About a week ago, some dark fella started coming over to see Jeannie. Used too much hair oil. Greasy type. Think you'd recognize him? Hmm. You bring me that present, lover boy, and I could recognize a clove of garlic in an onion warehouse. <laughs> I'd make a book on it. May I use the phone? Go right ahead, lover. 
Oh, uh, by the by, hundred proof, huh? Hundred proof. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, well, this is Rick. I'm up at the girl's apartment. Not here. But the landlady says she can identify some guy who's been hanging around here for the last week. So look up... Oh, the... hold it a minute, Rick. Something coming over the hot shot. Okay. Oh, uh, bottle and bond, is that right, dear? Oh, lovely, lovely. Mm, lovely. Rick? Yeah? Get that landlady in here, then meet me out at the end of River Street, Pier 14. Something up? Sus came up. Someone didn't want it to. When she hit bottom, the bricks in the sack must have torn it open. What? A dock worker spotted her floating near one of the pier pilings. Jean Lawrence? Yeah. I'll see you over there. Something happened to little Jeannie. I could hear... Found what... her floating in the river. Oh. Well, if we're going down to the station, can we stop off and get that present? Yeah. Bottled in bond, you promised. I grabbed a cab and took Mother McCray over to the 5th Precinct, making one stop on the way for the promised present. I turned her over to the desk sergeant and took off for Pier 14 at the end of River Street. When I got there, I spotted the homicide prowl car and Walt standing near the ambulance. On the wooden floor of the pier, covered with a sheet, was the dead body of Gene Lawrence. The coroner had just finished his examination. Well, give me a full report as soon as I get to the lab, Lieutenant. Well, this is a rush, coroner. It always is. Well, hello, Rick. Hi, Charlie. Shot twice, then thrown in the drink. Yeah, nice, nice. Anything else? Book of matches in the coat pocket. Probably don't mean a thing. Lieutenant, we just got a report from the precinct. Hello, Diamond. Oh, good afternoon, Clum. You're looking fine. Oh, you'll be kissing each other on the cheek in a minute. Well, what about that report, Sergeant? The landlady Diamond brought in 22 minutes ago has just identified a picture in the morgue as a man who had been visiting Gene Lawrence for the past week. Anyone we know? William Nash, alias William Barnes, uh, alias Bootleg Barnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, five feet 11, black hair, brown eyes, slight scar. Uh... Oh, whoa, oh, hold it. What about his record? Uh, nine arrests, two convictions, robbery and assault. In the cafe business now at... Uh... Red Dot Inn? Yes, sir. Matches you found on the girl, Walt? Yeah, Red Dot Inn. Let's take a run over there. Yes, Jess, what'll it be? William Nash, you around? No. Police. He still ain't around. You got an office? Well, I... Uh... He got an office. Yeah. Where is it? Top of those stairs. Down the hall, last door. Go around to the back of the bar, Clum. Yes, sir. Hey, now, wait a minute. You ain't supposed to come back here. See that he doesn't have any way to let Mr. Nash know we're coming up. Just go ahead and tend your bar. You guys want to get me in trouble? Not unless Nash is really in his office. Then you don't have to worry about trouble. You're in it. Let's go, Ray. Down the hall, he said. Last door. We both go? Yep. Fire escape down there. This way, Sergeant Clume covers him. Can uh, Clume shoot? I forgot to ask him. You get on there by the fire escape in case he gets past me. Who is it? Fire department. What? Yeah, we received a report that your cafe isn't properly equipped in case of fire. Are you nuts? I just had no extinguisher. William equipment. Nash? Yeah. Now, what the Let's devil... go. Huh? You heard him. Hey, what is this? Police, let's go. He's clean. All right, copy. You want to haul me in? What's the charge? Murder. Murder? Now listen, Start you Start walking. Who's murder? Gene Lawrence. Down the steps. I don't know any Gene Lawrence. Sure, sure. Everything all right, Lieutenant? Go upstairs and watch this guy's office. Yes, sir. You need a warrant for this, you know. I'll get one. I tell you, I don't know any Gene Lawrence. My friend, I know a little old lady who thinks you wear too much hair oil. She's going to make a very big liar out of you. NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. All right, Sergeant, get the lineup going. Yes, sir. Henry Phipps. Henry Phipps, alias Henry Phipps. I've never alias seen Henry a lineup before, lover. The man you identified earlier from the picture. See if you can pick him out. George Chalmers. No, ain't him. George Chalmers, alias George Lippert, alias Geo the Lip, George Petty. Ain't him, neither. William Nash. William Nash. That's him. William Barnes. All right, hold him. 
You sure that's a man who was calling on Gene Lawrence? Yep, that's him. Why don't he use bay rum on his hair? Nash. Yeah? Yes, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. You know Miss Gene Lawrence? I told you I don't, Lieutenant. He sure is a lousy liar. All right, run him off. Step down. Hell in a... He killed Jeannie. We don't know. Yes, sir. He sure should use bay rum. <laughs> Well, Walt and I and a couple of the boys took Nash downstairs and worked on him for about a half an hour before I got tired and decided to see what I could turn up myself. Nash still wouldn't admit he knew the dead girl, and we still weren't any closer to finding Ralph Baxter. I was pretty sure that Nash was connected with Baxter in some way, or he would have admitted knowing the girl and denied the killing. So I went back to the Red Dot Inn with a warrant to search Nash's office. Sergeant Andre Klum was guarding the door in the best prescribed manner. Legs spread, arms folded, back straight against the door. You're flat. Mm-hmm. What? Oh, oh, Diamond. Uh, I have absolutely no excuse. I, I'll understand if you report me to the lieutenant. Uh, no one could get by, could they? Not without waking me. Mm-hmm. Then you did what you told to. You guarded the place. But there is no excuse for falling asleep on duty. Unless you get tired. Now forget it, I got a warrant here. Let's give this officer going over. And that's exactly what we did. We took the place apart, piece by piece. And I have to go on record by saying that Klum really knew his business. He didn't miss a thing. This might be important, Diamond. What is it? Bills to William Nash from the garage. Let me see. Mm. Nick's Garage, 13th Street. 1,000-mile service on both cars, 1490. Parking space rental on both cars, $25. Two cars. Mm, may not mean a thing. I'll check it anyway. Two cars were used in the escape, Diamond. Now, don't get excited. You stay here. I'll call you from the garage. I left Klum and went over to Nick's garage, looked up the owner, and he showed me the two cars, both sedans. 48 Chrysler and a new Hudson. Nick told me that both cars had been taken out the night before and returned early that morning. He said that Nash had driven one and the girl the other. So I put in a call to the Red Dot Inn and Sergeant Clune. Yes, the lab has two good casts of the tire prints. Well, put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to get right down here with him. I hope you'll forgive me uh, being a little premature, but... You uh, already told him to come down. Uh, yes. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant, you don't know anything about the fifth at higher layer, do you? One by uh, step up in one uh, and... Goodbye, eight. Sergeant. Well, this is Nick Miller. Runs a garage. Hi, Lieutenant. Hello. How about the cars? Uh, this one and uh, that one. Hold this cast. I'll try the other one. Okay. Fit? No. Those tread prints on that cast supposed to fit the treads on one of these cars? We hope so. How about that one, Walt? Like a glove. Try your cast on that car. Uh-uh. Fits this one, Walt. Rick, both of the cars were used in the getaway. What happens now? Go back to headquarters and tell Nash we got him dead to rights. We'll sweat him till he cracks. I got a better idea. Turn him loose. What? Nash knows that it's only a matter of time until we turn up his evidence anyway. And he knows something else. He knows Ralph Baxter. He knows if he spills anything, Baxter will kill him, sure. But we'll promise him protection. Against Baxter? Baxter'd get him if it took ten years. Not if we get Baxter first. Nash probably knows where he's hiding out. Walt, even if Nash knows where Baxter is, he'd be a long time telling you. In the meantime, Baxter can cause a lot of trouble. All right, so I let Nash go. So what? Get a hold of the newspapers. Tell them to run a story that you've picked up Nash for questioning in the prison break. But that you had to release him because of insufficient evidence. You think Baxter will go after him? Well, he'd at least send some of his boys. I think the girl was knocked off because she got out of line. You can bet that Baxter won't want Nash around for a witness. Okay. Gee, you're kind of making Mr. Nash a sitting duck, ain't you? Oh, I guess you'd say that, Mr. Miller. Now, why don't you come on down to the station with us and answer a few routine questions? Uh, hey, I don't know nothing about this. That's what Mr. Nash said, but you can see what a liar he turned out to be. We went back to the precinct that the garage owner was held for questioning. In the meantime, two men were sent to the home of William Nash and the phone tapped. Two other men took their places on a stakeout at the Red Dot Inn, another pair at the garage. The garage owner was cleared of any suspicion and told to go back to work, but warned not to say anything. 
About four in the afternoon, a call came over the hot shot at the 5th Precinct. My name is Barton. I've just been robbed. Where are you calling from? I own the Rome Jewelry Store. Three men came in and tied us all up. They stole over $100,000 in gems. Anyone hurt? My clerk. He's still unconscious. All right. What's the address? Uh, Corner of Wilmot and 21st Street. It looked like just a routine robbery at the time, so the robbery detail took over. Walt released Nash and called the papers. Around 4.30, Walt got a call from robbery. Levinson. Jennings, Walt. Those guys are held up the jewelry store over on Wilmot Street. The owner just identified one of the holdup men, Tony Lugetti. Oh, thanks. Rick, Tony Lugetti, one of the guys that busted out with Baxter, has been identified as one of the holdup men in the jewelry store. Now it starts. The gang had gotten away clean. No trace except a cab driver who spotted a green sedan in front of the jewelry store. Three men in it. We waited. Levinson. Sullivan. Nash just got a phone call. Man said he wanted to see him for the payoff. Said to meet him at the place, Nash left the house, Fisher's tailing him. Right. Nash just left the house, got a call. Let's go. We piled into the squad car and headed across town in the direction of Nash's house. A newsboy on the corner yelled the planted news of Nash's arrest, and the car radio told us what Nash was doing. Suspect just went into garage. We're parked across the street. Instructions. I'm about two blocks away. If he gets in his car, let me know. He's coming out, turning north on Chestnut. See him? There he is, Walt. We've got him, Jennings. We'll tail him. We followed Nash until he hit the outskirts of town. He drove for another good half hour, then pulled into a roadside eating place with a motel off to the left. Uh, this looks like it. Yeah, yeah. Drive past. We'll swing back. Nash is going into the diner. We'll walk up. Attention, all units. I'm at a roadside diner. The stop a while motel near it. Suspect just went into diner. All units proceed with caution. And a whole bunch might be in that motel. Mm-hmm. Hope the boys get here before things start popping. You said it. We can't go in. Hey, there's uh, Nash at the counter. See anyone else? Not from here. Let's walk over to the other side. Hey, Walt. What? Over there by the gas pump. Green sedan. You think it might be the robbery car? Uh, nobody in it. Look. Two guys coming out of the restroom. Yeah. And one of them, Tony Leggetti. Baxter's boys. I got a hunch Baxter's around. I got Tony's going in the diner. He's going in to pick up Nash. Probably going to take him for a ride. Let's take this guy before Lugetti comes out. He hears us. He's turning around. Police. He's going for a gun. You knocked him cold. Nice tackle, Rick. Vassar, 28. Here's his gun. I'll dump him in the car. Here come some of the boys. I'll wave them off. You get in the back of the car. Okay, I'll get in with you. I wonder where Baxter is. Can you look out that back window without being seen? Yeah, yeah. Two more prowl cars pulled up. Mm, the boys in the diner don't spot them. Nothing yet? No, no. Hey, here they come. We're getting a Nash? Yeah, holy cow, the whole bunch. Is Baxter with them? Yeah, and one, two, five others. They've spotted the cars. They're headed for this car. You go out that side, I'll go out this. You're boxed up, Baxter. Look out, Rick! Two of them. Two of them down. Baxter's heading around back. Rick, don't go after Malone, you crazy! Now he tells me. Stop, Baxter! You get him, Rick? Yeah, but just barely. That was my last shot. How was the dinner? Oh, if I'd eaten any more, I'd, uh, I'd need a new belt. <laughs> you gonna tell me what you did all day and why you were so late? Mm, went for a long walk in the park. Oh, that's what I love about you. Gone all day. Come in smelling like a shooting gallery until you tell me you went for a walk in the park. Oh, no. I'll get it. Yes? Oh, Rick, you gonna give me a routine or do you want to hear about Baxter? Oh, Harold Applenocker's tired. Let's have it. 
Giddy's dying in the hospital. Two of the other boys died on the way. The guy you tackled is singing all over the place, and Baxter will have a quiet funeral tomorrow. The others we got locked up. Your boys all right? One of them got it in the leg. Otherwise, okay. You were right about the girl. Baxter killed her because he was afraid she'd talk. Seems she had a beef and walked out. Baxter got worried. Nash was to get his tonight, just like you figured. Okay, Walt, thanks. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And thanks, Rick. Sure. Well? Well? Wanting to know if his boys were all right. Now, Rick, you've been doing something exciting, and I want to know about oh, it. honest, baby, the park's very dull uh, in the afternoon. Want to go stir up some action in it now? Good move. Rick, why don't you lie to me? Mm. No... All right, come on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're forgetting something. I've got to sing a song first. Oh, Rick, now that you've brought it up, I want to go to the park. Well, this will only take a few seconds. You just pucker up and hold. Well, 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 look who's here. I haven't seen you in many a year. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. Baked the cake, baked the cake. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band, grandest band in the land. Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band and spread the welcome mat for you. Now, I don't know where you came from, cause I don't know where you've been. But it really doesn't matter, grab a chair and fill your platter and dig, dig, dig right in. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. Hired a band, goodness sake, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Now I don't know where you came from, cause I don't know where you've been. But it really doesn't matter, grab a chair and fill your platter and dig, dig, dig right in. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. Hired a band, goodness sake, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Oh, how'd you do, how'd you do, how do you do? Well, still puckered? Mm-hmm. Think you can hold it till we get to the park? Mm-hmm. Now, you see, if you're patient, I always make it up to you. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle and Wilms Herbert. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Richard Diamond's Private Detective will next be heard two weeks from tonight. Check your local newspaper for the time of broadcast. Listen next week at this hour for Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, Soldier of Fortune. Remember, at this time next week, it's Dangerous Assignment on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us two weeks from tonight when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For all the family, try Father Knows Best tomorrow on NBC. Being a private investigator means two things. You can be sure you'll run into trouble, and you can never be sure you can get out of it. Well, there's not much you can do about it, I guess. Except, like Julie always says... Walk softly, Peter Troy. And now, Peter Troy investigates the blonde with the delicate air. This girl, Julia, met a moment ago. She keeps the bill collectors at bay and generally runs the place I loosely call my office. You'll meet her again in a little while. But right now, I want you to meet the lush lovely this case is all about. Her name is Caroline Varley, but most people call her Carol. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, sorry, Lawrence. I was a million miles away. <laughs> so I noticed. Cigarette? Mm, no, no thanks, darling. Beautiful girl. Soft lights. All we need now is the sweet music. I don't need a thing. Mm -mm. Delicate. That's the operative word, Carol. Mm -hmm. Blonde with a delicate air. That's how I'll always think of you. No. That's nothing. Oh, dear. Expecting anyone? No, as far as I'm concerned, whoever it is can go jump in the lake. Better answer the door and get rid of them, darling. Yes, I guess so. And hurry back. Huh? Yes, what do you want? Crack. Oh, Webster. Now, now, look, I can explain. Shut up, get back inside. Uh, uh, give me that. You didn't have to do that. I didn't mean to. He jumped me. Easy. Easy. No. No, he's still breathing. Where's the package? In the drawer of that desk. He put it there as soon as we came in. Good. Hmm. Well, what happens now? We have someone deliver the package for us, that's all. Anyone in mind? Yes. Troy. Peter Troy. Oh, that name sounds familiar. A private investigator. Canadian. Tough. Very tough. And a ladies' man. Oh, yes, of course I remember now. Open up here a couple of years ago. Done very well by all accounts. You think he'll do a job like this? Sure. The way we sell it, he'll be answering the appeal of a lady in distress. Meaning me? Mm-hmm. Not afterwards? Afterwards, I'm afraid Mr. Peter Troy will just have to die. Pity. Necessary. But well... Into each life, some death must fall. It had been one of those bad months. Seems no one in London needed the services of a private investigator. Money was like chorus girls in Alcatraz. There wasn't any. So to rent collectors and sundry tradesmen, I was but definitely out. But to delicate, dewy-eyed, husky-voiced blondes like... Carol Farley, I was, but definitely in. So, to put it briefly, I need protection, Mr. Choi. Uh-huh. I'll go along with that, Miss Farley. Springtime, a young man's fancy. This young man is going to try to kill me. Uh-huh. Well, that's no way to win friends and influence people, is it? Who's the guy? An irate suitor, Mr. Choi. He wants to marry me. I declined the invitation, and now he's threatened to kill me. And? The job pays 100 pounds for approximately two hours' work. That buys you a great A bundle of protection, Miss Farley. Has this uh, character got a name? Laurie Webster. He's a very persistent man. He's been pestering me for months. He just won't take no for an answer. It happens. Just not my type, you know. Anyway, he's coming round to my place tonight to propose again. And if you say no? He said that if he can't have me... No one else will. It sounds corny, but you want me to be there. I thought you might be able to uh, disillusion him just a little. If you know what I mean. I'm way ahead of you. My address is 15 Carlisle Road, South Kensington. 8.30 this evening. On the nose. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, ma'am. Carol. That's nice. I'll get some bourbon in. Bourbon? Don't all private detectives drink straight bourbon? You've been reading too many pulp magazines. I'm the exception. Scotch. Mm -hmm. I remember that. The exception or the scotch? Both. 8.30? I'll see you then. Hi. 8.30 on the nose. I like punctuality in a man. Come in. Thanks. Do you get many of these sort of assignments, Mr. Troy? Oh, well, I was, uh, I was going to talk to you about that. A hundred pounds, that's a lot of money just to dissuade a guy from carrying a gal off to the altar. Why don't I go to the police? Uh-huh. 
I value my privacy, Mr. Joy. Don't you? Yeah. Scotch? Thanks. A hundred pounds worth of privacy? Has he phoned you or anything yet? Oh, he won't phone. He'll just arrive. In the meantime, let's relax, hmm? Do you like music? Me and Beethoven were just like that. You can't dance to Beethoven. Well, that's the point. You dance very well. Thanks. It's a nice place you have here. It's home. No place like it. Hold it right there, Mr. Troy. Company, huh? Don't turn around and don't move, Mr. Troy. Nasty way to break in on a dance, mister. Isn't it, though? Oh, poor Mr. Troy. He danced so nicely. All right, Carl. Help me set the scene. We haven't much time. You must have a head like a cannonball. Oh, that's all I need. The charming and benign features of Detective Inspector Mellonby of New Scotland Yard bending over me. Oh, oh, brother. What are you doing here, anyway? Investigating? Yeah, well, I want to report a case of assault and battery. I was just a... Hey, where's the cute little blonde bombshell? Which cute little blonde bombshell? The gal who owns this apartment. That smack on the head must have addled your brains, Troy. This apartment belongs to a man. Or at least it did. Mr. Laurie Webster. What do you mean, dead? The aforementioned gent is, I regret to say, very dead. Shot at close range. That's what I'm investigating. Now, wait a minute. Where did all this happen? You got a suspect or anything? Because if you haven't, I might just be able to... Your first question is right here in this apartment. In fact, right here in this room. If you move your head a fraction, you'll see the late Mr. Webster stretched out on the floor just a couple of feet away from you. Hey, with this... This just doesn't make sense. As for your second question, yes, I do have a suspect. A private investigator called Peter Troy. Oh, very funny. But I'm not in the mood for jokes. Want to tell me about it? Tell you about it? What would I want to kill Webster for? I've never even seen the guy. Guns on the floor beside you. The Smith & Wesson 32. And I've no doubt your fingerprints are splattered all over the butt. Now, you know I don't use a Smith & Wesson. I've got a license to carry a Browning automatic. A license which I regret to say must be withdrawn. Now, look, there's a frame and you know it, Inspector. They set me up. I... Hey, how did you know about all this, anyway? A phone call, Mr. Troy. The caller said there was some trouble here in Carlowa Road. Yeah, with me right in the middle, huh? Well, it's nothing that the trouble is going to be just as soon as your I Your get... secretary, Julie's outside... Now, have Miss Summers come in, Constable? Right, sir. Miss Summers, please. Oh, Pete. Pete, they made me tell them about oh, that girl. I get it. I get it all now. Julie told you about the blonde that came to see me this afternoon, the girl who wanted a bodyguard to protect her from an over-anxious suitor, and you think I... I think you took your duties too seriously. You didn't have to shoot him, you know. I didn't shoot anybody. Oh, maybe the Smith & Wesson belongs to him, eh? He pulled it on you, there was a struggle... You got possession of the gun, pulled the trigger. Oh, look, you know me. I'm the sort of guy that goes around giving people lead poisoning. I could take that weasel lying over there, my hands tied down my back. That weasel gave you a fair-sized clout on the noggin, laddie. Julie, you better get hold of Randell. Looks as though I'm going to need a lawyer. You're already legally represented, Mr. Trump. Huh? All right, you can come in now. Thank you. Who are you? Oh, my name's Regan, of Regan, Regan and Forsyth Solicitors. My card. I should be happy to look after your case. And for the moment, I strongly advise you not to answer any more questions. Who sent for him? Yeah, I heard about the disturbance and thought you might need help. Furthermore, I think I can furnish the police with a witness. A witness whose testimony will clear you completely, Mr. Troy. Well, now, that's more like it. Where are you going to get this witness from, Mr. Regan? Now, Inspector, you should know better than that. The defense cannot give away its sources of information at this particular juncture... Now, I should like word in private with my client, please. This way, Mr. Troy. Just don't try and leave this flat, either of you. Well, now, Mr. Regan, I think it's all very charming, but... You're in trouble, Mr. Troy. 
that trouble. Hmm? In fact, it would seem that you could wind up with a rope around your neck. No, but I thought you said something about a witness. Yeah, I did. But I omitted to say in front of the inspector that my particular witness, if she gave her testimony, would most certainly take you straight to jail. You see, Miss Carol Varley was here when you shot down Laurie Webster. Well, I know that she was... Oh. You mean she's part of the frame? A rather uh, luscious frame, don't you think, to coin a phrase? Yes, I'm afraid you're in trouble, Mr. Troy. Real trouble. Well, this was certainly cute. This was really cute. This was the tender trap. The more you struggle, the deeper you get into it. But this guy, Regan... Now, here was an angle. Yes. A rather delicate predicament, isn't it? Of course, I'd like to help you, Mr. Troy. The lady sent you? As a matter of fact, yes. How come? She has a proposition. <laughs> she had one before. Look where it got me. This could be an answer to your problem. You see, I can tie up the police legally and demand your formal bail. Without Miss Varley's testimony, they have very little real evidence. You ever watched Inspector Mellonby at work? He makes Dick Tracy look like an amateur. Nevertheless, I can get you out of here. And? And naturally, we shall want a small favor in return. How small? From here, you are to go home and you are to make no phone calls. Tomorrow morning, you go to your office as usual and you pay particular attention to the parcel mail when it arrives. There'll be a package for you. It'll be double wrapped. Well, keep talking. Undo the outer wrapping, and you will see a letter addressed to you. In it, there will be some instructions. You follow them, but you do not, I repeat, you do not open the inner package. It's been specially sealed, and we shall know immediately if it's been tampered with. You're an untrusting lad, aren't you? Mr. Troy, all you have to do is deliver that package. It's not a very difficult job. In return for doing that, I offer you your freedom. I've got another suggestion, Mr. Regan. Oh? Why don't I just bop you one and make a quick exit? I may not have seen Melon be at work, but you have. How far do you think you'd get? Oh, about a block and a half. You see, my way, you've got nothing to lose, Mr. Troy. <sighs> okay, so I go along with it. But uh, just tell me one thing. If I can. Who really did kill that fellow Webster? But you did, Mr. Troy. Ask Inspector Melonby. He's positive you did. Troy didn't kill that man. Oh, I know, I've cursed that wretched Canadian troublemaker in my time, but I will say one thing in his favor. He's no killer. But the evidence, sir. What evidence? Look, a man lies dead on the floor with a bullet in him. The police surgeon maintains that he's been dead for 24 hours. Troy didn't even know a man called Webster existed 24 hours ago. Well, I still don't think it was wise to let Troy go, Inspector. Regan knew we couldn't hold him. We had to let him go. Incidentally, Troy's being shadowed. Best team in the yard looking after him, sir. Good. Troy's no fool, and I think he's purposely sticking his neck out. You mean he may be setting himself up as a bait, sir? Yes, the fool. When will he learn to stop poking his nose into police matters? Well, this time he really didn't have any options, sir, did he? Hmm. I wonder what's behind all this. Um, anything from ballistics yet? They're still working on the serial number. It's been burnt off with acid. They're putting it through photo analysis, but uh, it takes time, unfortunately. Yes, yes. Um, anything on the deceased yet? Well, we know one thing. He has a criminal record. Spent a couple of years in Dartmoor. Worked an old confidence game. Uh, but that was five years ago. Not a thing since then. Why was he killed? We get the answer to that and... Go oh, to the devil with Troy. Why didn't he stay in Montreal? <laughs> Pete? Present from Santa Claus for being a good boy all year. Pete. Hmm? I'm sorry about blabbing to the police. I had no idea. It's okay, honey. Well, I just wanted to help. That's nice. How is it you get yourself into so much trouble, Pete? Trouble and me got married a long time ago, baby. Will they arrest you again? No. How can you be so sure? Because Melanie knows I didn't kill Webster. Oh, but He how... was looking for a patsy, too. You got your notebook handy? Um, yes. Well, take this down. Mm. Troy... Deliver the enclosed package to a Mr. Giles Nolan, Honeywick Cottage, Levendale. Mm -hmm. Levendale, where's that? Uh, Buckinghamshire, about 40 miles from London. Uh -huh. Deliver it today, deliver it unopened. You're being watched. Oh, Pete. Make with the pencil, honey. You're being watched, and if you attempt to contact anyone else, there'll be trouble. 
Hmm, another word again. Don't allow yourself to be followed by plain clothes men. Hmm. And my angel, our anonymous letter writer, has enclosed 20 crisp little fibers. They look real, too. Oh, there's a postscript. No matter what happens, this package must reach Levendale. Pete, I'm getting that old feeling again. Yeah, it looks as though someone's going to try and stop me from getting this package to Mr. Nolan, doesn't it? Well, let me ring through to Inspector Mellon. Oh, no. Well, you just put that copy of the letter into an envelope and send it to him express. Address to his home, not Scotland Yard. Okay? But it'd be so much easier to phone. You're a sweet, innocent babe, and I love you like a brother. I've got a brother. You know something? I bet our phones are tapped this morning. Oh, Pete, don't go. Judy calls. See you. Oh, men. Peter Troy Investigations. Miss Summer? Yes? I gather Mr. Troy has left. Who is this? Never mind. Just don't make any phone calls today, Miss Summers. Otherwise, I'm afraid you'll never see your employer again. What? And don't answer the phone if it should ring. But and I... don't attempt to leave the office until 5.30 this evening. Stay just where you are. But I have to go to the post now, certainly. Don't attempt me. to leave the office. You are being watched. Leave the post till tomorrow or you won't live till tomorrow. But I... Hello? Hello? I couldn't care less who makes the delivery, Miss Valley, just so long as I get the stuff. Oh, you'll get it, Mr. Nolan. No need to worry about that. Yes, and what about Webster? He had an unfortunate accident. Yes, in other words, he was hijacked and killed. Sounds like Craig's work. Is Craig making the delivery, then? Oh, no, that wouldn't be very smart, would it? Webster's men know Craig too well. They intercept him before he left London. Well, then. The delivery will be made by a rather dashing young Canadian private investigator called Peter Troy. Private investigator? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Nolan. He's completely trustworthy. He had to be. He's living very close to a noose at present. And I've heard of Peter Troy. He's tough. He's very tough. But of course, that's the whole idea. No one's going to hijack that messenger. And what happens after he's made the delivery? Now, what will you think? Oh, I see. Occupational hazard, Mr. Nolan. He was going to do it. You are. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. Because if you don't, Peter Troy will get you, Mr. Nolan, no one way or another. I doubt very much whether he's in the sweetest temper just at present. As soon as he hands over the package to you, you'll give me the money, and then Mr. Troy dies. Excuse me, sir. These seats taken. I'll be my guest. Nice weather for this time of year. Isn't it, though? Going far? Oh, just as far as Levendale. I say, excuse me a minute, will you? I'd just like to get something from the rack above you. Can I give you a hand? Uh, no, thanks. I can manage. All I really want is this briefcase. Oh, there we are. Just want to get something out of it. My gun, as a matter of fact. Now, look. I'm a very nervous sort of guy, so just don't make any sudden moves. Well, now, I guess you're a couple of Caroline Viley's little playmates, huh? Mr. Regan sent you? Now, Troy. Oh, ho, ho. you know my name. Well, that's neighborly. Now, just take off your neckties. Our ties? All the better to tie you up with. Troy, we're police officers. I'm Sergeant Benson, and this is... Don't inspection. make me laugh. You characters have been tailing me ever since I left my office this morning. Okay, get those ties off, or I'll have to do it the hard way. I have to make a personal delivery, mister. Put the package on the table. Look, it's kind of dark in here. Okay. Don't even get to see who you are. You don't need to, Troy. You don't ever need to see anyone again. I don't like the sound of that. Don't turn around. Stay exactly as you are. You know, when people say that to me, mister, I get nervous. I start looking around for something like this table. All right, Troy. Troy. Come on out. Give me a good reason. Not good enough, Buster. He's got a gun. 
So what? You've got him trapped. Ah, the Lady Caroline. It figures. Well, this is your last chance. Throw out that gun, boy. You want it? Come and get it. What the devil? Something came through the window. Gas. Tear gas. Troy, this is Melanby. You all right? Yeah, but hold everything, Inspector. Police. I have a cordon of men surrounding the place. Well, keep them outside. I might be able to reason with this guy now. Not a chance, Troy. I'll give you two minutes, and then we're coming in. That ought to do it. All right, fella. You got no chance against the police. You may as well call it a day. You might have what? Not a chance. Are you crazy? They've got us cold. The lady's right, you know. They'll never take me alive. Watch it, Melanie. He's making a break for it. You fool! Come back! gas. Well, couldn't you find some other way, Inspector? In any case, how come you got to the scene of the make off Well, Troy... You can thank your lucky stars you've got an efficient secretary. Well, yeah, I'm glad you delivered a message, delivered but... Delivered the message? You don't know the trouble I had doing that little chore. I was being watched. I couldn't leave the office, nor could I use the phone. Then, uh... But at 9.30 this morning, I had a visitor. Guess who? You got me. Our very irate landlord demanding the back rent. I gave him the letter and told him to take it straight round to Inspector Melanby. Okay, so you're a genius. Troy, did you have any conception of what was in store for you? Yeah, sort of. But I had to play it out. Otherwise, we're going to lose track of our playmates. It is dope, isn't it? Heroin. There was enough of the pure stuff in that package to poison a herd of elephants. It was hijacked from the dead man, Webster. He had it smuggled in... Carol and her boyfriend decided to take it from him and make the delivery themselves. And the difficulty was getting it to Nolan. Webster's boys knew Carol's boyfriend. The delivery had to be made by a stranger. And a Troy. Well, I'm glad I was ready for the ambush. Oh, uh, and in future, Troy, please try to refrain from tying up my police officers in trains. They don't appreciate it. <laughs> they really were, you meant? They were. You heard what the man said. Hmm? Walk softly, Peter Troy. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Thirteen, Kara Star Times. They said my son was killed in a drunken brawl. I know he wasn't. He was a good boy. He was murdered. Why, I don't know. If you come to 733 Winchester Avenue. If you'll come to 733 Winship Avenue anytime and listen to my story, I'll be grateful to you forever. Mrs. Catherine Daly. And that was the letter to Box 13. Just a few lines. But, brother, what those few lines led to. And now, back to Box 13. I get some funny letters through Box 13. Some don't mean a thing. Others are from people who answer all the ads. But this one from Mrs. Catherine Daly. It had a real ring to it. I get so I can spot the letters from cranks and curiosity hunters. They're full of big phrases. It's the simple ones that count, like Susie said. Well, it's short, Mr. Holliday. Uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, what would you do, Susie? Mm, well... You know, Susie... I don't know how you managed to get right to the point of things so quickly. Oh, it's easy. Mm. Okay, you talked me into it. I don't know what I'd do without you. I try to make myself indisposable. The word Susie is indispensable. What's the difference? None, I guess. All right, Susie, I'm on my way to 733 Winship Avenue. <laughs> Mrs. Catherine Daly was a little woman, maybe about 50, 60 was difficult to tell because gray hair was pushing hard against the brown. 
It was her eyes that got me. Maybe not too long ago, they'd been able to smile. But now they were dead. Lifeless. Something had been taken away from... From well inside. She led the way to a little living room, furnished cheaply but neatly. She sat down, pointed to a chair for me, and then... Are you serious about that advertisement, Mr. Holliday? Well, yes, I am, Mrs. Daly. I, I haven't any money. That is not much. I can afford something, if it's not a whole lot. Oh, now, look, Mrs. Daly, I'm a writer, and sometimes Fox 13 leads me to a good plot. You see, I don't take money because I get paid very well for the stories I get. You see, I used to be a newspaper reporter. Newspaper reporter? Anything wrong with that, Mrs. Daly? Arthur, my son, he was a reporter. Oh, what paper? The evening record. Your your letter said that your son was killed. He was. They said he was drunk, that he got into a fight in a cheap saloon. Arthur was never drunk in his life, and he hated fighting. That his picture on the table? Yes. In uniform. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Daly, start from the beginning. Tell me how you want me to help. I'm sure Arthur was murdered. Murder's a tough word, Mrs. Daly. Tough to say and tough to prove. But for a week before he was killed, he kept telling me that we could get out of this house soon, that he was going to make a name as a reporter. But he didn't tell you why? No. Then, the night he was killed, he got a phone call. From whom? I don't know. He hurried out and... The next time I saw him was when they asked me to come down and identify him. That's as much as you can tell me. It's every word. Mrs. Daly, this may sound brutal, but but your son's dead now. Why would you rather have it said he was murdered? I want to show everyone he couldn't have died in that cheap, shoddy way. <laughs> Well, that was that. I believed her. Maybe it was the way she talked. Maybe it was her eyes. I don't know. Anyway, I left her house with nothing to go on but what she had told me. And that was little enough. Just that he was on to something would make a name for him as a reporter. Anyway, I went to see what Lieutenant Kling knew about it. About what, Harvey? About the kid that got killed in the saloon brawl. Well, that's what the records show. They show anything else? No, no, they don't. You know, I... I like you. Thanks. You can have the next dance. I'm serious. Okay, so you're serious. What about? You're not satisfied with the daily case either. What makes you think I'm not? Just the way you talk. You don't believe it's right. I believe what the witnesses in that dive said. The daily kid got drunk. Somebody said something to the girl he was with. Nothing bad, but daily got mad and started swinging. And? Then he ended up in the red. You didn't arrest anybody? Look, we get a dozen calls a night from down at the hill places like that. Somebody's always getting pushed around, roughed up, killed. Some of the things don't even hit the newspapers. Run of the mill stuff. Sure, sure. But look, Kling, what kind of guys get killed in places like that? Bums, winos, characters who hang out in those joints. But not a kid like Daly. And you're an honest cop. What was that crack for? For a compliment. The daily thing bothers you because you know as well as I do that something's wrong about it. Then you tell me. I'll try. Later. Now, look, Holiday. I'm not on the case anymore. Homicide's got enough to do without running down a fight in a saloon. But, uh... But what? But, uh, I don't like it. You're right. I knew I liked you. Okay, I'll marry you in the morning. The place you want is 183 River Street. Oh, nice neighborhood. You're right. The cops go in quartets down there. Thanks. See you later. And for the love of Mike, don't end up in the meat wagon like Daly did. Kling was right. It wasn't a neighborhood to raise kids or anything else. And the place I wanted was called the Riverview. Fancy name. Oh, a great place. I stepped over a couple of boarders spending the night on the doorstep and walked inside. There was a tinny piano played by a guy mechanically banging out a tune that its own composer wouldn't have recognized. The bar was set at the back facing the door. I went over to it. The bartender took a long, good look at me. 
I must have looked strange. I was wearing a necktie and a shirt. He walked over. Yeah? What's with, bud? How are you? Awful. You? Practically dead. Okay. Now that we know each other, what's on your mind? What do you got to drink? Arsenic. Want some? Straight. Water on the side. <laughs> Funny man, ain't you? Sure. Look, what do you want? A drink, maybe? No, you don't. That suit you got on cost maybe 150 The tie, five bucks. Any cook who comes in here dressed like you don't want a drink. All right. You in. Swell. Slumming, huh? No. Looking. For what? Last week there was a fight in here. A kid got killed. Arthur Daly. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Did you ever see the girl who was with Daly? I told you I didn't see nothing. Oh. All through the fight, you just kept your back turned. Yeah, I hate fights. Can't stand the sight of blood. That what you told the police? Same thing. Who are the witnesses? Look, when a fight starts in here, there ain't no witnesses. Everybody's blind. That makes it easy. You a friend of this daily character? Yeah. Yeah, a good friend. Uh Uh-huh. I still don't know nothing. Now blow, mister. Out. Get it out. He knew something all right. But he was clammed up tight. I left and walked up the street. I was close to the spot where I'd parked my car when I heard something. I stopped. Somebody was tailing me. Following me from the saloon. Okay, somebody didn't like me nosing around. I walked past my car. Just ahead of me was an alley, and pulling out of the alley was a truck. I walked a little faster. I got to the alley, skirted around back of the truck so my trailer would lose me for a couple of seconds. Then I stepped inside a doorway. It was dark. The truck pulled away. I waited. Then I heard the steps. He didn't know where I'd gone. But if he was going to pick me up again, he'd have to pass the doorway where I waited for him. Come here. Oh, 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 let go. Let go. You hurt me. Shut up. Oh, please, mister. I ain't no crook. I wasn't going to put this thing on you. It's idea of telling me. I heard you talking to Barkeep back there. I wanted to talk to you, honest. That's all. You should have caught up with me before this. Oh, gee, mister, I didn't want anybody to see me, honest. All right, talk. Oh. You want to know something, huh? Come on, come on. What do you want to say? Well, honest, I might get in trouble. Look, I, I got to know I'll get something out of this, eh? Spill what you've got and we'll see how much it's worth. Uh, maybe a fiver? Maybe. Go on, talk. Look, I could get in bad trouble. You are right now. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, make it a fiver. What do you know about Arthur Daly? I saw the fight. I saw the whole thing. Did you tell the police? Me? I don't get nothing to do with the cops. All right, tell me. This guy that was bumped, he didn't start the fight. Who did? A pug. Ex-pug named Billy Connor. The Daly guy didn't have nothing to do with starting it. It was a frame. Was Daly drunk? No, no, he had one drink. The girl slipped something in it. I saw her. She was a good looker, so I was watching her. Do you know her? Me? (laughs) Me know a thing like that? Nah. All right, well, here's your five. Now, keep your mouth shut, understand? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, maybe you'd like to know something else, huh? What? Well, mister, it ought to be worth something. I... All right, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, you ain't been out of the joint down the street more than a couple of seconds when a barkeep goes to the phone. So? I heard him tell somebody that you was nosing around. Mister, something tells me that you're in bad trouble right now. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had a few facts now. First, Daly knew something that might have got him killed. Second, the girl who was with him put something in his drink so he'd look drunk. Third, an ex-pug named Billy Connor started the fight. 
Why? The answer to that would put me on first base. So I asked around a little and found out that Billy Connor, a third-rate fighter down at the heels, suddenly came into money. And right after the fight in the saloon, I found him in a second-rate nightclub. You the guy that wants to see me? If you're Billy Connor, I'm the guy. Who are you? Knowing that won't make any prettier. Hey, you're a smart boy, huh? Maybe. But you're not acting smart. What? What are you talking about? You're making too much splash, Connor. The, uh... The boss doesn't like it. People might start asking questions about the money. The money you got for killing Daly. Me... Oh, no. I just started the fight. Then I ducked. Somebody else banged his head for him, not me. Ah. Uh, that's the way it was, huh? Sure, you know... Who are you, anyway? I get it, Connor. Wait a minute, fella. Why'd you say that's the way it was? Didn't you know? Sure. Sure I know. You... You ain't from them. Come home. You dirty sneak. You... You a copper? Maybe. Think it over, Connor. Hard. I left him standing there with his mouth open. I thought I'd found out what I wanted to know. But Kling told me... Doesn't mean a thing. You can't prove anything, Holiday. What if I get proof? How? You've got the name and address of the girl Daly was with the night he was killed. And you want him, is that it? You could get hurt. Meaning you won't give me the girl's name? Meaning that if I do, you're on your own. I'll take that chance. Do I get a name and address? Eileen Simmons, 4674 Roberts Drive. And I hope you get more out of her than we did. I hope so, too. I didn't like walking up a blind alley with murder at my back and maybe in front of me. I got to the girls' home, a boarding house in a shabby section, and took a look at the mailboxes downstairs. While I was walking up to her flat, something tingled the back of my neck. Something that screamed a warning. I got to her flat... She didn't answer. Then I smelled it. Gas. I stooped down and one look at the crack between the door and the sill was enough. It was stuffed with newspapers. There was only one thing to do. Eileen Simmons wasn't going to talk to anybody. The room was heavy with gas. The window I broke let in some air. Scared faces stared in at the door. I smashed open and I yelled at him. You call the police. Ask for Lieutenant Kling. Go on, hurry. I took a quick look around before I left. In one closet was a fur coat. And from what I knew about fur, this one took money to buy. It had her initials embroidered in the lining. But it didn't fit with the cheap flat. Well, I thought it was about time to make a trip to the evening record where Daly worked as a reporter. Some of the boys knew me, so it was easy to get to talk to Daly's editor. I don't know, Holiday. All I know is that Daly promised me a big story. Something he was working on. Now, look, Charlie. Any idea what it was? None. The kid was close mouthed. Oh, but you must have some idea. Didn't he give you any hint? Just that it was big and would blow off the top of the building when we printed it. How long did he work for you? Oh, about six months, no more. What big assignments did you give him? None. Routine stuff, he didn't have enough experience. Just out of journalism college when the war broke. Mm -hmm. Went through it. Then served at the war trials in Germany. And in the six months with you, there wasn't anything important enough to get him killed, huh? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, let's see. We sent him on a routine assignment to San Carlito and... San Carlito? What's that? Just one of those little islands in the West Indies. The paper's doing a series on Latin American neighbors and we... Anything there that might have been the big story? You mean what he was talking about? Yeah, that's it. How long after he got back did he begin to talk about the something big? Hey, just about the same day he walked in here. Where's his desk? Just outside this office. Oh. All his stuff in there? Uh, most of it. We were going to send it to his mother, but, well, you know how things are. It was too soon. We figured we'd wait. And... Come on, let's take a look. Just the usual stuff. What are these photographs? Never saw them before. Full face, profiles of men. You know them? Not from Adam. Oh, uh, Charlie, can I have these? Well, I don't know, Holiday. One ex-newspaper man to an editor. Come on, let me have them. Okay. I didn't see you take them. Uh, thanks. Now, mind if I go through the rest of your stuff? 
No, help yourself. I'll be at my desk. Right. I went through Daly's papers. There was one little notebook with an entry in it that read, Got to be careful. Never be alone. They won't dare make a try for me unless I'm alone. I've got proof on film. Photos of the men I recognize. Okay. So Daly's notebook gave me another lead. But where to? Well, maybe Daly's mother would know. I looked at my watch, but it was after midnight, so I figured it was too late to see her, and I decided to wait until morning. I wish I'd have gone right then and there. The next morning, I went to see Daly's mother, and I found her in the middle of an excited bunch of neighbors. When I got her alone, she told me what was up. There were burglars. They ransacked Arthur's room. Well, let's take a look. But there's nothing missing. Well, let's look anyway. They went through all the drawers. You didn't hear them? No, I slept right through it. Uh-huh. Mrs. Daly, what could they have wanted? I, I don't know. There's nothing of value here. Look, uh, when Arthur came back from San Carlito, did he uh, bring anything with him? Why, I don't think so. A camera, maybe? His own, but he took that with him when he went. Now, now think hard, Mrs. Daly. Did he take any film out of that camera when he got back? I think he did. Yes, I remember. He hurried out with some film to have it developed. Where is it? I don't know. Did he get it back from the shop where he took it? I don't think so. I think he'd have shown them to me if he had. And the roll of film he took out of his camera is still in the shop. It must be. Mrs. Daly, we've got to find a check for that film. The kind you get when you leave film to be developed. Come on, let's look. We looked and looked and looked. No check. It began to seem as though whoever ransacked the room found the check, and if he had, well, the thing was over. After half an hour, we gave up. But there was still one more thing to find out. Mrs. Daly, would you mind taking a look at these photographs? Do you know any of these men? Why? Well, I... I'm not sure. They look familiar, but... His scrapbook. The one he brought back from the war. There are pictures like those in the scrapbook. Well, show it to me, will you? It's in my room, right next door. Here it is. Here they are. The pictures. But I don't see... I think I do. But I'm afraid to believe it. Look, Mrs. Daly, whatever you do, stay with your neighbors. Don't be alone for a minute. I left the house, and the idea I had was buzzing around inside my head. If I was right, then the whole thing was fantastic. But the pieces began to fit together. Maybe I was thinking too hard. I didn't see the big black car that turned down the corner. I didn't see it until I was almost staring between its headlights. I jumped back and up, and the fenders of the car took the skin off my legs, and the car roared away. That big black buggy had my name for a license plate. It would have looked just like an accident. But it told me something. That whoever was doing the dirty work didn't have the check for the film. Because the proof of what Daly knew was on that film. And if Mr. Accident Maker had it, he wouldn't have risked another accident. I called Kling, got him on the phone. What do you want me to do? Check every Photoshop in the city for a roll of film mailed just before Daly was killed. How do you know he mailed it? Because he wouldn't have been fool enough to take it to a Photoshop. He knew they were tailing him, waiting to grab that film. So he mailed it, with a note that he'd called for it. Okay, I'll pick up the film, if I can find it. Oh, no, Kling, don't pick it up, please. You just said you were... Bing, tell me where it is. Call my office and I'll pick it up. Look, you're asking for a cray breathe in your door. If those babies are what you say, they'll cut your little pieces. You want them, don't you? Sure, but I don't... The only way to get them is to make them come after that film. And they won't call it headquarters for it, Clink. But they will try to get it from me. I waited. Finally, Kling gave me the word. I picked up the film and printed the little finishing shop. Kling had given orders that I was to have it. I got in my car, looked in the rear vision mirror, and saw a big black sedan pull in behind me. This was it. I couldn't spot Kling in the squad car he said would be handy. Maybe something held it up. I didn't know. 
I got to my apartment. The sedan pulled up behind me and parked. I walked up to my apartment, went over to the window, and saw a man get out of the sedan. He walked slowly and disappeared into my apartment building. I sat down with a film and prints burning a hole in my pocket. Then... Who is it? The holiday. I'd like to talk to you. I took one more look out of the window. The street was empty except for the sedan. No squad car, no clink. Brother, if ever I wanted to see that big guy, it was now. I walked to the door. Mr. Holliday? Uh huh. Who are you? My name is, uh, we'll say, Stefan. Okay, you're Mr. Stefan. So what? I shall be brief. You have a roll of film and some prints. I am a, a camera enthusiast. I shall pay you a good price for the film. Hmm. How much? <laughs> You're going to be reasonable. That's fine. Shall we say 10000 That's big money for a strip of celluloid. I am very enthusiastic about photography. You know, um, I like pictures myself. Especially pictures of some nice little Nazis who got out of Germany with a lot of money. Oh? You guessed, huh? Yeah, but Daly wasn't guessing when he recognized them in San Carlito. He wasn't guessing that San Carlito is a little island with lots of deserted coastline. Easy to land on. <laughs> yes, very handy. And they paid well to escape the trials in Nuremberg. You just talked yourself out of $10,000. Oh, now that's very funny. You would have killed me anyway, as you killed Daly to keep him from spreading the story. <laughs> You're so right. Now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that gun didn't look nice. He had it right at my head. I sat still. Stefan came slowly toward me. The black hole in the barrel of his gun looked like the business end of a cannon. Then... Get the floor, Holiday! Come! Playing at this particular minute, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> Well, at that moment, Susie, Lieutenant Kling landed and took over. Sorry I drew it so close, Holiday, but I had to let Stefan talk a while. Yeah. But by the way, where was that squad car? <laughs> well, there wasn't any. The squad car would have scared Stefan away. I had to make it look safe. Boys and I were right next door. Had been for an hour. Now, he tells me. <laughs> well, it's up to the Federals now. We're clean on this end. Gee, I sure... Oh, Mr. Holliday, you might have been killed. Oh, it's okay now, Susie. It's all over. But but you might have been killed. And I like this job so much. <laughs> what I say? Very funny, Kling. Nothing, Susie, nothing. <laughs> Good night. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> X3 Sentinel X3, now the most refreshing drink in the world, Orange Crush, presents the Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies who try to destroy our America. With his faithful valet Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld, risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet.
Now ride with Britt Reed in the thrilling adventure of Ceiling on Crime. The Green Hornet strikes again. The adventures of the Green Hornet are brought to you by Orange Crush, the world's leading orange drink that tastes better naturally. Orange Crush is flavored with the juice of fresh, tree-ripened Valencia oranges, so naturally it tastes better. Always keep delicious Orange Crush handy in your refrigerator. At your dealer's, get the Orange Crush Handy Pack. Six bottles of Orange Crush in a handy carrying case. Only three persons in the city knew that the young publisher of the Daily Sentinel, Britt Reed, was the Green Hornet. They were Reed's valet, Cato, his secretary, Lenore Case, and Police Commissioner James Higgins, Reed's close friend. Britt Reed and Commissioner Higgins had met for lunch at their downtown club. As they finished dining, Higgins glanced at his watch. Oh, I have an appointment at the federal building, Reed. I'd better hurry along. Are you still trying to help the government in tracking down the bootleg ring? Yes, but it's more than a ring, Reed. There's a vast organization working. They're making their own alcohol, bottling the stuff, and selling the rotten mixtures for half the price you'd pay at a licensed store. The health of millions is in danger from the poison those criminals make. And in the bargain, our government's losing tax revenue in the millions. You uh, haven't come across any leads yet, huh? No, not yet. But if I didn't know that Schmiggy Milton and his bootleg mob had faded after Prohibition, I'd say they were behind this outbreak of lawlessness. It's almost as bad as the 1920s, Reed. If we don't nip matters soon, it'll be much worse. Back in his office, Reed was handed a letter by Lenore Case, who, with Michael Axford, waited beside his desk as he read the contents. It was from a Mrs. Effie Adams of 984 Stone Avenue, a widow. Her apartment was managed by the M.K. Realty Associates. The legislative ceilings on rent had been lifted, and the tenants of 984 Stone Avenue received a rental increase of 100%. As a result, all the other families in the building moved out, but Effie Adams refused to pay the increase or to move, unless forced to do so. She wanted the Daily Sentinel to expose the owner and his agents. Reed finished the letter. A thing like this is outrageous. Yet with the repeal of rent ceilings, an owner may charge whatever he likes. Isn't there something you can do, Mr. Reed? I doubt it. But I'll try. No landlords that I know of up there rent that much. You're right, Michael. They've been very fair. The Apartment and Realty Owners Association members own the greatest part of all properties in this city. They agreed when ceilings were lifted not to take advantage of the situation. And they haven't. I know that much. I'll call them. Reed telephoned and learned that the M.K. Realty Company managing the property was headed by a non-member of the real estate board. His name was Martin Keesby, and his business record was one that had brought him into the courts many times in the past. Axford, how would you like to do a little research work on Martin Keesby and this rent increase? I'm your man, Reed. What will I do? Interview Keesby. Find out why he raised rent so high in that particular house. When you've done that, you and Clicker Benny go to 984 Stone Avenue. See Mrs. Adams. Take pictures of the premises. Interview anyone else there. Martin Keesby, smooth and arrogant, tried to get rid of Michael Axford at once. I have no interest in what your filthy rag may think. If people can't afford to pay the rent, they get out. It's as simple as that. Nobody could afford to pay that much of an increase. And they wouldn't if they could find another place. The poor people who live there... Are no concern of mine. Mr. Axford, I have no time to waste with your sob stories. Please leave. Yeah. Axford, furious at being rebuffed, slammed the door after him as he left. Then Keesby made a telephone call. Come on. Schmiggy, I think we'll have newspaper people hounding us about that Stone Avenue deal. I'm afraid about those crates. Have some of your men get over there right away to guard them. Michael Axford was fuming as he entered his car, which was parked in front of Keesby's office building. Clicker Binney, the Daily Sentinel's vivacious girl photographer, was concerned about his mood, but amused also. Now, you're angry, Michael, so be careful how you drive. Uh, 
Watch out. Almost hit the fender of that other car. Well, why doesn't it watch where it's going? <laughs> ah, what are you laughing at? What's so funny? <laughs> oh, Michael. Michael, I love you when you're this angry. You tickle my risibilities. You tickle your own risibilities. I'm driving. <laughs> We're going to 984 Stone Avenue. When they reached the shabby apartment house, Axford and Clicker left the car and entered the vestibule. Mrs. Adams is in apartment 31. Shall we go up? No, let's look around the joint first. Oh, all those walls, Michael. Are they a disgrace? Well, they haven't been painted or plastered in years. And them haven't the nerve to charge Oh, Michael, here's an open door leading out to an alley. There are a lot of crates there. See them? Maybe they're for Keysby to make repairs he told me about. Those crates look as if they might have bathtubs in them. Maybe we'll take a peek. Oh, look at the size of the guy coming in out of the alley. A massive pumpkin-headed man entered the hallway, followed by three others equally tough-looking. What do you two want here? Get out. We're newspaper people, and we came to visit Mrs. Adams. Now, she's here. We know that. Now, look, Bob. I'm janitor here. These guys are my assistants. If you don't beat it out of here, they'll run you out. Oh, a janitor, are you? And these are your assistants, are they? Well, listen, three chin, I've right been around. There. You know who I am, do you? Yeah, you're three chin Pemberton, who used to work for Schmiggy Milton in the rum running days. And these three hoodlums Come on, are. Come boys. How'd he go? All right, they'll do you. Michael, they'll hurt you. Let's get out of here, please. I will not. Come I... on, get going. Oh. oh, all right. But only to please you, Clicker. Come on. Axford and Clicker, followed by the four hulking hoodlums, walked back into the street. Axford was bridling, and Clicker tried to calm him. Now, before you do anything, Michael, why don't you call Mr. Reed and tell him what happened? It's late. It's getting dark. All right, all right. I'll give him a ring now. Uh, There's a drugstore on the next corner. Call him from there. Okay. Uh, You come along with me while I fall. At that moment, in an apartment building on the opposite side of town, the stillness was suddenly shattered by a terrific explosion. And in a matter of moments, fire alarms and telephones were ringing throughout the area. Rick Reed, in his office, answered the telephone nearest to him on his desk, the phone that connected him directly with the city editor. Yes, Gunnigan. An explosion? Where? West 59th, I... Well, say, if it's that bad, use every man available. Who? Axford? No, he hasn't called yet. When he does, I'll tell him and Miss Benny to go there. Keep me posted on the details as they come in. Mr. Reed's office? Oh, yes, Michael, just a minute. Mr. Reed, it's Michael Axford. Oh, thank you, Miss Case. Hello, Axford. Hey, whoa, 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 slow down a bit. What's that? Repeat that part again, will you, please? Reed listened as Axford gave an account of his interview with Martin Keesby and his subsequent encounter with Three Chin Pemberton and the goons. Reed's reaction denoted concern, interest, and finally consternation. But when Axford finished his story, the immediacy of the explosion assignment became uppermost in the publisher's mind. Now, forget all about that for the time being, Axford. There's something more important on tap now. You and Miss Benny go to West 59th Street in the 800 block. An explosion has just taken place there. Read all about it. Explosion killed five. Here you are, sir. Let's select five. Police Commissioner Higgins stopped at the Sentinel office a few hours later on his way back from the scene of the disaster. I just want you to know that the men killed have been identified by fingerprints. They were all in the police files? Yes. And all of them had been arrested back in Prohibition days for bootlegging and traffic in alcohol. Yeah, the very thing we were talking about at noontime, huh? Exactly. We found three more stills in the building, Reed, which were not destroyed. Well, who were the men who were killed? Oh, minor hoodlums. I didn't get their names. I'll do that when I return to headquarters. I only know that all of them once were members of the old Schmiggy Milton gang. Clicker Binney reached the Sentinel office alone, turned in her pictures of the explosion, and went to Britt Reed's office. 
Chief, Axford didn't come back with me. I know. Gunnigan told me Axford telephoned all the details he had and was following up on an inside tip. Do you know what it is? Yes, and the police must know it by now. But when Michael received it, it was exclusive. Chief, that building where the explosion took place is managed by Martin Keithy. Keithy has left his office, and when I left Michael, he was headed for Keithy's home. You should hear from him soon. Uh, let's see, it's uh, ten minutes to ten now. Michael said he'd call you at ten sharp. Michael Axford reached Martin Keesby's house at 9.40. By the time he parked his car and inspected the house and grounds from the outside, the time was 9.55. Finally, the Sentinel reporter stood before the front door and pressed the bell. Inside the house, Keesby was talking with an unexpected visitor and was visibly nervous. But, Schmiggy, I can't admit I know anything about those stills in that house today. Your stupid bungling men were to blame. Are they... expecting someone? No, no. Miggy, what about those trucks of yours? When will they remove those crates from the Stone Avenue premises? When the neighborhood quiets down, about midnight. I wish it could be done right now. Oh, Schmiggy, stand behind that screen while I answer the door. All right. Martin Keesby walked to the door and opened it. Yeah. So you finally answered. Oh. Oh, it's you, Mr. Keesby. Just the one I came to see. Well, I've no desire to see you. Never mind. I've come to get a statement from you. Regarding what? Regarding an explosion that killed five people, that's what. An explosion in a house that you managed. I manage no houses. My firm does that. I know nothing about the explosion this evening. Nothing at all. Oh, no? And I suppose you don't know that you have a lot of police characters at 984 Stone Avenue, mild street in the public. I don't suppose you know that one of Schmiggy Milton's old gangsters, Three Chin Pemberton... I is... haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. <clears throat> but I... I am interested. Come in, mister. I'll come in, all right. Hmm. Have a seat. That chair near the screen is comfortable. Keesby closed the door and, with hands behind his back, turned the key that was in the lock. He pocketed the key and walked to where Axford was seating himself. I want to know what your explanation is about there being stills in the apartments of that house where the explosion took place. There is no explanation. I knew nothing about them. Oh, no? And I suppose you tell me that you don't know about Three Chin Pemberton... And those other hoodlums working for you at the Stone Avenue place. Schmiggy Milton's men they are. And that thing... And they... what? Go on, Mr. Big Brain. Holy cow, Schmiggy Milton. Schmiggy, you blithering idiotic fool. Don't talk to me like that, Marty. I had to come out. I wasn't going to stand back and listen to this guy throw out hunks of information. I want to get all the information he knows. About me especially. I know plenty about you. So do the cops. And where should they hear about this? Nobody's going to hear what you know. Except Marty and me. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Hello there, fellas and girls. There's one word in the English language I'm sure you often use. It's the word naturally. It's natural for you to use this word when you talk about the good things of life. And naturally is the word to use when you talk about Orange Crush. Yes, because naturally it tastes better. You see, Orange Crush is made from the natural juices of sunny California. So naturally it tastes better. Better than any orange drink you ever tasted before. It's the world's leading orange drink. No other can match it for flavor. That tangy, fresh fruit, orange crush flavor is so refreshing and satisfying. Your very first sip tells you why we say, naturally, it tastes better. Have plenty of delicious orange crush on hand to enjoy over the weekend. It's wonderful to serve with snacks when your friends drop in. Tell mom you want orange crush today. Tell her it's good for you, too, that it's made from nutritious, fresh, natural orange juice. The whole family will love Orange Crush. So make sure you get enough. Buy it at your dealers in six-bottle handy packs. And always ask for it by name. Don't just say orange. Say, I want Orange Crush. Because naturally, it tastes better. That's Orange Crush. O-R-A-N-G-E-C-R-U-S-H. Orange Crush. Now back to the Green Hornet.
Michael Axford had gone to Keesby's home to get a statement regarding the explosion that had killed three people. He ran into difficulties when Schmiggy Milton, gang leader and head of a bootleg ring, appeared unexpectedly. Schmiggy repeated what he had said. Nobody's going to hear what you know except Marty and me. I have nothing to do with this matter. Oh, no? Listen, Pops, I didn't come out of retirement and set up this million-dollar deal for you just to have you turn yellow and walk out on me. But, but Button sh- your lip. <laughs> Let's get it straight right here now, Marty. I'm taking over. From tonight on, I'm not discussing anything with you. You're not tough enough. You're not... Schmiggy, grab him. Axford had turned suddenly and was running toward the door. Why, then, don't shoot. He can't get out. The door's locked. Well, then, come on. Axford, tugging at the doorknob vainly, turned to meet the two men who came at him. Schmiggy holding a gun in his hand. You shoot me. Grab his arms, Marty. Get away from that door. Take your hands off of me. Oh, tough, are you? Okay. There. Schmiggy, you... You killed him. By hitting him with a gun like that? You're crazy. He'll be out for an hour or so, that's all. We can't leave him here. Alive or dead, we can't do that. Who said we're gonna? I came in the rear door without being seen. We'll take him out the same way. And the better we do that, the sooner the boys will be waiting with the trucks at 11 o'clock. Uh, it's five after ten now. Yeah, we got a little time then. First, we'll search this guy, see if he has anything written down. Then you and I are gonna come to an understanding. Uh, I'm concerned about this Axford man. Ah, forget about him. He's as good as taken care of. When the boys take back the stills to the hideout, they'll take him with them. They may be getting along in years, but they still know how to fix up those concrete slabs. <laughs> Just like they know how to turn out the alchemy. When 11 o'clock came and Britt Reed in his office heard no further word from Michael Axford, he turned to Lenore Case. In this case, there's absolutely no need for your staying here any longer. I don't mind, Mr. Reed. We were busy every minute until a short time ago. But we're not busy now. So call a taxi and go home. I've been thinking about the things that happened today, and suddenly I'm beginning to see what looks like a pattern. I don't understand what you mean. Well, it started with a conversation I had with Commissioner Higgins on my way back from lunch. It took a nebulous form when Axford and Miss Benny had their set to with the hoodlums at the house where Mrs. Adams lives. Axford said this man, Three Chen, was a former member of Smiggy Milton's mob. Well, so were the five men who were killed in the explosion. Exactly. Making alcohol and stills which had been sneaked into apartments in a house managed by Martin Keesby. A man who got rid of tenants by raising their rents to a level that no one could pay. Why? Well, if you mean what I think you do, it's because... Mr. Reed, you mean he may intend using that house as a place for making alcohol? Why not? Bootleggers need some basis of operation. Smiggy Milton's men were all bootleggers, or criminals aligned with bootlegging business. And Milton's men are already on the Stone Avenue premises. Right. Axford may have figured things as I do, and if he did... Mr. Reed, what? They might do something to him if he gives himself away. Yes, but all oh, this is surmise on my part. I don't want to notify the police until I'm sure. That's why I'm about to call Cato to meet me with the Black Beauty. The Green Hornet is going to investigate? Yes, I'm starting at 984 Stone Avenue to see what, if anything, is in the empty apartments there. Miss Case went home. A short time after a telephone call to Cato, Britt Reed walked to a dark alley near the waterfront. There, Cato was waiting at the wheel of the Black Beauty, fabulous streamlined car of the Green Hornet. A few minutes after midnight, the Green Hornet and Cato, who was masked also, left the great black car in the shadows at the end of Stone Avenue. They made their way along a back alley to the house that bore in numinous numbers above a delivery entrance, the numbers 984. Wait a second. What's it going on in that area way beside the building? The men do something there. There must be four or five of them at least. If we stay close to the wall and move without noise, maybe we get close to see what they do. Yes, those crates will mask our movements. There are quite a few of them. Come on. As they reached the protecting cover of the crate that stood at the end of the line, they could hear voices talking distinctly. Six men, including Three Chin Pemberton, stood around Schmiggy Milton as he talked to them. Now listen, my car's at the corner of the next street to the right. My partner and I'll be waiting there when you get this job done. When the trucks are loaded, drive around the corner and follow us. 
We'll lead you to a storehouse my partner's got picked up. Hey, what about this newspaper guy you say you got tied up in the car? Did you croak him yet? No, no, I'll leave that to you, boys. The storehouse, you can take them over and do the rest. Okay, come on now, boys. Start lugging these things, huh? As the men began to work, Mickey Milton left Three Chin Pemberton in charge of the group carrying the crates from alley to truck. The Green Hornet and Cato had heard everything. They ran to the rear of the alley, still unseen, and talked briefly. We'll get Smeggy before he turns the corner to go to his car. The way he talk, men in car is maybe Mr. Axford. Yes, we we'll have to be careful when we move in on the car. We don't want trouble with Smeggy's partner. But we don't want Axford to recognize us either. And I know. We take care. We run now. Be at end of street when Crook reach corner. Smiggy Milton, nearing the corner of Stone Avenue, stopped to look back at the figures of his henchmen loading the truck. Suddenly, from an area away, two figures darted at him. Hey, Smiggy hey. reached for his gun. Too slow, Smiggy. It's a green nut. <laughs> Hold him for an hour. We'll drag him back and leave him in the hedge. Okie dokie. <clears throat> Let's get to his car before the trucks come. Will you stay in car, Mr. Britton? Yes. Until we get to the storehouse or until the police move in on the trucks. He'll be ready to pick me up at any time with the Black Beauty. But let's get to the car in the next corner. Martin Keesby, nervous and jumpy in the front seat of Schmiggy's car, turned once more to look at the figure of Michael Axford, gagged and trussed up on the back seat. Suddenly there was a banging against the left side of the automobile. Keesby turned to look outside. At that moment, the door on the right side opened, and a figure slid in beside him, pressing a gun against his back. Move an inch and I shoot you. No, no, don't shoot me. You're the Green Hornet, aren't you? Aren't you? What do you want with me? The Green Hornet, silent but menacing, held his gun hand steady as Cato opened the rear door and pulled Axford out onto the sidewalk. The scene became a tableau for a few minutes, with scarcely a movement from the four men in and next to the car. The first truck appeared at the corner of Stone Street as Cato stooped with a knife in his hand to cut the ropes that bound Axford. The Green Hornet spoke low to Keesby. Start moving. Let those cars follow you. We're going on to the storehouse. I'm taking Smiggy's place. You are? I didn't know about this. Where's Smiggy? You'll find out. Start moving. Signal for the trucks to uh, follow. Yes. There. I gave the signal. Hornet, look. The man who's with you is running away. He's leaving Axford free on the street. That's what he's supposed to do. Now start. Yes, yes, I'm starting. Keep that gun away. You don't need to use it on me. I may, if you don't tell me the things I want to know. Schmiggy's holding out on me. You... You and Schmiggy were partners, and he's holding out on you? Put it that way. I think that's what he plans to do to me. Hornet, if you and I were Keep to get... driving and keep talking. I'm interested in your proposition. You're about to make one, aren't you? Uh, yes. Yes, I'll tell you what it is. Michael Axford massaged the numbness from his legs and watched in wide-eyed fascination as the Green Hornet rode off with Keesby. He saw the trucks follow the lead car. Then, heading towards Stone Avenue, he muttered to himself, Glory be, I escaped with my life anyway. Now you'd better get to a phone and call Commissioner Higgins and the cops. Then I'll call the paper. Holy cow. There's a dead man in the bushes. Oh, let me take a look. Glory be, it's Smiggy Milton. And he's dead to the world. I'll go back and get the ropes they had me tied up with, and I'll use them on him. Then I'll call the cops. <laughs> Commissioner Higgins and police cars, in response to Axford's call, sped to Stone Avenue. They placed Schmiggy under arrest on Axford's charge, and then started off in the direction taken by the Green Hornet and the trucks. Axford, sitting with Commissioner Higgins, began to pour out the story of all he'd learned that evening about Keesby and Schmiggy. Commissioner, they're partners. Oh. They used the empty apartments to set up their alcohol cookers. Then they put in filters to take out the smell of the mash. Good work, Axford. Green Hornet, playing for time, had Martin Keesby drive slowly as the crooked real estate manager outlined his plans for making a fortune. And now, with Schmiggy out of the way, we'll take over all his equipment. 
and pay off his gang members at our rate. I uh, suppose the owners of the apartment houses you manage get wise to what you're doing. I'll handle them. Oh, nice guy, aren't you? Well, I see my car driving up past the trucks. The police must be coming. The police? Yeah, stop the car. Here's what? where I leave you. You? I'll stop it then. There. Now, here's your gas. Oh. A police car has come. Not far behind now. Hurry! Get going, Cato. Everything's under control. <laughs> the police car has arrived on the scene in a matter of minutes. They shot over the heads of the hoodlums who had stopped their trucks behind Keesby's car. All right, keep your hands high, all of you. Men, handcuff them. Place drivers on the trucks. One of these crates is open. It has a still in it. They all do. I told you that, Commissioner. And speaking of still, look how still our pal Keesby is there in the front seat. <laughs> too bad we got here too late to steal that other scallywag, the green harnet. Hey, what am I talking about? He's the one who saved me life. <laughs> the Green Hornet story for today. Another exciting story brought to you by the most refreshing drink in the world. The drink that's actually good for you because it's made with real oranges. The one and only Orange Crush. It sparkles, it tingles, it makes you feel fresh again. Always keep several bottles in your refrigerator. And always remember, the handy way to do that is to get the handy pack. Six bottles of Orange Crush in a handy carrying case. This program is a feature of the Green Hornet Incorporated. Created by George W. Trendle. Produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated. Directed by Charles D. Livingston. And edited by Fran Stryker. The part of the Green Hornet is played by Jack McCarthy. This copyrighted feature originates in Detroit. And all characters, places, and incidents used are fictitious. The Green Hornet is brought to you every Wednesday and Friday at the same time by the most refreshing drink in the world, Orange Crush. That's the drink you like best of all. Try it. Next time, ask for Orange Crush. But remember, don't say orange. Say Orange Crush. O-R-A-N-G-E-C-R-U-S-H. Orange Crush. Next Wednesday, listen to the Green Hornet again in the exciting story of danger entitled The Cigarette Filters. And now till Wednesday, this is Fred Foy saying so long from Orange Crush. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, International Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery, suspense, and adventure in tonight's story of The Two Little Sisters.
When a six-foot, 200-pound guy turns up with a knife in his back, maybe a short hundred pounds of cool, green-eyed blonde did it. And maybe she didn't. Well, this time there were two blondes, sisters. They looked alike, but they were about as much alike as a sheepdog and a cobra. Goes to show you can't tell by the package. Their names were Zemansky, Mary and Dolly Zemansky. They worked for the Everybody's Happy Pastime Carnival shows. It was old E. Happy Pastime himself who was sitting in the lion's office when I got there about noon. Jeffrey, my boy, glad you've come in. I'd like you to meet our new client, proprietor of the Everybody's Happy Pastime Carnival shows. No doubt you've heard of them, Jeffrey. Uh, sure, sure. How are you? <laughs> Laryngitis? Yeah, our friend here is troubled with laryngitis, Jeffrey. Purely psychological, purely psychological. A result of worry, profound worry. Isn't that right, sir? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, Jeffrey... What do we do? Now, Jeffrey, I'm glad you asked that question. To tell the truth, I envy you. Fine opportunity for you to get out of the city while I sit here sweltering in this heat. You, Jeffrey... Get to the point. Uh, <coughs> well, yes. Well, uh, Jeffrey, the fact is our friend here leaves on the two o'clock plane for Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, advance arrangements for the carnival. Sure. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Well, uh, meantime, the star performer of everybody's happy pastime carnival shows, a girl named... Uh, Oh, now, where's that piece of paper? I jotted it down. Is it... Oh, 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 here we are. Uh, Dolly Zemansky, the queen of the blades. Ice skater? <gasps> Knife thrower. Oh, I get it. Uh, she's a knife thrower with the show, Jeffrey. Best in a line, they say. Well, what's the trouble? That's just it. That's just it. Someone's been threatening her. A man named Rand. Rand. It's upsetting her, Jeffrey. Beginning to show in her work. That's what worries our client here. What's Rand got on her? Well, I don't know, Jeffrey. Our client doesn't know. Isn't that right, sir? <gasps> yes. No, but we'll retain to find out. And get rid of him. Exactly. Get rid of him. Get rid of him, Jeffrey. <laughs> Like the lion said, it was a chance to get out of the city. I drove Father Time back out to his carnival. He had to pick up his stuff and then make the two o'clock plane at International Airport. The carnival was set up on a couple of vacant lots out on Sepulveda. Big sign, everybody's happy pastime carnival shows. Tents, trailers, Ferris wheel, sawdust, the usual stuff. The old guy pointed out Dolly Zemansky's trailer, and I was on my own. I didn't get far guy in a 1922 tux, three days whiskers, and a turban like a second-hand bird's nest stopped me. Oh, there. How do you do, sir? The only legitimate thing about the Swami was his breath. That was 90 proof. <laughs> you are Regan. What's that to you? I am Swami Al-Kaji. Step this way, please, into my tent. I will consult the crystal. The crystal ball tells me many things. Yeah? Like what? <laughs> uh, sit right here, Mr. Regan. Thanks. The crystal ball tells me, Mr. Regan, that you've been hired to help Dolly Zemansky. Tells me you have been hired by... Ah, uh, uh, yes, by the owner of our little carnival. How much of that did he tell you? Uh, yes, Mr. Regan, it was he who told me. I uh, saw you arrive together. What do you know about Rand? Fred Rand, let me see. Yes, let me see. The crystal ball is cloudy. Yeah, the sand of time runs through the glass, Mr. Regan. Cut it out. What do you mean? You're a swami like Truman's a Republican. Uh, yes, yes, true. Uh, yes. Well, have a drink, Mr. Regan. Uh, I see much more in this than in the crystal ball. Uh, yes, uh, say when. When? Uh, you are. Thanks. I'm a four-finger man myself, Mr. Regan. <clears throat> Been my ruin. You said you had information. Yes, there are two sisters. Zemansky? Yes, Dolly and Mary. Who's married? The younger sister. She new to the show? A few months with us. Her sister get her the job? Yes, Dolly Zemansky is our star performer. Naturally, she has influence. Okay. What about Rand? I will consult the crystal ball. Look, I don't get paid by the hour. What's Rand got on Dolly Zemansky? I don't know. No? I see letters forming in the crystal. Okay, I okay. Play it your way. F, F, Z. I can't see any more now. Perhaps if you'd care to... Uh, uh, b -b -b Mr. So Regan! Uh, Mr. Regan! Maybe the Swami had something to sell. But if I couldn't get it for free, I could go back and buy it later. It was only a little ways to Dolly Zemansky's trailer. Big, expensive job. 
Everything was wide open because of the heat, so I walked in. Nobody home. Ladies' clothes lying around, theatrical makeup, grease paint stick. Picture of some round-faced guy with a crew cut, signed, yours adoringly, no name. Knives and daggers around. And a frosty blonde with green eyes in the doorway watching me. What are you doing in here? Homework. It's clever. Who are you? That's what I ought to ask you. Oh, guess. You're Dolly Zemanski. No, I'm her sister. Mary Zemanski. Yes. I'm Jeff Regan, International Detective Bureau. You're, you're a detective? That's it. You joined the carnival about four months ago. Five months. Five months. Been in show business before? No, I... I was a boy back home, but I... That him? What? Photo on the dressing table. <laughs> no. Sister Pine. Pine? He's in love with my sister. Pine. Pine, don't I? <laughs> Harold Pine. J.J. Pine's son. Yeah? You know, Pine warehouses, they're all over Los Angeles. So your sister's going to marry them? Why, I think so. But maybe she isn't. Mr. Regan, Supposing I... you give me what you know, hmm? About four days ago, a guy turned up, Rand. Yes. Your sister's scary, isn't uh, No, no, Mr. Regan, that's just it. She's strong-minded. She left home when she was 15. Go on. Well, life can't have been easy for her, you know, show business. Just tell it. Well, she's independent, Mr. Regan. I've tried to tell her... What about Rand? Mr. Regan, I, I can't tell you. Lady, I've got a job to do. What about Rand? I... I don't know. Your sister's scared of him? I... I... She is or she isn't? <laughs> it's something else. She told me she didn't know him. She said he was trying to get fresh, but twice I... I shouldn't tell you this. My fee says I help your sister. All right. There's a little street two blocks up Sepulveda. Twice I walked by there this morning and two days ago. There was a green sedan parked there both times, and Fred Rand and my sister were in it. They were... Well, they seemed to be arguing. Mr. Regan, that's all I know. Okay. How do I find your sister? She performs in the main tent, but she must be just about through. She might be over there. Okay. See you. I started for the main tent and got about halfway up the midway when he passed me, going down the midway and into the big shiny trailer. Broad-shouldered, six-foot guy with red hair. And when he went into the Zemanski sister's trailer, I knew he was Rand. I started for the trailer. I thought I heard voices quarreling. And then I knew something was wrong. That was Mary Zemanski screaming. I hadn't had my eye off the door of that trailer 60 seconds since I left. Nobody went in but Rand. Nobody came out. But I busted fast. I made the last hundred yards like Mel Patton on Dexedrine. And what I saw when I got inside that trailer stopped me cold. It was Mary Zemanski and Rand. But it wasn't like I figured. Mary was hanging onto the wall and staring down at the floor, sobbing. And on the floor was Rand, with a knife in his back. All right, give it to me. Give it to me fast. No. 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 What happened? Come on. No. No, I can't tell you. I can't. But you've got ten seconds before the whole carnival will be in here. What happened? Oh. Tell me what happened. I won't talk. I won't talk. All right, both of you stand back at the end of the trailer. Who are you? Sergeant Post, police. Hands above your heads. All right, all right. Clear away now. Clear back, folks. You were uh, Dolly Zemanski? No, I... I'm your sister, Mary Zemanski. Your turn, mister. Maybe we can take our hands down? You armed? Yeah. Where till I get it? Hip? Shoulder. Okay. Let him down. Thanks. Got a permit to carry this? Sure. Show it. Regan, private detective, International Detective Bureau. Here's the file copy. Look good, Regan. You kill this guy? <laughs> okay, Regan. Well, maybe you'll tell me who the guy was. His name was... Fred Rand. That check, Regan? What I heard. Maybe you knew Rand, Regan. Nope. How'd you get in here so quick? Heard screams. Sure. Oh, what's the use of all this? You both know what happened. No, what did? <laughs> Mr. Rand came in and I... Well, he'd been bothering Dolly. Maybe he thought I was Dolly. We look a little bit alike. And he came in and... And? Go on. He struggled. And I killed him. It hung together like the Jap Navy. 
She was sore at Rand because he'd been bothering her sister, so when the big six-foot guy came into the trailer, she grabbed him and stabbed him in the back. Sure, it could have happened like that. But from the look that came on Sergeant Post's face, I could see he'd try to make it stick. He looked like a hungry kid at a bakery window. He was seeing lieutenant stripes. Well, half an hour later, Mary went off for the ride downtown in the paddy wagon. I figured it was a funny thing Dolly Zemanski hadn't showed up. I decided to look for her. She wasn't around. She'd finished her act a little bit before the record started and it looked like nobody had seen her since. Then I saw a tent with some stars and crescent moons painted on the front, and that reminded me of something. A phony swami with information for sale. He was inside. All right, swami, get busy on that crystal ball and dish up some answers. Uh, yes. Like FZ. Ah, yes, yes, the letter's FZ. Uh, the crystal is clear. Oh, clear it. It's a murder rap now. FZ what? Ah. Uh, Rand. Yes, Mr. Reed. Fred Rand. Mrs. Fred Zemansky Rand. Dolly Zemansky was his wife. Now you've said something. <laughs> That gave me something to work on, but halfway to my car, I remembered something else. Something Mary Zemansky had said. A green sedan parked twice in the same place. Maybe it was parked there a third time. It figured the owner wouldn't be driving it away. He was taking a free ride as a guest of the county, to the morgue. It was there, green sedan, on the little street two blocks up Sepulveda. The door was unlocked. The registration on the steering post read... Fred Rand. That figured. The address was on a street called Delancey in San Francisco. But maybe I wouldn't have to go that far. There was a card down on the floorboards. One of those commercial hotel cards. Globe Hotel, Main Street. I stuck it in my pocket. That was when a guy said, I'm gonna kill you, Fred Rand. I hit the car door with my shoulder. That knocked him back, but he came in again and tied for me. I blocked it. Why, are you... <coughs> That was when I got a good look at him. He was the guy in the picture in the Zemansky sister's trailer. Yours adoringly, Harold Pine. I'd like to have stuck around and had a little talk with Harold Pine. Maybe he knew some answers. But one answer he didn't know was who killed Fred Rand. When he made that college try on me and called me Rand, it didn't take the FBI to figure he didn't even know Rand was dead. But it looked like Pine was going to be asleep a while, so I went downtown. The Globe Hotel. Last stop on the line for the canned heat crowd. Brass platoons. Row of cracked leather chairs along the front. Two or three old guys dying in them. Nobody at the desk, so I picked up number 306 from the register and went up. Door wasn't locked. Inside, you could see why. Nothing in the joint but a brass bed. Cardboard suitcase on a chair with a couple of neckties in it. Fred Rand had been traveling wide. But there was something else in the suitcase stuck in the lining. Item torn out of the weekly variety, the show business sheet. It said a couple of knife throwers named Duncan and Dolly had checked out of Las Vegas for work at a spot called the Blue Dolphin Casino, Los Angeles. The dateline was half torn off, but you could make out the 46 at the end. There was a phone on the wall, and I tried the Blue Dolphin Casino. There was nobody home. Too early for a night spot. So I decided to let the lion work on that one. The International Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon, President speaking. Lyon, I've got something for oh, you. What... Jeffrey, I'm glad you called. Uh, I've just talked to the proprietor of the Everybody's Happy Pastime Carnival shows from Phoenix. So we're off the job. Well, now, Jeffrey, what can we expect? We were retained to get rid of that fellow Rand to relieve Miss Dolly Zemansky of any undue nervous stress that might endanger the box office value of her performance. Go on. Now, 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 Jeffrey. It just seems that, uh, well, the, the sister did the job for us. Sure, sure she did. Jeffrey, I don't think I understand you. You can understand this. This job we stick on. Jeffrey, be reasonable. The matter's in the hands of the police. They've got the wrong goose. What's that? I don't think she stabbed a six-foot guy in the back. I think somebody pitched the strike out in through the window. Dolly Zemansky? Maybe. I think that's what her sister thinks. I think that's why she confessed. Oh, I see what you're driving at now. 
we're defending the innocent again. We're not in business for money, are we, Regan? Why should we be with the world full of poor unfortunates waiting to be held? Cut it out. Regan, from now on, if you want to work for charity, you work alone. You're fired. That's the only good news I've had all day. <laughs> I checked out of Rand's hotel the same way I went in. When I was crossing the street, I saw somebody coming up the other sidewalk. My high school geometry told me that if I walked fast enough, I could get opposite where my car was parked the same time she did. Okay, come on. Let go of come on, me. sister. Get in the car. You can't do this to me. Your dolly's a and I'm doing it. Get in there. And stay still. I don't like you, dolly. How do you know my name? You look like your sister. Mary? Mary. Who are you? Never mind. Well, where are you taking me? A ride up Hill Street. There's a place to park above Temple. There's a nice view of the city jail. Jail? That's right. Jail. All right. There. Like I said... That's a good view. What's the pitch, Regan? How'd you get back? The Regan? It's on the steering pose. You got good eyes. Thanks, honey. I didn't say that way. So you don't love me. What's the pitch? See that building down there? It's the city jail. Do you know who's in it? No. It's your sister. Mary? Mary. Why? She says she killed a guy named Fred Rand. Fred Rand? Never heard of Fred Rand, then. Then why are you going to the Globe Hotel? You never heard of that either. You can get rest. Talk, will you? Okay, I will. You get the pine warehouses on the hook. It looks good, but there's just one thing wrong. Fred Rand. You're married to him. The guy turns up. Maybe he heard about Harold Pine. He blackmails you. Okay, he blackmails me. So what? So you want to get rid of him. You come back from your act this afternoon with the knives in your hands. You get near the trailer. The window's open. You see Rand inside arguing with his sister. That must have been an easy pitch for the star of the show. Your sister's locked up down there on a murder rap to cover you, and you've got nothing to say. Okay. I got nothing on you. Not now. But you'll talk. Later. Now get out. I got business. That gave me nothing, so I went down to the jail to try to see Mary Zemanski again. It took me an hour to find out I wasn't going to get to him. But I did find out one thing. That cop had done his job well. Mary had signed a written confession to the murder of Rand. I got in my car and bucked traffic out to Ventura Boulevard. I hit a gas station and checked the address of the Blue Dolphin. It was in Encino. That meant it was near the carnival and I could pick it up later. Everybody's happy pastime was doing peak business by the time I got there. The midway was lit up like a sailor on shore leave. But where I went, it was dark. Out in back of the Zemansky sister's trailer, maybe I could pick up some proof that Dolly Zemansky pitched that night that killed Rand. I tripped over a tent rope and bumped into something. Wait a minute. Who are you? What? I'm Borky. Come on out in the light. Yes, sir. You're Pine. Yes, sir. I'm Pine. Harold Pine. But they call me Porky. Porcupine. I reckon you could say it's a sort of a joke. Porcupine? <laughs> it started when I was in college. Yeah. My name's Regan, private detective. Oh, I owe you an apology, Mr. Regan. I uh, mean it at the car. Skip it. I thought you were Fred Rand. Well, why were you gunning for him? Fred Rand? Calls a Dolly. Dolly's a Minsky. You're going to marry her, aren't you? Well, I... Uh, What's on your mind? Well, um... Well, now that there's been a murder... Go on. I think I better tell the truth. That's a good idea. Um, you asked me if I was going to marry Dolly. Well, I am married to her. San Bernardino. Last Thursday. M my father, J.J. J. Pine, reckons Mr. Regan because of the family money... Sure. That... You couldn't have married Dolly Zemanski. She was married to Fred Rand. Not for three years. Huh? They was divorced, Mr. Regan. You know that? Well, Dolly had the decree. How else could we have got a marriage last? Did you see the divorce decree? Oh, yes, sir. When was it granted? 1946. Month. You remember? Uh, yes, October. Day? 
Well, Mr. Regan, I don't see what... What day? October 14th, 1946. October 14th, 1946. Okay. Well, Mr. Regan, I don't Look, understand... Rand showed up again, huh? Yes, sir. So you decided to kill him? He was molesting Dolly. Sure. Well, maybe I'd just beat him up. You're a kid, Pine. Maybe I am. You're keeping bad company. I don't think so. Who do you think knife Fred Rand? I don't rightly know. What were you looking for in back of that trailer? Nothing. I didn't think of anything. You know Dolly's sister, Mary? I do. You think she killed Fred Rand? No. Then who did? I don't know. Okay, Pine. You didn't, anyway. Well, maybe I was just pretending I didn't know he was dead when I fought with you at his car. No, Porky. You're not that smart. Mr. Reagan, I reckon that's so. Next stop was the Blue Dolphin Casino. The manager wasn't there, so I waited around. Must have been almost midnight before he showed. <laughs> Me. You're the manager, I am. You bought it. In here. You book acts? Houston. You ever hear of Duncan and Dolly? Knife throws? Did they ever play us? 1946. Maybe, uh, October? I could look it up. Okay. Over here. Files, over here. Man, plenty of cheesecake on the wall. Oh, those pictures? <laughs> Acts that have played us. Yeah? Yeah. Autograph photos to Mandy, boy. Mandy is me. We're just scared to love. Dimples Davis. Hmm. <laughs> Dimples. You see what I mean? Yeah. See what you mean. Yeah. October 1946? Could be. No. No. Hey, hey, wait a second. Last week of September. 26 through the 29th. Last week of September, 1946, Duncan and Dolly... Let me see that. Dolly Zemanski and Harry Duncan, King and Queen of the Blades. Split week booking, September 26th to 29th, 1946. I'm thinking King and Queen of the Blades. Wait a second. Behind this locker. Yeah, photos all over the place. I'm just remembering. We keep the leg on out where you can see it, but this stuff, you see... Yeah, like I'm remembering. Demandy, sincerely, King and Queen of the Blades... Duncan and Dolly. Let me see that picture. Yeah. You recognize me? Yeah. Both of them. Dolly and Duncan. Yeah? What'd it get you? It gets me my answer. I made it fast back to the carnival. The midway was closed, but I could see a light on in one of the tents. I could hear voices. What do you mean? You tell them to put it over on me with that no good two bit. You're a shite. Oh, that's no good. But when I walked in, the light went off. Duncan. The lights back on. That told me where they were. I started. Slow. I waited. Duncan, don't. Put that knife down. Duncan's enough. Rand was enough. All right, Duncan, I'm coming. <laughs> The knife went past, took some air that belonged to me, and stuck in the tent pole. He shoved the table at me, and I shoved it back. He made a try for the tent door, and that was when I got him. Turn the lights on, Dolly. Harry Duncan, the phony swami. It's a rat. You should talk. He... He okay? He'll come out of it. He killed Rand, thought I'd take the fall. You let your sister take the fall and kept your trap shut because you were scared of what he knew. Knew what? Blue Dolphin Casino, end of September, 1946. How do you know that? When you were supposed to be in Nevada divorcing Rand. You gotta stay there six weeks, baby. You can't even leave for one day. Figure it out. You're perjured in the Nevada courts. Your divorce is no good. When you married Harold Pine, you weren't divorced from Rand. Wise guy, Regan. You don't get Pine. I'll take care of that. Your marriage to him is good. Like a three dollar bill. Thanks. Maybe I can do something for you sometime. So the swami killed Rand. That's what I figured wrong. If Mary didn't stick Rand, it had to be a toss job. Somebody had to toss that knife through the trailer window. Somebody professional. I figured you. Till I saw that photo of Duncan and Dolly. Why'd he do it? Because he hated Rand. He loved you. How'd you figure that? Guys fall in love with dames like you. I don't know why. 
We were a duo. Duncan and Dolly. We were going to get married, but I... I ditched him for Rand. That figures. Rand looked good a while. Dunk went on the bottle when I married Rand. Pretty soon he got too shaky for a knife act. Ended up like this. The phony swami. He said Rand had beat his time with me. He said he'd kill Rand if he got the chance. <laughs> Didn't think he had the nerve. He's coming out of it. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't want to talk to Dunk. So long, Regan. Get out of here! That wrapped it up for me. The police took it from there, and after a few hours at headquarters, I headed back to my apartment. But if I figured it was that easy to get rid of the lion, I was in for a new set of figures. The lion was there, waiting... Hat in hand. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, my boy, you've come back at last. I heard all about it. I've been waiting for you, Jeffrey. Sure. Candle in the window. Jeffrey, will you ever forgive me? Will you forget the unkind words I've uttered, the meaningless, petty things I've said? Oh, I rue the day I mistrusted you, Jeffrey, my boy. It was madness. Come off it, fatso. But, Jeffrey, I mean it. You were right all along. Mary didn't kill that man. Mary was an innocent girl caught in the tangled web of suspicion. But you, Jeffrey, you defended her in her most trying moments. A noble thing, Jeffrey. But I'm fired. Fired? Oh, nonsense, my boy, nonsense. Haven't I apologized? It's just that I feel so sad about that poor child, Mary, and that pine fellow without the bride he had taken to his heart. What will they ever do, Jeffrey? Save your sympathy, Lion. They'll get along. What? What do you mean by that? Well, when I last saw them, they were sobbing it out on each other's shoulders. You mean it, Jeffrey? They've discovered each other? How charming, how positively charming. And with all those millions he has, too. Millions of dollars. Stop drooling, fatso. There's nothing in it for you. Eh, no, Jeffrey, I suppose not. But I can dream, can't I? <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, directed by Sterling Tracy and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Personal notice, dangers my stock and trade. If the job's too tough for you to handle, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Greetings, as always, mystery lover. Time for another Let George Do It adventure. Our little tale of suspense, uh, which, by the way, is called It's a Mystery to Me, has to do with a disgruntled bartender, a mystery story writer, and an elusive gal named Cynthia, just to name a few. And since it's rather a long story, I think I'd better get off so they can get on. Why don't you want a drink? Oh, never mind, never mind. Use up the stools. Keeps the leather in condition. Dear Mr. Valentine, to me, life is hopelessly complex, but with your help, it can be beautiful, terrific, magnificent. To me, life isn't worth living to without... To me, it's the... raining. Here, eat up the pretzels. They're for nothing. Stale, too. <laughs> Look, we're just sitting here, friend. You don't really mind, do you? Well, I was just going to lock up when you walked in. Library's closed, I guess. Got to read your mail someplace. Only... <laughs> Look, we're waiting for somebody. We'll buy something pretty soon. Chin up. Why? In Joe's Oasis, it rains inside. Have some flat champagne. Well, business can't be so bad if you sell champagne. A couple was in here just before you. Happy, rich, showing off. You know, it's that kind of a neighborhood. Everybody wants something big and gets it and goes someplace else. <laughs> to you, life is pretty complex, too, isn't it? Look around, you lady. It's the only business I had tonight. Well, don't shoot yourself, friend. We'll take some coffee. Uh, big sale. I'm out of the red. 
To me, lady, it's as complex as a six-foot piece of mahogany with silver on the trimmings yes. and the clearest glass in it you oh, ever saw. Oh, don't be gruesome. To me, life could be beautiful if... Huh? What do you think I'm talking about? When nobody ever gets what they want. To me, it's the six-foot Superview console. What this bar needs is a television set. Only I haven't got the money. Never to... mind, Joe. I'll get it. Uh, reading room. Telephone exchange. <laughs> Tell you, lady, it's the most beautiful thing you ever saw. Hello, Joe's Oasis. I want to speak to Mr. Marlon King. Uh, King? Brooks, give me that letter. Hurry, please. Is that, uh, M.J. King? I called his club. Yes, yes, of course, Marlon. I called his club. They said he was there at the Oasis. Oh, I'm sorry. No, he's not. Uh, I'm here to meet him myself. You what? Yeah, that's right. My name's George Valentine. Look, can I take a message? Or do you want him to call you? Oh, no. No, tell him I'll write him. Tell him not to get in touch with me. I'll write him. I'm leaving. I can't wait hey, for him Hey, to... slow down, will you? Who are you? Just tell him. He won't understand, but tell him. Something's happened and I have to leave. And... Cynthia, my name's Cynthia. Well, where can he reach you, Cynthia? I'll write him, I said. I don't care if you understand. I won't see him again. I can't see him. Not ever. Look, Cynthia. Oh, never what... mind. Never mind. Well... <laughs> she won't ever see him again, huh? Hmm? And Marlon King in his letter says... To me, life isn't worth living without a girl I've just met by the name of Cynthia. Well, that was a short romance. Nobody ever gets what they want. Said he'd meet us here at 10 o'clock. Almost 11, isn't it? So look, both of you, will you please let me lock this place up? It's raining outside. To me, I... it rains a little sometimes, too. All right, friend. All right. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Now back to Let George Do It and George Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Oh, here you are. I thought I might find you here in your office. Uh, my name's King, uh, Marlon. Oh, for heaven's sake. Well, we chased all over looking for you, friend. <laughs> never mind, never mind. Listen, it's this girl of mine, see? There's something terrible going on, and I need your help. You talking about Cynthia? She says it's all off. Huh? Yeah, grit your teeth, Mr. King. I got a message for you. Cynthia says she won't see you again. Ever. Oh, no. No, she didn't mean it. She loves me. I know she does. She's young and sweet. Oh, I think we'd better go talk to her, don't you? No, no, we can't. I mean, it, it only makes it worse. She's not that kind. I've asked her what's wrong, what it is, what's happening. She's so sensitive and she's scared about something. She won't tell us. Only Mabel might. That's why I need you. I can't talk to girls like Mabel. I can't. Hey, 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 one girl at a time. Oh, I know. It's complicated and mixed up and hard well, to... Just take it easy. Make it simple. Sit down. Oh, no, no, it's not. I, I'm so confused. To I me, can... life is complex. What sort of a person are you, anyway, that everything should be so... I'm a mystery writer. Oh. Wouldn't you know? Sure, so that's where I've seen your name, yeah. Scientific crime detection by... Mabel Marlon is King. Cynthia's roommate. Mabel works at a cheap nightclub, a cigarette girl. You see what I mean? Mabel and Cynthia, different as day and night. Mabel's hard as nails, but she came from the same small town years before, and she offered her a room. And then there's this skinny little dark guy named Tony who watches Cynthia. Say, look, tell me something concrete, will you? A locket. I bought Cynthia a locket. It's a beautiful little thing. She wanted it to carry my picture in. You know, around her neck. She wanted me to get a cheaper one. That's the way she is. You can see how close we are to being... Yeah, you bought her a locket. For $200. And she wore it, and she loved it. But I saw how envious Mabel was. She's that kind. And then one day, Cynthia said she lost it. And when I asked her, she was scared. She was lying, and, and she cried. Two days later, Mr. Valentine, I saw Mabel showing that locket off to the housemaid. Mabel was wearing it. Well, didn't you ask Cynthia? Would she you... won't tell me anything. Just says she lost it. Wishes we could get married and go away someplace. Uh -huh. And tonight, she says, she'll never see you again. Maybe this is more than a Dorothy Dix case. Mr. Valentine, I know I tell it backwards. I've got a good, clear brain, only now when I love her so much, it's hard to... Here, help me with my coat, will you? Huh? This is why I kept you waiting. Oh! I had to have it bandaged. Well, 
Somebody just stepped up on the street. Your shirt's all torn. Your shoulders... Yes, thin. my eye will be black in a few minutes, too. Just a big guy in an overcoat. Said I was interfering. I should stay away. Hey, somebody really worked you over, friend. He said I should stick to writing mysteries, not trying to solve them. He said unless I stayed away from Cynthia, to me, life would be a marble slab. But she's supposed to be working. And I'm supposed to be at the wrestling matches. Does that signify Mabel's not here, I told you? Oh, it gets worse and worse. Now Mabel's disappeared. Take it easy, Marla. Take it easy. Where's she gone? How should I know? Dummy! Hey, Matt, there. Huh? You said Mabel's not here. The other guy, the big one. Listen. What's in there? The boss's office. And you it's the guy who hit me, the guy who beat me up. Come on, sister, come on. Who's the big guy? I found her, but you can't. Oh, yes, I can. So you act like Beaver Eagle, No, 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 stop it. So you act just like... Wait a minute. There, you see what I mean? They're Bouncer Valentine. I know it's him. I'm going in there. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to hold hands what? with her, yeah. Hey, let go of me. Uh, no, but, but, boss... Yes, I... yes, of course, Michael. Get back to your work. Oh, uh, sure, boss. And what can I do hey, for you? Hey, wait a minute. It's your strong boy there I want to talk to. He is quite busy. Excuse me. I do the talking to customers. I am Tony. Ah, oh, Tony, huh? Small world. Skinny little dark guy named Tony. What do you mean? So everybody works for you, huh? A big guy who beats up people and a missing Snoopy girl named Mabel? I gave her the night off. Who do you work for? Marlon King. Ah, uh, the innocent. The what? Please, I'm in quite a hurry. You have a subpoena. A subpoena? What are you But talking? of course, no, not at this time of night. My lawyers will call you in the morning. Yes, yes, the strong man works for me. It's quite regrettable. Such muscles in the head... Say to Mr. King, please, how I am sorry. My lawyers will make sense. Hey, hey, not so fast, Buster. Why did you sick the muscle I am quite on? busy. Good night. Suppose I ask you about a locket. Locket? <laughs> oh, what's so funny? <laughs> Alas, the poor innocent. Now, go on, get out. Look, Buster, I'm staying here until you explain what you know about a girl named Cynthia. What are you and your hired hands trying well, to do? You see, gun permit. Permits me to have this gun. Never mind, I'll take your word. It permits me to ask you to leave. Mr. King, I'm quite sorry. For you, I don't want to be. Yeah, I can see you're crying. Just don't wait. To me, why should life be so full of stupids? Get out, get out! Oh, is it ever going to stop raining? George! George, here I am. Oh, hello, Brooksy. Did you get hold of that housemaid that Marlon here told yes, you about? Yes, she's here, but George, first I Miss have to... Miss Brooks, I'm getting scared for Cynthia. These are the men I should talk to, dearie. Yeah, but wait a second. Look, George... we didn't learn anything, Agent. That locket. Boy, a beauty it was, too, if you like them old-fashioned she, kind she, of... She knows all about the locket, George. But that Mabel didn't steal it or make Cynthia give it to no, her. No, it's because my was... brother's in the buy and sell. You know, a pawn shop with trade, that's all. What are you talking about? And Mabel, she gave it to me, see? You know Why? Because Cynthia wanted to trade it for a real gold set of earrings she'd seen in his window once. Only she didn't want the sucker who gave her the locket to know about it. What? <laughs> that Cynthia, she's something all right. George, please. Well, there's your mystery, friend. The innocent. She's so young and sweet and sensitive. So different from a girl like Mabel. George. No, no, I don't believe it. To me, she's always... Do you be quiet, Mr. King. George, the important thing is, didn't you see Lieutenant Riley's car? Pack but listen, she's in oh. trouble. Hey, she's in minute. danger. Wait, wait, wait. What did you say, Brooksy? The mystery isn't Cynthia, George. It's Mabel. Mabel's dead. You are listening to Let George Do It. Our adventure will continue in just a moment. Back to George Valentine. To me, life is hopelessly complex, the man wrote. And for Marlon King, it apparently is, at least when it comes to love. Because his wonderful Cynthia, you have found, is not quite the type girl that she made the innocent believe. 
And as for her avaricious, snoopy roommate, Mabel, well, even if your name is George Valentine, you will never know now, because, as Lieutenant Riley so gently points out, Mabel has been murdered. Do I have to draw your diagram? Look at the place. Just look at it. Torn up like Coney Island on Monday. All right, all right. So she put up quite a fight, Riley. But you haven't here, told me. Here, here, here. That's the weapon. Don't, don't touch it. The skillet. Heavy iron skillet. Yeah. yeah. Grabbed off the stove, I guess. A single blow on the back of the head. The body was here in the kitchen hall. The porter found it when he came up to deliver something. Mm-hmm. Single blow. But all the earmarks of a big fight. The stuff spilled in the kitchen. The telephone not crooked. Maybe she tried to grab be for it. Be careful. That needs to be dusted, too. Fingerprints? Sure, in a crime like this. As a expect... matter of fact, she did try to grab the phone for help. Or somebody did. The switchboard girl says the light went on for a second, but then off again, so she didn't mm, plug in. When was that? Oh, about two hours ago. Doesn't remember exactly. Didn't anyone hear anything? The neighbors were all asleep. There's a back stairs to the alley off the rear porches. That's how the killer left. Kitchen door, huh? How do you know? We found the weapon tossed in a trash can up the alley. Crime of passion. Well, you'll have plenty of clues right here. Yeah, the technical boys are on their way now. But uh, you've already formed another idea. (laughs) Haven't you? Hey, Marlon, Mr. King. Uh, Here, Mr. Valentine. I, uh, I guess the lieutenant wants to see you now. I'll be with you in a minute, Riley. So this is the expert, huh? Knows all about crime, scientific detection, the habits of criminals. But when it comes to the habits of women... Oh, Lieutenant, don't. He's all mixed up. Yeah. He thinks he's in love with Cynthia and you're I not know. Done. I've got it coming. But at least I was right about Mabel. I'm sorry she's dead, but, well, you know what she was like. Oh, yes, yes, my friend, yes. Little Mabel here was the kind of a girl who was always in trouble. It's not surprising she got what she did. I thought Cynthia was different. I mean, she Yes, was... you're so innocent. I know you got taken in. But the hired help will tell you the same thing you found out through that business of the locket she got out of you. Just for laughs and a set of gold earrings. To them, Cynthia's even tougher than Mabel, my friend. I know, I know now, Mr. But... King, the doctor tells me Mabel died approximately two hours ago. Well, now, come on, think back. That's about the time Valentine here was in Joe's bar, isn't it? Oh. And remember what we told you Cynthia said? She was in such a hurry. She apparently called from here, from home. She had to leave. Something had happened. But I don't know where she could have... If life weren't so complex to you, you might see some of the simple things. What she was really like and that she was up to something and Mabel did snoop on her and what Lieutenant Riley means. Oh, I know where he's staring. To me, Cynthia was always... Well, Mabel worked for that guy, Tony, who had me slugged. Why don't you... Oh, we'll round up him and his strong arm, all right. To me, sucker, life is simple. To me, that Cynthia of yours is an obvious grade-A suspect for murder. Well, Riley, to me, huh? Cynthia is a girl who carried gray gloves. Huh? Yeah, and a black purse with a big gaudy thing on it. Well, well, yes, she, uh, she had one like that. A couple of suitcases because she was going to run away someplace. Oh, uh, what To me, you... Riley, Cynthia is a girl whose body's been jammed into a closet out there on the back porch. Strangled. Yeah. Well, there's your original crime of passion, Riley. Dead, both of them. And unless I'm wrong, she's been dead just as long as Mabel, maybe longer. It's not simple anymore, is it? No. I found the gloves over here, in a purse. Suitcases were thrown behind the broom closet. All packed and ready for a trip, wasn't she? Nicely dressed. No ornaments, though. Wristwatch. Oh, yeah, or earrings, too, from the inner... Uh, Don't uh, touch any of that. Don't worry, Riley. I know what you're thinking. But I'll give you something else to think about. Wearing a raincoat, rain hat. In the suitcase. That's right, Angel. Packed and ready to go. There's a back stairway. And down at the end of the alley, a neon sign says garage entrance. Here, let me see your purse. I'll open it. Yeah, there we are. Keys. Car keys. Apparently had her own car. So she might have been killed just as she came out the back door to run down the stairs. Uh Uh-huh. And the kitchen door was open. So maybe all that struggle out here and through the hall was put up by Cynthia instead of Mabel. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? So what? George, look. Hmm? Rejoice and be happy at Joe's Oasis. What? Matches in her purse. This is 14th Street, isn't it? Must be right around the corner. And here, a cork from a champagne bottle. Remember flat champagne? Hey, come on, let's go. Hey, Lieutenant, we got him. What in the name of heaven's going on? We got him. That Tony at the airport. He was just about... Well, 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 look who's here. Trying to run away someplace too, Tony? What? 
Look, what is this? I thought you were trouble when you came crashing into you my... You gave me double talk tonight, Buster. I'll give it back to you. The Champagne Corp. Joe's Oasis. Mean anything? Well, of course. We were there, Cynthia and me, George, but... they were the couple who were there just before us. Is there a law against it? You have a law? Some more double talk. This is for you, Riley. His face isn't scratched, but he's got on a tweed coat. And if she'd scratched Get his coat... Get your hands off me. What are you driving at? Life is complex, but murder is simple. When a person is strangled... I'm one jump ahead of you, pal. They scratch, they fight, they claw out to protect themselves, particularly if it's a woman. So under the fingernails, you always... Wait, fi- wait. You... You said... Oh, strangled? cut out the innocent act. You hired a thug. The girl named Mabel worked for you, keeping tab on Cynthia. Yes. Yes, Mabel, she introduced me, helped give me a pitch with Cynthia. The strong man, he was to keep Mr. King away. Competition, that's all. Competition? I was to the airport to meet Cynthia. I was to the bar for celebration because she accepted. What does that do? Where is she? Where is Cynthia? Take it easy, Tony. Look behind you. She... She was my type. Girl with realism. She tonight accepted my big campaign to marry me. Now look, Joe, the man said he was in here, in the oasis with this girl. Of course they were here. It's that kind of neighborhood. Happy, rich, showing off. Celebrating, they said. He said they talked about getting married. He asked her right here over a bottle of champagne. I should hear love stories yet. Decided to up and do it tonight. He'd take her home and then they'd meet out at the airport. You know what I think? Only customer gives me a buck tip in five weeks and she's got to go get strangled. Raining, see what I mean? I was talking to the switchboard girl, Mr. Valentine. I didn't pay no attention. He came walking down the street, this Tony. He kisses her. She goes upstairs. He hops in a cab. Hey, what do you want my fingerprints for? I'm just amazed. Keep talking. Never mind. I ain't got no scratches on me. You don't think I'm big enough to choke a wildcat like that? All right. No. Mabel come in later. I don't know what time. That's all I've seen. You can't lock me up like... Hey, you! Flatfoot! Sergeant! Come back here and let me out. Take it easy, Michael. Take it easy. You're in for assault and battery. Now, look. The boss said he'd make it up. He, he's loaded with dough. You never saw such a spender. So I hit the guy. So I get conscientious trying to make an impression. Is it my fault somebody murders the boss's girl? I just keep his competition away. Yeah. Uh, now, listen. I said, Hey, you! Come back here! Hey! Crime of passion and not one single solitary clue. Not one single solitary fingerprint. Holy mackerel. Take it easy, Riley. Take it easy. It's almost over. Huh? Yeah, we've got our evidence. The murderer won't make a mistake, Riley. He'll slip. He'll catch himself. Me, life is hopelessly complex. That's what you wrote, Marlon. This is where I came in. Hey, you buying anything? We're waiting or... for somebody, Joe. We explained to you when yeah, we came... like chewing gum on a phonograph record. Round and round. I... I just write about crime and things, Mr. Valentine. I mean, well, I'm always getting mixed up with some girl. Well, don't tell Lieutenant Riley that. But why should he keep looking at me like... Listen to this, Marlon. A crime is like a story plot. It's only as mixed up as you make it. Sometimes it's simple. Sure, but... Now, one person killed both Cynthia and Mabel. Somebody waited for Cynthia when she stepped out on the back porch with her bags. She fought. She tried to get back to the phone. Then Mabel came home and stumbled into it. So our man's desperate. He has to grab the handiest weapon and swing on her, too. But why? I mean, Mabel was all mixed well, up with... It's simple, I said. One thing at a time. Uh, Cynthia's gloves. 
Huh? Yeah, those gloves were loose on the porch, weren't they? Well, she naturally would have dropped them. Well, is it likely that a woman all dressed up in a raincoat and carrying two suitcases and a purse would be carrying her gloves loose? More likely have them on, wouldn't she? What? Well, now, look, I understand the murderer went through all kinds of complicated cover-ups. The murderer was frantic, Marlon. That's why both gloves were off. But they were on at the time of the struggle. So, Cynthia left no fingerprints. But how do you know the gloves were the... It's true that a person being strangled always tries to scratch a claw. But Cynthia's fingernails were perfectly clean. At the time she was killed, her gloves were on. (laughs) Now, you see what I mean? Don't get complicated. So the murderer wasn't an expert. Someone who would think to... Well, anyway, it it was a crime of passion. If you could call it a passion... Hey, Mark, this is the Oasis? It's a lecture hall where you get free lessons. Oh, wait a minute, Joe. Hold it. What do you want? I got a delivery outside. Make up your mind. Okay, okay. Don't let the rain in. You see, while the important evidence we got was from Joe here and the housemaid. Besides Tony, probably nobody saw Cynthia up close from the time she left here until she went up to her apartment. And what had happened here in the Oasis? Tony had asked her to marry him. But, George, I I don't... She had accepted. A little engagement party. Tony's big campaign, and they sat at the bar and showed off. Only, uh, showed off what? A mercenary number like Cynthia certainly wouldn't have accepted a well-heeled shrimp like Tony without some valuable token. Lesson five, lesson six, yakada, yakada, yakada. Yeah, Joe? Step on it. Where do I put this thing? A box. A crate. What in the name of... Super View yeah. console. Six-foot model. Television set. Sure. Well, so what? Wait a minute. I didn't order no... T- oh, where do you see the aerial? Uh, uh, receipt to sign, too. Brooksy, a while ago you noticed Cynthia wasn't wearing any ornaments besides a wristwatch and earrings. Is that right? Uh, listen to me, will you? That, that television... George, I didn't it explains order... why the murderer ripped her gloves off. What he was looking for. Why he did it. That's it, Brooksy. I didn't. I didn't, I tell you. What? The television, I mean. Listen to me. I didn't order... Everybody no... wants something different out of life, Joe. Engagement ring. Why didn't you mention it, Joe? From a person like Tony, it must have been a really terrific stone. What? No, 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 no. listen. That's set there. I Cynthia didn't... showed you the engagement ring, didn't she, Joe? And you were trying to close up so you could go after her. She was in here regularly, so you know where to find her later after she phoned and we no, left. no. No, no. If you didn't order that television set, why does it bother you so much? Maybe your wife or somebody has already paid for that super view. I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. What did you say? Grab him, George. Back to the conclusion of our Let George Do It adventure in just a moment. For the last time, Angel, I'll get this straight. I'll explain it to you. I was the one who ordered that television set. I wanted to break Joe. I told you before, I was waiting for somebody. Mm -hmm. That was it. And it was a simple crime. Well, it was simple, all right. But I didn't expect to find the ring right in his pocket. Just did it for money. Yeah. Maybe he didn't even intend to kill her. But he ended up by having to kill both of them. Yeah, but George, I thought that Marlon No, 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 Angel, not Marlon. You see, Marlon and that thug, that Michael, they gave each other an alibi. Didn't you catch that? Hmm. Yeah, but Tony, he didn't have an alibi. (laughs) Angel, let me explain something. A man who's going to marry a girl doesn't kill her, does he? Well... No, he kills himself. George! have just heard It's a Mystery to Me, another Let George Do It adventure. Robert Bailey was starred as George Valentine, with Virginia Gregg as Brooksy. David Victor and Jackson Gillis wrote the story, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Now this is yours truly inviting you to another visit with Valentine, when you will again hear what happens when you let George do it. <laughs>
The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If Mike Shane were a painter, right now he might be gazing raptly from his office window at the sun setting directly into San Francisco's Golden Gate. If Mike Shane were a poet, he might be gazing dreamily at Phyllis Knight, his office associate. Being simply a very practical private detective, Mike's eyes are focused upon a typewritten letter on his desk while he and Phyllis share the telephone talking to the inspector of homicide. And it goes this way, inspector. Dear Mr. Shane... My life is in great danger. I dare not come to your office for fear I shall be followed. This note is to acquaint you with the fact so that when I telephone to you, you may come instantly without question and well armed. And it's signed with the initials R.E.M. Hmm. When did you get it, Mike? Oh, we could go Tuesday, Inspector. No return address given, and it's typed on the very cheapest paper. Sounds a little different from the usual crackpot thing, Mike. But I think that's all it is. Mm. Our department gets a dozen of those letters every day. Mm, I know, Inspector, but this afternoon I got a phone call from the guy. Still wouldn't give his name. Said he was in really desperate peril now. He was going to risk coming to see Mike anyway at 4 o'clock. And so? Well, it's 6 o'clock and we're still waiting. And forget it, Mike. Guy's just a screwball. If it had really been serious, he'd have gotten in touch with the police. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, uh, by the way, Mike, what are you doing this evening? Oh, Mike and I are going to go to dinner and maybe a movie. You want to make it a force? Well, my wife is spending the night down on the peninsula with her folks. Okay, Inspector. Look, I'm going back to my apartment and change shirts. Say, uh, what do you say you meet us there in a few minutes, huh? I'm on my way there right now. Hope you kids don't mind my inviting myself along like this. Oh, nonsense. We love to have you. But I make one condition. No shop talk from you kids tonight. Deal. <laughs> well, it'll be a painfully quiet evening, then. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Any mail in my box? Uh, uh-uh. No, not today. All right, make yourselves to home, children. It won't yeah. take me a minute to shave and put on a clean shirt. under the star... Mike! Huh? There on the floor. Holy... Mike, what do you want? Where did you get it? It's a head. A mummified human head. Yeah, it's been shrunk. The head's no larger than a baseball. And the skin, it's almost black. That long hair. Oh, it gives me the shudders. Mike, how in the devil did it get in here? Somebody pulling a gag on you? Blamed if I know, Inspector. From what I've read, I'd say it's a trophy of some headhunting tribe. Probably Sarawak or uh, Borneo. The cheekbones look more like an Indian's to me. Mm. You know, they say they have headhunters in Martinique and up the Amazon. You're right, Phil. It's a South American Indian. But how did it get in here? The front door was locked. The same goes for the windows. Unless maybe the one in the bedroom. Inspector? Yeah? Mm. Yes. Look. Look on my bed. A body. These slight markings on the throat are conclusive, Mike. He was strangled. Yeah. And with a good deal of finesse. It was done with something, some soft noose, uh, a garot, garot or something. First we find a mummified Indian head and then a man strangled. Well, kids, there must be a connection between the two. Yeah, Phil, but what? Did the killer leave the head for Mike, or did this man drop it? Hey. Hey, there's something on the floor. Yeah. Huh? The man's wallet. The driver's license gives his name as R.E. McIntyre, 1198 California Street. Born April 5th, 1896. Listed as married. R.E. McIntyre. R.E. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. The initials on that letter. R.E.M., R.E. McIntyre. 
This is our man. Yeah, but what in the blazes was he doing in your bedroom? I thought he was to meet you at your office. Well, maybe he was being followed, Inspector. Decided he'd be safer if he could hide in Mike's apartment till Mike came home. Oh, yeah. it's dizzy any way you look at it. There's almost a hundred dollars here in his wallet. He's dressed like a Knob Hill millionaire. Yet he wrote to me on the cheap paper a schoolboy would use. Yeah, let's go through his pockets and see what else we can find. Okay. First, the wallet. Here. A gold pen and pencil, initialed R-E-M. Yeah. There's a checkbook. Key ring. Gold knife. A couple of dollars in small change. One pack of cigarettes. Match folder. That's all. Yeah, it doesn't tell us anything. Hand me the phone, Mike. I'm going to call headquarters for the squad, and after they get here... We're leaving for 1198 California Street and the lady who is Mrs. McIntyre. When did I last see my husband? Well, we ate luncheon at the Palace Hotel, and... Then Mr. McIntyre said he had some business to attend to. What time was that, Mrs. McIntyre? Mm, I would say two o'clock. Well, that's just about when he telephoned the office. He told me he was coming to see Mike at four o'clock. Did uh, your husband tell you, Mrs. McIntyre, that his life was in danger? That apparently he was being followed everywhere he went? Mr. McIntyre never talked over his affairs with me. However, I, I did notice that the past several weeks he seemed very nervous. I thought he was brooding over some business matter. And just what was his business? Mining. He and his partner, Anthony Locke, own a big tin mine in South America. South America? That's where the dried Indian head came from. It did mean something. Mrs. McIntyre, do you know if your husband had any enemies? I've answered that. Mr. McIntyre did not talk over his affairs with me. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly provided a beautiful and expensive home. Mrs. McIntyre, can you explain why he should write us that letter on the cheapest sort of paper and then sign only his initials? <laughs> Max done that trick before. Mm hmm? Uh -huh. He wanted you to think he was a poor man, so you might work for him at less money. Oh. He would even introduce himself by some false name that would fit his initials. <laughs> yes, he thought that much of a nickel. Except when he could spend it on himself, huh? I presume, Mrs. McIntyre, your husband left the will. Mr. Shane, I'm getting very weary of repeating this. Mm? My husband did not talk over his business with me. Of course he had a will. And of course I'm the beneficiary. You must realize, Mrs. McIntyre, that I we're... realize that for one half hour I've been subjected to highly impertinent questions. I know nothing which can help the police department. And there the matter ends. Mike, for two cents I'd go back to the house and haul that royal lady down to headquarters. I think she'd decide to answer our question. Look, let's forget her for the time being, Inspector. We've got to talk to McIntyre's business partner, Anthony Locke. Hey, kids, I just saw a man duck behind that front gate. You did? Okay, let's have a look. Hey, he got in that car. Quick, we'll follow him. Here, jump in. Thanks. Right. Mike started. He's getting away. He's gotten away, Angel. The wires have been pulled loose from my ignition switch. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Many motorists have been amazed at the way the new 76 gasoline performs in traffic and on hills. Well, the reason is simple. It's because the new 76 contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline Union Oil Company's refineries produce for the Air Forces. That means the new 76 gasoline for your car is packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice its instant response as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like its quieter, faster action. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. Nearly all Union Oil Minuteman stations have the new 76 on hand now. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Tonight, a triple mystery dogs Mike and Phyllis. Why was a mummified Indian head left in Mike's apartment? Why was a man strangled to death in Mike's bed? Who pulled the ignition wires loose in Mike's automobile? 
Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have gone to the home of the murdered man's partner, Anthony Locke. The dining room door opens. Mr. Locke asks if you would please join him in the dining room. Why, certainly. Thank you. Ah, good evening. I was just beginning my dinner. Hope you haven't eaten. I'll have water set extra plates. I'm afraid you don't understand, sir. I'm the inspector of homicide. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, private detectives. Oh, really? Well, I uh, misunderstood, Waters. Bit hard of hearing, you know. Too much quinine, touch of malaria. Sit down, sit down. I despise eating alone. Happy to have your company. Mr. Locke, this is not a social call. No, can't recall inviting you. Don't know what you're doing here. But uh, how about some terrapin soup? It's excellent tonight. Sir, I'm from the police department. Your partner, Mr. McIntyre, has been killed. Murdered. Strangled to death. <laughs> when? Tonight, in my apartment. What? And in the next room, we found a dried, mummified human head. Uh, what? Mr. Locke? Mr. Locke, are you all right? <laughs> the sign of death. You know what it means? Yes. Yes, McIntyre came to me with an anonymous letter. It said he was going to die. When was this? Uh, about ten days ago. I tried to get him to go to the police. He wouldn't. Finally, he said he'd hire a private detective. We both knew who sent the letter. But I didn't think he'd actually kill. Hmm? That's what that head means. He who? Please, Mr. Locke. His name is Ferd Stockel. He lives in Bolivia. McIntyre and I bought our plantation from him about five years ago. Mm -hmm. It was just jungle and bare mountains. Then we dug the tin mine. Stockel said we cheated him out of it. He swore he'd get even. <laughs> the scar on my cheek. He did that with a the machete. Then you think he's in San Francisco? He must be. The letter was postmarked from here. But, gentlemen, this isn't the end. I have received the same letter. The hmm? same death threat? Yes. Okay, let's have a look at that letter. Well, that's a strange thing. I had it on my desk, then suddenly it disappeared. Then we'd better move fast. I want a description of this third stock. Well, I can give you that. He's about five feet seven. He has black hair, black eyes, very dark skin. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd be about uh, 40 now. He speaks English with a peculiar hissing accent. Good. Now, Mike, we better get moving. But, but, but how can you catch him? What can you do? Plenty. We're going back to headquarters and broadcast a general alarm. All right, boys. That's the man's description. Get that on the radio right away. See that all squad cars are contacted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Smith. Your men will cover all airports, train depots, bridge control stations, and highways. He may try to skip town. Yes, sir. Russell and you boys go over the registrations at all hotels. See if you can get me the immigration authorities. Yes, yes sir. Right. That's all. Get busy. <laughs> Inspector, we made an inventory of everything in McIntyre's pocket. So did we, Sergeant. Oh, then you know about the folder of matches. Matches? What about it? Address on the cover there. That's the third rate place down in the Embarcadero. Hardly a place for a rich man like McIntyre. Mm, you're right, Sergeant. Not only right, Inspector. I suggest we visit that third rate hotel on the Embarcadero right now. <laughs> That's what I said. Ain't nobody name of Ferd Starkle registered here. Well, he may be under another name. You got any man registered from South America? Here, let me think now. South America? Well, yeah. Yeah, room 307. That great big guy with the beard. Signed in from Lima, Peru. When? Oh, maybe two weeks ago. Name's Ed Badger, he says. Two weeks ago. Hmm. Time fits if the description doesn't. Okay, I guess this time we walk up. Yes, I come up from Lima. What about it? Before that, Mr. Badger, by any chance were you in Bolivia? Oh, now I'm on. You've been talking to McIntyre. What's Mac doing? Running to the police just because I, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I thought he had some sense. You were going to say just because you what? Well, now, gents, it was a good deal. I figured Mr. McIntyre and Mr. Locke wouldn't mind owning the second tin mine down in old Bolivia. I could fix it so they'd get hold of a really big one. Mm -hmm. A few thousands played in the right place, you know. <laughs> but if Mac is going to turn Sunday school boy on me... Mr. Badger, you, uh, you work for McIntyre and Locke? I was boss of the mine, madam, until uh, 
they were looking for an excuse to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. But Ed's banner is not one to hold hard feelings. When did you last see McIntyre? Well, he come to the hotel here yesterday. Now, I'm not one to do Mac dirt. You ought to know that. So if you gentlemen will give me an idea what this is all about. Mr. McIntyre has been murdered. Been be oh, that's not so good. No, no. Uh, Mr. Padger, you mind telling us where you've been for the past three hours? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, I've uh, been right here in my room. And, uh, oh, maybe a couple of trips to the bar. Did Mr. McIntyre tell you that he'd received a letter threatening his life? No. A letter, eh? So that's what was worrying old Mac. I figured he was having trouble with his wife. While you were down in Bolivia, Mr. Badger, did you know a man named Starkle? Third Starkle? Oh, did I know Third? There's a cutthroat for you. Oh? Now, if you were to ask me if Third Starkle would kill Mac, I'd say yes. I, Mac and Locke, really crossed him up once. Uh, have you seen him in San Francisco? Here? Yeah? No. He's down in Bolivia. When did you last see him there? Why, a couple of months ago, I say. Yeah. You mean you think he's in town? I wouldn't like that, gents. He's a bad one. You said a moment ago you thought McIntyre was having trouble with his wife. Uh, where did you get that idea? Well, I, uh, I, I only thought. I don't know. Go on, go on, please. Well, I, I don't know anything. Mac just said something about his wife nagging him. I, I hope you gentlemen won't tattle that to her. I may have to do business with her and lock. Hey, you won't say anything, will you? That's for us to decide. Uh, Mr. Badger, is there anything further you can tell us? Anything else that comes to your mind? No, I can't think of anything. Mm-hmm. Inspector, yeah, I Mike. think I've got a slightly different angle on this case. I'd like to go back to McIntyre's house and have a look at his private papers, whether Mrs. McIntyre likes it or not. I mean, I know what you're thinking, Mike. You figure Ed Badger is in this deeper than he'll admit. Now you want to get some proof in black and white. Well, that's part of it. Yeah, he told us just what he wanted us to hear and no more. Mm -hmm. So he's a shady character. But probably he's never risen above petty larceny and confidence games. You know, he doesn't look like the... The type, yes. Uh -huh. You know, someday, Angel, the inspector and I are going to take you down to Rogue's Gallery and show you the pictures of every convicted murderer for the past ten years. You'll say most of them look uh, as innocent as the inspector uh, or myself. That's no recommendation. Oh, get her. <laughs> Here we are, kids. I'll pull up in the driveway. Stop and... the car. Quick. What? There's that man, the man who tore the wires out of Mike's car. Yeah, he's running down the walk. Hey, you, stop. Stop or I'll shoot. That stopped him. Come on. Inspector, if you've hit him... Don't worry, I aimed at the pavement. He's pretty shaky in the legs. What's the big idea? Try to kill a man. Listen, if I wanted to hit you, I couldn't miss it that short range. You can't get away with this. Sticking up a guy right in... I'll have the law on you. You're talking to him, buddy. I'm inspector of homicide. And we want to know why you were sneaking around outside this house. And why you pulled the wires loose in our car. I'm a private detective. I was paid to watch this house. Who paid you? McIntyre. I'm watching his wife. Oh, is that so? Then, Inspector, suppose we give him a chance to do uh, more than watch her. Suppose we make him talk to her. <laughs> man's lying. Why would my husband hire a detective to watch me? Well, we don't know that he is a detective. I got a license. Here, see if he is so. Mm-hmm. Your name Andy Blackmore? Yeah. License was issued last month. I never heard of him before. So what? I never heard of you before. I'm new in San Francisco. Mr. Blackmore, when did Mr. McIntyre hire you to shadow his wife? Last week. It's preposterous, I tell you. He's lying. My orders were to watch her and a fellow named Locke. Well, get McIntyre. He'll tell you if I'm lying or not. McIntyre was dead. But murdered. He's what? Mr. Blackmore, just what were you supposed to find out about Mrs. McIntyre and Locke? Well, I don't know. I was supposed to keep track of her and everybody she was in contact with, especially Locke. And what happens? I get myself half strangled to death and then you shoot at me. Wait a minute. Hold on. Who strangled you when? Oh, some big guy with a beard. He was leaving here a couple of nights ago and when I... Hello? Is the inspector there? Yes, he's here. It's for you, Inspector. Thank you. Hello? Inspector? Yes? Mr. Locke just phoned headquarters. Says he's discovered a very important clue. All right, Sergeant. Tell him we'll be right over. You meet us there. Mm. 
Mike, I, I don't like this at all. Mr. Locke's front door open, the electric lights off. Not only off, there's no electricity at all. Listen, you guys aren't going to mix me up in this. I'm going out and waiting in the car. You're staying right here, mister. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. Not a sound. Where are the servants? I want to find the telephone. Mike, throw your flashlight around. Oh, Mike. Huh? Throw it this way. I just kicked something. It, it, it rolled. There it is. A head. Another head. Yeah. And right behind it. On the couch. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. We don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate all your traffic problems, but we do say it will make your driving a lot more pleasant. Even the oldest cars perk up and come alive when you put in the new 76. That's because this new post-war fuel contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline that Union Oil Company's refineries are producing for the air forces. That means it's packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice this as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like the quieter, faster action of the powerful new 76 gasoline. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the new Super 76. The new 76 gasoline is now going on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. In the darkened house of Anthony Locke, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a second mummified human head. But this time, the murderer has failed. Our trio have arrived just in time. Anthony Locke himself has been revived. In the yellow light of Mike's flashlight, the victim gasps out his story. Thank heavens you got here. You thought he had killed me. Well, we did, too. The garage was still wrapped around your neck. Did you see who it was? No. I, it, it was Starkle. Ferd Starkle. It must have been. But you couldn't see him. No. No, I came home and, and found the servants gone. I got scared. I phoned the police. Then I heard a window smash. Where? The breakfast room. In there. Suddenly, the lights went out. Somebody grabbed me. I felt something tighten around my throat. That's the last I remember. Well, he left you for dead, then ran out the front door and left it open. Well, it must have happened in the past 15 minutes. You were all right when you phoned us. Yes. Oh, please, that, that flashlight hurts my eyes. You can light the candles on the mantel. Uh, I'll light them. Who, who's that man there beside you? Andy Blackmore. I'm a private detective. He claims McIntyre hired him to shadow Mrs. McIntyre and you. Mac hired him to... No, no, he's lying. I tell you it's the truth. Now, listen, you guys aren't going to rope me into this. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke, you said on the phone that you had discovered some important clue. Yes, I, I found the letter. Good. Oh. The letter threatening my life. I, I, I've got it in my pocket. Good. It may be the key to the whole case. No, I'm sure I... No, it's gone. I, I had it right here in my pocket. He took it. Doggone, just when we thought uh, we... You've got to catch Starkle. You've got to. He's mad. He'll try again. We'll do our best, Mr. Locke. But I'm worried about these missing servants. Uh, how many are in your employ? The butler and the French cook. Why would they disappear? Is that the front door? Inspector! It's the sergeant. Oh. And Ed Badger. And why not? Gentlemen, I was suspicious. I couldn't see any lights except a couple of candles. Because somebody pulled the light switch. And tried to murder Mr. Locke. To mi No, Mr. Locke, too. Are you all right now, sir? He is. But uh, what were you doing outside? Why, I was coming to see him. After you gentlemen left me at the hotel, I figured I'd better talk over my business with him personally. He's the man I was trailing the other night. He's the one that tried to strangle me. You again. Now, look here, friend. Remember what I told you about messing the things that don't concern you? Inspector. Yeah, Mike. Before the trail gets hot, uh, uh, we'd better look for clues. The killer may have dropped something. Right. Let's start with a broken window. Mr. Locke said it was in the next room. There's the glass scattered all around the window. Yeah. Double sliding window. Now, 
Let's raise it and check for footprints outside. And a little luck. Cement paving. Oh. He smashed the glass, crawled through the window, but he didn't cut himself or snag his clothes. Well, let's look around the room. Mike, let me have that flashlight a minute. Well, what is it, Angel? Look. Look, this window has an upper and lower half. Yeah, and the bottom half is smashed. Yeah, but there are little pieces of glass scattered along the wooden frame here on the top of the lower half. Mm. Now, how could glass from below the frame get on top of the frame? Angel, Angel, you hit it. Hmm? The top half of the window was lowered first. And when it was raised again, the glass was transferred from one frame to the other. Then that window was smashed from the inside. Wait a minute, kids, wait a minute. Remember Mr. Locke said he got a threatening letter just like McIntyre's? Yeah, the one he just said was stolen for the second time. But only McIntyre did anything about it. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Locke. Yes? Mr. Locke, where is the uh, power switch that turns on the electric lights? Right down in the basement. And immediately after the window was smashed, the lights went out and somebody grabbed you? Yes. Mr. Locke, it would take several minutes to get from that window down into the basement, then tumble back upstairs in the dark. What? Why, why uh... You why... faked the whole thing. You broke that window yourself. You got rid of the service. No, no, it was Ferd Stockle. He you was built the... up a dramatic story for us to swallow. What? But your own partner didn't believe it. That's why McIntyre hired a detective to watch his wife and you. You were the one who insisted on going to the police about McIntyre's threatening letter. But you also got a letter. You never went to the police. You didn't hire a detective. Because you knew there was no danger, Mr. Locke. Because you are the murderer. No, no, no. Somebody followed McIntyre to Shane's apartment. Somebody climbed through the window and strangled him. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Thank you. As sweet a confession as I ever heard. None of us told you that the killer got into my apartment through the window, but you're perfectly correct. Well, Inspector, I guess that's all the proof the D.A. will ask of you. Mike, Hmm? do you realize we haven't had a single bite of dinner tonight? Oh, my stomach won't let me forget it. Oh, the inspector told me he'd meet us at Fisherman's Wharf as soon as he finishes at headquarters. I hope he can find out where Locke got those gruesome Indian heads. Oh, he probably brought them with him from South America. Well, maybe so. Anyway, Mike, I think I can guess Locke's motive for the killing. He was in love with Mrs. McIntyre. He wanted the husband out of the way. Uh-huh. Locke's elaborate build-up was just to disguise a very simple, sordid murder. No. I don't believe Mrs. McIntyre had the slightest interest in Locke. Or even suspected his intentions. Well, it just goes to show you, Angel. When some men are in love, they'll stop at nothing. Uh huh. Uh-huh. That's not my problem. Hmm? Mm. It's when some men are in love and will do nothing. Why, Angel! again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.
Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. We've done that because we recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like Plenamins, for example, Rexall's famous multivitamin capsules. Two Plenamins a day give you more than your daily minimum requirement of every vitamin for which such requirements have been established, plus valuable liver concentrate and iron. What's more, plenamins cost you only pennies per day. Ask for plenamins at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. We trail them, we nail them. If they're guilty, we jail them. No charge for poetry. Oh, no. Edgar Guest with a shoulder holster. Hello, Helen, baby. Rick, guess what's in town? Unless I win something, I give up. The carnival. Well, is the balloon concession tied up yet? Oh, Rick, I'm serious. I haven't been to a carnival since I was little. Let's go tonight. You mean peanuts, popcorn, cracker jacks, and all that? Yes. Sounds awful. Oh, now, Rick. Please. Uh, okay, honey. I'll be around at eight. Shall I wear my knickers? Rick. Bye. That night, I picked up Helen, and we went to the carnival. There were more people on the midway than Rexall has stores, and we got pushed so much, I felt like the tax bill in Congress. Helen decided she wanted a Cupid doll, so we stopped at the shooting gallery. That's pretty good shooting. Think nothing of it. Just three more bullseyes and you win a dial. Well, here's your dial. Where'd you ever learn to shoot like that? At the ski club. Would you like to try a shot, Rick? Uh, no thanks. Come on. Oh, Rick, isn't this doll cute? I... And now, oh, for your amazement and proof of my statement, I'll ask him to step out here. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Samson, the strong man. Step right up, folks. He'll thrill you with his amazing feats of strength. Now, crowd right in. Don't be shocked. There is no... Standing on the platform with the biggest collection of muscles I'd ever seen. Samson looked like an overgrown orangutan. And at least three tigers had contributed their all to the loincloth he wore around his middle. Samson, the great. And now, our sensational offer. $100 to any man who will step up here and defy the mighty Samson to put him to sleep by squeezing his chest. Now it is harmless, my friends. And if any one of you daring gentlemen think the mighty one cannot put you to sleep with a mere squeeze, then step right up. If Samson fails, then one hundred dollars is yours. Well, Rick. Now I tell you, friends. Well, Rick, what? Don't you want to show off? Not my insides. Rick, you mean you're afraid just to let him squeeze you? you Honey, I'm afraid to let him breathe on me. One hundred dollars. Come on, let's go see that fortune teller. I stared Helen toward the next booth before she could talk me into anything my bones would regret tomorrow. The sign outside the tent read, Madam Tanya, your past, your present, your future. And inside, we found Madam T staring intently into a crystal ball. She wore gypsy clothes and a heavy makeup that covered what might have been very lovely features. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Hmm. Haven't I heard you on the radio? She didn't crack a smile, and I didn't exactly blame her. She motioned us into chairs around the crystal. The room was decorated in about the same motif as the tattooed lady and would have impressed a man with a bad case of DTs. Madame Tanya went back to staring at the crystal, so I followed suit. I couldn't see a thing in the glass ball, but then maybe she picked up television on clear nights. 
The crystal grows dim. Ah, I can see that you are both very much in love. Well, go on. It is good. This man adores you. He worships you. He idolizes you. Wake me up when I propose. You are an unbeliever? Oh, let's be modern. I'm a cynic. The crystal does not lie. But to make certain, I will consult the cards. She picked up a deck that was too big for poker and too small for canasta. I should pay to watch a girl play solitaire? I nudged Helen. We were about to leave when a tall, thin young man pushed back the canvas flap and walked in. Hey, Tony, I just... Oh, I didn't know you were busy. Excuse me. The boy pushed back the flap to go out and then made a sharp, gurgling noise in his throat. He doubled with pain and fell to the floor. Even from where I was sitting, I could see the big, ugly bullet hole in his chest. Bruce! Don't scream. We'll have the whole crowd in here. Stand back, Helen. Is he hurt bad? You don't need a crystal ball for this, honey. He's dead. Even under the heavy makeup, I could see her face turn pale. I sent Helen to call the police, and then I looked around outside. The killer had either used a silencer or else the shot was not heard in the confusion. Twenty minutes later, Lieutenant Max Talbert arrived, followed by Sergeant Otis wearing his Hopalong Cassidy badge. Hi, Rick. Well, hello, Max. Where's Walt Levinson? He's on vacation, Rick. I've taken over his cases. Also his problems, I see. Hello, Otis. Hi, Shamus. So there's been another murder, huh? And you just happened to be here. Sounds suspicious to me. Otis, why don't you stick your head through a piece of canvas and let people throw baseballs at it? And get my brains knocked out? Oh, no. Why not? You got nothing to lose. Rick, uh, Miss Asher told me over the phone what happened. It sounds like we'll be looking for a needle in a haystack. You want to work on the case with us? Not particularly. I just happen to be here, that's all. Yeah. I still think that's awful funny. Otis, I'll send you my confession in the morning. So long, Max. It's not that I wasn't interested in the case. I was. But in my business, you can't poke your head into murder on a gratis basis. So I took Helen home. The next morning, I went to my office as usual. And then around 10 o'clock, I had a visitor. Mr. Diamond, I need your help. Well, thank my lucky stars. Sit down. Thank you. She looked like a well-dressed Lady Godiva, minus horse. I stifled a drool as she sat down, and then I realized that I'd seen her before. This was Madame Tanya, minus the heavy makeup, gypsy garb, and the phony accent. It's about last night's murder. You see, it's not the first. Four men have been killed within a year. And all because of me. Go on. My real name is Tony Lawrence. About a year ago, a boy I knew asked me for a date, and we went out. Next day, he was killed. There were two more after that who showed an interest in me. They both died, too. It's getting so every time a man looks at me twice, he's murdered. Well, it's a pleasant way to die. But uh, what about this kid last night? Well, he, he'd asked me for a date at a small party we had after the show one night. He worked in the show, but I hardly even knew him. I see. Did you tell Lieutenant Talbert all this? Oh, yes. He says he'll have to make a systematic check on everyone on the show. That could take months. Yes, it could. Talbert's a good cop, though. Why'd you come to me? I want you to go back to the lot with me. I'll arrange to get you a job there. Honey, I got a job. I'm a private detective. Oh, I know. I'll pay you what you ask. Oh, well, that uh, understanding will just continue. Well, maybe working undercover, you'll be able to find out who's behind all this. Well, I, uh... Oh, I'm sure it'll work. I'll get you a job as Barker for the girl show. Mm. You know, I've always wanted to run away with the girl show. We drove back to the carnival, and I became Rick Diamond, boy Spieler. The kid who was murdered last night had asked Tony for a date at a small party. There were only three other people at that party, and it seemed logical that one of them was the killer. First on the party list was Chuckles, the clown. Tony took me over to his trailer. Here we are. I think you'll like Chuckles. He's got a great sense of humor. Well, Tony, come on in. Can't stay long, Chuckles. I want you to meet Rick Diamond. He's the new barker on the girls' show, and the boss wants me to introduce him to everyone. Well, any friend of Tony's is a friend of mine. Glad to know you, Rick. Uh, How are you, Chuckles? Oh, just fine. (laughs) So you got the job at the Shakers, huh? You ever bark before? Only at pet shows. Oh, well, you'll do a good business over there. All the old fogies go to see Karen. She's the head shaker. 
Is that all she shakes? <laughs> hey, hey, that's pretty good. Put some gags in your pitch. The crowd eats it up. We'd better go, Rick. You start to work soon. Yeah, well, drop around any time, huh? <laughs> Number two on the suspect list was Samson, the strong man. I remembered him from last night and took a last look at my fingers as we shook hands. Glad to meet you. Do you wrestle? No, but I'm a demon with jacks. Oh, I can't find no one around here to play with. Oh, you poor kid. Have you tried the lion cage? Rick's going to pitch the girl show, Samson. Ah, oh, fooey, that's no fun. Hey, look, kid, you work out with me, and someday you can be a strong man, too. Well, that's a tempting offer, but I'm afraid I'm just a natural-born sissy. Well, if you change your mind, come around and... And uh, you'll change my posture, I know. Glad to have met you, Samson. So long. Playful little character. He's really very nice. Hey, let's stop here for a hot dog. Good. My favorite meal. Give the man a cooked one, Maisie. Sure thing, Tony. Uh, loaded with onions, honey. No date tonight. Aren't you hungry, Tony? Uh-uh. I've got to change for my act soon. Tell me, uh, how did a pretty girl like you get tied down to a crystal ball? Oh, I don't know. I grew up on shows. Mom and Dad were wire walkers. Well, I don't like high places, so I decided to be an actress. Mm-hmm. Well, after a few feeble stage attempts, I came back here. Now you do your acting in a tent. That's right. But these murders aren't solved soon. I'll be on the move again. Those, uh, those two characters we just met, do you think one of them might be the killer? Gee, I don't know. They've always been friendly with me, but... Well, they did overhear that boy ask me for the date. Karen was there, too. Oh, yes, uh, the shaker, as Chuckles put it. You'll probably meet her later on. She's always quick to discover a new man. Well, I can hardly wait. Say, I'd better get back. I'll see you after the show tonight. Here you are, mister. It's got enough onions to keep you out of circulation for a week. Tony walked away, stopped, turned, and gave me a smile that made me feel warmer than the hot dog I began munching. She was a very pretty girl. Pretty enough for someone to kill any man she got interested in. And that someone was either a clown, a strong man, or a hula dancer. Yeah, it was quite a mess, and here I was in the middle of it. But as P.T. Barnum always said, as a sucker born every minute... Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you develop a simple headache, what's the first thing you think of for fast relief? Why, aspirin, of course. Right. But it's also smart to think one step further and choose Rexall aspirin. <laughs> Give me three good reasons why. Okay. First, every Rexall aspirin tablet contains five full grains of pure aspirin. Second... There is no faster-acting aspirin made. What do you mean by that? I mean that when taken with water, a Rexall aspirin tablet is ready to go to work for you, even before it reaches your stomach. Sounds swell so far. What's the third reason? Just this. In the economy size 200-tablet bottle, Rexall aspirin costs you little more than three-tenths of a cent per tablet. That I'll remember. And remember this also. You can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right up and see Karen and her friends. Come on, boys, don't be bashful. Put your wives on the Ferris wheel drawn in. Get away from me, son. You bother me. Only one-tenth of a dollar plus 15 cents in your old set. You'll see Karen, the blonde bombshell. That night, I yelled my head off. The crowd was heavy, and the men poured into the tent until there was panting room only. I looked at my watch and saw that I had four more hours to go. So I warned my tonsils and kept right at it. My mistake, mister. Go on in. Four hours later, I felt like a politician and had a voice like Andy Devine. Tony met me after the crowds had left, and we had a Coke. Tired. Tired? Me? No, oh, no. 37 hours sleep and I'll be as good as new. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Oh, do I have to? I thought the girl show would be great, but they're inside. I'm outside. Well, you'll meet Karen soon. Uh, that's some consolation. No, I'm saying, while I think of it, 
Maybe we'd better not be seen together so much. I got a great affection for life. Yeah, I've thought of that. You'd better go on from here alone. But, Ricky, be careful. I gave her my for you I will look, and then she left. I had been assigned a bunk in one of the trailers and was about to head toward it when something grabbed my arm. At first, I thought one of the snakes had left the charmer's neck. But this one had long blonde hair. Hi. My name's Karen. You got a match? I'd heard the match line in a movie, but what this gal carried around could never pass the censor board. I'd been singing her praises all evening, and now I could see that I'd been guilty of understatement. Thanks. Oh, that's all right. I'm loaded with them. <laughs> hey, you're cute. The last guy had a lousy voice, but you're cute. What's your name? Diamond. You can call me Rick. You want to buy me a Coke? Sure. Well, never mind. I just wanted to see if you wanted to. Well, any more party games up your sleeve? Oh, sure. Lots more. Uh, I've seen you with Tony. You like her? Well, shouldn't I? I don't know. Only the way things have been happening, it ain't so healthy. Yeah, so I heard. You like her? She's all right. Burns me, though. She makes more dough than I do, and she's strictly no talent. She just makes up them stories. Now, me, I give the boys the money's worth. Well, uh, I bet you do. (laughs) You know, I bet we get along real swell, you and me. Well, I, I hope we do. You know, there's nothing but jerks around here. You look sort of like a gentleman. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just tired. Oh, I like it. You, uh, want to take me into town and go dancing? Well, I'm all worn out tonight. Oh, I don't really want to go. Just want to know if you'd like to take me. Oh, we're back at that. Yes, I would like to take you. Good. Gee, it's a nice night for a walk. Would you like to... Uh, let's not go around again. Say, you're awful cute. Good night. That night, I went to bed with a lot on my mind and an ice pack around my neck. I was after a murderer who left no clues. The only apparent motive was to keep men away from Tony. Chuckles or Samson? Maybe they were in love with Tony. On the other hand, Karen might be jealous enough of Tony to commit murder. I didn't count sheep that night, just characters... Next morning, while I was roaming around the carnival grounds, I found Chuckles sitting on the steps of his trailer, sewing a bright-colored costume. Well. Hi there. Sit down. Uh, thanks. Hey, you're pretty handy with that needle. Oh, you gotta be. How'd it go last night? Well, I'm a little better, but I'm in no condition for a cigarette test. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to yell my lungs out every night. I just stand around and let people laugh at me. I have a friend named Otis who does the very same thing. Say, you should have been around yesterday if you like excitement. Guy was murdered. Oh? What happened? Somebody shot him. Seems like the only reason was because he liked Tony. You mean the girl who showed me around yesterday? Yeah, that's her. Oh, I guess not many guys give her the eye. No. (laughs) Uh, There's one fellow that kind of likes her, though. A guy by the name of Leonardi. Oh? He don't work here no more. He's on another show. Tony and him write a lot, though. I'm always mailing letters for him. Well, maybe they're just friends. Yeah, that's what she says. He worked on this show before I came over here. I don't really know him, but I bet there's something between those two. Maybe he's the one behind all this. Could be. Well, it's not good to poke your nose into other people's business. You're telling me. Well, I guess I'll look over the show. Yeah, well, drop around any time. <laughs> I left Chuckles and wandered on up the midway. About half past the merry-go-round, I ran into Karen, the curve cram kid. Hi, handsome. Hi, yourself. You know, I dreamed about you last night. You do wonders for my ego. Mm, You do wonders for my dreams. Uh, Care if I walk along with you? Not at all. Uh, Karen, do you know a guy named Leonardi? Oh, sure. Used to work here. Why, why do you ask? Well, I've heard he might be interested in Tony. That's risky business, you know. Tony and Leonardi? Oh, no. Now, somebody's pulling your leg. Oh, Rick, I've been looking... Oh, I didn't know you had company. Hello, Karen. Hi. I I just thought I'd see if you were getting along all right, Rick. He's in good hands. That's all a matter of opinion, dear. Uh, Look, why don't you girls amuse yourselves while I make a phone call? 
Karen, you do the shimmy while Tony tells your fortune. I'll be right back. Both girls were exchanging icy stares as I pulled up my coat collar and walked away. So far, I'd accomplished nothing, and the case was still as mixed up as a chef's salad. I called Max to see if he'd uncovered anything on the latest murder. Homicide, Lieutenant Talbot speaking. Max, this is Rick. How are you coming on that circus murder? Oh, Rick, what a headache. Get screwier every minute. Yeah, I know. The fortune teller hired me. Oh, well, then you know almost as much as I do. And uh, there's one new development, no? Well, don't be greedy, Grandpa. Shoot. That's what someone else did last night. And a guy by the name of Leonardi. Leonardi. The guy Chuckles told me about. The one who liked Tony. Max filled in with the details. The killer had written a letter to Leonardi and told him to come to a hotel room in the city because Tony was sick and had been asking for him. Then the killer rigged up a gun trap so that when Leonardi opened the door, the gun would go off and kill him. Only Leonardi was still alive. The killer had made one mistake. I thanked Max and went back to Tony's tent, certain I could use that mistake to my advantage. Hello, Rick. Hey, where did little Miss Wigglehips go? I don't think she liked your leaving her. She went back to her trailer. Mm, good. Now, Tony, you told me that only three people were present at the party when Bruce asked you for the date. Are you certain of that? Why, yes. Just Samson, Chuckles, and Karen. They dropped in after the show, and we had coffee. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to invite our three friends over again after the show tonight. Will you do that? Well, yes, but I don't understand. I went back to the girls' show and began my afternoon pitch. That evening, I went through it again, and then around midnight, I went to the party in Tony's tent. They were all three there when I entered. Sit over here, honey. Thanks, Karen. Hi, a weakling. Oh, please, Samson, I'm sensitive. <laughs> Say, you should have seen the matinee today. We did a bang-up routine and the crowd ate it up. We did the old one where we all pile into a car... You know, you... They were all relaxed, and I decided it was time to try my long shot. Chuckles was just finishing his story as I took a deep breath and crossed my fingers. Back, and then we all pile out of this little car. Oldest trick in the book, but they loved it. Uh, Chuckles, remember that guy you told me about the other day? I think his name was Leonardi. Sure, what about him? Well, nothing. I was just curious. Did you know him, Samson? Know him? Why, Leo and I used to room together where we worked here. Him and me is the best of buddies. And you, Karen, you said earlier that you knew him, right? Yeah, but I didn't think he was so great. He was nothing but a pest. Hey, you can't talk that way about my buddy. Oh, Samson, please. This is a party. Yeah, take it easy, Muscles. Now, let's see. You both knew Leonardi. That lets you out and leaves only Chuckles. You said earlier that you joined the show after Leonardi left, didn't you, Chuckles? Yeah. <laughs> Say, why all these questions about Leonardi? Because you tried to kill him last night. What? You thought there was something between Tony and him. What's this? <laughs> it's a joke, that's all. Yes, clown, but the joke's on you. You're the only one who didn't know Leonardi. The only one who would rig up a gun trap the way you did. What are you... What are you getting at? When Leonardi opened the door, the bullet went over his head. Well, over his head? That's right. You rigged the trap to shoot a normal-sized man. You're the only one here who didn't know Leonardi, didn't know he was a midget. Well, you, you're kidding. <laughs> He's a midget? That's right. Still feel like laughing? Well, I, I, well, it, it, it's on me. <laughs> the joke's on me. <laughs> you tried to kill my little pal. And, and there wasn't anything between Tony and him, huh? <laughs> Just friends, like she said. <laughs> Oh, what a laugh, a midget. <laughs> Why, you dirty... Take it easy, Samson. Little Leo's my pal. I'll kill this bum when he wakes up. Never mind, friend. That's the job for the state. And so, dear Helen, my life at the carnival ended and I have come back to you. Beaten, perhaps, but ready to continue my valiant fight against the forces of evil. Justice must prevail. Truth must march ahead to... Oh, Rick. Quiet, I'm auditioning for Portia Face's life. Rick. Hmm. Was that Karen person pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. What kind of a dance did she do? Well, she started by, uh... And then she... Well... 
Oh. One of those. Mm-hmm. Only more so. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Helen, you're so thoughtful. Rick. Yes, baby? I wonder how I'd be doing that. Doing what? Helen, please. This is more your type. Sweet and lovely, sweeter than the roses in May. Sweet and lovely, heaven must have sent her my way. Skies above me, never were as blue as her eyes. And she loves me, who would want a sweeter surprise? When she nestles in my arms so tenderly There's a thrill that words cannot express In my heart a song of love is taunting me Melody haunting me Sweet and lovely Sweeter than the roses in May And she loves me There is nothing more I can say. So that's my type, is it? Come here. Mm. Wow. Well. Oh, I guess a man's entitled to change his tune. <laughs> Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Tonight, I'd like to say a special word to users of mineral oil. I know that what you search for is one with an extra heavy body. Well, Rexall mineral oil is refined by a special process to obtain just that. And because it's so exceptionally pure and bland, Rexall mineral oil is non-irritating and non-habit-forming. What's more, it's tasteless, odorless, colorless. Next time, try Rexall mineral oil. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Bill Johnstone, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Parley Bear, Joe Duval, and Joe Gilbert. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hi, you beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go stag. Wednesdays this fall, hear Groucho, Gildy, and the Halls of Ivy on NBC. Stand by for crime. Hi. I'm Chuck Morgan, newscaster on radio station KOP here in Los Angeles. You know, corruption in government is something that will probably always be with us. 
let's face it, we have our share, I guess, just like every other large American city. There are a few of us who are in a position to do something about it. So we keep trying, with varying degrees of success and failure. There are other forms of corruption, too. In sports, for example, like that basketball business a while ago, and boxing. That's a story I'd like to tell you. You've heard of Lefty Luke Larson and K.O. McCready, light heavyweights, both of them. Well, last week, they were scheduled for a ten-rounder in the Starlight Stadium. It was supposed to be a grudge fight, but I had pretty good information that the scrap was fixed, with Lefty set up to kiss the canvas. I tried for a week to get my hands on something concrete that I could use without a libel suit being filed and got no place. Well, on the night of the fight, I got back to my office just before a seven o'clock broadcast and found my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis, knocking herself out over something she'd been reading. <laughs> all right, all right. What have you been oh. doing? Reading the Los Angeles weather reports or something? Oh, Chuck. Honestly, this is the funniest thing I've ever read. <laughs> yeah, some of your own dialogue, I'll bet. No. Look, this letter was addressed to the question and, and answer department and got to a mail by mistake. Yeah, who's it from? <laughs> oh, that's unimportant. Listen, dear sir, I have a small ranch in the San Fernando Valley. For several months, I have been troubled by my neighbor's chickens wandering into my backyard and laying their eggs in my garden. This morning, there wasn't a single solitary egg there, and I want to know what I can do about it. <laughs> Well, don't you think it's funny? Yeah, I'm dying. Now, look. Oh, well, you don't get it, Juggy boy. This woman says she's being troubled. Get that troubled yeah. by these hens laying their eggs in her yard and all. Yes, yes, I get it, I get it. Now she's mad because they've stopped. <laughs> oh, you do get it. Some people's sense of humor. Did the ducats come in? What ducats? The ducats to tonight's fights, of course. Oh, yes, they're here. And you don't have to bite my head off. Hey, who's going to use the other one? Other what? Where's that lighter fluid? Uh, the ticket. There are two. Oh, a friend of mine. Oh, here it is. I see. You know, Glamorpus, I'm as convinced that tonight's fight is fixed as I am that the sun will rise tomorrow. It burns me up because there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, this friend... The fight you... game's always been pretty clean. It's a lousy shame the way a gambling syndicate can move in and put the fix on. Mm, maybe your friend knows the answer. Uh, I don't think so. Glamorpus, it's almost time to go on the air. Oh, listen, answer the phone, will you? Chuck Morgan's office. Oh, hello, Bill. Yes, he's here. Who is it, Bill Max? Yes. He sounds excited. Hello, Bill. How are things? What? No kidding. Half hour ago, huh? Yeah, I can get it on the show, but talk fast. There's only about about three minutes to airtime. Take this down, Glamorpus. Okay. Lefty Luke Larson, contender for the light heavyweight championship of the world, was found murdered in his apartment at 720 Citizen Street this evening. the local fight fans quite a shock with the story of Lefty Larson's murder in my seven o'clock broadcast. But that was nothing to what was coming. At 7.15, I left the studio and drove out to 720 Citizen Street. It was a small apartment house located up against the hills in the Las Vegas district. Two cops were keeping a crowd of curious people moving. Both of them I knew, so they let me inside. Larson's apartment was on the ground floor rear... Tom Brady, the medical examiner, was just leaving as I entered. Bill Meggs was inside, another cop, and a red-headed girl. She was sitting in a corner, staring dazedly at the floor. Her eyes were red, and it was obvious that she'd been crying. How's it look, Bill? Uh, not good, Chuck. The guy was murdered, all right. Tom says it was most likely cyanide poisoning, although he can't tell for sure until he performs an autopsy. You got a cold, Bill? Yeah, I'm just getting over it. Oh, that's too bad. What makes you so sure it was murder? It had to be. Come over here. Right. See that uh, damp ring on this bedside table? Yeah. The glass containing some sort of liquid must have been there not long ago. That's right. Well, the glass is missing. If Lefty had committed suicide, it'd still be there. Unless someone else took it away. It isn't very likely that someone would come in and take that glass away with Lefty's dead body lying there in the bed without doing something about it. Unless it was the murderer himself. Unless it was the murderer himself, which, of course, it was. I figure it's all right. What's your idea what happened, Bill? 
Well, we've checked around and learned that Larson left Mosley's gym around 4.30. Said he's going home to pick up his good luck piece and maybe lie down for an hour or so before the fight. Which I guess is what he did. I figure he poured himself a glass of milk, sat on the edge of the bed, drank it, and then lay down. Mm -hmm. Well, couldn't he have carried the glass back to the kitchen? Well, he could have. But he wouldn't have had time to wash it and put it away. Not with that poison in him. Yeah, right. And he was found right here on the bed. Who found him? That girl over there. Her name's Lil Framingham. They are... Well, they were engaged. She says she called him here on the phone about 5.15. Told him she'd pick him up and drive him to the stadium at 6.30. When she got here, she found him dead. I see. What was the good luck piece you mentioned a minute ago? Set of rattles from a rattlesnake. We found him in his pocket. Oh, uh, by the way, Chuck... I'd appreciate your giving me a hand in this. You know, I never was much of a fight fan. Don't know many of the people mixed up in it. You have to in your work. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll be glad to do anything I can. I don't suppose you uh, came up with any fingerprints? No. Nope. Everything wiped clean. <laughs> Another one of those, huh? You mind if I talk to the girl? If she'll talk. She's pretty upset. Thanks. Hello, Lynn. I loved him. We were going to be married. I loved him. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a tough break. But now we've got to see if we can't find the man who did this thing. Can you think of anyone who might have wanted Lefty out of the way, Lou? I loved him. We were going to be married. Did he have any enemies? Anyone who, who hated him? Hate? Yeah. Anyone hate Lefty? Nobody hated Lefty. He was the swellest guy who ever lived. I loved him. Okay, Lou. I'll ask Lieutenant Meggs to have someone take you home. We can talk again later. Well, how'd you make out? She's in a bad state of shock, Bill. You better get her home. I intend to. Only kept her here this long so you could talk to her. Thanks. You, uh, sometimes have a way with females. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, by the way, where's Carl? Back of the studio, sweating over typewriter. Didn't want to come, huh? Yeah, she wanted to. But I have to throw my weight around once in a while and show her who's boss. What do you mean? Huh. Nothing. Only kidding. Well, you got any ideas? Yeah, one or two. I'll tell you what. I'll take a run down to Mosley's now. I'll talk to some of the boys. Let you know if I pick up anything. I changed my mind about going down to Mosley's and went back to the studio instead. I remembered that out in San Fernando Valley, an old-time boxer named Babe Starkey, long since retired... I bought a small ranch and was operating it for the few bucks he needed in his old age. Most of the boxers, especially the young ones who came to town, found time to go out to Babe's and swap yarns with him. Babe knew more about fights and fighters than anyone. It occurred to me that he might have the answer to a few questions I wanted to ask. So the next morning, I picked up Carol around 9 o'clock and we headed over Coinga Pass into the valley. By the way, what kind of a ranch is it that this Babe Stocky runs? Oh, didn't I tell you? No. It's a snake ranch. A what? A snake ranch. Didn't you ever hear of a snake ranch? Oh, I've heard of every other kind out here in Southern California. Orange ranches and chicken ranches and cucumber ranches and avocado ranches. But never a snake ranch. What kind of snakes does he raise? Rattlesnakes. Rattle... Oh, Morgan, you stop this car at once and let me out. Oh, come now, take it easy. Glamour well, post. Chucky boy won't let the nasty old snakes do anything. Did you say something, Glamour Booth? No. Well, why not? You're usually talking. I was thinking. With what? I, I mean, what about? I was thinking what a shame it is that you and your friend couldn't go to the fights last night. Yeah, it was. Oh, oh, here we are. I remember those two gateposts well. Chuck, this uh, friend... Turn into the drive. Hey, hey, there's Babe. Hello, Babe. How are you? Hey, Chuck Morgan. Yeah. How are you, boy? Step down from your saddle, son, and squat in the shade a bit. <laughs> Hey, who's that with you? Ah, uh, you've heard of me much of my secretary, Carol Curtis. Well, I never met the young lady, but I'm sure glad to do it now. Hey, she's pretty. <laughs> well, thank you, babe. You're pretty, too. Well, now, that's plum decent of you to say that, ma'am. Come on, get out, get out of there. Where did you latch on to that western talk, babe? Well, now, it's like this, Chuck, my boy. I figured as long as I turned rancher, I'd better talk like one. <laughs> Here, yeah. Uh... Just you sit right down there in the shade of the sycamore tree, Miss Curtis. Make yourself comfortable. <laughs> My, you are pretty. Well, 
Thank you again. How's the rattlesnake business, babe? Well, it's like this. I raise them and kill them and skin them and pack the meat in cans and sell the hide. Make a few bucks here and a few there. Not much, but it's kind of fun. Dangerous, too. Dang critters like to kill you if they get a hold with their fangs. How about me showing you around the place? Got some powerful Bill Sidewinder. No, thanks. <laughs> well, we've only got a few minutes, babe. You heard about Lefty Larson, I suppose. I sure did. What a shame. Yeah. Now, who do you suppose the one of murder Lefty? He was a good boy. It's only a month ago he was out here. Spent the day with me. I'd give him some rattles for a lucky piece. Tell me, babe, did Lefty seem to be bothered about anything? Uh, bothered? Yeah, anything seemed to be troubling him. Was he happy? Did he feel confident about winning last night's fight? Uh, well, no, Chuck. Or had the gambling syndicate put the finger on him? Gambling? Uh, hey, that, that's pretty dangerous talk, Chuck. You better be careful. So they've got you scared, too, huh? Well, how's this for a guess, babe? Lefty came out here and told you about the syndicate trying to get him to throw the fight. He asked your advice because he respected you. And you taught him to go ahead and throw the fight. That's true, isn't it? Well, no, no, Chuck. Uh, that ain't it at all. That ain't the way it happened. Uh, well, I'm an old man, Chuck. This little acre's all I got. I can't afford to lose it. They, yeah, they got here while Lefty and I were still talking. They said that unless I kept my mouth shut, they'd... Well, they... Yeah, yeah, okay, babe. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. You won't tell him, Chuck, huh? You won't tell him... Not a word, me. babe. I'll keep your name out of it entirely. Now, quit worrying, will you? All right, Chuck. Thanks. Come on, Glamour, let's go. Chuck, did you ever talk to him like that? He's so harmless and sweet. Yeah. Harmless and sweet. Get into the car, Glamour, please. Unless I miss my guess. I'll be able to announce the identity of the murderer of Lefty Larson on my 7 o'clock broadcast tonight. By the time I got back to the studio, I'd begun to wonder if I hadn't been a bit hasty in making the 7 o'clock broadcast a deadline. There's a lot to be done during the next few hours. But first, I wanted to have a talk with my boss, Pappy Mansfield, owner of KOP. Pappy listened patiently while I explained what I had in mind. It's a good idea, Chuck, and it might work, but you can't do it. Good for you, Pappy. That's exactly what I told him. If he thinks he can... Glamour What? Drop dead. What do you mean I can't do it, Pappy? If my guess is right, we'll have one of the biggest stories of the year. Yes, and if your guess isn't correct, I'll be minus one good newscaster. Nope, not a chance. All right, Pappy, I'll make a deal with you. It's now 2 o'clock. I'll start for Mike Mosley's gym right now. If I'm not back by 4, you get hold of Bill Meggs and come looking for me. Well, why don't we get hold of Bill Meggs right now and go down there with you? For obvious reasons. Name three. How about it, Pappy? Well, I don't know. Good, it's a deal. You stay here, Glamour and wait for the phone to ring. When it does, it'll be me with the solution to the mystery of the boxing champ murder. Mike Mosley's gym was located in a loft over a pool hall on Santa Monica Boulevard. I went up a flight of outside stairs and found the door at the top unlocked. I went in. But the big cavern-like room was deserted, which was unusual. Most any day, you could find a half a dozen more pugs working out here. There are trainers and handlers all over the place. Fresh air had been a stranger in the room for quite a while. The place stank of stale tobacco smoke and sweat and rosin. I walked around the ring that was set up in the middle of the room and found the door that led to Mike's private office. I knocked, but there wasn't any reply. Then I heard a sound behind me and turned to find Mike standing there. Behind Mike were a couple of beat-up-looking kids wearing trunks and boxing gloves. Hello, Morgan. What's on your mind? Hey, Mike. Your place looks deserted. What's that for, out of respect for a dead pal? It could be. But I got another reason for shutting up shop, too. Huh? Yeah. I've been expecting a visitor. Yeah? Who's that? You. No kidding. Now, why would you be expecting me, Mike? Well, you got a habit of getting ideas, Morgan, and there's some of us in a fight game that don't like them. Such as the fact that you've let the gambling syndicate move into L.A., and you bought yourself a couple of new cars and a place at Malibu within the past six months? Ideas like that, Mike? 
Yeah, yeah, ideas like that. Ideas that you can't prove and never will be able to. So why don't you get an idea to talk about the Iowa State picnic on your show tonight? Mm, be a cleaner story than the one I'm going to broadcast. Yeah? Oh, while you're here, Morgan, I want to introduce you to a couple of new boys I'm bringing along. Uh, Buck, come over here. Buck, this here's Mr. Chuck Morgan. He's a newscaster on one of the big radio stations in town. Ah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, he's a lot of other things, too, but I'm too polite to mention him. Now, Buck, I want you to show Mr. Morgan that right hook you was practicing yesterday. Hey, Slim, hey, you stand over there. When I give the word, you demonstrate that left jab of yours. These are things Mr. Morgan likes to know about. Okay, Buck, let him have it. Now, just a minute. All right, hit him, Slim. Give it to him, boys. Hey, baby, Mr. Morgan won't be so snoopy from now on. Give it to him. Don't let him fall down. Keep on his feet. Add a boy, Buck. Once more, Slim. When I came out of that one, I was in a cab heading down Santa Monica Boulevard. My face felt like a boiled beet. I put my hand up where my nose should have been. Oh. oh. Cabby. Cabby! Don't ask me nothing, mister. I ain't seen nothing. I ain't heard nothing. Just doing what I got paid for. Who paid you? All right. Where are you taking me? Any place you say, mister. So long as it don't cost more than two bucks. Okay. Take me to K.O.P. I could tell by the expression on the faces of the people I met when I walked into the K.O.P. building that Mike's boys had really done a job on me. Glamour Puss let out a yelp when I walked into the office. Oh, Chuck! Hi, Glamour Puss. Get me a drink of water, will you? Oh, Chuck! Oh, you poor boy. What happened? Were you in a fight? In a... No, no. I, I got this way sitting under a sun lamp. Get me a drink of water, will you? All right. Carol, uh... Well, who's this? Chuck! Hello, Pappy. What happened? Were you in a fight? Oh, no, not you two. Here's the water, Chuck. Thanks. And here's the first aid kit. No, 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 get and away And don't you dare tell me you're all right and don't need attention. Now, hold still. What happened, Chuck? Oh, well, some of... Uh, ouch! Now, will you take it easy, glamour puss? Oh, don't be a sissy. Some of Mike's boys worked me over. Why? I guess they don't like me. Uh, Oh. I hope this will teach you to take someone else's advice once in a while. If you had let Bill and Pappy go down there shut with up. you... It, I won't shut up. You're a newscaster, not a detective. Now, here, turn your head this way. Uh, obviously, he's uh, not a prize fighter either. Yeah? Well, let me tell you two something. I'm not bad at either one. You haven't seen those other two guys yet. And don't forget, it was I who figured out that fingerprint deal two weeks... Hey. Sit still. I let me have that phone. What's got into you? Oh, it must be the effects of the sun lamp. I'll show you whether or not I'm a good detective. Police department. This is Chuck Morgan. Get me Bill Meggs. Just a minute. Hello, Chuck. What's on your mind? Listen, Bill. Did you tell me that you didn't find any fingerprints when you dusted that room where Lefty was murdered? Not a one. Why? Think hard, Bill. Weren't there any at all? No, only my own on it. Hey, Chuck, that's it. You bet that's it, my friend. You got the address? Sure I have. Good. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. <laughs> out of there fast, ignoring the protests of Carol and Pappy, and ten minutes later I was pulling up in front of an apartment house on North Hobart. Bill Meggs was waiting for me in the doorway. Oh, what the heck happened to you? You've been in yeah, a fight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been in a fight. Come on, let's go. The mailboxes gave us the number of the apartment we were looking for. It was on the second floor. We went up a flight of carpeted stairs and knocked on the door of 2A. Try it again. Yeah. Hello, Lil. Mind if we come in? Why, it's Lieutenant Meggs and Mr. Morgan. Why, no, of course not. Come on in. Hello, Morgan. My. Huh. Imagine finding you here. What's the matter, you Yeah, yeah, fight? yeah, yeah. You know Lieutenant Meggs, Mike? He's from headquarters. So? Mike and I are old pals. Oh, so you men know each other. Mr. Mosley's been so kind to me since Lefty passed on. Some of the boys at his gym took up a collection and gave me the money. When did this happen? Why, today, I guess. How much money was there? None of your business. Mike, that is, Mr. Mosley asked me not to tell. You can call him Mike, Lou. We understand. What do you mean by that crack? Well, I'll tell you, Mike. 
You've got your coat off and your tie loosened. That's rather informal when the girl only knows you well enough to call you Mr. Mosley. You're being rude. And you're being stupid, Lil. Seems to me you got over your grief pretty fast. Yesterday you were too stunned to talk. I don't like your manner at all, Lieutenant. I wish you'd leave. Oh, we're going to leave all right. And you're coming with us. Why? Because you murdered Lefty Larson. I murdered Lefty? Oh, why, Lieutenant, you can't be serious. I'm serious, all right. You weren't in love with Lefty, Lil. You only pretended you were. Actually, you're in love with this two-bit chiseler, Mike Mosley. When Lefty wouldn't throw the fight and threatened to expose you, you murdered him. Mike's as much to blame as you. How do you like that? I'm as much to blame. I wasn't even near the joint. No. All you did was provide Lil with the poison and tell her what to do. Well, now, ain't that something? You can prove it, I suppose. We won't have to prove it. Lil's going to tell him. Lil's going... Oh, drop dead, Morgan. Lil ain't going to tell nothing to nobody. Like you said, she's in love with me. She does what I say. Okay, Lil, get your hat. Let's go. Wait a minute. Mike, are you going to let me take the rap for this? Oh, don't worry, kid. I'll get you out of it. You're going to let them take me out of here without doing nothing to stop them? Take it easy, kid. I told you Why, I'd you get you out of it. Why, you cheap, two-time and jerk. You're in this as much as I am. It was you. Shut up. I won't. You gave me the poison. Shut up, I said up. All right, Mosley, that does it. Keep your hands off me, copper. Shut up. Oh, that was when I sure owed. Well, that settled that one. Lou gave a full confession, which of course implicated Mike Mosley. We guessed pretty accurately as to how the thing had been worked out. It was just another one of those cases in which a murderer thought he'd covered his trail enough to be very sure of himself. Will they ever learn? Of course, I had a lot of explaining to do to a certain blonde secretary and a gentleman named Pappy Mansfield. Okay, genius. Gather around, Pappy. This is the moment that Chucky boy likes. The ham. <laughs> Glamour, Bliss. You're just sore because you didn't figure this one out yourself, huh? All you? right, all right. Now... If you two have exchanged the usual number of insults to assure each other that you're really in love, suppose you give it to us, Chuck. Sure, Patty. It was really quite simple. Oh, you modest man, you. Go ahead and brag. For the moment, Glamourpus, I'm going to ignore you and talk to Pappy. It was like this, Pappy. Lil said she called Lefty at his apartment and talked to him on the phone an hour before he was murdered. Yet Bill Meggs couldn't find any fingerprints except his own, which were on the phone. My guy. Lil had wiped everything clean of fingerprints, including the telephone. But Bill used the phone when he got there. Uh -huh. So both Bills and Lefties should have been on that receiver. Oh, my, my. And to think our Chucky figured it all out by himself. Oh, say, Pappy. Yeah, Chuck? Those tickets I had for the Larson McCready fight. They're sending me two others for the Aragon bout next week, so we won't miss out entirely. Oh, good. Chuck? Hmm? Huh? Was Pappy the friend who was going to use the other ticket? Sure, didn't I tell you? No, you didn't. No, I'm sorry. Chuck Morgan, I think you're dreadful. Why? You knew I thought you were going to take some other woman, and you let me think so... Glamourpus. What? You're pretty. Oh, Chuck, I think you're pretty, too. What evil lurks in the hearts of men. <laughs> the shadow knows. Ladies and gentlemen, to stay at the top and meet the competition of the underworld's keenest minds, the shadow has to be still better than any of them. And it's the same way with tires. For years, Goodrich Silver Towns have given motorists the real blowout protection of the Golden Fly. Now, like a true champion, 
Goodrich offers another important safety feature. The amazing new Lifesaver tread that gives you the quickest non-skid stops you've ever had. This new tread is specially designed to overcome the hazard zone of motoring, where a slippery film of water on the road may make complete command of your car almost impossible. Its never-ending spiral bars sweep the water right and left, force it out through the deep grooves, make a dry track for the rubber to grip. Wouldn't you be thankful for a tire like that the next time you're faced with a wet road emergency? Put Goodrich Silver Towns on your car now. The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, a man of wealth, a student of science, and a master of other people's minds, devotes his life to righting wrongs, protecting the innocent, and punishing the guilty. Cranston is known to the underworld as the Shadow. Never seen, only heard. His true identity is known only to his constant friend and aide, Margot Lane. Today's story, Murder on Approval. Dr. Kalanza. I have read your statement. Yes? Frankly, I am interested. I thought you would be, General. Otherwise, I never would have traveled so many thousand miles to see you. You say that you can infect a large number of persons with a deadly disease at will. Yes. That you can cause more deaths in an army than all the guns in the world. Your Excellency, once let loose, this disease would totally destroy an enemy's morale. With its aid, you can easily overcome any nation in the world. The General is already ruler of the East. But he will not stop with his conquest. I am sure His Excellency is planning to extend his powers even further. I can give him victory. What is this sickness you can spread, Doctor? I am sorry. That I cannot divulge at this time. Uh, Nor the method of infecting the enemy, Doctor. Nor that, Your Excellency. And only I know the cure. Dr. Colanza, your name is not unknown to us. You have been many things. Scientist, adventurous, spy. But you've not always been successful. No. General, may I suggest that you let me try an experiment on troops of your own choosing? Troops? I cannot sacrifice my men. If your disease is fatal... Not on your own soldiers, sir. But why not those of some other power? That is an idea. Soldiers of some country you would be glad to humiliate and hurt. Perhaps even in vain. But we are not at war at the present time, Doctor. Does that matter? General, pick any spot in the world, any well-guarded garrison. And in two months, I shall have wiped out that garrison. Choose the spot for my experiment. But perhaps it would be better to choose some country you are interested in, yes? Yeah, I see. Yeah. All right, we will select your guinea pig. Captain, the map. Yes, sir. Here's the map. Alanza, do you know this spot on the coast of the United States? No, but uh, that does not matter. It is one of their army bases. A splendid choice, General. It is well guarded, Doctor. All the better to prove my point. I will leave for America at once. In a short time, many American soldiers will die in their barracks. Then, if you wish me to destroy the whole army of the United States, I can do it for you. Good. Captain, you will make the arrangements with the good doctor, please. To purchase his little methods for murder on approval. (laughs) Enjoying yourself, Miss Lane? Very much, Colonel Torrance. I like the army. And so I've noticed, Margot. I think you've danced with every officer at the base. Well, why not, Lamar? <laughs> the poor boys are due back inside the post at midnight. Awfully glad you could come tonight, Miss Lane. I don't get away from the base often myself. You'd be surprised at the trouble a couple of thousand men can manage to get into. Uh-huh. Trouble, Colonel? Yes, if it isn't one thing, it's another. Yesterday, what should crop up but some new fangled disease? Oh, a, a new disease? Oh, nothing serious, I hope. Is it catchy? Well, nobody seems to know much about it. 
Unfortunately, there are only a couple of cases. Dr. Harris isolated the sick men immediately, so the rest of us should be safe enough. Have I met Dr. Harris, Colonel? I think so. He's around someplace with a foreign doctor. Yes, the stocky, red-faced officer coming this way. Oh, yes, I see him. Harris promised to introduce his guest. Uh, evening, Dr. Harris. Uh, good evening, sir. Miss Lane, Dr. Nicholas Harris. How do you do? We met at dinner, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Colonel. Uh, Colonel, may I present my friend, Dr. Gregor Kalanzan? You're welcome, Dr. Kalanzan. Thank you, kindly. Well, Lamont, shall we dance? I'd love it, Margot. Will you excuse us, gentlemen? Uh, certainly, certainly. <laughs> Well, how are those boys in the hospital, Doctor? Well, they seemed a little better when I left, sir. Good. Uh, get him to tell you about that, Dr. Calanza. A couple of soldiers have caught some strange disease. Really? Yes, yeah, seems so. They're pretty sick, too. Oh, sorry, my wife is looking for me. I'll see you later. Yes. That's quite amusing. What? You are to tell me about this strange new disease. Not so loud. Oh, nonsense. There's nothing to fear. No one knows anything about us, Harris. Unless you have done some talking. Is it likely I'd go around telling people that I was betraying my country? You are being well paid. I know, but... Nothing can happen, Harris. The disease is unknown. It strikes very quickly. And it is fatal within a week. Well, I had no idea when we started that I was handling such powerful germs. That's why I insisted on shooting antitoxin into you. Without it, we would both get the disease. No, I wish it were over. Oh, don't worry. In a few days, it will be. And you'll be a rich man, Harris. Yes. Rich. <laughs> After all these years in the army. You broke the little glass bottles as I instructed? Yes, I dropped one of them in the barracks tonight just before I came away. There are enough germs in those bottles to kill a regiment. You will have some new cases shortly. Mm. Be careful. Here comes one of the lieutenants. The doctor. Doctor, have you seen Colonel Tolland? Why, yes, yes, he's right over there. Oh, yes. You better come along, sir. You'll be needed. There's trouble at the base. Trouble? Yes, hurry, sir. It seems that our plan is going smoothly, Harris. Be quiet, will you? Get come me. on over to Colonel Tolland's. Get me inside the base. All right, all right. Now keep quiet. Colonel Tolland. Yes? From the base, sir. Urgent. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Let's have it. Yes, sir. Let me see. Hey. Good Lord. What is it, sir? A whole barracks has come down with that confounded disease, Harris. Two hundred men. They're pretty bad, sir. It's an epidemic, sir. Yes, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. General order. All officers must report back to post immediately. Emergency. Yes, sir. The base is already under quarantine, sir. Good. Announce the recall from the bandstand. Right away, sir. Oh, uh, Colonel, perhaps Dr. Kalanza could give us a hand. We're going to need every doctor we can get. I would be delighted, Colonel. Well, very kind of you. Oh, so exciting, Colonel. Uh, Cranston, you'll have to drive us back at once. The base is hit by an epidemic. Oh, an epidemic? Yes. <laughs> Will you have room for Dr. Harris and Dr. Colanza? General order! All officers are report back to post for duty immediately! <laughs> Faster, the colonel's in a hurry. The car's going as fast as it can, Lamont. Yes, we'll be there in a minute, Cranston. Uh, Dr. Harris. Yes? I say, have you any idea what this mysterious disease might be? Well, unfortunately, no. That's why I brought Dr. Colanza along. From the symptoms described, it is something entirely new in medical science. We've got to save those men and check the disease. I'll do my best, sir. This thing has spread very rapidly, Doctor. It, it might almost be some new form of... Oriental plague. Oriental plague? Here? In the United States? Oh, nonsense. Well, Doctor, I've seen disease spread like wildfire in the Far East. You know, I'd like to take a look at this, Colonel. Well, I'm afraid that's impossible, Mr. Cranston. Well, why, Harris? The post has been quarantined by general order, sir. You can't ignore that order. But Galanza's well, going in. Yes. I am a doctor, Mr. Cranston. And besides, Mr. Cranston, you might catch the disease. Well, I... I don't mind taking that chance. Well, that's very brave of you, sir, but I'm afraid we can't allow it. The order is definite quarantine against civilians. Yes, I'm afraid the doctor's right, Lamont. In the army, orders are orders. Very well. Just as you say, sir. So it is it's just around the bend, Miss Lane. Pull up alongside the gate. You are right here, Miss Lane. All right. <sighs> here we are. 
Halt! Who goes there? Colonel Torrance. Advance to be recognized, Colonel Torrance. Well, thanks for the lift, Lamont. Don't mention it. Come on, Dr. Colenso. I... I am ready. Good night, Miss Lane. Good night, gentlemen. I still wish you'd let me go in and take a look around. Well, I'm afraid that's out of the question entirely, Mr. Cranston. Uh, come on, Clanza. Coming? It's nice of you to offer, my boy. Goodbye. Goodbye, Colonel. Well, I suppose we might as well drive back to the hotel. Just a moment, Margot. I'm getting out here. Getting out here? But, but Lamont... I'm they... going to take a look at this disease, Margot. And there was a queer look on Colanza's face when I mentioned it might have an oriental origin. Yes, but the, the sentries won't let you in, Lamont. The, the place is quarantined. Well, I'll have a very hard time quarantining a shadow. Lamont, you mean you're going in there as the shadow? Yes, Margot. When the car door slams, I shall immediately become the shadow. Who's there? Say. Hey, wait a minute, Mitch. Oh, uh, well, you want something, soldier? Why, I, I just heard the car door slam. Did somebody get out? Well, you don't see anybody, do you? No. Oh. No, oh, ma'am, but I, I thought I saw it. Well, I guess it's all right. That's kind of funny. Hey, Joe! Yeah? I could have sworn I saw somebody get out of that car. Anybody go through the gate? Hey, there's enough floodlights here to light up the entire army. I didn't see a soul. I don't know. I thought I saw a man and... And just like that, there wasn't anybody there. Uh, you must be getting punchy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while we leave the shadow for a moment, just put yourself in this picture. You're driving along in the rain. The road ahead looks safe, even though it is plenty wet. But suddenly you flash past that familiar warning sign, Road Slippery When Wet. <laughs> Tires on your car slip or grip. And motorists, your tires will grip wet roads if they're the new Goodrich Silver Towns with Lifesaver Tread. This fact was proved not alone by Goodrich, but by the nation's largest independent testing laboratory, the noted Pittsburgh Testing Laboratory. The impartial engineers of this great laboratory tested the new Silver Town for three months against both the regular and premium price tires of America's six largest tire manufacturers. And here are the results. They found that no other tire tested, not even those priced at from 40% to 70% more than Silvertown's, came up to the new Silvertown in skid resistance. Furthermore, they found that this Silvertown gave more non-skid mileage than any of the other tires tested in its own price range. In fact, it averaged 19.1% more mileage before the tires wore smooth, which is the same as saying you'll get every sixth mile free. And remember, motorists, many tires cost more than Silver Towns, but no other tire at any price can give you Lifesaver Tread skid protection and the famous Golden Ply blowout protection. Equip your car with these life-saving Silver Towns now. Spoken <laughs> glass. Glass. <laughs> Just lie still. He's raving again, nurse. He was all right a minute ago, Dr. Bergen. My head. My head. It burns. That's the fever. Comes in waves. Moments, he's quite mm -hmm. rational. Who's there? Who broke the glass? I heard a glass break. Yes. You... Get Dr. Harris. Maybe he can get that fever down. I can. Right away, Dr. Bergen. I've got to go look up those other patients. Shut the door after us, nurse. I'm on fire. Water. Water, please. Glass. Hear it? Broken glass. Steve. <laughs> Steve, can you hear me? Uh, Listen to me. Who, who is it? Oh, someone there? You must tell me uh, something, Steve. It's important. Where are you? I can't see. Don't I... worry. Even if you can't see me. There's, there's only a voice. I... I'm here, Steve, here in the shadows. Listen to me. Yes? Listen. Quickly, before the fever returns. <laughs> Tell me, why do you keep repeating the words? Broken glass. Broken glass. Yes. Keep saying it over and over. Why? I don't know. I... Think, Steve. <laughs> Think. What is there about broken glass? Glass. Uh, Think, uh, son. 
glass, broken glass. Oh, oh I know. Yes? That's last night in the barracks. When, when all the fellows were asleep, yes, I, Steve? I woke up. I thought I heard something, and like glass breaking. In the room, Steve? Yes, yes, just a little tinkle, like someone had dropped a tiny glass. And then a few hours later, we, we were all sick. I... <laughs> Oh, my ass. Who broke glass? <laughs> All right. Shut the door, Doctor. This tells me this one is quite bad. One of the new ones. Great Scott. What is it? What's the matter? Oh, my ass. Why, this boy, he, he's my nephew. Your nephew? Yes, my sister's son, Steve. Uh, Steve. Uh, Steve, how do you feel, boy? This is unfortunate, Harris. Well, I thought he was home on leave. He wasn't due back this week. Uh-huh. Is, is he fatally ill, Colenza? Too bad, Harris. I give him two days at most. No, 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 he can't die. I am sorry, but it is unavoidable. Uncle Nick, Uncle Nick, help me. Calandra, you've got to do something for him. Nothing can be done. Steve, Steve, it's Uncle Nick, Steve. I'm here. Uncle Nick, oh, help. Please, Glad. Oh, boy, delirious, honey. But save him. Impossible. There is no cure. But Steve is my nephew. Steve. Be quiet, you fool. Come, let us go to your office. No, 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 I must stay here. Come up, I have to drag you. Brace up, Harris. Don't lose your nerve. Come on, man. Broken glass. Oh, Uncle Nick. Someone. Broken glass. Yes, Steve. Someone broke glass. And I mean to learn just what your Uncle Nick had to do with it. He and Gregor Kalanza. <laughs> Calanza, you've got to do something for Steve. What can I do? I told you the disease was fatal. I don't care about the others. Steve's different. He's my sister's son. So you said. I am sorry. Calanza, tell me. Isn't there some sort of serum? No. But you gave me antitoxin. That was to prevent your catching the fever. It is different. Your nephew is already infected. There is no hope now. There's got to be. Harris, pull yourself together. You are being well paid. I know, but money won't give Steve back to my sister. I told you I was sorry. But there is nothing to be done. Nothing. I am going back to the wards. The progress of the disease is very interesting. Oh, don't be so callous. I am a scientist, Harris. Now, get hold of yourself, man. Remember, a soldier died this morning. It is murder now. Murder? Yes. And death is the penalty for that. So you'd better keep quiet about it. I will see you later. Oh, Kalanza! Later. Oh, Steve. Steve. (laughs) Weeping won't help Steve, Dr. Harris. Eh? Who spoke? Who's there? The shadow. Your nephew is dying, Dr. Harris. Uh, Who are you? Where are you? I am here, although you cannot see me, Dr. Harris. What do you want with me? You and Gregor Kalanza are responsible for this disease. No, you're wrong. I don't know anything about it. You cannot lie to the shadow, Doctor. I tell you, I know nothing. Then your nephew dies, Doctor. Dies horribly. Oh, stop it, will you? Stop it! The voice of the shadow is never silent when there is evil. I won't talk to you. I won't talk to you. I'm getting out of here. You cannot escape from the shadow. Leave me alone. (laughs) We shall meet again, Dr. Harris. And then... (laughs) That's tube you wanted, Dr. Harris. All right, put it down, man. Put it down. Yes, sir. Now, leave me alone. I've got to find the serum that will counteract the effect of this fever. Yes, sir. Good luck, sir. Mm. Let's see, where's, where's that culture? Oh, yes. And now, now this formula will only work. All right, Dr. Harris. Steve is dying. Oh, you... Oh, you... You dropped your test tube, Doctor. Just the way you dropped one in the barracks. Spread the germs. You know that. But I didn't. I didn't. Tell the truth, Doctor. Think of Steve. Oh, you fiend. Will you leave me alone? I must find a serum that will cure him. Only Gregor Kalanza can give you that in time. Who is he? Where's he from? Uh, I don't know anything about him. Is Kalanza more to you than your nephew? Speak, man. Kalanza got you into this, didn't he? And now Steve is dying. Dying, Harris. Stop dying. it. Stop it. I tell you, I can't stand it. Let me out of here. Uh, uh, 
safe in my room. Now, wait, I... I must lock the door. Uh, locked. And bolted. Now we can't get in. That voice... Coming from nowhere. Always in my ears. Oh, I'm going crazy. Hmm. Where's my bag? I've got to get away. And leave Steve dead behind you, Doctor? <laughs> How did you get in here? I'm with you all the time, Doctor. Oh, please. Go away. Please leave me in peace. There is no peace, Doctor, for a man who will let his nephew die in agony. Oh, I'd save him if I could. Believe me, but I I don't know how. The Lanza knows. But he says there's no cure. Did you believe him? He had an antitoxin, didn't he? Perhaps he has a serum that will cure the disease once it is developed. But he told me... He got you into this crime, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he promised me wealth. I've always been poor. Why did he pick this army base for his crime? Because if he's successful, it means the entire army will be wiped out in this way. United States Army? Yes. This disease would wipe out whole armies. But then invasion would be a simple matter. But you can't isolate the germ. There's no cure. There must be a cure. Kalanza would have one. But he says there is none. There must be. Make him tell you what it is. Otherwise, your nephew dies. But I can't help him. Or this country, either. Steve is dying, and you're afraid to cross the one man who might cure him. What is Kalanza compared to your sister's son? He got you into this. Make him help you. Uh, all right. All right, yes. Yes, I will. But hurry. He's out there now. Watching the soldiers die. Watching Steve and the other men he's poisoned. And enjoying it, Harris. Enjoying it. I'll, I'll get him to my office. And make him give me that serum. That's it. I'll make him. Hurry, Doctor. Hurry. This way, Colonel Torrance. Tell me, who are you? I am known as the Shadow Colonel. Please do not waste more time in wondering that you cannot see me. I told you I could clear up the mystery of this epidemic. I'll keep my promise, sir. Just step in here, please. All right. Wait a minute. This is Dr. Harris' office. Yes. You'll know the whole story in a few moments, Colonel. Get behind the screen, please. Don't move until I give the word. Ah. Here they come. Come in here, Colonel. Harris, have you lost your mind? Maybe. Dragging me out of the wards like that. You must be mad. Now, you'd be crazy, too. If that... If that thing followed you around all day... That thing? What are you talking a about? A voice, Colonel. A voice. Something that you can't see, but you can hear him all right. He keeps talking, talking. Oh, Harris, snap out of it. I tell you, I heard him. He knows all about you and me and the disease. Who knows all this? That voice, the voice. He knows everything. Oh, ah, not dreaming. Seeing your nephew sick has upset you. Yes. We we made my nephew, Stephen, get the disease, Columbus. Oh, well, he is not the only one. But he's got to be cured. No, no, don't stop that again. There isn't any cure. You're lying. Harris, don't be a fool. I can't afford then, to. Then, there is a serum that will cure the disease. Well, what if there is? I am not wasting it on your precious nephew. Oh, yes, you are. Harris, put down that gun. You listen to me, Kalanza. Either you give me the formula for that serum or I'll kill you. I mean it. The formula is worth a fortune, Harris. It will make us both rich. If you will only use your head. Never mind the talk. Don't try reaching for your gun, either. I'm watching you. But the formula for the serum, quick. All right. Where is it? In my pocket. It never leaves my wallet. Give it to me. Oh, just a minute. Here. Take it. Uh, thanks. Now I can save Steve. Do you know enough medicine to read that formula? I must read it. I must read it. Yes. Yes, it's plain enough. I can make this serum. Look. It says you take it. This is it. I was you fool. Did you think I really meant to have you get my serum? Die like the others. Now, I will take back my formula. No, I'll take that paper, Kalanza. What? Who snatched that paper? I did, Dr. Kalanza. A voice. Harris was right. Dr. Harris was quite right. Give me back my formula. I'll shoot. What will you shoot at, Doctor? You better not shooting, Kalanza. Throw your hand. Then it's hard. Stop that gun. Never. Take it, it, then. Uh. Kalanza's dead, Colonel. Never a man deserved to be shot. It's that murderer. Yes. What about you, Shadow? My work is finished, Colonel. First is up to your medical staff. Kalanza and Harris dreamed of power and wealth to be acquired through mass murder. Such dreams are dearly bought. 
price of Colanza's dream and Harris's traitorship was death. The hidden menace to the armed strength of our country has been uncovered and destroyed. You have been listening to a dramatized version of one of the many copyrighted stories which appear in the Shadow Magazine, now on sale at your local newsstand. <laughs> the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The Shadow knows. <laughs> All the characters and all the places named are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. private investigator means two things. You can be sure you'll run into trouble, and you can never be sure you can get out of it. Well, there's not much you can do about it, I guess, except, like Julie always says... Walk softly, Peter Troy. And now, Peter Troy investigates the trouble with Tanya. Julie, the gal with the signature tune, she's the one who fights the unequal battle to keep me on the straight and narrow path. And you'll meet her again. But in the meantime, there's a blue-eyed, statuesque dame with hair as black as sin that I want to introduce you to. She's a living doll. She's not going to thank me, because Tanya means trouble. You'll be up and about in next to no time, George. Next to no time. I'd like to believe that, Tanya, but... It's just that I don't seem to be getting any better. The doctor said you're just fine. I spoke to him. That was very considerate of you, my dear. You're important to me, George. And you are important to me. You'll find that out what one day. <coughs> George? Those tablets on the side there. These? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me one, please. Certainly. Oh, hurry, hurry. You know, George, I've been wanting to talk to you about your will. With the tablets... You're a very rich man, you know. Oh, Tanya, please, Tanya, unless you give me one of those tablets. What, did you hear me? Why are you looking at me like that? Tanya! Ow! What on earth? Harriet, what's the matter? It's Mr. Castellia, ma'am. What's the matter with him? I, he's dead. Dead? Are you sure? I, I just went into him and bring him afternoon tea. Okay, ring for Dr. Townsend quickly. Oh, yes, ma'am. Tanya. Yes, Adele. He's dead. I heard it. Was it... 
Was it... Did I kill him? I should imagine it's what everyone will want to know. George Castalia was dead. The famed multimillionaire impresario was very dead. A man with a stack of enemies and very few friends. The question was, as Tanya, his very attractive ward, had already mentioned, did he die nice and quietly, or was he murdered? If the latter was the case, then it would seem that there could only be one logical suspect. Tanya Castalia. Oh, no. Oh, yes. She's in the outer office waiting to see you. Am I in? Uh, she's tall, raven-haired, and with the biggest pair of blue eyes you've ever seen. So I'm in. Mm-hmm. I rather thought so. Uh, Miss Castalia, Mr. Troy will see you now. Thank you. Scream if you need anything, please. Oh, bless you. Oh, don't mention it. Now, won't you sit down, Miss Castalia? Thank you. You can guess why I'm here, Mr. Troy. No, well, the newspapers have a story. I was reading it just before you called. Famed impresario's mysterious death. Your father... My guardian. George Castalia looked after me following the death of my own parents in 1946. Uh-huh. The... Police refused to give out any details about the cause behind my guardian's death. Well, that's, uh, strange. Still, they must have a reason for it. Yes, they have. I suppose they believe he was murdered. Hmm. And if that's the case, then I'm the logical suspect. I see. You see, it's common knowledge that there was no love loss between George Castalia and myself. On top of that, I'm his next of kin... And as he left no will... How do you know that? His solicitor told me. Oh. George Castalia didn't like wills. He said they reminded him too much of death. Nevertheless, his estate will come to me. He took out formal adoption papers in 1947. Okay, so where do I come in, Miss Castalia? I think it's only a matter of hours before the police arrest me. They'll charge me with his murder, but... I didn't kill him. Well, then surely this... But I'm the only one who could possibly gain by his death. Oh, I want you to prove that I had nothing to do with it, Mr. Troy. Nothing at all. Well, now, the odds aren't altogether in your favor, are they? No. Is there anything else you have to tell me? No. Now, think carefully before you answer. I'll take the case, sure, but you'd better be warned that I only deal in the truth. Now, if you're innocent, you have nothing to fear from it. But if you're guilty... The truth will hang me. Exactly. So if you're holding anything back, you'd better spill it out now. <laughs> I have a horrible habit of ferreting out people's secrets. Mm. Very well, then. That's better. I was the last person to see George Castalia alive. And? And I need his money. Desperately. <laughs> I think you're out of your head. Oh, well, that's nice. If the police find out Castalia was murdered, then obviously the girl did it. Obviously? Well, if you ask me, she as good as confessed to you. She merely said she was the last to see him alive. She needed his money. And there was no love loss between them. You know, come to think of it... Oh, Pete. <laughs> okay, but why'd you retain my services, honey bun? It makes a good cover, don't you think? Yeah, but it also pays a couple of bill collectors, too. And there was nothing phony about that hundred pounds retainer she handed me. Hmm... Well, I've got that old feeling again, Peter. Huh? Oh, why don't you just stick to insurance claim cases? Because they don't pay so well. But you live longer. Live fast, die young, and have a handsome corpse. Well, you'd better slow down. Otherwise, you'll be the proud owner of that handsome corpse before you're ready. Oh, that looks like Castalia's house over there on the hill. Hmm. There must be a drive around here someplace. The place looks like a castle. Look, sweetie, look for a driveway on your side, huh? Uh, oh, a hundred yards further on. I think there are some gates there. Where? Oh, yeah. Oh, Pete. Yeah? Let's turn back. Oh, now, listen, sweetie. Oh, this feeling... We need the dough. Oh, I don't think it's worth risking your neck for. Well, here we are. Gates are closed. Simple. I'll open them up. Oh, Pete. Relax, please, Julie. I think there's someone watching us, Pete. It's a free world. 
Well, the gate's not locked anyway. So let's open it up and drive in. Mr. Troyer, huh? how do you feel now? Like I've been blown up. You had a narrow escape. Hey, I was blown up. Someone had booby-trapped the gates. Why aren't I dead? I don't know, Pete, but I think we ought to say our fond farewell. Mr. Get... Troy, Who are I... you? My name's Adele Lester. I'm... I was Mr. Castalia's housekeeper and private secretary. Hey, where's Miss Castalia? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Miss Lester says that no one's seen Tanya Castalia since she left here yesterday to come up to London. To see me. But she told us she was going straight back home. I'd venture to say that by now she's probably on her way to Europe. Well, it's skipped. I think that's what they call it. Well, the police... I've did. told them she's disappeared. Weren't you a little premature with that assumption? I don't think so. Now, look, Miss Lester, I wonder if you could rustle me up a cup of coffee. My head feels like it's suddenly going to leave my shoulders. Coffee would have anchor in, I think. Certainly, Mr. Troy. Thank you. Oh, that woman gives me the shivers. Well, she's not the sort of girl you take home to meet Mother. Hmm. Now, listen, as soon as we settled in, make some inquiries about the place. Hmm. Down the village, maybe, huh? Find out if anyone's seen Tanya Castalia today. Find out if she didn't come back. Pete, what are you getting at? I'm very nearly casting my chips, remember? Hmm. And somebody doesn't want me around the place. If Castalia didn't die a natural death... Then, then that there's... someone could be the person responsible for killing yeah. her. Yeah. And our number one suspect is uh, Tanya Castalia. You think she did come back? Oh, I wouldn't know. They could easily hide an army in this mansion. Well, I had the horrible feeling there was someone watching us back. Mm. Now I have the feeling we're still being watched. Oh, Peter. The door over there, look. What? Relax, Troy, and put that gun away. Oh, Inspector Caswell. Didn't they tell you I was investigating this case? If I'd known that, Are I... you down here by invitation? Yeah, and you know it. And the trouble with you, Troy, is that you won't take any hints, will you? Do you know about the little mishap I had at the main gate? Yes, I do. Well, I could have been killed. Oh, no. What do you mean, oh, no? It was a nasty explosion, but there wasn't enough power behind it to kill anyone. Evidently, it was designed to scare you. Well, in that, it succeeded. You know, you ought to take the hint. Well, I was paid a retainer by a client. Ah, yes, and... yes. Um, Miss Tanya Castalia. Oh, you're a mine of information, aren't you, Inspector? Well, now, you can hand the lady her money back. <laughs> That'd be rather like asking Peter to part with his right arm. She retained me to clear her of... Uh, of what? The murder. What murder? Oh, for heaven's sake, George Castalia's. Mr. George Castalia died naturally, Troy. He suffered a heart attack. His doctors have been expecting him some time. Well, well, I'll be... And you can tell your client to come out of hiding now. As there's been no murder, there can't possibly be any suspects. Can there, I wasn't going to leave the Castalia household, no matter what the inspector would have me believe, until a couple of very important questions were answered to my complete satisfaction. Now, firstly, if there was no murder, then why had somebody gone to all the trouble of booby-trapping the gate? Secondly, if George Castalia had died naturally, what was Inspector Caswell still doing at the scene? Now, I think maybe the delectable Tanya could have answered the questions if she'd been there. But she was another query. Where the devil had she gotten herself to? No murder, no suspects. No sense in your hanging around the place, Troy. Ah, you're just a little bit too eager to get rid of me, Inspector. Oh, no, I just think you're wasting your time, that's all. Inspector, if you aren't a staunch upholder of the law, I'd be inclined to believe that maybe you had something to do with that firework display at the main gates. Oh, no, you have a suspicious mind. Yeah, well, once we're on the subject of suspicious minds, would you like to tell me why you're still here? No. So cooperative. Uh, personally, I think we should take the inspector's advice and go home. Oh, I couldn't do that, Julie. Wouldn't be ethical. No, I have to find my client and return her money to her. Incidentally, Inspector, is my client the only person who gains by Castalia's death? Well, he had enemies. I suppose technically they all gain by his death. Yeah, but specifically, though. Your client. And? Castalia's secretary. Ah. Something in a will, perhaps? Yes. Now, that's strange. 
Tanya led me to believe there was no will. Really? Then she was under a misapprehension. She ought to be told. No, she will be when we find her. Oh, she's not in the house. We've searched. The grounds? No, not yet. Well, then you won't have any objection if we have a look around. No. Oh, and one last thing. Oh, yes, Troy. The mysterious will. Where is it now? I'm afraid I can't answer that. Why not? Because its whereabouts is a bit of a mystery. No one quite knows where it is. Or if there really is one, I'll bet. Exactly what are you looking for, Pete? I'm just trying to figure out whether or not that booby trap was meant for me. Huh? Yep, here's the gimmick. You pull back the gates to a certain distance, and that pulls this wire, which leads to what used to be a detonator in charge. Hmm. I think Caswell was right. It's only meant to scare me or somebody. Well, I've settled for Adele Lester as being responsible for the little surprise packet. Oh, you could be right. Hello, what are we here? What are you staring at? Look, through oh. those trees. Caught the reflection of the sun on glass. Window pane, maybe. And I think there's a little house or something tucked away in there. And well, let's go and have a look-see, huh? Oh, please. I know. You're getting that old feeling again. <sighs> hey, there's an old path here. Hasn't been used in ages. It's overgrown. Oh, you're right. It is a house or, or a lodge. And it looks deserted. Oh, looks, my pet, can be deceiving. Oh, in this case, I hope they're not. Well, uh, do we knock? No, I don't think it's necessary. Just stand back, sweetie. Mm. I'm going to kick in the door. Okay. Here we are. After you. It doesn't seem like there's anybody in residence. Pete... Huh? There's something wrong. Oh, now listen, No, sweetie. this isn't intuition. This is fact. Huh? Well, there's not enough dust around. And when you kicked in that door, it didn't creak. Hey, you know something, Julie? You're right. So let's get out. Now, wait a minute. Julie, you go back up to the house, find Caswell, and ask him to lend you a torch. Oh, now, I... go on. Oh, you're the boss. Julie? Julie, is that you? Did you close the front door? Okay. Who is it? Come on now, no games. I know there's somebody there. Is he... No, he's not dead. Oh, you can't do anything right, can you? The bullet creased his skull. He's out to it. All right, then finish the job. I can't risk another shot. They could hear it up the house. Well, then what? The well. Push him down there, and that'll be an end to him. Well, hurry, then. Let's get the snooper out of the way. For good. House. Yes, we found it near the main gate. It's hidden from the drive. And that place is empty. Well, Pete doesn't think it is now. He wants to borrow a torch. Crazy interfering fool. Oh, Inspector, please. Oh, all right, but I'm coming with you. Well, let's hurry. Oh, come on, then. Oh, you're taking the long way around. Here, follow me. There's a path back this way. It's the one Mr. Castalia used to use. Castalia used? Yes. The lodge house used to be his hideaway. He made the place into a study. Well, then that explains the door that didn't creak and the lack of dust around the place. He used it right up until the time of his death. Who knows about the lodge house? Well, I knew about it, and Tanya most certainly did. What was that? It sounded like a splash. The old well. What old well? There's a disused well over beside the lodge house. It's very deep. Yes, and it sounds as though Troy has fallen down into it. <laughs> You'll never find his body down there. Since I thought I heard someone coming. Uh, your imagination's working over time. Come on, let's get back to work. Uh, I 
I don't think we're ever going to find it, Vince. I don't think there is a will. Oh, of course there is. I witnessed it, remember? It has to be around here somewhere. It has to be destroyed. But he always said he disapproved of wills. He said they were morbid. Then he changed his mind. After he learned about your many gambling debts, my love. He didn't want Adele to be left out in the cold. He wanted her provided for. <laughs> With three quarters of the estate. Uh, she worked for him a long time, you know. Oh, that darn thing must be hidden in here somewhere. Why he refused to keep it at our office, I'll never know. Perhaps you guys didn't trust what the hell? Why? A lady who next you want to terminate a private investigator's services find some other way of doing it, will you? Oh, and incidentally, drop that gun, mister. I'll guarantee I can empty this revolver of mine while you're still thinking about pulling the trigger of yours. Yeah, that's better. How did you get out of that, man? Just relax. It'll be my secret for the time being. Uh, you, I take it, would be Tanya's ever-loving boyfriend. What? Oh, don't look so surprised. I knew there had to be a man tied up in this case somewhere. I'll tell you something else, too. Your ex-Royal Engineers. <laughs> You're guessing. <laughs> a pretty good guess, huh? How did I know? I was in Korea, Buster. I've seen booby traps before. The one you rigged to the gates was a pretty professional sort of job. As professional as George Castalia's murder. I shouldn't do that. Perhaps not. But it was a murder, wasn't it? Would you shoot a woman, Mr. Troy? What's that got to do with it? Just this. I'm standing right in front of you, and Vince is going to pick up his gun. Now, if you want to stop him, you'll have to shoot me. Get out of the way. Too late, Troy. Get him, Vince. Not on your life, Tanya. I'm getting out. Lady, you've been dead. He can't get away with this. He just did, and you're left holding the bag. Well, they can't prove anything. I've got him, Sergeant. Well, it would seem that your boyfriend's just ran into some trouble. Oh, uh, I did forget to tell you. It was Inspector Caswell who pulled me out of that deep well. I'm sorry, Miss Castalia, but Mr. Eldridge is dead. We had no option. He tried to shoot it out. He double-crossed me. By running out on you. Did, did he say anything before he died? No, but I think you ought to do some talking. About what? About how you murdered George Castalia. He died of a heart attack. True. But he needn't have done. You know, he could have survived it. If he'd been given one of his tablets. And you were the last person to see him alive. All right, so he had the heart attack whilst I was there. But I, I couldn't help him. I... I didn't know where the tablets were. They were on the table beside his bed. Uh, I didn't see them. Oh, you saw them all right, and you picked them up. Your fingerprints are on the bottle. No. Seems to me you deliberately held them back from him. You can't prove anything. Well, maybe. But a judge and jury will think differently. It wasn't my idea. Was it Eldridge's? Yes. Yes. All right, Sergeant, open the door and let him in. Let who in? Me, Tanya. But, but they said you were dead. An unethical lie, but it seems to have done the trick. All right, but it was still his idea. He was George Castalia's lawyer. He knew about the will, but he didn't know where to find it. If he had come to me, I could have told him where it was. You mean to say he didn't hide it? Well, he didn't hide it down in the lodge house anywhere. Tanya, you said you were sure it was there. It was under his pillow. You were within a foot of it when you were upstairs with him, Tanya. Oh, my, my. You made a lot of mistakes, didn't you, Miss Castalia? Yes, and the biggest was bringing Troy in on the case. Yes, why did you do that? Oh, that's easy, sweetie. She thought if the police discovered it was murder, then they looked to her as the logical suspect. She knew the will stipulated that three-quarters of the estate was to go to Miss Adele Lester. She knew that I'd find out about that will eventually, thereby giving the police another suspect. Then why try and scare you off? Uh, because we made no official statement of our Castalia's death. But we uh, put the rumor around that we were sure he died of natural causes. And then, of course, Tanya was scared that I'd snoop around until I found out the truth. And you always seem to make one mistake, don't you? I do? Mm-hmm. You never seem to remember to walk softly, Peter Troy. <laughs> Tanya and her boyfriend, Vincent Eldridge, had searched the lodge house for nothing. The carefully laid and almost perfect murder plan came unstuck. 
Oh, I, I uh, didn't refund a retainer to her. I figure she doesn't need money where she's going. Board and lodgings are on the house. But I did get a nice, handsome check from Adele Lester after that missing will was read. And she thought I needed some compensation from the ducking I got down that will. <laughs> and as Julie says, 50 pounds buys an awful lot of aspirin. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its files to bring you the unvarnished, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. This is an accurate record, authentic from start to finish, of the most famous criminal investigation organization in the world, compiled from the files of Scotland Yard by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. New Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situated near the embankment on Whitehall. Here also are the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department. The body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime, the unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. Police officials of every nation in the world are constant visitors to Scotland Yard. Some of them come as observers of Scotland Yard methods, others on official police business, and many remain as students of Scotland Yard's crime... It was raining in London the second day of my visit to Scotland Yard. It practically always rains in London. I got out of my taxi and walked through the gates of Scotland Yard shivering, and the red-faced young constable at the steps of the building was very polite. But he was also very firm with me. I said, good afternoon, Constable. Good afternoon, sir. Commander Rawlings is expecting you. Uh, you're the American gentleman, aren't you, sir? That's right. From Minnesota, sir? From where? Minnesota, sir. Minnesota? Oh, thank you, sir. Commander Rawlings will be in the Black Museum, sir. Where is that? It's inside, sir. You take the stairway down to your left. Third door on the right, sir. Right, oh, Constable? Right, sir. I've been there the day before. Up the stone steps, through the heavy doors, into the big, bare outer corridor with a musty old smell that every copper in the world can recognize with his eyes shut. Look in the room, sir. Deputy Commander Rawlings, Sergeant. Oh, you're the American gentleman, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Down the stairway, third door on the right, sir. Sir, polite cops. Well, third door on the right. One, two, three. Come in, please. Ah, good afternoon. Afternoon, Mr. Rawlings. Uh, do come in, old boy. Glad to see you, Mr. Rawlings. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Uh, not at all. And welcome to our little chamber of horrors. Quite a place. Who's that? That? Oh, uh, death mask of Heinrich Himmler. You know, Hitler's... I remember, yeah. The, the SS man, Butcher. Some of the chaps took him in, you know. But he was a, a trifle too quick with the poison. What's this? Gunny sacks. Oh, yes. Uh, a bloke named Manton wrapped his ex-wife up in it. 1943. A place called Luton. What happened to him? Took the eight o'clock walk. Huh? Execution time was always eight o'clock. Bloody early. Oh, Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. Lost property, eh? What is it? Looks like a burnt chicken bone that somebody busted. That is Mrs. Rachel Dobkin. It was a gang of navvies that found the skeleton. Navvies? Uh, Laborers, you know. Pick and shovel workmen. Ah, all over London at the time, uh, that was in July 1942, workmen were tidying up uh, the bombed-out wreckage. Uh, the Blitz, you know, uh, they did quite a good job. Uh, this gang was working on a Baptist chapel in Kensington, piling up bricks and mortar, uh, digging into the ruins for buried victims and whatnot. They uncovered a good many, incidentally. Well, uh, they called a nearby police constable and reported it uh, as they were required to do. 
The constable took the routine notes as the navvy gave him the facts. I prized up this here stone slab, and there he was, just like he is. Lord Stone the Crows, I says, like, he looks a natural down there. And I looks again, and I says to Sammy, yeah, Sammy, I says, what's a skinnington doing all burned up like this? And down in the basement of a Baptist chapel, I says. That's sod Hitler, I says. What do you think, Constable? Well, not knowing, I can't say. All right, then, I'll call the yard and have him pick him up. What's the poor Skellington done, Scotland Yard wants him? Identify the poor fellow, Cuthbert, like we always do. So we can see if he's to be charged to Hitler's account or was murdered or something. In a Baptist chapel? And don't muck him about, neither. Before the yard men get here, he's burnt and broke up enough as it is. The laboratory will have a time not off with him finding out who he was. Mine now. Who does he think he is? A bloody Prime Minister? Muck a bad with a skeleton indeed. I wouldn't even brush the plaster dust off the poor thing. Now, that ain't plaster dust, mate. It ain't? What is it? Well, I was a master mason for the Blitz, mate. I know quicklime when I see it. Quicklime won't destroy a body, Rowling. That's a myth, a superstition. You know that. But murderers don't usually know it, old boy. I see what you mean. Keith Simpson, the home office pathologist, walked into my room upstairs the next day. Skeleton was a lady, Commander. Oh? Yes. About five feet tall, I should say. Between 40 and 50 years of age. Probably wore an upper dental plate with seven teeth. Four other teeth had fillings. Oh, found two or three strands of grey hair also. Well, pass it on to Edward. She's got to be identified. It's quite a job, I should say. Has to be done. And that's all? Uh, you said something about quicklime. Yes. No trace of quicklime in any other part of the rubble of this chapel except near the skeleton. Uh, suspicious of murder. Uh-huh. Yeah, have a look at this. Yeah. What is it? The thing the skeleton talked with. Talked? When she was alive. The trachea, voice box. Oh. Look here. Mm-hmm. See these things? Yeah. These little wing affairs? Uh-huh. Very fragile. Now, the upper horn of this wing... Yes, it's been broken. Yeah, this, my dear Commander Rollins, is one of the most significant fractures in the whole field of forensic medicine. Assume that I've asked a question. It is almost always caused by one means... Manual pressure. Oh? Strangulation. Checking the missing person's register occupied several weeks, and the yard men found 281 names of missing women between the ages of 40 and 50, around five feet tall and with gray hair. I think they would. Then we were faced with the problem of finding which one of these women wore an upper dental plate of seven teeth and also had four other teeth which had been filled. And on the 85th personal call, Detective Constable Charles Barry reported that a woman in Bayswater, whose missing sister's name was on our list, had told him this sister had worn false teeth and an upper dental plate. The woman who had disappeared on uh, Good Friday, 1941, uh, 16 months previous, had been married, but living apart from her husband. Her name was uh, Mrs. Rachel Dopkin. Uh-huh. Something clicked in my mind. I had seen that name and that date before somewhere. Uh, that was uh, at the time of the Great Easter Blitz of 41, when the Luftwaffe really poured it on us. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I sent uh, the files for a copy of the Police Gazette of April 11, 1941. The Police Gazette? The Yard's Daily Police newspaper. Oh. We got a Police Gazette in the States, too, but uh, it's kind of different. Yes, I dare say. Uh, well, I-, I found the item I wanted, a very brief one under Lost and Found Articles. A woman's purse had been found in a post office at Guildford and Surrey by the postmistress when the office was closed on the evening of Good Friday, 1941. Well? It was Mrs. Rachel Dopkin's purse. I don't get it. <laughs> Neither did we. I assigned Detective Inspector Lewis Hatton to work with me. We agreed it was most baffling. Most baffling? Hmm. No question that this was her purse. Ration card? In the name of Mrs. Rachel Dupkin. 
Identity card. Same name. Ten shilling note. Eleven pence and coin. A lipstick. Comb. Mirror. Two tram tickets. Hers, all right. Curious. Curious there's no return ticket to London. Perhaps she was running away. Yeah, she'd not get far in England without her ration and her identity card. No inquiries were ever made for the purse. Hmm. And uh, we find her skeleton in Kensington 15 months later. Sure it was hers? No doubt at all. We found a dentist almost at once. He positively identified the jaw and the fillings and the teeth. Charts? I showed the sergeant his charts made at the time he did the work. They checked. Um, when was that um, chapel place destroyed? The day before Easter, Saturday. It wasn't a bomb hit, knocked down by concussion, no hit. But she was reported missing the day before, Good Friday. Aye. No fire either. But the skeleton was burned, charred. Baffling. Where are you going, Hatton? Oh, I thought I'd take a run up to Kensington again. I'd like to see the Kensington Fire Brigade's occurrence book. And there wasn't any fire? No, not on the night of the raid, sir. Saturday, but we don't know about the other days. Louis. What? Telephone me if you find anything. A hunch. A hunch, sir, that's right. Uh, sometimes they, uh, what is it you Americans say, uh, pay off? Pay off, that's right. Sometimes they pay off. Hatton didn't telephone me. He came bursting unceremoniously into my room upstairs two hours later. Eh? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. There was a fire. Really? I saw the occurrence book at the Kensington Fire Brigade. The fire was on Tuesday the 15th at 11.31. That was when the Kensington Police Station telephoned it in. What? One of the constables had discovered it. Police constable? That's in the police occurrence book, too. But didn't the ARP fire watchers have... No, no. The fire watchers didn't report it at all. Well, maybe there wasn't a fire watcher there. Oh, yes, there was one, sir. Don't you want to know his name, Commander Rawlings? What? The name of the fire watcher who didn't report the fire in the chapel where the skeleton was found is... Harry Dobkin. I called for a meeting of all those who were concerned in the case. Keith Simpson, the Home Office pathologist. Evening, Detective sir. Inspector Hatton. Uh, sorry to be late, sir. Uh, Station Sergeant Andrew C. McLeod of Kensington. Yes, sir. And myself. McLeod was there to tell us what he knew. The others to lend me a hand in taking stock and determining what should be done next. Now, first I asked Hatton, uh, have you uh, discovered Harry Dobkin? Unfortunately, not yet, sir. Why? Well, it is true, sir, that he was employed as a fire watcher by the firm of manufacturing chemists who... Buildings had joined the chapel in Kensington, but they informed me that his services were unsatisfactory and he was sacked on 14th September last year. He wasn't an enrolled ARP member then? No, sir. He was employed as a private fire watcher. We've checked the address he had given. The place was destroyed by enemy action on the night of, uh, night of 21, 22 February this year. There has been no trace of him since. Due inquiry is being made, however. Oh, naturally, sir. And it is certain that he was on duty the night of the fire on Tuesday 15, April uh, 1941. Yes, sir. It's a matter of record in Station Sergeant McLeod's occurrence book. <clears throat> yes, sir. According to the occurrence book, P.C. Ivor Lamb of Kensington Police Station saw him, recognized him, and spoke with him after the fire was extinguished by the fire brigade. I uh, brought with me the page in question, sir. Uh, third entry from the top, sir. Uh, thank you. Nothing much we can do until we see Dobkin. We'll find him, sir. Unless he's gone for a Burton. Unless he's dead, yes, sir. Now, um, let's see what we have. Keith Simpson says the woman was murdered. Yes, I am strongly of that opinion, Commander Rollins. You believe that she was murdered by her husband, Harry Dobkin? I have no opinions whatever on that subject, Commander. That is a detective matter, not a medical one. However, I believe that you'll find that she was murdered. <clears throat> uh, one moment, Sergeant McLeod. Simpson, you are convinced the skeleton was that of Mrs. Rachel Dobkin? I would testify to that effect. 
There is the matter of the deduced description tallying with that of Mrs. Dobkin. The teeth have been positively identified as hers, and I have here what I consider highly important corroborative evidence. Now, this is a film copy of a full-face photograph of Rachel Dobkin. Oh, let me see. And this is an X-ray photograph to the same scale of the skull of the victim. Now, I superimpose them. And you observe that there are at least five points of coincidence. Mm -hmm. Observe. Size, yeah. height, and width of the eye sockets. Right. Height and width of the nose space. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say, I, I should say there is no doubt that the victim was Rachel Dupkin. As I stated, I suspect murder. Well, as uh, the uncalled for purse in the post office at Guildford, for one thing. If the woman were alive, she'd certainly make inquiries about a lost purse. She couldn't live without her identity card and her ration book. Yes, and that broken bone in the voice box of the skeleton is almost unmistakable evidence of strangulation. Manual strangulation. <clears throat> Sir. Oh, yes, uh, Sergeant McLeod. Sir, this man Dobkin uh, was living apart from his wife. Uh, it was uh, a legal separation. Yes, we know that. Something you don't know, sir. Begging your pardon. Dobkin had been contributing to his wife's support for several years. What? Aye, but it was very irregular about it. You know, she had him in court for it. So? Yes, sir. Well, now, up to the end of the second week in April, he had been quite dilatory about paying in his weekly 20 shillings. How do you know? He had to make the payments at the Kensington police station, sir. Either to me or my assistant. Oh. And he hadn't paid anything in since, say, uh, the 18th September 1940. Well, that may... Yes? Excuse me, sir. There's an urgent telephone call for Station Sergeant McLeod. Kensington police station calling. Uh, will you excuse me, sir? Oh, you can take it right, right here, Sergeant. Uh, there's a telephone over there, uh, top of the bookcase. Oh, aye. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, very good, Constable. Yes, sir. Interesting, at least, sir. Might have something to do with the motive, though. Yes, of course. Well, it's good to have a record of it, anyway. Your friend Dobkin hasn't been blown to bits. Yes, but they have enough evidence to charge her with murder. Good thorough chap, this Kensington man. Sergeant McLeod, oh, the best and old guardsman. Oh, so? CSM, 4th Battalion, Scots Guards in the First War. Military medal with bar, DCM. Uh, good man. Oh, you thought that moustache spell, Sergeant Major, didn't they? <laughs> Sir, that was Detective Constable Sanderson from our house. Yes? He's uh, spoken to the parson of that judge. Parson tells him nothing inflammable was oh. ever stored in that cellar where the skeleton was found. Mm. Ah, but when he went to view the damage after the fire, on the morning after, that was on Wednesday, 16th of April, 1941, he found a half-burned straw palias in there. It had been torn open and set on fire. I see. Oh. It obviously did not belong there. Didn't the parson see the skeleton at the time? It was under that rock slab, sir. Ah, yes. Well, very interesting. Oh, uh, you didn't finish telling us about Dobkin and the money he wasn't paying to his wife at your station. Oh, I sir, that. Well, it's quite curious. You know, on the morning of the 16th of April, he showed up big as life and paid in his 20 shillings. Yeah. I did. I sir. And he showed up on the dot every Wednesday after that with payment. Until the date when he was sacked by his employers there in Kensington. And Mrs. Dobkin never appeared at your station to collect it. How could she, sir? She was dead. That was the way it all ended, then. Or did you find the murderer after all? Or was it murder after all? That bit of the late rather unlamented Mrs. Dobkin there would hardly be here in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard if it wasn't murder, old boy. Yes. You know, that broken bone there is real good evidence of strangulation, isn't it? It was good enough. Well, go on, go on. What did you do when you found out Harry Dobkin was dead, too? Give up the idea well, that he... He didn't find out that he was dead. But the bomb that... Merely found out that he had disappeared. Oh. It would be rather a coincidence, wouldn't it? A woman apparently murdered under circumstances that involved her husband so deeply, and then the suspected husband popped off so conveniently before he was even suspected. Well... A little too much to swallow, a little too simple. Yeah. If I'd been in your Harry Dobkin spot, I'd be tickled silly if people thought I'd get pumped off. 
And if the opportunity offered, you'd be glad to walk away and say nothing to anyone. Let people think so. And that was one of the several mistakes Dopke made. If he could have taken another name... Didn't he? There's the matter of identity cards. Ah. Oh. In a country at war, it's a little difficult to walk in and say, I'll have an identity card and a ration book in the name of uh, Sam Small or Bonerges Bl- Blitzen Jr. Uh, they ask embarrassing questions, you know. Spies, huh? It, spies they'd be thinking of. Right. And a few questions will discover the fact that your name is Harry Dopkin and there are more embarrassing questions. And first thing, you know... Uh, I get it. So we reasoned if Harry Dopkin was still alive, he'd be alive somewhere as Harry Dopkin. And all we had to do was to find him. Uh-huh. Oh. And did you? Detective Inspector Hatton had the idea. On the first day of September, he walked into an establishment on Edgware Road, a shop that sold men's cheap clothing. It was the 39th place he had visited, and other yard men had made similar inquiries in about 400 other similar shops all over London. He asked for the proprietor and was ushered into the man's little cubicle of an office. He identified himself. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Detective Inspector Hatton of Scotland Yard. Here are my credentials. What's the matter? There's nothing... I mean... I I merely wish to see your records, sir. Records? There's nothing... I'm looking for a name, sir. A purchaser of clothing of any sort between the 21st day of February and the present date. Well, uh, I don't... Uh, You know, uh, you are required by law to take the name of any purchaser of clothing who presents the proper ration coupons for the articles purchased. But I can't Uh, spin you... Or perhaps you sell articles without the proper coupon. An actionable offence. Oh, no. Uh, No, 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 Inspector. Uh, Uh, May uh, may I see your books? Uh, But of course, of course. I have them right here. Right here. Here. All up to date and correct. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Taped. Henry. Yeah. Meredith. Oliver B. Barbassio and James. Yeah. Authoress. Thomas. Dobkin. Harry. And the address. Did you find him? I thought he'd have to buy new clothing eventually. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. Yes? Come in. Oh, Hatton. I found Dobkin, sir. Well, that's very good work, Detective Inspector. Thank you, sir. Where is he? Outside, sir. Well, uh, shall we have the gentleman in? By all means, sir. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. This is Mr. Harry Dobkin, Deputy Commander Rawlings. Come in, Mr. Dobkin. Have a chair. Thank you. Be seated, gentlemen. Might I ask what... uh, Why Scotland Yard is interested in me, Commander? Mr. Dobkin, you were a fire watcher near the chapel in Kensington where a fire occurred on the night of Tuesday, 15 April 1941. I was. Why did you not report that fire? Well, it's rather a story, sir. We should like to hear it, Mr. Dobkin. Well, uh, I was supposed to report to the fire warden at Neville Place. And did you do so? Well, no, sir, I didn't. Why, if you please? Oh, he wasn't there. Hmm. Where was he? Oh, I don't know, sir. I suppose he'd nipped around a corner or somewhere for a smoke or a mug-up or something. Well, you understand, sir? I knew him quite well. What was his name? (laughs) Do you know, his his name slipped my mind completely. Uh, Gordon? uh, Gresh? No, no. No, I'm I'm afraid I've completely forgotten it. I did report it to post number seven, though. After the fire brigade had come and gone? Yes. I didn't want to leave the premises. You you see... Why are you so interested in this after all this time, may I ask? 
Certain things happened that night. Well, they must have happened whilst I was gone to report to Post 7, sir. You saw nothing suspicious at all? No, sir, no, nothing at all. What happened? At any time that night? No, sir. The skeleton of a woman was found destroyed by fire in that cellar. There's been no fire in that place either before or since the 15th of April last year. Oh, dear, how dreadful. The woman was your former wife. I'm very sorry to hear that. I did hear that she had disappeared. I'm sorry, I, I disliked the woman intensely. You are surprised to hear of that? Well, naturally. But we've been separated for some time. Uh, I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was so... Well, never mind. And that's what became of her. And you have no knowledge whatever of the circumstances? No, none whatever, sir. Very well, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you. We may perhaps call on you later. Is that all then, sir? Quite. Thank you for coming in. I'm terribly shocked, James. You have our sympathy, Mr. Dobkin. Good afternoon, sir. Well, uh, thank you, sir. Well, he's a liar. Yes? Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, was there anything else found in that, that place? What sort of thing? Oh, why, uh, a pelleus, uh... A straw mattress. Why, uh, Why do you ask, Dobkin? Why, uh... Why, you see, I had an old straw mattress on the roof of the building where I was fire-watching, and... You know, it disappeared that same night. And it, I thought perhaps someone could have stolen it and, uh, used it to start the fire. Why, uh, I'm sure I don't know. Well, uh, I was... I was just thinking back. Well, if... I can be of help in any way... Thank I'll... you, Mr. Dobkin. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Dobkin. Asking for it, eh? We watched him quite closely for a week. Dobkin was puzzled, we discovered, and by the simple-mindedness of the odd people who had accepted his explanation so readily. Think he would be. But then he decided, apparently, that our ready acceptance was much too suspicious. Got smart, eh? Not so awfully smart. He called on me again. Hatton was with me. We were so genial and guileless, we listened so politely. I just thought I'd stop by and inquire what progress you're making. Oh? I remember that fire warden's name. Ah, Greenbaum his name was. Greenbaum. He told us his name was Gregory. Did he tell you I reported to him? Oh, yes, yes. Although he said his post was only two minutes away from the chapel, and if all the things that occurred, uh, placing your wife's body in the vault, doing all the other things, were done in the four minutes you were absent, well... I told you, I don't know anything about my wife's murder. Why, Mr. Dobkin, nobody has said anything about murder. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. I, I tell you, I didn't strangle her. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Harry Dobkin, I arrest you on the charge of willful murder. No, I, I didn't. I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. And what happened? He was brought to trial, and with the evidence that Scotland Yard was able to supply, the Crown found no difficulty whatever in convincing a jury of his guilt. There were out 25 minutes. The verdict was guilty, and he was sentenced to be hanged. On the evening of Thursday 10, September 1942, he made a final and complete confession. The following morning, Friday, 11 September, at 8 o'clock... <laughs>
The story you have just heard was transcribed from the files of the Metropolitan Police, New Scotland Yard. Dates, names, and places are real. The story is true. The information came from Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the true story was written and directed by Willis Cooper. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. I know my life is in danger. I think you can help me. I'm desperate and don't dare go to the police. Please, if you want to help, call at the Tivoli Theater box office for the ticket left there. Our handbill will take you more. Our handbell will tell you more. Yeah, that's the way it started. The note from the girl, Maria. The theater ticket. And then, murder. And now, back to Box 13. It was Thursday when I received the letter from Maria through Box 13. Some of the letters I get are from cranks. Some from people who are just curious about a reporter-turned-fiction writer who advertises Adventure Wanted. Will go any place, do anything. But with this one, it was just like Susie said. Gee, Mr. Holliday, it doesn't look like one of those crank letters or somebody that's just curious, thinks you're crazy or something. How can you tell, Susie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just female ignition. There's a dictionary over there, Susie. Look up ignition. Don't you know what it means, Mr. Holliday? Mm. It's it's when a woman... Skip it, Susie. Skip it. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to pick up a ticket for tonight's show at the Tivoli. Take a look at this handbill. Torino. The great Torino. Like his look, Susie? Well, mm, I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay, Susie, close up shop for the day. You're going to follow it up, huh? That's the general idea, yes. I want to see what Maria has on her mind and why she's afraid. This was it. I picked up the ticket at the Tivoli. A big poster told me this was a charity affair with the axe doing a two-night stand. Tickets? Ten dollars a throw. I circled around the lobby, looked at the acts advertised, singers, dancers, a dog act, and then there it was. A big life-size cut out of the great Torino, complete with mustache and goatee. Nice-looking guy, maybe too smooth-looking, but it was what he was doing that made me take a better look. He held a rifle to his shoulder and was aiming it across the lobby at another cutout. And this one? This one was a girl. Pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. Big eyes, maybe a little scared looking, and looking straight across at the great Torino and right into the barrel of that rifle pointed at her head. Well, if this was Maria, she had a right to have something on her mind. Anybody who stands up and lets a rifle be fired at her is earning a living the hard way. I was thinking about it when the call buzzer zizzed in my ear. I didn't know with a crowd during the overture and took my seat. First we're all right on the aisle, easy to get at. An usherette shoved a program in my hands. The great Torino was scheduled next to closing. Okay, that meant I'd have to sit through the rest of the acts. I did. It was skipping. But the great Torino was something different. He had two assistants, a girl and a good-looking young guy. It was a magic act with class, and Torino was clever with his hands. He did a trunk effect that was really great. And the girl who helped was the same girl whose cutout was in the lobby. Torino tied her with a rope, slipped the big canvas bag over her, and locked her in a trunk. He fired a shot, and bang, the girl came running down the aisle. And the trunk she was put in, well, empty. All done in a split second, too. 
The great Serena took his bow. But I noticed something. When he reached out to take the girl's hand and bow with her, she managed to be busy at something else. Okay. She didn't like him. He gave her a funny look and walked to a rack and picked up a nice nickel-plated rifle. I sat up in my seat because the girl threw a quick look at me and a tiny nod. No one would have noticed it but me. I, I looked back at Torino, who was speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to call your attention to my final effect. A most dangerous one. So dangerous that few illusionists will attempt it. The history of the magician's art has recorded several deaths during the feat. My assistant will go into the audience now and select a committee of volunteers who will please come upon the stage. Maria, if you please. So the girl was Maria. I guess my cue was to be selected as one of the committee. I raised my hand. She picked me. I went on the stage with four others from the audience. Stood there while Torino went to the footlights and spoke again. Uh, please, the music. No music. Please, no music. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall give the gentlemen of the committee this rifle. It may be examined thoroughly. Also, three bullets, which they may mark later for identification. Gentlemen, the rifle. And here... The bullets. Uh, please mark the lead in any way you choose, unmistakably. We took the rifle and the bullets. And the great Torino, well, he had the audience sitting on the edges of their seats. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and Torino wasn't going to tell them until the right time came. And one of the other men on the committee spoke to me. Uh, bullets look okay to you? As good as any bullets can look. 22s, huh? Yeah. How do we mark them? Initials? Yeah, yeah, good idea. The three of us cut our initials in the lead. That all right with you, mister? Good. How about the rest of you? Suits me. I've got a knife here. Yeah, let me see the rifle. Yeah, sure, here. Rifle look okay, no gimmicks? Mm, not that I can see. All right, my, my initials are cut in the bullet. Uh, you want to cut yours? Oh, yes. I cut my initials, D.H., in one of the bullets. So we had three bullets with initials cut in the lead. No chance for a substitution. Then Torino took the rifle and the bullets. Thank you, gentlemen. Grazie tanto. You are satisfied? Uh, sure, I am. Yes. Good. Now, if you will all watch closely, I shall load the bullets in the rifle. So, and uh, what is your name, sir? Holiday. Good. Then, uh, Mr. Holiday, if you will please hold the loaded rifle until I am ready for it. Oh, sure, sure. In this way, there can be no trickery. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw me load the market bullets, yes. So, and you have the loaded rifle. Good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce once more Maria. Maria? <laughs> the young lady is as courageous as she is lovely. Maria, you will take your place, please. Mr. Holiday. Would you care to shoot at Maria? Oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> then that leaves it up to me. No. The rifle, please. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall ask for complete quiet. <coughs> thank you. Maria, you are ready? Yes. I'm ready. The great Torino walked to the other side of the stage. He raised the rifle to his shoulder, pointed it at Maria. She was pale as death. Her arms were tense, tight. Perspiration stood out on her forehead. And on mine. And on everyone in the audience. Then... So help me, this is what happened. A bullet appeared between Maria's teeth. She let it drop to a plate. She held in her hands, then... Two more bullets popped between her teeth and fell to the plate. No one in the audience moved. No applause, just that tense feeling. Torino walked over, took the plate. His hands never touched the bullets. I'll swear to it. He walked to me and the other three men with me and... Gentlemen, you will please to identify the bullets, yes? This one. Initials, T, 
Gee. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's mine, all right. Thank you. And uh, this one, K-R. Mine. Thank you. And the third, D-H. That's mine. <laughs> How did he do it? I don't know. All I know is that when I walked off the stage, Maria managed to get a note into my hands. When I read it later, it asked me to meet her at a little coffee shop about three blocks from the theater. All right, that's what I did. We sat in the booth, back out of the way, and Maria talked. Thank you for coming, Mr. Holliday. That's all right, Maria. I, I saw a great act, but what am I doing in it? You can help me. Please help me. How? Doing what? You can keep Torino from killing me. More coffee? Didn't you hear me? Oh, sure. Sure, but I don't get it. You saw the act. The rifle trick. Yeah, it was great. Then you must see how easy it would be for Torino to kill me while doing it. Slow up a little, Maria. Let's start from the beginning. All right. You saw the other assistant. You mean the good-looking kid? That's Billy. I love him and he loves me. Then what's your problem? Torino. He hates Billy. And he hates me for loving Billy. Jealous? Insanely. Well, quit then. I will. After tomorrow night's performance. But why wait if you're afraid? I won't be afraid if you're there. What could I do? Be on the committee again. If I think any, anything's wrong, I'll signal you. And then? Do anything. Drop the rifle, but don't give it back to Torino. Now, wait a minute. How could he kill you? He'd claim it was an accident. Three magicians or their assistants have been killed accidentally doing the trick. The mechanism of the gun goes wrong. Giving away secrets, Maria? I have to. There's a mechanism in the breech of the gun. It drops the real bullets down into Torino's hand when he closes the breech. Oh, then I get an unloaded gun. There are blanks in it. The mechanism substitutes them for the real bullets. Hmm. That's good. And he slips the real bullets to you. Yes. When he takes my hand to introduce me. And you slip them into your mouth. While the audience is watching Torino and the rifle. I see. Maria. Yes? Why don't you go to the police? Torino would know. He'd know. How? He watches me. Then aren't you afraid he's watching now? No. Not tonight. I slipped away. I don't think I could manage it again. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday? You're my only chance. I saw you had in the paper, Box 13. You mean the police would ask him questions and he'd lay low until he got the chance to... Yes. Will you be there tomorrow night, Mr. Holliday? Look, I have a ticket for you here. The same seat. Please. Please. All right, Maria. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to keep the trick from being trumped by the great Torino. Now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it sounded like a great assignment. And from the way the setup looked from where I sat, it gave the great Torino a perfect chance to kill Maria. I checked on Maria's story about the accidental deaths during the trick, and Jonesy at the Star Times verified it. A smart cookie like Torino could fake an accident, and who's going to pin the black ribbon on him? Nobody. Okay, it's up to you, Holiday, to figure it out. The next night, I sat in the same seat and watched Torino go through his act. The trunk thing, still great, knocked the audience off their seats. Me, too. Couldn't figure it. But the big stuff was still to come, the rifle trick. I went on the stage, kept my eyes on Maria. I marked one of the bullets again. Oddly enough, Torino didn't seem to recognize me. That was all right with me. And now, ladies and Torino ladies, went through his same spiel, word for word. I kept my eyes on Maria. But it was though she'd never seen me before in her life. She looked... Well, it sounds silly, but she looked hypnotized. Then I heard Torino saying to me... Mr. Holliday, would you care to shoot at Maria? No, thank you. <laughs> Torino looked at me hard. My name and my face together might have tipped him. There was a funny look in his eyes. I stared at Maria. Not a sign from her. Maria, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. 
I relaxed a little. She hadn't given me a sign. Everything was all right, and then... Maria! Maria! She dropped. Maria dropped. And right between her eyes was a little round hole. Look, Holiday. Is that straight, that story? Sure it is, Kling. She was afraid she'd be killed. But you say she didn't give you a high sign. No, she didn't even look at me. But she told you if there was anything wrong, she'd tip you. Yes, but she didn't tip me. Okay. Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Get to Reno over here. Yes, sir. All right, you. Lieutenant Kling wants you. Got any ideas, Holiday? Uh, I'm dry. Bone dry, Kling. And what about this guy, Billy, she told you about? I told you. Okay. It was accident. Accident. Something she was go wrong. Please. Quiet. Now look. Accident. She's oh. wrong accident that it happened. You're so I am an artist. You tell me I do something wrong. No, no, no. It is wrong. Holy accident. mackerel. I've times Sergeant. I have done yes, sir. Drinking. Put this guy in his dressing room. And keep him there until he blows off that head of steam. Wrong, you know. But watch his door. And the window from outside. Yes, sir. Come on, Hootie. Come on. It's funny. I'm hysterical. I don't think. What's funny? The girl, Maria. I don't think she knew me tonight. She looked right at me. Didn't give me a tumble. Yeah? So? She told me she'd signal me if anything was wrong. I... I don't get it. But it looks as though she... She what? She deliberately let Torino fire a gun she knew was set to kill her. That makes great sense. I know. No sense at all. Besides that, there... Get away with it. You're going to let him tell you it's all an accident. Well, don't believe him. He killed her. That's Billy. Kling. What? Let me ask him a couple of things. Now, look, Holiday, I'm in charge of this case. You're in on a rain check. Okay, but I'm in, huh? Yeah, for the one reason that Maria told you about it, and he I... He killed her. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I'd better go help the sergeant. Any objections if I mosey along with you? None. Just keep your mouth closed, that's all. Sure. All right. So I listened while Kling asked questions. But there was something knocking at the back of my head. Asking to be let in. Something I'd seen, heard, remembered. I didn't know. But what bothered me was Maria not giving me a signal. When she said she'd know if Torino was up to something. Billy answered Kling's questions. No, no. All I know is that Torino <laughs> bluffed Maria. He said he'd kill her if he saw me hanging around her. Who loads the rifle with blanks? Maria. Maria. Does she do it tonight? She always does it. Maria loaded the rifle herself. She did. Before the performance. So I got an idea. I left the stage where the investigation was going on. And I walked backstage toward the dressing rooms. I wanted to talk to Torino. But there was a large blue cop sitting at the door. He looked at me and... Well, Holiday. Oh, hi, Murph. I feel lousy. No, oh, that's too bad. Uh, say, I think I could talk to Torino. No. Oh, now, look, you can watch and listen, tell Kling everything that goes on. <laughs> Playing detective holiday? Nope, uh, playing a hunch. What about? Why not listen and find out, and if you learn anything, tell Kling. And you might learn something good. You mean something that might break the case? Yeah, might. Well, well uh... What's the matter, Murph? Can't you use a couple of strikes? Aye, sure. Oh, okay. But I'm standing right here, understand? Sure. Right. Hey, you, get up and... Oh, brother. Look. Hmm. Ain't nobody gonna ask him no questions. No, I don't think he's in any shape to answer. A promotion, you say? A promotion? I'll be lucky if I ain't fouled up for good. This guy's been knifed right under my nose. That's right. Somebody stabbed Torino. He was as dead as Maria. And nobody saw anybody go in or out of the dressing room. There was one window. It was open. But the officer outside swore he had his eye on it. Hmm. Nobody in or out. And nobody in the room but Torino. And the knife was in his back, so suicide was out. Clegg and his boys turned the... Room upside down. Torino's apparatus and trunks were shoved around. Still nobody. And it turned out nobody had a motive for killing Torino except Billy. Me? 
Me? Are you crazy? I never left the stage. I was talking to you. I was answering questions. I can't be in two places at once, can I? He was so right. Kling was tearing his hair. Then more questions. The rest of the acts were strangers to Torino. Knew nothing about him. I was thinking about it when something hit me. Something Billy had said. While Kling was still firing questions, I got to a phone. Hello? Oh, hiya, Kenny. Still running that private eye? Swell. Do something for me, will you? Hmm? Okay. Put a man on the Tivoli Theater right now. And get him to tail a guy named Billy. Huh? Here's what he looks like. About 5'9", stocky, light complexion, wearing gray suit. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. Hiya, Susie. Any messages? Uh Uh-huh. The detective agency called. And what? What's the message? Oh, oh, I wrote it down shorthand. Here. Uh, Trail Billy in shoe... No, wait a minute. Oh, terrible ink. Uh, oh, I got it. To insurance company this morning. He placed claim for double indemnity policy for his wife, Maria Baker. Hey, hey wait a minute, Mr. Holliday. That's not all. That's enough. I'll see you later, Susie. Torino, Torino. Step on him, Jonesy. Oh, you want hard facts? It takes time to find them. Even in the Morgan to start times. Okay, Jonesy, okay, but hurry up, will you? Ah, here we are. Torino, born Italy. Skip that. How long has he been in the country? Uh, six months. Noted magician in Italy and Europe before the war. Only six months. Now, Jonesy, if you were a magician, you wanted assistance. How would you get them? Advertising a billboard. Magazine for show folks. What else? Hmm. Where can I see the last six months' copies of the billboard? Right, I got a local office in town. All the copies you want. Hey, where are you going? Thanks, Jones. You'll be seeing you. I've got a lot of reading to do. Six months' copies of the billboard. I looked through every one of them, and when my eyes were falling out of my head, I saw it. An advertisement. The one I wanted. And the one that tied up was something Billy said. And something I saw during Torino's act. I tried to get Kling on the phone, but no dice. He was out. I left word for him to meet me at the Tivoli, and I went there myself. There was nobody there but the watchman. The five-dollar bill got me in. Oh, there's no place gloomier than backstage in an empty theater. I headed for Torino's dressing room. Because I had a good idea how someone got in and stabbed Torino, then disappeared. I opened the door, stepped inside. It was dark. The shade on the window must have been down. I was fumbling for the light switch when somebody pulled the shade on me. Slugged your holiday. Yeah, Kling, I have. All right. Who? Billy, maybe. No dice. He didn't come near this place. We had a tail on him. Do you know about the insurance? Sure. But he couldn't have killed his wife because she loaded the blanks into the gun. Uh Uh-huh. And the medical examiner's report on the bullet that killed her? What about that? Twenty-two. No initials on it? No, none. So it looks like this Maria deliberately planned her own death. It wasn't an accident. If it had been, the bullet in her head would have been marked. Kling, put out a dragnet. For who? For the one who slugged me. I'll cut it, Holiday. If you know anything, spill it before I lose my temper. Who do you want to pick up? Here's a description. Young woman, about 26. 26. Brown hair. Brown hair. Lovely blue eyes. Blue eyes. About five foot two. Five foot two. Worked as a magician's assistant. Hey, what are you giving me? That's Maria. Uh Uh-huh, Maria. She's dead, you dope. You mean her twin sister's dead, Kling. Twin sister? What are you talking about? The trunk effect Torino worked. Could have only been done with twins. Billy tipped me off on it. Billy? Sure, when he said nobody could be in two places at once. And Torino advertised in the billboard for twins. You are dreaming this. Put out a dragnet for Maria. Who stabbed Torino? Maria. She got her twin sister to take her place in the rifle trick last night. That's why I didn't get a signal from her. 
The sister didn't know me from Adam. Now, look, Holiday, we searched this dressing room. There was nobody in it when Torino was stabbed. Maria was here. Look. Falls back in his cabinet. Good old magician's gimmick. She was here all the while. Maria and Billy took out an insurance policy on her and planned to make me the patsy. Because I'd testify that she told me Torino hated her, that she was scared. Torino was knifed to keep him from spilling about the twins. Billy was in the clear on that, because he had an alibi when Torino was killed. Okay, Clint? I, uh... Okay. We'll put out a dragnet. Yeah, Susie. They got her. Gee, sounds just like a story. Uh Uh-huh. Only nobody will believe it. Look, I've got a knot on my forehead to prove it. (laughs) Does that make you hysterical? No, but I was just thinking. Don't be reckless, Susie. What about? I was just thinking, with that bump, you'll have to wear off-the-face hats for a while. (laughs) You're a great help. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Stay in here, Dr. Van Peter. The human mind is like a cave. Beyond the light, there are dark passageways and mysterious recesses. I, Dr. Daniel Danfield, have explored those unknown retreats and know their secrets. In a moment, we return. Danger, Dr. Danfield, but first... Dr. Daniel Danfield, authority on crime psychology, has an unhappy faculty for getting himself mixed up in hazardous predicaments because of his astonishing revelations regarding the workings of the criminal mind. As our story opens, we find Dr. Danfield in his office dictating to his pretty young secretary, Rusty Fairfax. It is, therefore, with regret that uh, I'm forced to use the following incident as an example of this type of criminal mind. Miss Fairfax and I had been invited to attend the engagement party of Miss Hazel Humphrey and Count Andre Devigny. Oh, there you are, Danfield. Enjoying yourself? Indeed I am, Mr. Humphrey. It's been a long time since I've seen so many celebrities at one gathering. Well, you notice any criminal types among them? Yes, as a matter of fact, there are quite a few. What? Well, who, for heaven's sake? It would be hardly discreet for me to single out those among your friends whom I believe have criminal tendencies, Mr. Humphrey. Oh, but look here. You can't just make a sweeping statement like that and then refuse... I'm sorry, Mr. Humphrey, but unless you can tolerate sweeping statements, you shouldn't ask sweeping questions. Well, I see. I think we'd better understand each other, Mr. Humphrey. I, uh, I strongly suspect that you invited Miss Fairfax and myself to your weekend house party because you're secretly amused by the nature of my work. Really, Dan Field, I... I take my work quite seriously, you know, Mr. Humphrey. I intend to be honest in my opinions also, otherwise I could hardly hope for success. Honesty is the best policy, don't you think? Of course, of course. And now that we've reached an understanding, Miss Fairfax and I would be happy to leave if you feel it. Oh, not at all. Oh, look here, Danfield. Perhaps I owe you an apology. No. No, frequently I run into this sort of thing. It's uh, often necessary to point out to my friends that I'm not an entertainer, but a professional man. Quite, quite. As a matter of fact, Danfield, I'm rather glad you're here. Oh? My wife is wearing her diamond pendant. It's quite valuable, you know. Oh, indeed, I do know. The Humphrey pendant is famous. I understand it's been evaluated at $100,000. Yes. 
And now that you've mentioned that, uh, well, that there are criminals present... Oh, well, you misunderstood me, Mr. Humphrey. I didn't say there were criminals present. I said there were many people present who possessed criminal tendencies. Well, it amounts to the same thing. All right, Jove, now I am alarmed. I think perhaps I'd better warn Edna and suggest that she... Well, here's the young lady. Yes. Somebody, eh, Dan? Oh, hello there, Mr. Humphrey. Uh-huh, hello. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, of course. You're Miss Fairfax, Manfield's secretary. I'm sorry I didn't... Oh, don't apologize. With this gang, I don't blame you for forgetting the names of half of them. Or do you know them all? No, I'm sorry to say I don't. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me, I must find out now. What's the matter with him? Am I poison or something? Mr. Humphrey is disturbed over the fact that his wife is wearing her famous diamond pendant, Miss Fairfax. Well, why shouldn't she wear it? What kind of a bang can she get out of owning the thing if she keeps it locked away in a safe all the time? Oh, Miss Fairfax, I'm afraid you'll never understand human nature. Some people enjoy possessing valuable articles, even though they may never see them. Maybe you're right. Maybe I don't know much about human nature, but I know an unhappy bride-to-be when I see one. Oh, and uh, to whom are you referring, Miss Fairfax? Hazel Humphrey. Who else? Hazel Humphrey? The young lady whose engagement is about to be announced? Oh, come, come, Miss Fairfax. Hazel Humphrey is making an excellent match. Who says so? Why, why, everybody. The papers have been full of it. Have they? And how do the papers know how a girl feels deep down in her heart? I haven't the remotest idea how the newspapers happen to know such things, Miss Fairfax. Yet I must confess that they publish facts with an air of assurance. Well, this time they missed the boat. Take a look over there. Over where, Miss Fairfax? Over there near the doorway to the dining room. See that tall, blonde girl talking to the short man with a mustache? Oh, yes. What a gorgeous creature. You would notice that. Well, anyway, that's Hazel Humphrey. And the person she's talking to is Count André de Valle. Is it really? Well, well. Does she look happy to you? Mm Mm-hmm. I see what you mean. She doesn't seem to be playing the role of the ecstatic bride-to-be, does she? Oh, well, probably a lover's tiff. Lover's tiff my foot. She doesn't want to marry the guy. Her mother's driving her into it because Count Fatso has a title. Oh, Dan, can't you do something? Do something? I? (laughs) Come, come, Miss Fairfax. Let's be serious. I am serious. Look, you're supposed to know all there is to know about human nature and human instincts and all that sort of thing. Why don't you get in there and help that poor girl out? Miss Fairfax, must I remind you that... Oh, yes, yes, I know. You're only interested in the criminal mind. All right. It's criminal if you stand to one side and let that poor girl fall into the clutches of that money-grabbing phone. That's quite enough, Miss Fairfax. I'm not conducting an advice to the Lovelorn Bureau. I haven't the faintest interest in whether Miss Humphrey marries Count Devillier or whether she jumps from the Brooklyn Bridge tomorrow at dawn. Now, is that clear? It certainly is. And a lot of other things are clear also, Dr. Daniel Danfield. It's clear that you're stubborn and selfish and that you can't see beyond the end of your nose. Miss Fairfax. It's clear that I was a fool to have ever hoped that someday you might thaw out and act human. Act human? It's clear that I that I think you're you're a prude and that someday I hope you fall in love and, and learn what it's like. Oh, ma chérie. Tonight you are very, very lovely. Oh. You are like the summer sunset over the ocean. You are Oh, nice. Andre, for heaven's sake, relax. Oh, my sherry. Now, look, darling, let's get things straight once and for all. You don't have to put on an act for my benefit. I know you don't love me. Mon dear, ma chérie, what is this thing you say? Well, do you? But we, oui, please, you must understand. To me, you are like the summer shower to the parched grass. You are like... Oh, nuts. Andre, listen, you're a good guy and all that. If you weren't such a little half-baked roly-poly, I could probably go for you. The fact of the matter is, I'm in love with someone else. Ma chérie. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to double-cross you. We've made a deal and it's that. A deal, ma chérie? Sure, my family's got money and you want in. Okay. You have a title and my mother and father are willing to pay for it. I'm the goat. Uh, what is this goat? Oh, forget it, darling. Other girls have been sold down the river before. <laughs> Why don't you run along and... Mon Dieu, all this talk of selling goats down rivers. I, I do not understand. Uh, Please, I have more words to speak. I count André, Amy, Pierre, Bobby, I have the great love for you. This you must understand. In no other way will I make with the marriage. Oh, that's well. Now that it's settled, leave us forget the double talk and make with the merriment. Shall we? We, oui, so long as there is between us the understanding. Uh, 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 we are interrupted. Oh, hello, Edwards. What's on your mind? Uh, the big pardon, miss. 
There's a gentleman waiting to see you in the library. Gentleman. Tell him I'll, I'll be right there. Uh, uh, Andre, darling, you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Well, why don't you go into the dining room and sample full of beverages? But these gentlemen... Oh, nobody important, darling. Just an insurance agent who wanted to talk to me about our engagement gift. Oh, then perhaps Don't I... bother, darling. I prefer to handle it myself. <laughs> see you later. But, my chérie, come back. I Andre. Ray. Hello, Hazel. Oh, Ray, why did you come here? Don't you realize what will happen it if you... It won't make any difference now if I'm seen. No difference? But, Ray, I... I... came to say goodbye, Hazel. Goodbye? Oh, Ray, you mustn't talk like that. You mustn't... Sorry, darling. I've thought it all over. It, it just won't work with us. Oh. It wouldn't be fair to you. Oh, now, stop it, Ray. You don't mean that. You can't mean now, it. listen to me, Hazel. I'd be a louse if I... If I took you away from the things you're used to, from the manner of living oh, that you... Ray. Ray, we've been all over that before. We've settled it. We agreed that neither of us could be happy without the other. Don't those promises mean anything? I haven't got a nickel, Hazel. I'm your father's gardener. Now, this sort of thing is for storybooks. It doesn't work in real life. It does, it will. Oh, Ray, don't you realize what you're doing to me? It's only because of you that I've been able to go through with all this engagement business. To tolerate the sentimental mush of that detestable little Frenchman. De Villiers is your type. He can give you what you want. He isn't my type. He can't give me what I want. I... Well, I'll not marry him whatever happens. Hazel, you've got to. Have I? Oh, Ray. Have you stopped loving me? Is that it? You know it isn't. I'll never stop loving you. Well, then there's only one answer, darling. We'll have to go through with our plans, because if we don't, I... Well, I'll make a worse mess out of things. Oh, Hazel, do you mean that? Oh, every word. Oh, my darling. I hope that's what you'd say. Oh, Ray. Ray. Hazel! Hazel, the idea! Oh, Mother. So this is what's been going on. Hazel, I'm a she... Oh, just a minute, Mrs. Humphrey. It isn't Hazel's fault, I... That's quite enough, young man. Go back to your quarters at once. Pack your things and get out. No. Ray, you stay here, please. Hazel, how dare you defy me? Well, I'm sorry, Mother. I hoped we could avoid this scene. I hoped it... Well, I hoped it would be all over before you found out. Found out what? I'm not going to marry Count Davier, Mother. Hazel! I'm going to marry Ray. Hazel, are you out of your mind? Oh, I'm quite sane. I can't help it. It's Ray I love, and it's Ray I'm going to marry. Is it? We'll see about that. Well, Raymond, are you going to obey my orders? I'm sorry, Mrs. Humphrey. Leave this house at once. When I do, I'm taking Hazel with me. Why, you... You bother. Oh, Mother. And you, my own daughter. Is this the way you express your gratitude? After all your father and I have done for you? Giving you every advantage? Sending you to the best schools? Arranging for you to meet the right people? And now this. Oh, Mother, I know I'm grateful for what you've done for me, only... Well, only sometime I've got to begin living my own life. Oh. Doing things that I think are right. Things that you think are right. Do you think it's right to hold a clandestine meeting with your... your sweetheart at your own engagement party? Do you know how much this party is costing your father and me? No, and I don't care. I didn't want the party and you know it. What? It was your own doing. I've told you a thousand times I didn't love Count Davier, that I wouldn't marry him. Yet you went ahead planning and scheming, convinced that I'd be carried away with all the glitter and glamour, and... and yield. Well, I won't. Hazel, you should be thankful I didn't embarrass you by not appearing at all. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, this isn't my girl talking. This isn't the child I, I reared with such loving care and... and oh, hope. Mother, stop it. Stop it. The little girl whom I've sheltered and protected... Oh, and... for heaven's sake, Mother. <laughs> stop the drama. Haven't you any feelings? Don't you realize that Ray and I love each other? Love each other? Oh, poppycock. You're not capable of knowing whether you love anyone or not. Love, indeed. What has love got to do with it? When you've an opportunity to marry a man with a title... Just a of... moment, Mrs. Humphrey, please. Well, what do you want? I want to tell you my purpose in coming here tonight. I came to tell Hazel I was going away. What? I came to tell her that you were right, that a marriage between us wouldn't work. I asked her to release me from my promise. Well, then... She refused, Mrs. Humphrey. And I thank heaven I had sense enough to listen. 
Now that I know what kind of a woman you are, how selfish and, and unfeeling and cruel, <gasps> what? there's nothing could stop me from taking her away. Oh, Ray. You fool. You young, stupid fool. What are you going to live on? The money you make as a gardener. I won't be a gardener forever. If Hazel isn't satisfied with the money I make, I'll get more. I'll get it if I have to steal it. Uh, Had I known of the foregoing incidents at the time the diamond pendant was stolen, it would have helped immeasurably in apprehending the criminal. Miss Humphrey and her young man did not leave the party that night. Whether this was out of consideration to the girl's parents or... Whether they felt that by waiting a few days they could convince Mr. and Mrs. Humphrey of the wisdom of their decision, I did not discover. At any rate, both the young people were present when the robbery occurred. I was sleeping soundly when Mr. Humphrey knocked on my bedroom door. Huh? Oh. Come in. Oh. Oh, it's Mr. Humphrey. Danfield, in heaven's name, get up. Something terrible has happened. Oh, something terrible? My wife's diamond pendant has been stolen. Stolen? Yes, stolen. Good heavens, man, don't you understand what this means? Well, naturally, Mr. Humphrey, the uh, loss of the pendant must mean considerable... It's more than the mere loss of the pendant. Danfield, listen to me. If those diamonds aren't recovered, it will mean my complete financial ruin. I, uh, I don't believe I understand. I had intended to sell the pendant next week. Things have not been going well with me financially. It's been necessary to keep up appearances. Danfield, uh, I suppose this will shock you as it would many people. But the truth is, I'm broke. Hmm. Well, that explains it. Explains what? Uh, Nothing, nothing. Uh, Tell me, Mr. Humphrey, this marriage of your daughter to Count Devillier. Devillier has connections. He believes that I'm rich. With the funds I received for the pendant... I could have satisfied my creditors until Davillier put me next to something good. Hmm. This is indeed amazing. Was the was the pendant insured, Mr. Humphrey? Well, no. I, I was forced to allow the insurance to lapse. Mm-hmm. When did the robbery take place? Sometime in the night. There was a brief shower. It woke Mrs. Humphrey. She lay for a while listening, thinking she'd heard a noise. Presently it stopped raining completely, and she heard the heavy breathing of a man. And then what did she do? Nothing. She lay still, waiting... Apparently, the burglar must have thought that she'd gone back to sleep. He crossed to the open window and jumped to the lawn below. That's rather an extraordinary story, Mr. Humphrey. As a matter of fact, I don't believe it. I beg your pardon? I should think you might. I suppose Mrs. Humphrey screamed and aroused the household, demanding everybody's arrest. Why, no. She she told no one but me. I rather thought it best to keep the thing quiet until you'd had a chance to investigate. Now, look here, Danfield. If you're suggesting... That, uh, That last statement interests me, Mr. Humphrey. Tell me, did your wife recognize the figure that jumped from the window? Why, no. That is, she, uh... Well, she rather thought at first that it was our gardener, a young man named Raymond Arrow, but she was by no means sure. Ah. What do you mean, ah? Nothing, just, uh, ah. Uh, Where is your wife now, Mr. Humphrey? She remained in bed. The experience upset her considerably. I've sent for Dr. Chandler. I see. Uh, Now, will you uh, please tell me the time? The time? Why, it's, uh, 6.45. Thank you, Mr. Humphrey. If you wake Miss Fairfax and ask her to join me outside in 15 minutes, I think I shall not only be able to identify your thief, but recover your wife's diamond pendant. We'll return to Danger Dr. Danfield in a moment, but first... seems to me you were bragging too much when you told Mr. Humphrey you'd recover the pendant for him. Oh, really, Miss Fairfax? Yes, really. How do you know who stole it? And if you did know, what good would it do you? The thief wouldn't be fool enough to leave it lying around where you could pick it up. That's a logical deduction, Miss Fairfax. Well, then I don't see why... Here we are. That, uh, that window up there opens into Mrs. Humphrey's bedroom, doesn't it? Yes. Dan, look. Why, George, two footprints plainly embedded in the soft earth beneath the window. And they're deep enough to have been made by a man jumping from the window above. Yes, indeed they are. Miss Fairfax, look. There in that leaf that's lying in the right heel mark. Well, what is it? Oh, my mistake. For a moment I thought the reflection of the sunlight on the water cut in the leaf was Mrs. Humphrey's diamond pendant. Dan Danfield, you're stalling. You didn't expect to find these footprints. 
You didn't believe that there had been a burglar in Mrs. Humphrey's bedroom at all. Miss Fairfax. You're not fooling me. When Mr. Humphrey told you the burglar had jumped from the window, you expected to prove he was lying because you didn't think you'd find any footprints, didn't you? Miss Fairfax. Oh, I... Stop calling me Miss Fairfax and admit the truth. For once, you're completely wrong. Miss Fairfax, I'm never wrong. It's high time you realize that. Oh? Well, then, just how are you going to explain these footprints? You come with me. I'll show you not only the pair of shoes that made those footprints, but the man who owns them. Well, there you are, Dan Field and Miss Fairfax. Come in, come in. Have you apprehended the criminal? Yes, as a matter of fact, we have. It was quite simple, wasn't it, Miss Fairfax? Oh, nothing to it. Of course, I don't know who the criminal is yet. Miss Fairfax, please. I'll do the talking, if you don't mind. Well, you asked me a question. Oh, I say, Danfield, is that a pair of shoes you're carrying? Indeed it is, Mr. Humphrey. Does anyone here recognize them? Well, they're certainly not mine. Naturally, they're not, Edna. They're men's shoes. Where did you get the things, Danfield? They look like a pair of workmen's boots. I believe they are, Mr. Humphrey. Do you recognize them, Miss Humphrey? I? Well, why should I recognize them? Of course not. I've never seen them before in my life. Oh, pardon me, Miss Humphrey, but you sound altogether too definite. I think you've seen these shoes before and on many occasions. They belong to your gardener friend, Mr. Raymond Arrow. Oh. Sure. You've got to be man wear shoes, does he? Most anyone would wear shoes, my friend, when he plans to jump to the ground from an upstairs window. I knew it. It was that gardener who stole my pendant. It wasn't. It couldn't have been. Oh, this gardening man with the cone is ultra thief. Ma chérie, at least I can't... Oh, Andre, for pity's sake, be still. Ray didn't steal the pendant. And this, this Danfield person or anyone else can't prove that he did. Dan, are you going to let her talk to you like that? Miss Fairfax, please. I'm sorry, Miss Humphrey. These shoes belong to Mr. Errol by his own admission. I don't believe it. The design on the rubber heels is identical to the designs on the heels of the imprints beneath your mother's window. Oh, there could be a hundred pairs of shoes of the same design. The mud which Mr. Errol scraped from the shoes is the same in texture as that near the imprint. Right, Miss Fairfax? I guess so. Never guess, Miss Fairfax. Be specific. Why should I? You don't pay any attention to Just a moment. Danfield, there's something amiss here. For some reason or other, you're stalling with a lot of nonsensical... Stalling, about... Mr. Humphrey? Yes, stalling. If Errol is guilty, why haven't you... Oh! Uh, what's the matter? Good heavens. Uh, what is wrong? What the window? Who's at the window? He's there. I saw him. He had a gun. What are you talking about? Who has a gun? I saw him. Go after him. It won't be necessary to go after him, Mrs. Humphrey. Oh. Come in, Mr. Aram. Oh, Ray. Hello, darling. Sorry I had to frighten your mother so. <laughs> Errol, was that you outside the window? Yes, sir, it was. What's the meaning of this? Dr. Danfield, arrest that, that burglar. I haven't the authority to arrest him, even though he were the thief, Mrs. Humphrey. What do you mean, even though he were the thief? He is the thief. You've already proved it. Oh, darling, I knew you didn't do it. Danfield, will you be good enough to explain what this is all about? If given the opportunity, I'll be glad to, Mr. Humphrey. There's no need for any further... Please still, Edna. Well? I think, Mrs. Humphrey, your husband's suggestion is a good one. The more you talk, the worse you make it for yourself. Why, the idea... Ever said... since your husband told me of the man jumping from your bedroom window, Mrs. Humphrey, I wondered why you didn't scream when you saw it happen. Why? I didn't scream. Yes, you see, there's not one woman in a million who would lie in a bed and watch a strange man prowl about a room and then see him jump from her window without raising her voice by a scream. Oh, nonsense. You'd rather gave yourself away, Mrs. Humphrey, when you glimpsed Mr. Errol's face outside the window a moment ago. Well, I... Of course, well, the I... reason you didn't scream last night when the prowler was in your room is because you knew his identity and knew why he was there. The idea... I... Edna, is this true? Who was this man? I am insulted. I shall at once leave. You'll stay right here until we get through with you. Keep your hands off me, corn gardening man. Take it easy, mister. Why don't you challenge him to a duel, Frenchie? Oh, it was Andre who was in Mother's room. Mother and Andre conspired to make it appear as though Ray were a thief. I wouldn't marry him. Oh, Mother, how could you? Edna, is this true? Speak up. Yes. Yes, it's true. I didn't want her to marry Ray. I wanted her to marry Andre because because he had a title and and, and a pendant. Where is it? Uh, it's in my room. I I hid it there so everyone would think that Ray had stolen it. Positively, I am insulted. One more minute longer, I will not stay here. I count Andre Frenchy and with apologies to the good neighbor policy. Here's a little memento that you can take back overseas with you. Oh. Well, 
return for the conclusion of Danger Dr. Dan Field in a moment, but first... Now for the conclusion of Danger Dr. Dan Field. The details of how this matter was concluded are, of course, unimportant. It is, however, significant that uh, those involved in the conspiracy to jeopardize the reputation of young Mr. Errol were... were... Well, Miss Fairfax? Don't your lecture classes ever get bored, Dr. Danfield? Bored? My lecture classes? (laughs) Come, Miss Fairfax, whatever put that idea into your mind. Because you're always feeding them this double talk about criminal potentialities and the workings of the criminal mind. Well, Miss Fairfax... Why don't you make it a little spicy? Tell them about how Hazel and Ray eloped the next day and the old lady finally broke down and admitted that she didn't want a title anyway. But, Miss Fairfax... Tell them when Ray found out that Frenchie would swiped his shoes and what he'd used them for, he socked the guy again, which pleased everybody. Miss Fairfax, it seems to me that... And then tell them how you knew that the old lady was lying when she gave out with that story about a burglar jumping out of her window. She wasn't lying. Count Devalier did actually jump from the window so that we'd find his footprints. Well, I know that, but it seems to me... There was merely a discrepancy in Mrs. Humphrey's story which aroused my suspicions. You see, she told her husband that she lay awake until it stopped raining completely. Then she heard a man's breathing, and then she saw him jump from the window. Well? Why, Miss Fairfax, you yourself saw the raindrops on the leaf that we found in the footprints. The sun shone on them, which made me think for a moment we'd found the lost diamonds. For gosh sake... Now, do you understand, Miss Fairfax? Why, sure. If the burglar had jumped from the window after it had stopped raining, there wouldn't be any raindrops in the leaf, would there? Quite right, Miss Fairfax. Now, shall we continue? Oh, let's not. Let's not? Dan, aren't you ever going to learn to be human? Human? Hmm. Miss Fairfax. Uh, Rusty, would you uh, lift your chin just a little bit higher? Yes, yes, that's fine. Now. Wow. How human can a guy get? Miss Fairfax, I uh, see what you mean. Shoe fly. As the old morning bugle call of the covered wagon trains dies away among the echoes, another true story of Death Valley Days is brought to you by the Pacific Coast Borax Company, who give you also the miracle of borax in three convenient forms. Twenty mule team borax for household use, twenty mule team borax soap chips in the big blue and yellow sunshine box for washing clothes and dishes, and boraxo for toilet use. And now for the old ranger and his evening's yarn which has the extraordinary title of Shoe Fly. Well, the title's no more extraordinary than the woman herself. The shoe Fly was a woman? Yes, woman prospector. Well. <laughs> oh, now, uh-huh. I've come across plenty of women prospectors in my time. Some of them I've already told you about. Now, there was uh, Happy Days at Goldfield, remember? Y- yeah. Went on that glorious junket at the age of 80. Hopping freights clear across the continent and back. I remember. Uh huh. And Silver Susie, that operated the mine at Cerro Gordo for years and years in order to put her children through school and college. And Ma Riggs and Hard Pan Hattie and, oh, I've known a bunch of them in the desert around Dead Valley. But none of them quite like the woman I'm going to tell you about tonight. I can remember perfectly the first time I ever met her. Me and Eddie Granite had come to Independence to file a claim we just located up in the Panamas. As we walked into the county recorder's office, we found him busy with another customer. A smallish woman with sharp eyes and wispy gray hair. Dressed. <laughs> it's funny how you remember such things. She dressed in a gray and a white calico dress and, and a black straw hat. <laughs> To corner monument number four, thence northwest, 300 feet to place of beginning, including all dips, spurs, angles, and variations. Mm-hmm. This looks all right. Of course, all right. 
The name of the mining claim above described is and shall be known as the, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, I can't quite make this out. It looks like shoe fly. Huh? Yes, shoe fly. Those are expresses by sentiments. You mean, uh... Shoe fly, don't bother me. Oh, <laughs> I see. Notice to claim jumpers, eh? Exactly. Well, let's hope they take the hint. Uh, they'd better. Located this 21st day of May, 1906. Uh, this your signature here? Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, no other? I got only one name. No, I mean there's no other locator? No. Well... Huh. Law don't call for more than one, does it? Oh, no. No, of course not. Then why'd you act so surprised? Well, you see, you're being a woman, I well, thought. Plenty of women locate claims. Well, they generally have partners, though. Mm, men partners. Yep. More fools, eh? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. What do I owe you? Her courtesy fee is one dollar. All right. Here you are. Now, you understand about assessment work... State law calls for $100 worth each year to be... I know all about that. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Folks have been known to lose legal right to a claim because they didn't do the necessary development work uh, or... Don't worry. I won't be losing my rights to this claim. I hope not. And now, uh, give me my change, will you? I'm in a hurry. Well, let's see. Uh, you handed me a five. Yeah. And here's one, two, three, four you get back. Haven't you got any real money? Why, well, that's... No, uh... I don't like that Los Angeles paper. I want silver. <laughs> All right, ma'am, whatever you say. Here you are. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Surprised she didn't bite him to make sure they was bona fide. Maybe she ain't got any teeth. What's that? Um, nothing, uh, nothing, ma'am. I, I was just talking to my partner here. Oh. Oh, hello, Eddie. Hello, uh, Ranger. Didn't recognize you. Hello, Jim. Uh, howdy. I'll be with you boys in a minute. Right. Just as soon as this lady is through. Yeah, I'm through now. Good day. Good day, madam. And good luck to the shoe fly. <laughs> <laughs> shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. I belong to Company G. <laughs> Gosh, what a charter. Hey, who is she, Jim? <laughs> I don't know. I never saw her before today. If you never see her again, it'll be too soon, huh? <laughs> well, I know two desert rats I am glad to see. Where you fellas been all this time? Oh, scratching around. Did you find anything? Uh, would we be here if we hadn't? Hey, you sound like old shoe fly. Uh, hey, now, you're here. <laughs> what have you located this time, boys? The lost gun sight? Hmm, maybe. It's silver, anyhow. And in the pyramids. Uh, here's a copy of the location notice. Well, yeah. let's see it. Hmm. Uh-huh. Notice hereby given to the undersigned of located 1,500 feet by 600 feet, main situated between between Tuber Canyon and Wild Rose Canyon in the Panamint Mining District. Hmm? Well, that's a funny thing. What is? Why, that's the same locality as where she just located her claim. Who? That woman who was just in here. You, you mean that... Oh, old shoe fly? Yes, sir. Well, I'll be darned. Are you sure? Well, here's the location notice she filed. Uh, let me see. Let's see. Situated south of Wild Rose Canyon. And north of Tuber Canyon. Now, that can't be any place but between the two. No. You're right. Neighbors, eh? <laughs> well, that'll make it nice. I don't think. <laughs> well, if we run out of butter and eggs, well, we can borrow from her. If we get lonesome evenings, why uh -uh. we... Remember the ladies' sentiments, boys. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. I belong to Company G. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Shoe fly, don't bother me. I belong to Company G. Well, the uh, hot weather set in about then. And Eddie and me quit the desert for several months. The time we was ready to go back and start work on our claim, we'd forgot all about our shoe fly neighbor till we was part way up the canyon. Hello. What's the matter? Uh, look at that. Huh? Where? Uh, that, that sign. Private property. Keep off. No trespassing. Penal code provision. Well, can you beat that? Uh, that ain't all neither. Look. A chain across the trail. Yeah. Uh. 
Just in case you can't read. Well, who in tarnation did that? Whoever it is ain't got no right to put a barrier up across this canyon. How do they think we're going to get up there to our property? No trespassing. Penal code provisions under Section 587 to 625. Is that a threat, do you reckon? It'll take more than that to scare me. Get up, Jerry. Wait a minute, Eddie. What are you going to do? Yeah, I'll ride right under it. Well, it's pretty low now. I don't think you can negotiate, not unless you unpack. Well, then we'll take it down. Is it padlock? Huh? Uh, no. Good. Well, I'll unfast it, and you can drive the burrows through. And You'll when... do nothing of the kind. Huh? Well, I'm the owner here. Nobody goes through without my say-so. Why, why it's her. A shoe fly woman. Oh. Oh, you know me, huh? Well, yes, of course. Well, we was in the county recorder's office the same time you was, uh, last June. And he blabbed to you, did he? No, 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 certainly not. Well, we couldn't help over here in the name of your claim, though. And its location and a few other important things. Well, we did... And now you come snooping around to see what I got. Oh, not at all, ma'am. We... Well, you won't have a chance to see nothing, because I'm letting nobody pass this chain. Yeah, but, madam, And we... if you try to force your way past, you'll get... Yes, hey, wait a, a minute. A gun. Yeah, slow to do, and I'm a good shot. Now, listen, man. You heard what I said. We go on, Vermoose. Well, let me explain. No back talk now. We ain't trespassers. No. No. Huh. Didn't look like it taken down that chain. We got a claim further up the canyon. Ah. Now, if you don't believe it, we'll show you the records. And we're on our way up there now. Not by this trail, you ain't. Yeah, but we... And that. Well, this is the only direct trail, ma'am. Yeah, to get up there from the other side, we'd have to go away to heck and back. Yeah, that's your funeral. Well, now, surely you wouldn't put us to all that time and trouble, ma'am. When... You see that chain, don't you? Well, yes, but... And you see that sign? Sure. And you see this gun. I don't know how I can make it any plainer to you, unless I... Hey, be careful. <laughs> hey, well, what do you mean, shooting at us like that? That's your starting signal. You... And you turn your outfit around and start down this trail, do you hear? And if you ain't on your way by the time I count ten, I'll shoot again. And this time I'll take good aim. But... One, two... Why, you... Three... Come on, Eddie, come on. There's no use one, arguing with it. The old sheep. Turn around, Kate. Six, uh, turn around. Go. Seven. Eight. Well, sir, that was the beginning of our troubles with our neighbor, Shoefly. Not only did we have to take a long, roundabout, difficult trail back and forth to our property, but whenever she got so much as a glimpse of us, she'd come a-stalking around with that gun of hers, taking occasional pot shots at us just to kind of remind us that she was still there. After a couple of months of this, we finally went to the sheriff and complained. It ain't just us, Sheriff. She's got all the prospectors in that region terrorized. <laughs> uh, you can laugh if you want to, but so one poor old woman's got you all, all you tough desert rats terrorized. Well, I'm surprised at you. Maybe terrorized is putting it a little bit too strong. Yeah, she's giving us all the willies anyway. <laughs> well, no, it's a fact, Sheriff. To say nothing of the inconvenience she's caused us. Yeah, she's got an idea we're trying to jump her claim. Whereas she's really the one who's claiming something that don't belong to her. What do you mean? Why, her property don't take in that canyon trail. Why, the boundary runs about 25 feet to the east of it. Are you sure? Absolutely. We've seen the location notice over at the recorder's office. Well, uh, have you explained this to her? Explained? Heck, we can't get within shouting distance of her without having her take a shot at her. Uh, crazy, most likely. Uh, she ain't crazy. She's just a honorary. In any case, ain't no use arguing with her. Well, I'll go up and talk turkey to her. Good. Well, you best take a posse with you, Sheriff. <laughs> I reckon I can tackle her single-handed. Hey, uh, you don't know shoe fly. <laughs> tell, me, tell me, is she there most of the time? All the time. Hey, every minute of the day and night. She never leaves the place. Yeah. Who's working the ground for her? I don't know. We never got close enough to see. <laughs> yeah, it's my guess she's doing the work herself. What makes you think so? Well, of course, I don't know who she'd ever find who'd be willing to work for her. The old porcupine. Well, now, Sheriff, if she <laughs> is doing it herself, she ain't getting very far. Her eyes are never off that trail for long. <laughs> well, you leave her to me. I'll go up there and talk to her. If she don't shoot you first. <laughs> <laughs> George, she has got you terrorized. Now, let's see. 
You say this property of hers is between Wild Rose and Super Cat. And so, a few days later, the sheriff started out from Independence eastward across the Argus Range and up into the Panamy. He found Shoefly looking for all the world like somebody's nice old grandmother sitting in a rocking chair knitting in front of her cabin. In her lap, though, under the knitting, lay a gun which she reached for as he rolled up. <laughs> Howdy. You can't get up the canyon this way, stranger. This is private property. The shoe fly, if I'm not mistaken. Right. You're the owner? I am. And you're the person I come to see. Uh, oh, shoe fly ain't for sale, mister. I'm hanging on to it, so you, you can turn right around and go back where you come from. <laughs> I'm not interested in buying your mine. Well, then what do you want? I happen to be the sheriff in your county. Oh, well, you can't scare me. No. No, I understand you're not exactly the timid type. Huh. Been hearing complaints about you lately from some of our citizens. Seems you're, uh, you're not behaving in a very friendly fashion toward you. Uh-huh. Get my property against claim jumpers. Nobody's trying to jump your claim, ma'am. Uh, they would if I give them half a chance. They think just because I'm a woman and an old woman, they can walk right onto my ground. If you're and... talking about the trail up the canyon, that don't belong to you. You see that sign, don't you? Yeah, sure. But that still don't make it yours. Your claim don't come within 25 feet of that trail. Why, listen, I located I know it. exactly what you located. Got the papers right here in my pocket. Oh. Now you've got to take that chain down from across the trail and let folks by. I'll do nothing of the That's kind. That's a public right away, and you can't block Shall it. I? Either you take that chain down, or I'll take you along with me back to Independence. Why, you can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I'm the sheriff of this here county, and I can arrest you and lock you up for 30 days or 60 days or whatever length of time the judge decides would be good for you. Uh, you're in league with them claim jumpers, I know. They want to get me away from here so they can take possession of the shoe fly. Now me. you're talking nonsense. Come on, come on. Let's see you take that chain down. Well, I... I don't like to arrest ladies, but if I have to... Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll take it down. Good. Sign's going to stay where it is, though. I have no objection to that. Uh, well, go ahead. Uh, chain padlock. I don't know if I can find the key. I'll wait till you do. I think maybe Ah Sing got it. Who's Ah Sing? Man that works for me. Oh, Chinaman, huh? Yeah. Where is he? Uh, he went down this morning with a load of ore. He, he won't be back till tomorrow sometime. Oh. Well, then I might as well make myself comfortable. You gonna wait? Yep. Not gonna budge till I see that chain down. Uh, he might have left the key in the cabin. Or, uh, it just might even be in your own pocket. Eh? Oh, no harm in looking, anyway. Hmm. Yeah, I thought so. Well, let me have it. I'll do the unlocking myself. Huh? Just as you say. Only be quick about it. I've got to get back to Independence today. Hmm. There. Now, you satisfied? I will be, if you keep it down. But just let me hear that you put that chain or any other kind of barrier up again. And I'll be paying you another call with a pair of handcuffs. You can't scare me. You nor nobody else. <laughs> All right, Pino. Come on, boy. Let's get going. Uh, there's nothing that walks on two legs can scare me, even if it does wear a badge. <laughs> Come on, Pino. Up this way. That's the boy. Easy now. Uh, we'll pay a call on the boys before we go back and tell them everything's fixed up fine. Trails open. Grandma's busy with her knitting. <laughs> hey, oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. Who fired that shot? I did. Why, you old... I, I seen a quail up yonder. I thought I'd bring it down for supper. Oh, you did, eh? Quail for supper. Man for breakfast, she means. I got a good mind to go back and... Oh, what's the use? Come on, Benno. Come on, boy. Oh, easy now. When the sheriff told us he'd put the fear of the law in old Shoefly, we had our doubts. And we soon found our doubts was justified. 
She didn't put the chain up again across the trail, but... It might just as well be there, Sheriff, for all we can get by. Why, she sits there in that rocking chair of hers and pops away at us with her gun and we so much as come within hailing distance. Oh, she don't ever hit you, though. Cause we duck. Oh, she wouldn't hit you anyway. It's just a, a gesture, this shooting. Why, she done the same thing to me the time I was up there. Oh, he didn't tell us about that. Well, wasn't worth mentioning. Mm, shot at you, did she? Well, she said she was aiming at a quail. And you let her get away with it? You're a fine sheriff. Why didn't you arrest her and throw her in jail? Well, yeah, because she's got him buffaloed like all the rest of us. No such thing. Then go and arrest her now. I would if I... Oh, I know there'd be an if. Now listen, fellas, I'll admit this shoe fly woman's an annoyance. Annoyance? She's a a menace. Uh, now, Eddie, come, come. Well, she really is a public nuisance, Sheriff. Well, we can't work our claim like it ought to be worked with, with her around. Yeah, she's driving everybody away from there. Well, I, I'd like to do something about it. And I will when I get the time to go over there again. But but you see, right now, i got some important business to attend to. That just it, Well, it just can't be put off. Mm. In the opposite direction, I suppose. Uh, up in Montana. Huh? Montana? Mm-hmm. Just got word this morning they caught the leader of the Bruce gang. You know, the fellas who robbed the First National. Sure. And they're holding him in view. Well, when are you leaving? Right away. And that means you'll be away a couple of weeks. Most likely. Gosh. When I get back, though, I'll do something about your friend Shoefly. I promise you. I'll go up there and tell her where to head in. If she hands me any back talk, I'll... But by the time the sheriff returned from Montana... There was no getting up into Wild Rose Canyon or getting down from there either. The first storm of the winter set in, and a bad one it was, too. For almost a week it snowed, and the wind blowed a gale. All we could do, Eddie and me, was to plug up the chinks in our cabin and thank our lucky stars we'd laid in a good supply of wood to keep us from freezing to death. Even after the storm had cleared, the drifts were so deep that it was, well, it was just about impossible to break any kind of a trail. So you can imagine our surprise one day as we were sitting playing checkers on an improvised checkerboard with the pieces of ore for men. Yes, your move. Hmm. Well, now, let me study this situation for a minute. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, if I move this feller, he'll jump me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, if I leave him where he is, where he'll take... Uh, it is somebody or not. Yes, it is. Get me in. My gosh, it sounds like... Uh, it is. Shoe fly. Yes. Thank the Lord you're here. That's great. Maybe you're gone, cleared out before the storm. No, we've been here right along. Come in, come in. Here, let me give you a hand. Well, if you hadn't have been here, I don't know what I'd have done. I couldn't have went back to to him. No, I couldn't. Pull that chair up for her, Eddie, by the stove there. All right. That's it. She's half frozen. Oh, take the cold that's making me shiver. It's... Yeah, how about some whiskey? No. Yeah, you'd better. No. It'll do you good, ma'am. That'll warm you up. Yeah, put new life into you. Uh, didn't do him no good. He just turned bluer and bluer. Who? I'll sing. Who? I'll sing. Chinaman is working for me. You ever see a Chinaman turn blue, mister? Well... Ain't blue exactly. It's it's green, uh, yellow and blue. That makes green, don't it? Well, what are you talking about? I sing. Well, is he sick? Dead. What? Dead. Yep. When? Where? Oh, four or five days ago. I last Tuesday, I think it was. Over at your place? Yep. Gosh. Yeah. What was the matter with him? I don't know. He took bed all of a sudden. The pains. I brought him into the shack and done everything I could for him, but he just got bluer and bluer. Then he had a convulsion and he died. Good Lord. Where is he now? Right where he died, of course. Where do you think? Right where he's been for the past five days and five nights. Laying on the bunk, just a staring and a staring. Well, now you'd best have some whiskey, man. No, no. After what you've been through, what? You stayed right there with him all this time? Uh, nothing else I could do. I couldn't get out with the blizzard raging and I couldn't put him out. No. Uh, I didn't have the nerve. Five days and five nights. 
snowed in with a corpse. Gosh. Uh, it was awful. The nights especially. Storm howling outside. Him laid out there, sir. So... Oh, I never knowed before what it is to be afraid. I've always said there was nothing in God's world could scare me. But when it ain't in this world, when it's something dead, stiff and staring... You take it easy uh, now, ma'am. Yeah. I try not to think about it. Well, as soon as the storm cleared, I got out. I knowed I couldn't make it all the way to Darwin, but I figured I might be able to make it up here to your place. I don't know how you ever did it with no trail, broke. You, you let me stay here, won't you? Why, of course. Sure. You just make yourself comfortable here for the night. In the morning, we'll all go back up to your place. Not me. All right, then. You can stay here, and Eddie and me will go over and tend to things. I'm never going back there. What? I'll never set foot on that ground again. You mean that you... I'm quitting. You, uh, you're going to sell out? Oh, sell out or just clear out. Uh, I'm all through with the shoe fly. Well, uh, I'm all through with the panamints in the desert. Hey, man. Oh, well, now, now, now. You, you, you may feel different later on. Well, I'm not waiting to find out. I'm going back to Idaho where I come from. Just as fast as I can get there. Well... <laughs> Well, I'll be. Say, hand me that there bottle, will you, Ranger? Yes, sir. The lady may not want a drink, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. Did uh, did our sing, uh, did he have a, a wife and children, ma'am? No, no family at all. Well, for a Chinaman, that's a calamity. He'll leave no descendants. Yes. Yeah. Well, I hereby appoint myself his descendant <laughs> by adoption. Uh, to bury him proper, uh, protect his effects, and uh, uh, set off the firecrackers in his honor at least uh, once a year. Uh, to our sing, my neighbor and revered ancestor. The program you've just heard is another true story of Death Valley Days. Presented for your enjoyment every Friday evening at this hour by the Pacific Coast Borax Company. Producers of 20 Mule Team Borax for household use. The 20 Mule Team Borax soap chips in the big blue and yellow sunshine box. For washing clothes and dishes. And Boraxo for toilet use. The discovery of Borax in Death Valley back in the 1880s was an event of far-reaching importance to industries as well as to each individual home in America. So great was the need for this gift of nature that men and mules endured untold hardship to bring the treasure out. The largest wagons ever made were created for the purpose, and strings of 20 mules were trained to answer to the jerk line and jump the traces in rounding the precipitous mountain trails safely with their great loads. So that's the story of where the trademark 20 mule team came from, and its presence on your box of soap chips is important to you, because it guarantees that 20 Mule Team Borax soap chips contain enough 20 Mule Team Borax to be of real benefit in cutting grease and grime, dissolving dirt, conditioning your water, whether it's hard or soft, and to make creamy, long-lasting suds. Next week, the old ranger plans to tell you about the telephone operator who had her finger on the pulse of Goldfield for 33 years. The artists featured in tonight's Death Valley Days program were Irene Hubbard, the Old Ranger, John McBride, Milton C. Herman, Frank Butler, and Jeffrey Bryant. This is George Hicks speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, the temperature does vary in the Argentine. A capillaris can be very warm if he's after a woman and very cold if he's out to kill a man you know of course that I'm married to Greg Collins the famous private detective I'm Gail Collins and I'll be back in a moment to set the stage for our puzzling crime it's a crime Mr. Collins tell me Senora Collins you mentioned the Argentine What's our story titled tonight? I call it The Chrome Yellow Death. Mmm, sounds exciting. Believe me, Jack, it was. 
Greg and I received an invitation to Los Colorados, just outside of Buenos Aires. Very wealthy tobacco magnate Tom McDougall owned an exquisite hacienda farther inland. In rather fetid, tropical, almost jungle area. He had known Greg a long time, and he'd asked us to fly down from San Francisco as his guests, including the plane fare. What especially intrigued Greg, though, was that instead of the usual come-and-visit-me note, the letter from McDougal hinted that there was some high jinx going on in Cruz Angelo. Anyway, we had left the airport and driven way inland to Tom's Hacienda, where the foreman greeted us. Bienvenido, senor y señora Collins. Welcome. I am Antonio Sebastian, senor McDougal's foreman. I will take the baggage, I think, no? Hello, Antonio. We haven't seen you in about five years, have we? No, senora. It is a pity. It is a shame. Where's Tom, Antonio? Out in the tobacco fields, I suppose. Ah, no, senor Collins. Uh, Senor McDougal, he never go near. He just let Antonio grow the tobacco. He stay here all the time. Uh, He will be here soon, I think. Uh, Would you like to make yourself comfortable? Uh, Yes. Here, I have prepared a daiquiri for you. Oh, it has well, Antonio. Antonio, make the best daiquiri in all Argentine. Uh, Thank you, Antonio. Well, salute. Salud y pesetas y amor, Antonio. Salud, senor y senora Collins. Mm. Mm. Sensational. Oh, I'm going to steal you from Tom, Antonio, just to have you in San Francisco. <laughs> we'll pay you twice what Tom does. And all you have to do is make the carry. Antonio. Antonio. Ah, there's Senor McDougal now. I'm here, senor, with your visitors, senor and senora Collins. They're here. I hadn't expected them so soon. Greg, my boy, and Gail, how are you both? We're fine, thanks, Tom. And you look a bit hot and bothered. Something wrong? Yes, a fire. Almost destroyed my tobacco crop. What is that? Oh, we got it out. But it was a pretty close thing. You were in the field, senor? Yes, Antonio. And something's very funny down there. I'll talk to you about that later, after dinner. Daddy! Oh, Lorna! Uh, Greg, Gail, you remember my daughter. Yes, of course. Oh, hello. Hi, oh, hello. Um, Daddy, did you tell me the truth? Do you swear you didn't hurt yourself putting out that fire? No. Have I ever lied to you, Lorna? Yes, often. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you something when we finish dinner, Greg. Huh? Uh, what's that, Tom? Something I found in my tobacco field. A rag soaked in kerosene. You found what, senor? A rag, Antonio, soaked in kerosene. Somebody started that fire deliberately. But why, Tom? I don't know, Gail. Something screwy is going on here, and I can't figure it out. Today, we had a brush fire. Last week, someone put poison in my wells. Antonio and I have watched and waited. We even notified the police. and had a few agents to police here, hanging around for a while. Anybody in these parts got it in for you, Tom? Oh, no, senor. Senor Tom, everybody love him. Everybody except Granite. Who's Granite? Jeppel lives about ten miles from here. Wild little fellow. He's an exporter. He's also a nut about Latin American culture. He collects things. Has about a dozen rooms full of Aztec weapons, Mexican novelties, Brazilian coins, all kinds of junk. What's he got against you? He wanted to buy this place. Of course, I wouldn't sell it to him. But you're wasting your time thinking it's Granite. He's clever. He wouldn't be pulling any of these stunts. They're too obvious for a man like him. Daddy, I still say you should sell and let's get out of here. I I hate this place. It's horrible. I can't sleep nice. Oh, please, senorita, do not cry. Hello, Lorna, darling. Oh, hello, Stuart. Greg, Gail, this is Stuart, my fiancé. Uh, hi, Stuart. Oh, oh, oh. You're just in time for dinner, Stuart. He's always just in time for dinner. Oh, now, Daddy, you've got to stop that. Young man... I'm among good friends, so I can speak freely. Someday, I'm going to take you by the seat of your pants and toss you up, once and for all. Look, MacDougall, you might as well get used to the idea that I'm going to marry Lorna. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. It is, eh? Why, you insolent... Daddy, young... please. We have guests. Uh, oh, oh, yes, eh? I'm sorry, Greg, uh, Gail. That's okay, Tom. Daddy's just in a bad mood because we've had some more trouble. I know. I heard about the brush fire. Mr. Granite told me. 
You know Mr. Granite Stewart? Yes. I work for him. I'm his foreman. Is he in town now? Yes, he is. And he's on his plantation. Now, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Collins, but you're on the wrong track. Mr. Granite isn't the only person in town who has a grudge against MacDougall. Stuart, don't start that again. Look here, Stuart. Oh, Senor Stuart, please. You know how you say exaggerate. Do I, Antonio? I began to see that Tom McDougall's beautiful hacienda was actually a very strange place. There was hatred and suspicion everywhere. But keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. After dinner, Greg and I took a stroll in the grounds. It was cool, the stars were out, and we stood by a long line of fountains that Tom had lit up with colored spotlights. Oh, aren't those fountains gorgeous, Greg? I know something much prettier. What? You, Chum. Oh, Greg. That's the first nice thing you've said to me for ages. Why aren't you romantic anymore? I know the next line, bub. It's about how marriage changes men and they take their wives for granted. But you do. Now, look, darling. Let's go up on that little balcony. You see it? Mm-hmm. The stars are shining right on it. Just see if I've forgotten how to be romantic. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Greg. Come on. The stairway's over here. Uh, Greg, look. Under that archway on the floor. It's Tom. He's fainted. Yeah, let me see him, Gail. What's that around his neck? It's a gimmick they call Las Bolas. Three strips of leather with three lead balls. But what's he doing with it? What's wrong with him? Las Bolas has one major purpose, Gail. And it's just served that purpose very well. You use Las Bolas to commit murder. The dead body of Tom McDougall sprawled on the colored tiles by the fountains in the starlight was a gruesome paradox. Greg leaned over, loosened those leather strips that were around Mr. McDougall's throat. It's quite a weapon, Gail. Used extensively in Argentine. These three lead balls are each at the end of a leather strip, see? An expert, and only an expert, can use Las Bolas. And he tosses it, sometimes from as much as 20 feet away. One ball knocks the victim unconscious. You see that bruise on Tom's head? Yeah. The other two wrap themselves around the throat, strangling the victim. Evidently, that's just what happened to Tom. We'd better call Antonio, don't you think? He can get the police. Antonio! Antonio! You call me, Senora Collins? Madre mia! Senor McDougal! Ah, Los Bolos! He, he's dead? He's dead? Yes, Antonio. Oh, Senor McDougal. Mr. Collins, Stuart and I wanted to ask you if... Daddy. Well, what's wrong with him? What's happened? Daddy! Your father is dead, Lorna. Oh, oh no. Easy, Lorna. Easy. Come with me, honey. Sit down over here. Did you find MacDougall's body just that way, Mr. Collins? Just this way, Stuart. Not five minutes ago. Recognize this yellow leather gadget? Yes. They call it Los Volos, don't they? Yes, they do. Take care of Lorna, Gail. I'll get someone to phone the police. You kill Senor McDougal. That is what I think, Senor Stewart. Shut up, you crazy fool. You hate him. You kill him. Where'd you get that idea? When you learn how to use Los Volos. Suppose I do know how. That doesn't mean I'd murder McDougal, does it? Please, please stop fighting this way. Daddy's dead. What good does it do to accuse each other? I think I can help, Lona. How? By going to the other plantation and talking to Granite. Stuart and Lorna stayed and waited for the police. Meantime, Greg and I got into a station wagon with Antonio and did 85 on those dirt roads till we reached Granite's plantation. Granite was a queer-looking duck, 
short, shabbily dressed, with very heavy glasses. He smoked small black cigars and peered at us behind a huge desk covered with paraphernalia. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Collins? I have some news for you, Mr. Grennett. Mr. McDougal is dead. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I loathe the man. A heart attack, I presume? No, no heart. Somebody kill him with Los Bolos. Well, then, he had the satisfaction of dying in a rather picturesque way. Uh, most of us aren't that fortunate. You wanted to buy Mr. McDougal's estate, didn't you? Oh, yes, indeed. I'm an exporter, Mr. Collins. The McDougal estate is by the waterfront, uh, has a ready-made landing. Uh, by the way, will you give Lorna McDougal a message for me? Yeah, what is it? Tell her I want to see her. See, it's very important. I'd never have persuaded her father to sell. He's very stubborn. Well, uh, somebody saved me a headache. Do not speak of the dead this way, Senor Grenard. You'll be punished. Senor, Senora Collins, please excuse me. Oh, where are you going, Antonio? I wait outside. I cannot speak to Senor Granite. If I speak to such a, how you say, man of the devil, poor Antonio will be punished himself. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, like most of the natives, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, Antonio is an illiterate fool, weaned on superstition. I'm sorry, Mr. Granite. I'm very fond of Antonio. You still haven't told me why you came here, Mr. Collins. You suspect me of murder, of course. But you must be incredibly naive to think that you could just walk in and have me hand you a written confession. I haven't accused you of murder, Mr. Granite. I'm just... shall we say... Gathering information. Let me help you. Would you like to look around my place? Most of my guests find it fascinating. I've dozens of rooms in which I've gathered Latin American curiosa. One entire room is filled with the remnants of the Mayan civilization. Oh, and uh, by the way, you'll see also a bolos, uh, which I know how to use. Uh, mine is painted green. What color was the one the killer used? Chrome yellow. Disturbing shade. I don't like it. Would you and your lovely wife care to follow me? I can describe the items in my collection as we go. Thank you, Mr. Gunnett. I'd rather not. Then may I offer you a drink? I have one of the largest wine collections in Argentine. I think we'd prefer to leave right now, Mr. Granite. Very well, Mrs. Collins, just as you say. My man tells me you came in your own station wagon, or I'd be happy to offer you a car... Uh, the front door is this way. Good night. Good night, Mr. Granite. Coming, Antonio? The station wagon is right outside, senor. I drove it around to the front. I... Oh, my head. I feel dizzy. I feel sick. Antonio, what's wrong? Oh, sick. Antonio feels sick. The drink there was... There was... Poison in the drink. Oh, what drink? Uh, Try to talk, Antonio. What drink? Say no, Grana. Man, he give me drink while I wait out here. Oh. Oh, oh. Antonio! He's been poisoned. I resent the accusation, Mrs. Collins. Antonio may be ill for half a dozen reasons, but certainly not because of anything he was served in my house. Uh, I'll call a doctor. You'd better call a doctor, and quickly, too. If Antonio dies, you'll have killed him. I'll have the physician come over at once. Don't excite yourself, Mrs. Collins. Antonio! Oh, he's so cold, Greg. And his eyes... Gail, we've got to leave Antonio in Granite's hands. But we can't. We must. Why? We've got to get to Lona McDougal. Bring her back here as soon as possible. We drove to the Hacienda, picked up Lorna, and made all speed back to Granite's place. As we walked through the huge entrance... Across the tiled floor. Look, there's Antonio. How are you, Antonio? Better, Signora. Mr. Granat did not send for the doctor. He didn't. Well, where is he? I'll tell him. I he think... took good care of Antonio. Got me these blankets. Put me on the sofa and gave me a drink. Antonio, better. See, Greg. Granite got a little too ambitious. He knew he couldn't let Antonio die right in front of our eyes. Where is he, Antonio? In that room, senor. He went in there. I think. Antonio, not sure. Antonio fell asleep. 
All right, Lorna. You know what to do. Go into that room? That's right. Tell Greenwich you want to know exactly what he has to say, why he wanted to see you. And don't be afraid of him. Remember, we'll be right outside the door. What are you doing? Uh, don't worry, Antonio. Just relax. Go on, Lorna. Through that door. Stand over there, Gail. So Granite can't see you when she opens the door. Ready, Mr. Collins? Ready. Open the door. Well? See him, Lorna? No. No, he's not here. I don't see him anywhere. I... What is it? In the corner of the room. Mr. Granite. He's dead. Lost boldness. Mr. Granite was lying in the corner of his room with a yellow leather bolus wrapped around his neck. His face twisted in agony with a horrible purple tinge from strangulation. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. Greg had examined the body and called for the police. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. You've had more than your share, Lorna. I don't understand it, Greg. All this time, I've been thinking that Mr. Granite was... The killer? Well, I was on that trail for a while myself, Gail, but... Mr. Collins, Mrs. Collins. Oh, there's Stuart. What are you all doing? What? Oh. Mr. Granite. He's dead, Stuart. Died the same way Tom McDougal did. Mm-hmm. Lost the wallace, huh? Where'd you come from, Stuart? I work here, Mrs. Collins. I told you that before. I'm Mr. Grant's foreman. Antonio, is this the man who gave you the drink? Drink? What's wrong with Antonio? No. Senor Granite has houseboy. You know, I think we could wash this up even before the police get here. The police? Now, if you'll calm down for a second, Lorna, and answer a question or two. Please, please, no more questions. Not about Daddy, anyway. I can't talk about that, please. Now, take it easy, Lorna. Sit down. <laughs> have a cigarette. I'm sorry I only have these native cigarettes. Oh, no, no, thank you. I, I only smoke American brands. Anybody else? Antonio. I bet you could use one. Oh, uh, thank you, Senor Collins. That is what Antonio need. Calm the nerves, I think. Why don't you take the chair in the corner, Stuart? I'm sure we'd all stop screaming at each other if we could get at the truth. Back. Never mind the psychological approach, Mr. Collins. All this cozy business doesn't impress me at all. Get to the point. Oh, I will. Yes, Stuart, I will. If I can get everybody to cool off. Uh, how about you? Uh, smoke? All right. I'll take one. <laughs> What's in this cigarette? It's marijuana. What? Greg, did you say marijuana? That's right, Gail. The killer smokes marijuana, and he... You are very much smarter than I thought, Mr. Collins. Antonio! Get out of my way, Mrs. Stop, Collins. Stop him! He'll get out through the window. Greg, the ball is on the wall. Give it to me. Here. Watch out, Antonio. I'm going to throw it. No. No, don't throw it. Oh, my legs. My legs. You're lucky, Antonio. I decided to wrap it around your legs and take you alive. You're lucky I didn't give it to you in the throat the way you did with MacDougall and Granite. After they took Antonio away and we said goodbye to Stuart and Lorna... We decided to finish our vacation in Caracas, Venezuela. As we waited in the airport. All right, Greg. Start from the beginning about Antonio. And tell me slowly. Because I'm not in a very bright mood. Well, it isn't complicated at all, Gail. When Antonio collapsed... After he said he'd been poisoned, a packet of cigarettes fell out of his pocket. I recognized them. They were marijuana cigarettes. 
Uh, that gave me a hunch. And when we went back to pick up Lorna, I had a look at the tobacco growing there on the outskirts of the McDougal plantation. It was marijuana. But what's that got to do with it? Uh, don't you see? I clinched it. Antonio, when we first met him, said McDougal never examined his plantation at all. He left it to his charming foreman, Antonio. Then if you knew it was Antonio... Well, I, I wasn't absolutely positive, Gail. Until I purposely offered those cigarettes to Lorna, Stewart, and Antonio. And of course, all they knew was that I had a native pack. Lorna refused them. They made Stewart sick. But Antonio enjoyed them. I know the rest. I can fit the pieces together as well as you can. Antonio was probably growing the marijuana way out near the jungle where McDougal wouldn't notice it. Yeah, that's right. Antonio not only smoked the awful stuff, but well, probably sold it at a terrific profit. He poisoned the wells and started the brush fire because he wanted to jinx the place. He didn't want anyone to buy the plantation. They might find out his secret. But McDougal must have stumbled across the stuff, so... Antonio killed him. That's the deal. Then, to throw suspicion off himself, he slipped himself a mickey in Granite's house. But Granite, who was a very sharp apple, must have guessed Antonio was faking. So, Granite had to get the Bolas treatment, too. Left call for flight 63 to Caracas. Greg, yes. darling, when we get to uh, Caracas, you owe me something. Yeah? Uh, what is it? A balcony in the starlight. Uh -huh. You were going to show me that even though we've been married for a few years, you could still be romantic. You were going to recite poetry and give me flowers and... Oh, no, girl. Oh, no. Oh, not me. I don't get romantic with all that icky stuff. But, Greg, when we do get to that balcony with gardenias all around it. The stars are out. And we're alone. What will you do? Hmm? Oh, I'll think of something. Well, folks, Gail and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Chrome Yellow Death. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Collins. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Our detective friend, Mike Shane, solves most of his cases by a combination of clues, shrewd thinking, and daring action. But he's also a great student of criminal files and case histories of famous crimes. This morning, Mike is at his desk, deep in study of the latest exploit of another well-known detective, Mr. Dick Tracy, when suddenly Mike's useful and very ornamental associate, Phyllis Knight, opens the office door. Psst! Mike! Mike! Hmm? Huh? Uh, yes, Angel? Hide that funny paper. There's a client in the waiting room. Oh, just when I was getting to the... Come on, come on. Okay, okay, show him in. Uh, Mr. Shane will see you now, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> this is Mr. Shane, Mr. Nelson Carter. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Won't you sit down, sir? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Mr. Shane, I'll have to be very brief. I'm an attorney, and I'm on my way to see a client. It's, uh... It's about him, about Mr. Dixon, that I've come here. Mm hmm I see. The situation is so uh, fantastic, really, I'm afraid Mr. Dixon's life is in peril. I fear for him. I really do. Is it a case that the police department should handle, Mr. Carter? Well, no, no. I, I don't see how the... 
Mr. Shane, three days ago when Gregory Dixon walked into my office, I, I screamed in terror. I almost fainted. Fainted? But, but Yes. What? Two months ago, we had buried Mr. Dixon. Oh, you had buried Mr... What? Yes. Oh, oh yes, it was a perfectly proper funeral. Hmm. Well, I thought I was seeing his ghost. We'd received word that Mr. Dixon was killed in an accident down in Mexico, in Yucatan. Imagine, imagine my consternation. Here he walked into my office while I'm administrating his estate. Uh Uh-huh, that would make anybody do nip-ups. Yet you say you buried him. Oh, it was a mistake, a horrible mistake. Oh. Somebody died in Yucatan. They thought it was Mr. Dixon. The coffin was shipped to Mr. Dixon's cousin. We held the funeral and I was appointed administrator of the estate. But, uh, uh, just a minute, sir. You started off by telling us Mr. Dixon's life is in danger. Yes, his heirs have received his bequests. Now, they'll have to refund the money. And, uh, <clears throat> well, with all respect for Mr. Dixon's relatives, I must say several of them are extremely unsavory. Well, that's no reason for thinking that they will uh, try to kill him. Well, I think there's every danger they will, Mr. Shane. One of his cousins came into my office yesterday. He was absolutely furious because he was cheated out of his inheritance. Hmm? He asked me about Mr. Dixon's health and how long I thought he might live and so So you on. want us to protect your client? Yes. Now, I'm going out to his house right now. I... I'd like you to come along and talk to Mr. Dixon. Well, I would rather prevent a murder than solve one. Then you will come with me? Yes, Mr. Carter, we will. Well, well, Carter, you're an old worrywart. A good attorney, but an old worrywart. Now, now, Mr. Dixon, you don't appreciate the serious danger which you're in. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, feel that I'm a man about to be murdered? Well, we really don't know, sir. You see... I uh... can understand Carter's feelings. He doesn't want to have to probate your will a second time. Every time you die, you make more work for the poor man. <laughs> Clarence, than you heard. <laughs> As I was coming in from the garden. I'm Clarence Fisher, Mr. Dixon's cousin. How do you do, Mr. Fisher? How do you Fisher? do? Of course, Carter may be right. I'm worth considerably more to you, Clarence, dead than alive. I can talk like that to Clarence. He's got a fine sense of humor. Not like his cousin Howard. Howard is sober as a judge with a toothache. Assuming Mr. Dixon's life is in danger, who would be the most likely suspect? Why, several. Before I left the office, I made a list of Mr. Dixon's beneficiaries. It, uh, well, if you care to read it now, I... Thank you, sir. Clarence Fisher. Oh, that's me. Oh, yes. Uh, bequest uh, $10,000. Howard Connell, 20000 William A. Wilkinson, 25000 And a farm at Redwood City. Various charities, 200000 Mm-hmm, I see. Apparently, Mr. Carter's modesty made him omit his own bequest to the tune of $25,000. Well, uh, <clears throat> but uh, after all, uh, surely I couldn't be a suspect. You know, there's one thing which puzzles me and which none of you gentlemen has explained. Mr. Dixon is here alive and well. But, uh, who is buried out in the cemetery? You know, I've wondered about that myself. You see, when I was down in Yucatan, I fell ill of a fever. I'm still about 30 pounds underweight. It ruined my eyes, and I had to get glasses. But that's beside the point. When I got up from my sickbed, I found my wallet had been stolen. So had most of my papers. I assume the thief was later killed. Uh, suppose somebody down in Yucatan received orders to kill Mr. Dixon. Suppose the person who did the killing, or uh, ordered the killing, now realizes that a mistake was made. Yes, he may try again. Mm, That's a grave thought, and no pun intended. May I ask who received the coffin here? Uh, Mr. Dixon's cousin, Howard Connell. Actually, the body was not buried. It was interred in the mausoleum. We followed the instructions in Mr. Dixon's will. Say, you brought up a good point, Phyllis. If we could find out whose body's in that coffin, it just might be a clue. We might even find out if the man had been murdered. Yeah, and if it were murder, we would know definitely that Mr. Dixon is in real danger. Well, then I suggest you have the body exhumed, if that's possible. It is possible, Mr. Dixon. I'll ask the inspector of homicide to use his influence with the coroner's office. Sometimes dead men tell very interesting tales. Think of a lot of things I'd rather do, Mike Shane, than visit a mausoleum. Yes, but we'll make it as short as possible, Angel. Now, let's see. According to the superintendent, it should be down this next corridor. All right. Hello. Mr. <laughs> Shane, Miss Knight. Oh, hello there, coroner. Mike, I'd like to know what's going on around here. What's wrong? Take a look in the coffin. There... 
There's no body in it. You're right, Angel. Nothing but gunny sacks and granite rocks. Mike Shane and Phyllis have dropped in at police headquarters to talk over their problem with the inspector. With them is Nelson Carter, their client's attorney. The whole situation is completely screwy, Inspector. A man is reported dead. Uh His coffin arrives from Mexico. He has a funeral. His property's divided. Two months later, the fellow turns up alive and kicking. And his coffin is filled with gunny sacks and granite rocks. It's a new one on me, kids. Unless this Gregory Dickler think he was dead. Well, then why would he come back at all, Inspector? He almost lost all his money and property. Uh Well, I don't see you need worry, Mike. Dixon is alive, but there's no corpse in the coffin. Nobody's dead. No, but it's got our curiosity up, Inspector. You know, Mike and I do handle other cases besides murder. This time we've drawn a completely wacky mystery. Well, you can make light of it, Miss Knight. But since finding that empty coffin, I'm more convinced than ever that there's something diabolical afoot. All right. Diabolical what? It's only three days since anybody knew Mr. Dixon was still alive. Several of the heirs would stop at almost nothing to hold on to their inheritances. You said that before, Mr. Carter. Now, let's see, you gave me a list of the bequests. Uh, which man stormed into your office yesterday? The uh, uh, one who wanted to know how long you thought Dixon might live? Yes, that was Wilkinson. William A. Wilkinson. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's listed here for $25,000 in a farm near Redwood City. Yes, he's living there right now. He was furious because he left to turn the farm back to Mr. Dixon. And then this Howard Connell. He's down for $20,000. Uh, what about him? A cousin of Mr. Dixon. He gambles, plays the horses, will do anything to keep out of work, and can't hold a job anyway. Well, I suppose we might interview those men. Though I don't know what we could ask them. No crime's been committed. Well, you won't be able to get hold of Howard Connell. He left for New York after Mr. Dixon's funeral. Well, we might start him with a little talk with Clarence Fisher, the uh, cousin we met in Dixon's house. Uh, If I were doing it, Mike, I know where I'd begin. Yeah? Where, Inspector? Well, you say Cousin Wilkinson lives on a farm near Redwood City. Yes? Well, it's a very pleasant sunny day outside, and twice as pleasant down country. I know a tidy little inn on King's Road west of Redwood City. They serve swell hamburgers, and there's a cute little Irish waitress with a green apron. Ah, oh, <laughs> say no more, Inspector. Say no more. You've sold us one trip to Redwood City. <laughs> If you don't mind, Mr. Shane, we'll sit and talk under this apple tree. Uh, Got to keep my eye on Alec, the hired hand. Laziest man you've ever seen. Whatever you wish, Mr. Wilkinson. Oh, an old-fashioned hammock. That's for me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, when I got Carter's letter about Dixon being alive, I couldn't believe my eye, so to speak. Sort of upset my plans for the future. By the way, it's sort of a warmish day. You folks like a drink? Uh, you, Phil? Huh? Not now, thanks. Maybe some water later on. Well, we'll make it apple cider. Water here doesn't taste right to me. Dixon just got done putting in pipe water, bricked up the old well over there, and went modern on it, so to speak. Uh, what did you folks say you came down here about? Uh, we didn't say, sir. Mr. Carter seems to think Mr. Dixon's in some sort of danger. Now, we'd like to ask you if he has any enemies who might, uh... Carter? I told that lawyer yesterday... Well, I guess maybe he repeated it to you, Mr. Shane. You can see this is a very nice little farm, and I was expecting to make myself a piece of money off it, so to speak. Handing it back to Dixon now is going to hurt like pulling eye teeth, so to speak. Maybe you could buy it back from Mr. Dixon. Did he make much use of the farm? Oh, spent all of his weekends down here, and I haven't got the cash to buy it from him. Mr. Wilkinson, you say that Dixon bricked up the water well? Uh, yes, he did it a couple of months ago. Left it in an unsightly mess. Alec cleaned it up for me, dug a new rose garden, and shoveled the dirt down in the well. Quite a number of stones missing from the coping around the well. Oh, Mike, I know what you're driving at. Yeah, You and I, Angel, have seen those stones before. The identical size and shape in a coffin in a mausoleum. Water. Water, I've broken through. My... Mike, can you hear me? Mike, have you found anything? Yeah. Yeah, plenty. A body. (laughs) 
Germany. Germany Christmas, Mr. Wilkinson. This is bad. Awful bad. Oh, stop your jaw, and Alec. You make me nervous. Mr. Wilkinson, do you know whose body this is? Of course not. How do you suppose I could tell? Mike, there's a ring on one of his fingers. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A gold ring. The band's in the shape of a snake. There. Let me look at it. Mean anything to you, sir? No. This hole in his head means something to me. He was murdered. Mike, we'd better get hold of the inspector. Yeah. Yes, we're heading back to San Francisco and pick up the inspector, and then... Yeah? Then we're going to have another talk with Mr. Dixon. Say, when I suggested that you kids take a little run down country, I didn't expect you to come tearing back to me with a body. Oh, and now that we've found it, the question is, whose body is it? Yes, and until we know that answer, we're not going to spill the news to Dixon. Remember that, Angel. All right. We've got to tiptoe very cautiously. There's Dixon, out in the garden, talking to Mr. Fisher. Yes. Look, Inspector, if you don't mind, I'll do most of the questioning. Mm -hmm. We've got to approach Dixon downwind. Suits me. Night. I was wondering what had become of you. We uh, brought along a friend of ours, Mr. Dixon, the Inspector of Homicide. Inspector of Homicide? Yes. You see, if anybody should succeed in killing you, this is the man who will lose his sleep over. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to know you, Inspector. And may your slumbers be unbroken. Uh, this is my cousin, Clarence Fisher. Well, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, suppose we go into the house so we can sit down. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Dixon, we just got back from a little drive down to Redwood City. We talked with another of your cousins. William Wilkinson. That's so? Hates to give up the farm, doesn't he? Oh, very much. He's put in a new rose garden. We noticed that the old water well behind the house has been bricked up. Oh, really? Wilkinson changing things around his suit, huh? Then... then you didn't fill in the well yourself? Me? Why, no. Why should I? Uh... Mr. Dixon. Yes? Did you have any people visit you down on your farm from the, uh, the, the past few months? Oh, a few... Howard Connell, Clarence here, Wilkinson, old fuss budget Carter, and a few others. I see. Well, sir, if I'm to properly protect you, I'd like to know what those people look like. Do you have any photographs? Photographs by the hundreds. I've got a scrapbook of snapshots. It's right over there on the wicker table. Here, uh, this what you want? Oh, that's perfect. How about this uh, group picture here? Oh, that's me wearing the straw hat. Girl, really? Yeah, uh, girl's Joan Brooks. Uh, the man behind, I, I can't remember his name. No, I can't either. Some chap was on his way to Canada. Uh, the last fellow on the far right is Howard Connell. Howard Connell. He's hmm. the cousin who's gone to New York, isn't he? That's right. Last time I saw Howard was when he drove me to the airport when I went to Mexico. Does he live in San Francisco? Uh, right next door. I'm living in his house till he gets back. And when will that be? Well, I can't say. He left for New York right after Dixon's... Well, funeral. The last letter I got from him didn't mention when he'd be back. Hmm. He was one of the beneficiaries under Mr. Dixon's will. I should think he would stay here in town. Oh, not Howard. He's always on the move. No telling where he is now. Here's another photo of you in the scrapbook, Mr. Dixon. A close-up. You're wearing a large, rather peculiar-looking ring. Why, yes, yes. I lost that ring some time ago. Lost it? Hmm. Have you uh, any idea where? Why, no. It just uh, slipped off my finger one day. No idea where I lost it. But I don't see what that matters. Hey, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, thanks very much for letting us see the pictures, Mr. Dixon. And now we'll be running along. Oh, but Mr. Shane, you were hired to protect me. You're always running off somewhere. We're working on the case, sir, I assure you. In fact, we're going to police headquarters right now, just on your account. <laughs> Now, this is the way I dope it out, Inspector. Check me if I'm wrong. Okay. First of all, we may be up against a colossal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The attorney Carter comes to Phyllis and me and says Dixon's life is in danger. Because Dixon was reported dead and now turns up alive and his heirs hate to part with their ill-gotten gains. Then we find that Dixon's funeral was a fake. Yeah. We find his coffin filled with stones from Dixon's own water well, and we find a murdered man hidden inside the well. And that murdered man, Inspector, I'm convinced is the real Gregory Dixon. The fellow who says he's Dixon is an imposter. Yeah, I know what you base that on, Mike. The fact that the ring on the dead man's finger is the same ring we saw in Dixon's photograph. Correct. But perhaps the ring really was lost, and the person who later found the ring is the man you hauled out of the well. Well, that's possible, Inspector, but I'd like to go one step further. 
I'll say that the man who calls himself Gregory Dixon is actually Howard Connell, Dixon's cousin and beneficiary. I was beginning to suspect that myself. Connell very conveniently disappears on a trip to New York. Nobody knows exactly where he is or when he's coming back. But Dixon's relative ought to be able to recognize the fake unless they're all in on the deal, too. That may be, too. But there was a strong family resemblance between Dixon and Connell. Mm -hmm. I noticed it in those photographs. Mm -hmm. That's why the story about Dixon falling ill, losing 30 pounds, having to put on glasses. An alibi in case anybody began to suspect. Okay. But who killed Dixon, Phil? Mm. Who threw his body down the well and bricked it up? Both Wilkinson and Con Connell denied they closed the well. Yes, Sergeant? Mr. Shane's call to Redwood City is waiting, sir. Thanks. Take it on this phone, Mike. Thanks, Inspector. Hello? Hello, Alec? You calling me, Mr. Shane? Yes, uh, I want to ask you a question, Alec. How long have you worked for Mr. Wilkinson? Why, about a month or so. Mr. Wilkinson hired me when he took over the farm. And uh, when you were making the new rose garden for him, Alec, did you dump all that dirt down the well? Yes, sir. The well was bricked up anyway. I didn't see no harm. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Alec. Well, Wilkinson told us the truth. Yeah. The well was bricked up when he got the farm. Well, then Dixon, I, I mean, Connell lied to us. Practically everything he told us was a lie, Angel. Well, Inspector, what do you say? You make out a pretty strong case, Mike. But we don't have any real proof that Howard Connell killed Dixon and then took his place. Don't worry. We'll get the proof. Okay. I'll take your word for it, Mike. Let's go out and pick up Connell. Mr. Shane, Inspector, I just telephoned for you. Phoned? Why? What for? The very thing I hired Shane to prevent. It's happened. What are you talking about? You don't mean to tell yes, me... Yes, I do mean to tell you. Mr. Dixon is dead. At the home of the late Gregory Dixon, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have found another body. The body of the man whom they were about to arrest. The dead man lies sprawled in the bushes directly beneath an open window on the second floor. Well, I don't understand. He fell from the window. We, we heard him fall. Mr. Wilkinson, what are you doing in San Francisco? I just got here from Redwood City. Carter and I came out to talk to him. Inspector, take a look at the man's head. Yeah, I see. A deep gash in the back of the skull. He must have hit his head on a rock. Hold on, hold on. Here's something else. A revolver in his coat pocket and a sheet of paper. It's a note. A typewritten note. To the authorities. I cannot go on. You know the truth by now. I killed Gregory Dixon. Then a typewritten signature. Howard Connell. Connell. Then it's true. I, I I can't believe it. Good heavens. So he committed suicide. All right. Suppose you all tell us what happened. Starting with you, Mr. Fisher. Well, I was next door in my house. Wilkerson and Carter rang my doorbell and asked if Dixon, uh, I mean Connell, had gone out. Yes, we'd been pounding on his door and got no answer. Yes. I was sure he was in, so I came over with them and let them into the house with my key. Wilkinson was all excited. He said he had some terrible news. He said the real Gregory Dixon was dead, and we'd all been tricked. How did you know that, Mr. Wilkinson? Yes, we just discovered that for ourselves, but you never told us. I, well, when I saw that body from the well and the ring on his finger, I recognized it. You told us it meant nothing to you. I know, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I wanted time to think it out. Then I drove up to the city and, and, and told Carter. I thought Wilkinson was crazy. I phoned Dixon, I mean Connell, and told him we were coming right out. I still couldn't believe it. That's why I jumped all over you, Mr. Shane, for letting the man get killed. I didn't know it was suicide and that he was a fake. Believe me, I didn't. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But uh, to get on, uh, what happened after you three were in the house? Well, Wilkinson was trying to tell me his discovery, and Carter was arguing with him. Connell wasn't downstairs, so I went up and called him. He shouted from the bedroom that he'd be down in a minute, and I went back to the living room and started asking Wilkinson questions. He told me about the ring. Yes. And we kept waiting and waiting. The living room windows were open, and I complained about the cold wind blowing in. Fisher went over and started to close the windows. He shouted, and we heard Connell crash to the ground. I saw the body falling past the window. Connell must have known he was trapped. He couldn't face us. Those open windows on the second floor, are they in Connell's bedroom? Yes. Now, let me get this straight. 
All three of you men were in the room when Connell fell. Yes, yes, sir. Right. That's uh-huh. right. Okay. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I'll ask you to step indoors for a few minutes. We want to examine the ground around here before you trample all over everything. Oh, yes. All right. All right. All right, kids. I know what you're thinking. Yes. One or more or all three of them are lying. Mm-hmm. It was not suicide. It was deliberate murder. Right, Mike. That bedroom window is less than 20 feet from the ground. Ten to one, that fall wouldn't kill a man. If Connor was really planning suicide, he wouldn't take that chance. He'd do it properly. Right. And he wouldn't be so cagey about writing his signature on the, the note uh, on the typewriter. Well, I can't believe he got that deep gash in the back of his skull from hitting one of these rocks. Well, they're not much bigger than pebbles. If you ask me, Angel, that gash was made by the butt of his revolver. One terrific blow. Then the gun was stuck in his pocket. Kids, I'm worried. We know it's murder, but hang it, with those three guys swearing they were all in the room together... We're going to have a devil of a time proving a case against any one of them. Yes, yes, but remember the old rule, Inspector. When all suspects have alibis, none of them have alibis. We've just got to get in and do some good head work. Well, while you're about it, maybe you can explain one thing to me. Huh? Explain what, Phil? Look, these rose vines. Rambling rose vines cover the whole side of this house, clear up to the roof, you see? And yet when you look at Connell's suit, there isn't a single tear or a snag... There's not even a broken rose petal on his clothes. Well, that could be because he jumped or was thrown clear of the vines. Well, then how could his body fall right against the foundations of the house? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The upstairs windows and the downstairs windows both open outwards. That's it, Angel, you've hit it. You're darn right she's hit it. Absolutely, Inspector. Now we've got some business indoors. was killed. Murder? Murder? Why, that's impossible, Mr. Shane. We were all here in the living room. We all saw the body fall. Of course you saw it fall, but Howard Connell was already dead. And he did not fall from the second floor. He did not fall? I'll uh, show you what happened, gentlemen. Now, when you three men were here in the living room, these windows were open. They were open outwards. The body was laid across the tops of both halves of the window. When Mr. Wilkinson complained of the cold, Mr. Fisher closed the windows. That took the support away from the body, and you saw Connell fall past the window. Why, that's idiotic. I'd have seen the body. You did see it, Mr. Fisher. You put it there. You killed Connell with the butt of that revolver. You murdered him because you had helped Connell impersonate Dixon. You were in the deal with him. No. No, he tricked me, too. No, Mr. Fisher. You told us that you'd gotten a letter from Howard Connell in New York. Connell never went to New York. He was right here. All right. All right, I admit it. I killed Connell when I discovered he'd murdered Dixon. He murdered my cousin. That sounds like a very lame attempt to plead the unwritten law. But that was not your reason. You killed Connell because you knew we were closing in on him. You knew Connell couldn't take it. You knew Connell would confess and that he would tie the noose around your neck, too. But I'm afraid that you've done a perfect job of that yourself, Mr. Fisher. Well, how about it, Inspector? Why uh, so quiet, Angel? What are you thinking about? Hmm? Oh, I was just thinking about that whole fantastic scheme. What a cockeyed motive. Yeah, but it almost worked, Phil. Connell and his cousin Fisher saw a way to get a hold of all of Dixon's money, instead of just the amounts he intended to leave them in his will. First, they had to kill Dixon, get his estate distributed, then bring Dixon back to life. All the heirs and beneficiaries would then have to return their bequest to him. Ah, and Connell and Fisher would have the whole estate for themselves. Well, I've heard of killing a man for his money, but never bringing him back to life to get his inheritance. When I see a case like that, I'm almost glad I haven't got any money. Poor but honest and alive. Mm Mm-hmm. Money is the root of all evil. I'll still take plenty of the root. Mm. The uh, correct quotation, honey, is the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, Yes, it's the, uh, the love that causes the trouble. Oh, love. Well, I'll take plenty of that, too. (laughs) (laughs) 
Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for Union Oil Company and reminding you once again to get your application for your Union Oil credit card this week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down? Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you are still using old-fashioned hair tonics, or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Sure. Why are you so nervous? Oh, nothing, nothing, really. I'm just glad to see you, dear. Oh, I'm glad to That's see you. That's all. Come on, out with it. What are you hiding behind your back? Well, it's, it's a surprise, Sam. So you just run along into your office and I'll be right with you. Surprise, huh? Let me think. Uh, Father's Day? No, surely not. Oh, no, Sam, no. It's just as regards our shortage of office supplies. I do hope you'll be able to mince your words. That's all that junk you got stuffed in between the pages of your notebook. Where? Oh, oh, well, Sam, you see, improvisation is a child of necessity. So, uh, to stretch our supplies, I just cut up some old strips of waste paper in case we run out of a genuine. Well, well, very ingenious. Uh, shall we commence? Hmm? Yes, but not too many corrections, Sam. I'm afraid this eyebrow pencil might not last. Well, don't bear down on it. Uh, where was I? No place, Sam. Uh, date, uh... I already have that, Sam. Oh, uh, this one goes to... Hey. Yes, Sam? The calendar, where is it? Calendar? Which calendar, Sam? You know perfectly well which calendar. It's been hanging there on the wall for three years. The one from Harold's Club in Reno. Oh, that old calendar. It was out of date anyway, Sam. That calendar was timeless. It was not, Sam. It was vulgar. That's a lie. I met the girl who posed for it. In more modest circumstances, I hope. Put it back. No, not Sam, don't. F, what did you do with that calendar? You mustn't excite yourself, Sam. Let me see that notebook. Yes, Sam. Uh-huh. Old waste paper, indeed. An art treasure mutilated, and for what? To serve your own base purposes. <laughs> Just because you were too absent-minded to order a few office supplies. But I frequently alluded to our dwindling resources, Sam. But no, 
You were too proud. Take these and put them in a safe place. You can put it back together with scotch tape on your own time. Oh, we're out of scotch tape, Sam. We've got a first aid kit, haven't we? We used to. Use the adhesive. Date, June 19, 1949. I won't soon forget that. <laughs> Two, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Uh, subject, the Apple of Eve caver. Dear Dundee. <laughs> The start of it was yesterday when Eve Adams first walked into my office. She was angry and she was terribly, terribly hurt. In fact, she had a shiner, a swollen jaw, and somebody had bitten her on the arm. And furthermore, she had the audacity to suggest that there was something shady between I and Mr. Hagen when it is an item of public information that her and Gort Hagen was washed up practically before they started. And I might just add in passing... Uh, just a minute, Miss Adams. You say this girl came to your apartment in a jealous rage and attacked you without provocation. None whatsoever. I never opened my trap to her except to remind her that it would have been a blessing to the human race if her old man had never met her old lady. And if she thought those three layers of pan cake on her puss could fool a blind man as to her true age, and seeing as what her mouth was, she should never open it for fear of what might come out. <clears throat> I see. And a girl's name? Down at that flea bag where she works, she's built as Dream of Love. And is she ever a nightmare? Dream of Love. That's uh, D-R-E-A-M-A? It says there. But I do not intend to take this episode lying down on my chin, Mrs. Bates. Why, if it had not been for the timely arrival of my concertee, that cheap nail would have brained me with my own gin bottle. I see. Landlady broke it up. And you say uh, she threatened to return with a gun and blast you if you continued seeing Mr. Hagen. That is a fact. And she is just cheap enough to try some low trick like that. Mm hmm. And uh, what do you want me to do, Miss Adams? I want you should pay a formal call on that dame and tell her that upon the very next occasion of any violence or threats thereof out of her, I'm going to yell cop. In fact, Mr. Spade, I am placing my life and limbs in your hands, and if you are anything of what you're cracked up to be, you will have no difficulty in giving that creepy crow the bums rush straight out of my life. Uh, pardon me, Miss Adams. My secretary seems to be calling me. Out of my way. I know who's in there, and I'm going in. Out of my way. Mrs. Spade is going to keep her off. You should have hired the 4th Marines, dearie. Now, now, ladies. Ladies, oh, please. No, no, uh, no, break no. it up. You know you, I'll show you who to get tough with. No, you don't show me shadows or I'll let you have it. Now, now, ladies, please. Now, let's talk this over calmly and sensibly. Okay, you ask for it. Now, ladies. Oh. Please. Awful. Water, Sam. Oh. Where'd they go? Well, they chased each other down the hall. I thought you'd gone out. I did. What did she hit me with? Well, she took a sap out of her purse and let fly before I could prevent it. Yeah. But you were still on your feet when you told me to close the door. Fine thing. Help me up. Yes, Sam. Easy, easy. Oh, when I think of you lying in here unconscious all that time while I went out to lunch. What? If anything had happened to you, I'd never forgive myself. You call this nothing? Oh, you poor dear brave boy. Now, you just sit down and relax. Now, the ambulance should be here any minute. Ambulance? But you know these things cost money. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam. I lost my head. When I saw you lying there all of a heap, forget I couldn't Forget it. Forget it. What's that gadget there on the floor? Oh. Oh, it's lipstick. Must have dropped out of her purse when she opened it for the sap. Huh. Apple of Eve. It's a ghost color, Sam. Apple of Eve. Mm. Unique Garage. Harry speaking. Spade, this is Dream of Love. Keep your distance. Look, uh, you left your lipstick, but don't bother to come after it. I'll mail it to you. What kind is it? Apple of Eve. Sorry, I've never used it. Good, then I won't give you another thought. Oh, but you got to. She's dead. Eve Adams? Yeah. She jumped into a taxi in front of your building. I went straight after her. But I got caught in traffic where they're tearing up Market Street. That could be anywhere between the Embargadero and Twin Peaks. Fine alibi. What comes next? Well, I'm at her apartment now. And she's dead. Sam, Sam! Hold on. Yeah, Effie? There's your ambulance. Shall I send him away? What shall I do well, with him? Well, it's ten bucks now anyhow. I'll use it for a taxi. Hello, Miss Love. Yeah? Stay there and don't touch a thing. I'll be right over. Good 
dream I hadn't waited, if that was really where she'd called me from. Eve Adams was on the bedroom floor in front of a dressing table. There was broken glass all over the floor. The place reeked of perfume. The front of her negligee was splashed with red. I looked for the wound, but I didn't find any. Then I looked at her hands. All the nails on her left hand and two on the right were the same color as the stain on her clothing. Evidently, she'd been seated at the dressing table putting on nail polish when the murderer entered the room. The back of her head had been creased by the well-known blunt instrument, such as a heavy sap. I felt the bumps on my head and looked at the overturned nail polish bottle on the dressing table. It was called Apple of Eve. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Apple of Eve caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Second time around the murder apartment, I noticed something I hadn't caught the first time. Some smears of Apple of Eve nail polish that didn't show very distinctly against the rust-colored carpeting, but left a clear trail across the kitchen linoleum. When I opened the back door, I smelled burning cloth. There was an incinerator just outside, and from it I fished a man's shirt, partially burned. The initials in the pocket were still intact, so were the red stains under them. The initials were G.H. The stains were, you guessed it, Lieutenant Deer, Apple of Eve. Yeah? I'm looking for Miss Dream of Love. Is she home? No, she isn't. Thanks. I'll come in and wait. Hey, wait a minute. You... Okay, you're in. What do you want with her? She's in a little trouble. You a cop? Why do you expect her back? I don't know. What's this trouble? She threatened to kill a woman, and now she's dead. Who? A girl named Eve Adams. Why would she want to kill Evie? The way I got it, they were locking horns over a guy named Gorse Hagen. You know him? Yeah, and I wish I didn't. Who is he? He used to run a gambling ship down at Malibu till the law turned it into a bait barge. Now he calls himself a yachtsman. But if you're trying to connect him up with my sister, it's a bad connection. She hasn't seen him in years. His idea or hers? Hers. And mine. Then what was the beef? And who are you? I'm her brother. Eddie's my name. And why would there be any beef between those two? Evie was my sister's best friend. And she was engaged to me. Then this news must be quite a shock to you. You're taking it like a little soldier. She was asking for it. I warned her. I begged her to leave town with me. But no, she couldn't sneak off like that without letting Gorse know the score. I told her he'd kill her before he'd let her go. Mm Mm-hmm. You live here, Eddie? Yeah, what of it? Where do you keep your shoes? In a closet, kidder. Where do you keep yours? Under the bed? Which closet? In here? Hey, wait a minute, you... Get your hands off me. Let me see your warrant. Then better be good or you're going out of here on your head. Take your hands off me, Eddie. Let's see that warrant. All right, I got a warrant, Eddie. Here. I didn't find what I was looking for, a pair of crepe-soled shoes with traces of Apple of Eve nail polish on them, but in one of his coat pockets, I found a sales slip from a department store cosmetics counter. There were several items, but the one that interested me said, one lipstick nail polish set, Apple of Eve. About then, I smelled brandy, and a voice behind me said, What happened to the kid? Huh? Oh, uh, he asked for my warrant. (laughs) 
Well, when you come to see me, I'll know better. <laughs> your name is Gorse Hagen. I'm headed for your place right now. What are you looking for? A pair of shoes with crepe soles. What do you want with my deck shoes? I thought maybe they'd match up with this piece of a shirt with your initials on it. Give me that. That's a fact. Where'd you get that? In the incinerator at Eve Adams' place. Well, that don't prove anything. Lots of people got the same initials. Have you talked to, uh, oh, uh, George Howard? He's alibi. He's out of town. That proves it's a frame. I don't know any George Howard. I thought so. Okay, let's cut out the monkey business. Give it to me. It's evidence. Give it to me! All right, I'll give it to you. I did, but he gave it right back to me. I was only losing on points until I tripped over poor old Eddie and lost my balance. That's when he gave me the coup de grace. I wasn't quite unconscious, but somehow I just didn't feel like getting up. And when the apartment door opened, I opened my good eye just wide enough to see Dream of Love walk in. Gorse, what are you doing here? I come to help you, Dreamer. I don't need any help from you, Gorse. I told you that three years ago. You killed Eve Adams. Why? You're wrong, Gorse. I haven't seen Evie in ages. Why did you kill her? I... All right, I did it. Yeah? Why? I was jealous. Seeing the two of you together after all we'd been to each other. <laughs> Go on, laugh at me. I committed murder out of love for you. It's very funny, isn't it? <laughs> I'm very fond of you, Dreamer. My poor little Dreamer love. I'd give you anything, honey. The shirt from my back. Here. Here's a piece of it on the counter. What? Where, where'd you... I see you're impressed. Me too. Come on, we'll go someplace where we can be alone and talk things over. Oh, no, Gorse, please. I can explain you everything. Can explain in a car on the way down to the boat. Come on. You're hurting me! Oh! Oh! No! Come on, out the door. <laughs> Stupid me, I staggered to my feet and stumbled over to the door. I reached it just as Hagen's car pulled away from the curb. By the time I found a taxi, they were at least halfway to wherever they were going. I didn't know whether the boat he had mentioned was tied up at the Embarcadero, anchored in the marina, moored at Sausalito, or becalmed in Oakland. But there was a seafaring man in our town who knew about such things. My port of call was the Seahorse Bar and Grill just off ahead of Pier 16, or is it the foot? Captain Basalti? P is silent, son, as in Prasad. My mistake. Salty by name, salty by nature. <laughs> Only one salty thing I can't abide. Salt water taffy and my teeth, you know. <laughs> Here, have a lifesaver. Well, uh, thank you, sir. You're very generous. No, it ain't money, mate, but it's straight from the mint. Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> <That> joke wasn't. <laughs> hey, what's up, sonny? You in the hole again? <laughs> You catch my drift? Yeah. Uh, what do you know about a yachtsman named Gorse Hagen? Oh, nicely put, matey. If there's anything lower than a yachtsman, he's it. Mm-hmm. Where does he keep his boat? Well, now, she's still afloat. She'll be dragging her hook somewhere off Sausalito. Now, she's a converted PT, you know. He calls her the Sea Queen. Mm-hmm. He had her bottom planks ripped out in the Battle of the Coral Sea, and they patched her up with plywood. Well, she's got two diesels she has and twin screws... Two to one reduction gear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the uh, quickest way of getting out to it? Well, now, there's not much craft for child to hear about this time of night, you know. There's that Novak fella, but just at present he's sleeping one hour. Figures. Might not be worth your while anyways. Why not? Well, Hagen stopped by here 20 minutes ago looking for his engineer. Said he was casting off on tide engineer or no engineer. Mm, what about your boat? My boat. When a matey, on a plotted course, she'll stand up to any double end of Monterey Dory in the class. Yeah. Without a head C, that is. Then on the other hand, you put her in a bottom race. A buck and a quarter swell. Yeah, well, yeah. How much? With... How much? Um, five dollars an hour. And that's with you, man, and the bilge pumps. Okay, let's go. This, um, here Hagen fella now. You on to the trim of his sails? Sails on a PT boat? Oh, not the boat, sonny. The man. Cut of his jib. No, I didn't notice that, but he was wearing crepe soled shoes. Mm. I'll tell you about this Hagen meeting. A fellow once tried to board him. A customs officer, no less. What's up? Picked him up four days later in a gill net with a fish gaff stowed clean through his neck. <laughs> Here, have another lifesaver. You may need it. Ask 
after he'd lashed me to my station at the bilge pump, Captain Fasali got his double ender Monterey Dory and a plotted cross to Sausalito, he hoped, and we plunged recklessly into the fog. As nearly as I could catch his drift, there was a 50-50 chance that A, Hagen had found his engineer and would be halfway to the Farallone Islands before we could make it past Alcatraz if we stayed afloat that long, or B, that he hadn't found his engineer and might be having trouble starting up those two diesels with the twin screws and the two-to-one reduction gears, whatever they are. Major. Which one? Oh, about five points to port. The gray one with the high freeboard. Uh-huh. You get up on the port, eh, Major. The ladder's round on the landed side. Uh. I'll swing round and put you on it. Hey! Anybody home? Uh, he's likely blow nursing them diesels. You got to rear back in holler, Major, like this. Where'd he get you? Don't write the note. Hurts a midships. Here. How do you run this thing? I got to get you to shore. That throttle. Uh, uh, there's a Ford gear. Uh-huh. Don't, don't pull her back all the way. She, she'll die. The vacuum tank. You lie die. still. What are you looking for? Jumper pocket. Lifesaver. In case you need it. I don't know more. Best. Winds on your after quarter, mate. You remember okay, that? Okay, take it easy, Captain. If he could see us well enough to drop Captain Sully, he'd let it go at that. And I got it. He was listening. Somebody was pulling out from shore in a rowboat. I didn't waste any more time listening. I dug into Captain Sully's jumper pocket, fished out a waterproof pouch. I took his seaman's papers out of it. He didn't need them anymore. Wrapped it around my gun. And I took off some clothes and eased myself over the side. I didn't swim for speed, but for distance. Stopping now and then to make sure the man in the boat was still covering for me. I felt my way around the hull till I found the anchor rope. Just as I grabbed it, I heard him rest his oars. Hagen, who's that? Eddie Love. What do you want? I've come after my sister. Go on home, Eddie. She's sailing with me. That's the way she wants it. You're lying. Wait a second. Come on out there, Dreamer. What's happened? Your brother's down there in the boat. Talk to him. Well, what am I going to... Talk to him. All right. Eddie. What's he done to you, sis? I'm all right, Eddie. Everything's all right. Gorse and I have decided... Go on home, Eddie. He's lying to you. He knows you framed him. If you sail out with him, you won't come back. No, Eddie. I'm coming aboard. Eddie, no. Gorse, please. No, Eddie. Eddie. Drop it, Hagen. No. Drop the rifle. I'll drop you. You're lousy, Seamus. Sam, did he hurt you? No, I've been kicked in the stomach before. It takes a woman to kick you in the teeth. I'm sorry. I don't care what you did. What burns me up, you didn't do it right. I hate a bungler, especially a female bungler. I'm a bungler. You're the one. It would have worked if you hadn't gone poking in the incinerator. I should have called the police. They'd have known what to do with evidence like that. They've been wanting to get something on Gorse ever since repeal. Listen, Angel, any flatfoot could have seen through that setup. Eve Adams was sitting in front of a mirror when she was maced. She saw the murderer enter the room. She got it in the back of the head. That means she trusted whoever walked up behind her. That also means the evidence of a struggle was fake. But the nail polish on Gorse's shirt... You put that nail polish on her fingers after she was dead, laid that trail to the incinerator with a pair of Gorse's shoes where any flatfoot was supposed to think he'd try to destroy the incriminating shirt. But the dumbest thing you did was lying to me about that matching lipstick you dropped in my office. That made you look guiltier than anybody, because anybody could have planted that fake evidence. I didn't kill her. I'm not a murderer. Your brother might have got off easy. Crime of passion. Oh, please, please don't say that. I can't bear the thought that after everything I did, it's all come to nothing. Yeah, here, here, here. Have a lifesaver. 
You may need it. Period. And a report. Oh, Sam. Poor Captain Pasolti. T is silent. Everson Passam. Go type that up. All right, Sam. Last one on the package. And now, listen to this. If you want the well-groomed look, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. Well, here it is, Sam. The size I got. What stopped you? The last page of my notebook going to our shortage of supplies, Sam. But in a way, I'm glad, because I didn't have to go through it again. I mean, my poor Captain Basaldi. Yeah, please. Please, now, honest, I'll buy you a new notebook, a nice fat one. Would you like that? Oh, yes, sir. There's always something so final about final pages of things. When, when I think of all the risks you take... To say nothing of my clients. I think I'll put a new sign on the door. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Oh, but I haven't, Sam. Where there's a will, there's a wisp. There's a what? A wisp, Sam. Small amount. Which reminds me, there's a couple of fingers left. Join me, uh, just a wisp. Oh, no, Sam. One of us has got to have a clear head. Well, it'll be me. All best. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Howard Duff can now be seen starring with Yvonne DiCarlo in Universal International's Technicolor production of Calamity Jane and Sam Bass. Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene and Pierre Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Seltzer presents The Adventures of Ellery Queen. Tonight, the makers of Bromo Seltzer bring you another thrilling adventure with Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective in person. 
Ellery Queen again gives you a chance to match wits with him as he relates another story of a crime he alone unraveled. Then, at the point where he was able to solve the mystery, he stops the play, gives you a chance to guess the criminal's name. In the studio tonight, we have as our guests Ken Sears, New York Yankee catcher, and Art Flynn, business editor of the weekly newspaper, Sporting News. We'd hope to have with us, too, the star second baseman of the Yankees, Joe Gordon, but he was unable to join us. However, Messrs. Sears and Flynn have accepted Ellery Queen's challenge to solve the mystery before the solution is revealed. And now, Ellery Queen, master detective and your host for the next half hour. Thank you, Ernest Chappell, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In tonight's story, Nicky and I quite unexpectedly become involved in the crucial game of the World Series. I call it The Adventure of the World Series Crime. Series. You all know what's happened. The Eagles won the first three games. Then the Larks came back to take the fourth and fifth games. And now the Larks are leading in the sixth game, three to two. Here's the pitch. Ball four. That's a walk for Henderson. Fills the bases for the Eagles. Two out. We'll see now. Oh, here's the great Sparks himself coming to bat. Now let's see. A hit will score two runs. The Eagles will win four to three, and the World Series will be over. But if the Larks can stop Sparky again, the series will be all tied to three games apiece, and the payoff game tomorrow, there it is, strike one to Sparky. You know, everybody's asking what's happened to Sparky. Champion batter of the major leagues, he was an Arkansas tornado in the first three series games, hit over 500, won the first three games for the Eagles almost single-handed, and then he folded. Here's the pitch, strike two. Sparky didn't get a hit in the fourth game or the fifth. And today, in three official tries, the great Sparks has popped up once and struck out twice with men in scoring positions. There it is. Ball one. That's one and two on Sparky. You know, there's some ugly rumors around, but take it from your Uncle Ted, they're just malarkey. You know, you've heard them, that Sparky's been drugged, Sparks has sold out to the gamblers. It's all... Here it is. Strike three. Sparky didn't even lift his bat off his shoulder. He's out. Well, that's the game, folks. Ties it up at three games apiece. But what's happened to Sparks? Mr. Dayton, owner of the Eagles, wants to know. Mac McClune, fighting manager of the Eagles, wants to know. What's happened to Sparky? Mrs. Dayton's private office. What? No. Say, listen, Weisenheimer, I'll give it to you in plain English. There ain't no more tickets. Oh, oh. hello, Mr. McClune. The boss in, Susie. Uh, yeah, he's waiting for you. Say, Mr. McClune, I want to tip you off. The boss said me and the boyfriend could see today's game from his box. And, well, you know what that means. Yeah. As usual, Dayton's ducking out in a pinch. Yeah, well, the rest of us still think you can lick them bombs, Mr. McClune. Thanks, Susie. You want to see me, Mr. Dayton? Oh, come in, Mac. Yeah. Mac, I am leaving you in complete charge. Going away today, Mr. Dayton? I notice you have your golf clubs already. Mm, yes, I'm running up to the country club. I, I couldn't stand the strain of the final game, Mac. <laughs> My uh, heart, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll phone you the result. Well, it's not as if I were running out on you or the team, Mac. Of course not, Mr. Dayton. Mm, you'll, you'll bench Sparks, of course. Thought you were leaving me in charge. But, my dear McClune, he's had half a dozen chances to win the series in the last three games. And what's he if done? If Sparky to... goes, I go. Oh, he couldn't bat a ball with a coal shovel. Bat a ball. Bat. Bat. Oh, what a fool I've been. Of course, the bat. What are you raving about, Mac? Look, Mr. Dayton, if your heart can stand the strain of making one phone call before you go out to play golf, just one, mind you, we can still win this series. A phone call? I want a detective. Pay any fee he asks, but have him here in 15 minutes. A detective? What detective, Mac? The best in the world, Mr. Dayton. If there's one man can save this World Series for us, it's Ellery Queen. <laughs> And 
And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our mystery. We'll be back in just a moment to tell you more. But first, Ernest Chappell. You know, nobody minds hard work these days because we're working for victory. But what are you going to do when you're stopped by a common sick headache? Now, Miss Edith Hyde of Fremont Avenue, Los Altos, California, has the answer to that. She writes, I work at the Red Cross seven hours a day, five and a half days a week, and spend what time I have left practicing my music. This constant work and study is quite a strain, and sometimes I get a common sick headache and my nerves feel on edge. Well, one evening, while listening to your very entertaining Ellery Queen program, I heard your clever, educated train tell about Belmo Seltzer, and I decided to try it the next time I got a headache. Was I delighted with the quick, effective relief I got? Why, in just a short time, my head felt a lot better, and my jumpy nerves began to calm down. I told everyone at the office about it, but most of them informed me that they were already familiar with Bromo Seltzer's grand health and had been relying on it for a long time. Now I'm never without Bromo Seltzer. I keep a bottle in my desk at the office and another at home. And that's a wise idea for everybody. You know, these days, you never know when you're liable to get a common sick headache. So if you don't already have a big blue bottle of Bromo Seltzer in your home medicine chest, get one tomorrow for sure. And now back to our mystery. In answer to Mac McClune's phone call, Ellery, Nikki, the inspector, and Sergeant Bealy have just arrived. Hello, Mac. Uh, hello, Ellery. You know my father, Inspector Queen? The inspector. Hiya, Mac. Sergeant Vealy. Hi. And this is my secretary, Nicky Porter. Hello. Hello. <laughs> when they heard you wanted me on a case, Mac, I couldn't shake them off. <laughs> is there anything we can do to help the Eagles win, Mac? Thanks, Inspector Queen. We're Eagle fans, all of us. We need them all, Miss Porter. I got a week sorry on the Eagles, Mac. You and a flock of others, Sergeant. <laughs> Where's uh, Mr. Dayton? In a place where he won't bother us. Uh, Ellery, if you can solve a mystery in three hours, we've still got a chance to win. If you can't... Doesn't sound like Mac McClune talking. Three hours. Give me the facts. Well, Ellery, you know ball players. They're all kind of superstitious. Yeah. Remember how Babe Ruth always touched second base on his way in from right field at the end of every inning? Sparky's worse, Sergeant. He's got a pet bat. You mean Ellery's got to find one of those nasty things that fly around at night? <laughs> Mac's a baseball manager, Nicky, not a zookeeper. He means a baseball bat. Go on, oh. Mac. Well, Ellery, with that pet bat of his, Sparky's the greatest hitter in the game today. Well, now that he's just a bum, huh? uh, Hold it, Sergeant. Oh. Mac, what happened to Sparky's bat and when? Well, the morning after the third game, Sparky told me about it, but it went clean out of my head. Somebody stole his bat. Aha! Uh -huh. If Sparky gets back his bat... You think you'll snap out of a slump, Mac? Inspector, I'll eat your badge in the lot's dugout if he don't. <laughs> Ellery's been asked to find stolen jewels, stolen documents, but a stolen baseball bat. Quiet, Nicky. Mac, was the bat stolen from the clubhouse? Uh, no, Ellery. Sparky was so nervous about it, he wouldn't leave it in the regular bat rack. He took it home with him. Where does he live? Well, Sparky got married just before the series. You mean the World Series of Sparky's honeymoon? Uh, sort of, Miss Porter. So, uh, Mr. Dayton gives Sparky and Lily, that's Sparky's wife, the use of his apartment during the series. They've been living there. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Uh, here's Dayton's apartment, Inspector. Okay, Mac. Really, you park out here in the hall and watch this front door. We don't want to be disturbed. Go ahead, Ellery. Knock. Hmm. Fancy layout. Oh, Inspector, you ain't leaving me out in the cold in a case like this. Bailey! Yes, sir. Mac, come on in. Oh, hello, Sparky. Uh, this is Inspector Queen, his son, Ellery, and Miss Porter. Howdy. Hi. I'm going to meet the missus. Lily, Hi, meet Mr. Inspector Sparky. Queen. Hi. See, it's awful good of you folks to help Sparky. I reckon I'm past being helped, Lily. Maybe not, Mr. Sparks. Uh, when did you first discover your bat was stolen? Well, Mr. Queen, I always put the bat in the hall closet there. The first thing I woke up the morning of the fourth game, I, well, I looked in the closet, and Uncle Sam, that's my pet name for the bat, you see. Sparky calls everything we own by a pet name, Mr. Queen. There's a skunk back home that bothers the chickens. Sparky calls him Hitler. <laughs> I'm beginning to like you, Sparky. The bat was missing, Sparky, when you first looked in the closet that morning? No, Inspector... That time, Uncle Sam's standing there all right. 
But then all that morning we have visitors, and when they go away and Lily and me get ready to mosey over to ballpark, why, I open the closet door and Uncle Sam's gone. How many visitors did you have? Uh, wasn't it three, Lily? Oh, four, Sparky. Four visitors. Well, that means one of them must be the thief. I reckon so, Miss Porter. Uh, I wasn't counting Mr. Dayton, Lily. He's not exactly a visitor. This apartment being his. Oh, uh, Mr. Dayton come first. He forgot to take his golf bag with him when he gave up this apartment. So he comes to pick it up. Uh, tell Mr. Queen who the other three were, Sparky. Okay, Mac. Uh, uh, first, there was Pigoli. Pigoli? The big-time gambler? I smell a rat. And what did Mr. Pigoli want? Well, it's, uh, it's sort of personal. Oh, now, Sparky, you mustn't hold anything back if you want Mr. Queen to help. Lily's right, Sparky. Well, Mac, I Now, look here, Ellery. Sparky's the idol of sports fans all over the country, and he deserves to be. He sets a good example for the kids. Don't drink, don't smoke, a square shooter. But he's got one weakness that's going to get him in a heap of trouble. It already has. I know. I read about it in the papers. Well, that's where the goalie fits. Gambling. Looks that way, Dad. Commissioner had you on the carpet about it, didn't he, Sparky? Mm, yeah, Inspector. But Sparky won't listen. He wastes most of his dough paying off. Oh, gee, I've tried so hard to make him stop. I, I even refused to marry him until he promised to quit. Only he he didn't quit. I reckon you'll have to excuse me. Oh, Lily, be a good girl, Nikki, and keep Mrs. Sparks company in the next room. All right, Ellery. So you owe Pagoli money, Sparky, and he came here yesterday morning to collect, hmm? When you start talking about gambling, Sparky shuts up like a clam. Guess who's outside asking to see Sparky, Ellery? Right? Speak of the devil, Sergeant. Huh? A big shot for Gawley. Bring him in, Veeley. All right, Inspector. Step into the parlor, Mr. Fly. Be careful with your hands, you. Yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Sparks. I come back tomorrow, eh? Well, now, now, I don't know. It might be too late, Pagoli. Inspector Queen, uh... I not see you at first. And an umpire's eye, you not see him. Be careful how you talk, Mr. Veeley. Sergeant Veeley to you, pig. Well, my business with Mr. Sparks, it can wait. I go now. Oh, wait, Mr. Pigoli. What do you want? Well, seeing how things are, maybe I better tell the truth. The truth? You told me Pigoli came to see you the other day about the money you owe him, Sparks. Well, I didn't want to worry you, Mac. Mr. Pagoli here, take care of what you spill, Hick. He was willing to forget my IOUs if... Mr. Sparks, I warn you. If what? If I threw the series, Mr. Queen. So that's it, Pagoli, you dirty backstab. Oh, you don't keep that right, Pagoli. Oh, it's dropped. Now I'll give you a demonstration of the famous feeling. Say, Uncle. Ah, that's better. Now, what are you going to do about it, Pagoli? Now, Mr. Piccoli, did you have any bundles or packages with you when you visited this apartment the other day? All of a sudden, no talk English, huh? No, he, he didn't have, Mr. Queen. You're sure, Sparky? Did he wear a top coat? No, sir. Okay. Let him out, Peely. Put a tail on, though. I think we'll be seeing more of Mr. Pig. Come on, Pig. Back to your story. Uh, Sparky, who were the other two visitors you had? Who came after Piccoli? After Mr. Piccoli comes Collins. Collins? Manager of the Larks? Yep, and uh, after Collins comes Buck Fisher. Uh, Fisher's the first baseman on your own team, Mac, isn't he? Yeah. Sparky beat Buck out of the batting championship by three points. Mm, less than two hours left. Time's running out. Dad, you and Mac tackle manager Collins of the Larks. Nicky and I will call on the vanquished Eagle batsman Buck Fisher. You'll find both of them at the stadium now, Ellery. Good. That saves us time. Dad, we check with each other at the stadium. Sparks can give us the other details on the way over. Hurry. <laughs> We've known each other since the old Sandlot days. We don't have to spar around. Well, what's on your mind, Inspector? Collins wanted you, the manager of the opposition team, drop in to see Sparks, the star batter of Max team during the World Series. It's your little idea, Max? Trying to frame me just before the start of the last game? You know me better than that, Collins. Okay. Inspector, I ran up to see Sparky about our bet. What bet? Two thousand bucks, even money on a World Series winner. Sparky bet his team to win, Collins. That's a hot one. Did you ever hear of Sparky betting against himself? Sure, he bet on his team. With his team taking the first three games, I thought Sparky might be willing to raise the ante at uh, big odds, of course. But no soap. Sparky said no. He was willing, Mac, but his wife said nix. Collins, 
Were you wearing a top coat that morning? Who, me? A top coat in this weather? Did you um, have any bundles with you? Criminy, no. Say, what's this all about anyway? Forget it. Come on, let's go, Mac. Uh, just a minute, Inspector. Uh, Collins. Yeah, Mac? Who you pitching today? <laughs> See tonight's paper. There's the door to the Eagles' locker room, Nicky. Uh, e- excuse me, uh, are you Buck Fisher? Yeah. See you out in the field, fellas. Okay. Who are you? What? Don't you know Ellery Queen? Never heard of him, lady. Hey, you're not the new sports writer for the Herald, are you? <laughs> Strike. <laughs> no, Fisher, I'm a detective. Detective? What goes? A few simple questions, Mr. Fisher. Why did you pay a visit to Sparks the morning of the fourth game? Well, Sparky and I had a bet all season on who'd wind up with the best batting average. Sparky won by three points. Ten is Hodge. And I saw him do it. Made five hits in the last game of the season. So what? So why'd you drop in to see Sparky that morning, Fisher? Oh, we had another bet. Who'd get the most hits in the series? Sparky hit like a house of fire the first three games, but I figured he'd fold. So that morning I comes up and I says, Sparky, how about doubling the bet? Did he, Fisher? He says yes, but his wife says no. So what's the matter, Sparky? Cold feet? Well, Sparky says Okay. Yeah, then his wife starts the water work, so I beat it. But the double bet's on. Mm. Oh, there's a signal for batting practice. I gotta go out and cloud a couple. Oh, uh, Mr. Fisher? Yeah? Did you wear a top coat that morning or carry any packages? What? No. Miss Porter, why did you ask Fisher those last two questions? If you can ask him of Pagoli, Mr. Queen, I can ask him of Fisher. <laughs> That's what I thought. Come on, Miss Copycat. Let's find Dad. Inspector, you learned exactly as much from Collins as Ellery and I did from Buck Fisher. Yeah, yeah, Nicky, a great big goose egg. Uh, Ellery, the game will be starting in a few minutes. Uh, are we getting anywhere? As... <laughs> well, Sergeant. Ah, we haven't even got to first base. Ellery, mm-hmm. we're not near finding that bat than when we start. I wouldn't say that, Dad. Ellery, don't tell me you know where... Yes, we're... I know where Sparky's bat is, Nicky. There's only a 50-50 chance it's still there. Dad... Step aside with me. I'll tell you what to do. Now, you tell us. Ellery and his pesky secret. Yeah. I wonder what's cooking. Mm-hmm. Nearly two hours since Dad made that phone call, Nikki, and no sign of anybody. You wear out the sidewalk, Ellery. Two hours waiting at the ball player's entrance, and we could have been inside with Dad and Veely watching the game. Uh, Dad, what inning is it? Last to the night, son. Uh, what's the score now, Sergeant? Still the same, Miss Porter. One to nothing oh. in favor of the large. Oh, give up, Ellery. It's too late now. You, you must have been wrong this time. Nikki, I tell you, I wasn't wrong. I couldn't have been. How can I go in there and face Mac McClune without that pet bat of Sparky? Well, you can't do the impossible, Ellery. He gave you only a few hours. What's that? Nikki, this is it. A police call? Ellery! Hello, Ellery Queen? Yes? Here it is. The bat. Got it. Are we in time, Mr. McClune? By the snakes of St. Patrick, it is. It's Sparky's bat. Hey, Sparks! Boy, boy, call Sparky back. He's on his way to the plate. Right? What's for the police department? Hank, hey, how's it saying? Oh, we're behind this plate. The same as yesterday. One to nothing. Last to nine. Bases full. Two out and Sparky up. Sparks! Sparks get a hit. Any hit will drive in two runs. And we win. Sparky, take the lead out of your feet. Hey, what is it, Mac? You're, you're not benching. You're me. fat, Sparky. Your own fat. Here. Now go on out there and use it. Uncle Sam. Don't you worry, Mac. Good old Uncle Sam won't let you down. One side, fellas. And there, 
ladies and gentlemen, you have the mystery and I hope a solution as well. Nikki, will you be good enough to introduce our guest armchair detectives for this evening? Well, Ellery, our guests tonight are certainly the right men to try to solve this mystery because both of them know just about all there is to know about baseball. And when I tell you who they are, you'll see what I mean. Our first guest is Ken Sears, catcher of the New York Yankees and son of Ziggy Sears, famous National League umpire. You can be sure that when the Yankees meet the St. Louis Cardinals for the first World Series game October 5th, more than a few eyes will be watching Ken Sears. All right, Nikki, I'll agree the first guest knows baseball, but what about the second? Well, our second guest isn't a ball player, but that doesn't mean he doesn't know about baseball. He's Art Flynn, business manager of the Sporting News, the Bible of the baseball world. Mr. Flynn has been with the Sporting News for 16 years and has covered every World Series in that time. Mr. Flynn says that the Sporting News has a tremendous international circulation, since so many of its old readers are now in the service, but still yelling for their copies. And, incidentally, they get them. And now, Ellery? Mr. Sears, I have two questions for you this evening. Number one, where did I find Sparky's bat? And two, who stole it? Well, Mr. Queen, I believe you found that bat in Mr. Dayton's golf bag. Mr. Dayton's golf bag. And uh, how did it get there? Well, I believe uh, Mr. Dayton visited Sparky's uh, uh, apartment that morning, and I believe he uh, stole that bat and uh, went out to the golf course to play golf and missed that last game of the World Series. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Sears. And now, Mr. Flynn. Where did I find Sparky's bat, and who stole it? I think I've got to agree with uh, Ken Sears, Ellery, uh, that he found it in the golf bag, because no one had a top coat. And secondly, I'd say that when the that the person that put it there was Lily, the wife, because when they were talking about if he threw the series and she walked out and said no when they wanted to double his bet. It's the case of that famous French saying, Cherchez la femme. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Flynn and Mr. Sears. You'll have to wait a moment to find out whether you've solved tonight's mystery correctly. And in the meanwhile, here's Ernest Chappell, who it develops is up on his modern slang. <laughs> Ellery means I'm hep to the jive, I suppose. And all because I happen to mention to him that when you have a headache, you just can't be on the beam. In other words, you don't feel 100%. But if you're hep, that is to say if you know your way around, the chances are that you know our bromo seltzer gives quick, effective relief from the three-way misery that may often accompany a common sick headache. Yes, bromo seltzer acts three ways. On head, nerves, and stomach. Try bromo seltzer the next time you have a common sick headache. See how quickly it has you cooking with gas. Or, as we old fogies say, feeling more like your old self again. But, Ellery, where did you find the bag? That was simple, Nicky, once I knew the facts. Only four people, Dayton, Pagoli, Collins, and Fisher, visited Sparky between the last time he saw the bat in the closet and the time he saw it was gone. So, obviously, one of those four stole the bat from the apartment. Well, I said that long ago, Ellery, but which one? The important question wasn't who took the bat, Nicky, but how. How was the bat taken out of the apartment under Spark's nose without Spark seeing it? Strike one. After all, a bat is the size of a object, 36 inches long and a solid hunk of hickory. So that's why you asked about the packages and the top coats. Huh? Right, Dad. But none of the four visitors carried a package or wore a top coat. Top good idea with a shot in the dark. Actually, you can't conceal a 36-inch baseball bat under a coat, or inside a trouser leg for that matter, and still walk like a human being. Yet the bat was taken from the apartment. How? Wow, one. There was one article taken out of that apartment that was big enough to conceal a 36-inch baseball bat. But Spark said nothing went out, sir. Wrong, Dad. Spark said one thing did go out. Remember? Dayton's golf bag. Dayton, the owner of the Eagles, the one who left the Sparks as his apartment? That's right. Dayton came back for his golf bag, Sparky said. A and with the top zippered over, it'd hold a baseball bat and not be seen. No! Strike two. Now, either Dayton put the bat in his golf bag or someone else did. 
If Dayton were the thief, the first thing he'd do once he was out of the hotel was get rid of the bat. But if someone else put the bat into Dayton's bag and Dayton hadn't yet looked inside, the bat would still be there. So, Nicky, Every told me to phone the chief of police nearest to Dayton's country club. Chief rushed to the club, found Dayton's bag still unopened, and the bat inside. Well, Mr. Dayton can't be the thief. And there's Bob, too. Then, then who stole the bat? Who did it? Well, who hid it in Dayton's golf bag? Well, who was in the apartment when Dayton took away his bag? Not Pagoli, not Collins, no Fisher. None of them had arrived yet. Only two people were there besides Dayton, Sparks and his wife. Did Sparky steal his own bat? Would he deliberately get rid of the one thing he needed most to win his bet? No. Couldn't be Sparks. Then it must be... You mean his own wife? Mrs. Sparks stole that bat. She's the only one left, so Sparky's wife must be the thief. Ah, ball three, my scholar. The thief take every one. Um, Mrs. Sparks. Mr. Queen. Will, will you come here, please? You want me, Mr. Queen? You've heard what I just said. Mrs. Spark. Lily, why did you do it? Oh, gee, I thought if Sparky lost his pet bat, he'd lose his bet. And Collins and Fisher and Pagoli and all the others. I thought that would cure him. But I, oh, gee, I didn't realize what it would mean to Mac and to Sparky's teammate and all the fans. I, well, I was scared to admit <laughs> Dog gone a foul. Ellery, do we have to tell Sparky? If everything comes out all right, I don't see why, Nikki. Oh, you're a darling. <laughs> don't forget Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam came through in the clutch, and he always will. <laughs> And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to the mystery. I want to thank Mr. Sears and Mr. Flynn for appearing as guest armchair detectives this evening. We want especially to compliment Mr. Flynn on his skill in solving the crime. We have for both Mr. Sears and Mr. Flynn a personal gift from Bromo Seltzer, also an autographed copy of my latest mystery anthology, The Female of the Species, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. In just a minute, Ellery will be back to tell you about next week's mystery. Meanwhile, here's a friendly tip from an old pal. Our famous talking Bromo Seltzer train. Why, yes, fight headaches three ways with Bromo Seltzer. You see, common sick headaches may often affect you three ways pounding head, nerves that jingle, jangle, jingle, and upset stomach. So it seems sensible to take Bromo Seltzer which is scientifically designed to fight all three. Yes, Bromo Seltzer gives quick relief from that pain in your head. Bromo Seltzer helps calm jumpy nerves. Bromo Seltzer helps settle upset stomach. Now you can take Bromo Seltzer while it's still fizzing or after it settles down. Use it only as directed on the label for frequent or recurring headaches. See your doctor. When it's a common sick headache that has you feeling miserable, let our talking train tell you how to lick it. Uh, say, Ellery, mm-hmm. come on back here a minute. You got anything to say before we close up this yes, shop? Yes, I have, Chappie. Well? Ladies and gentlemen, because you had asked for them, during the summer months, we brought you what we felt were the best of the Ellery Queen mysteries broadcast during the last five years. Tonight's story marks the end of these command performance. For with next Saturday's mystery, we will again bring you brand new Ellery Queen. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and the complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you The Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. For between-meal lunching, for quick company treats, for all sorts of delightful menu surprises, serve Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food that's so good in a hundred appetizing ways. Pabstet spreads easily, so you can whip up a marvelous tray of sandwiches in less time than it takes to sit out a hand of bridge. Pabstet slices neatly when chilled, and that's a grand way to serve it with fruit salad or apple pie. And for main dish treats... Pabstet blends ever so smoothly into tempting Welsh rabbits, light fluffy omelets, and cheese-flavored macaroni, egg, and chicken dishes. 
They're all so wonderfully satisfying when you add Pabstet's mellow cheddar cheese flavor. Remember, Pabstet is a fine energy food, wholesome and nourishing. So look for Pabstet in the familiar round, flat package, and always buy Pabstet when you can. Tomorrow, treat the whole family to Pabstet. Now let's join our friend the great Gildersleeve, who is still suffering the pangs of conscience for his momentary lapse into the arms of Leela Ransom a few days ago. He's also suffering because Eve Goodwin hasn't spoken to him since he confessed his slip. We find him now at home trying to gather courage to telephone her. <laughs> Let's see. I could just pretend there's nothing wrong at all. Pretend the whole thing was a bad dream. Well, Eve, I can say. How have you been? Where have you been keeping yourself? No good. Maybe I could ask her some kind of a question about my campaign. Ask her how to get the women's vote. Oh, no, that wouldn't do. <laughs> Maybe if don't I... Don't be ridiculous, Leroy. This costume is just right. I don't care if it's right or wrong. I won't wear it. You'll have to wear it. Oh, make me. Leroy, what is all this, Marjorie? Leroy, Leroy has to be in a maid for that. Stop, stop, stop it, stop it, it one at a time. What is this? Leroy has to take part in a maypole dance at Mayor Terwilliger's picnic, and he just... Just a minute. Let's get one thing straight around here. It's not Mayor Terwilliger's picnic. It's the annual outing of Summerfield City employees. The city pays for it. The invitation says that the mayor is paying for the ice cream. Well, the city pays the mayor. What's this about a maypole dance? The school kids have to do it. Some idea of Miss Goodwin. If it's Miss Goodwin's idea, it's all right. I want you to cooperate 100%, Leroy, at least. A maypole dance. That's kid stuff, huh? It's not kid stuff at all. By a few hundred years ago, the maypole dance was a universal custom. The peasants used to dance around the maypole every spring. Grown-up peasants, too. Well, I ain't a peasant. <laughs> We needn't go into that. If Miss Goodwin's putting on a maypole dance, you'll take part, Leroy, just like the rest of the children. Oh, I wouldn't mind that so much, but I got a special part. Oh? What is it? I have to present the crown to the Queen of the May. They made me want me to wear this little old Fauntleroy suit and to walk up there with a crown on a pillow. And then I have to kneel down and present it to the Queen of the May. Well, I think that's a very... And who do you suppose is Queen of the May? Who? Ethel Hammerslag. <laughs> Leroy, you make me sick. Ethel Hammerschlag is a very nice little girl. Oh, yeah? Then you crown her. <laughs> I not only have to crown her, but then I have to sit beside her on her throne. I don't even want to go to Terwilliger's old picnic. It's not Terwilliger's picnic, and you'll go. And by George, you'll wear that costume. But these pants are too tight. The suit is two years old. It's as good as new. You've never worn it. And today you will. Now go upstairs and put it on. Oh, for corn's sake. Go, Leroy. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Gillsleeve, what about lunch for the mayor's picnic? You want hard-boiled eggs? Ye gods, Bertie, this picnic is not the personal property of Mayor Terwilliger. The city is paying for an outing for its employees. Yes, sir. You want hard-boiled eggs? I'm not going. <laughs> Give the children whatever you have. Oh, Uncle Mort, I think you ought to go. And watch Terwilliger swelling around as if he owned the park? No, thank you. I fixed some fried chicken. Mm-hmm. And some nice cucumber sandwiches. Mm-hmm. Little mayonnaise on them, Bertie? Uh, just a touch. Then I could put in some of them little baby tomatoes. Mm, delicious. <laughs> I thought I might just whip up a quick devil's food cake, Mr. Gilsey, but if you ain't going to the picnic, maybe I shouldn't bother. Well, the children will enjoy it. Besides, it never does any harm to have a cake around the house, Bertie. <laughs> no, sir. Well, I better get with it. Well, I should think you'd want to go to the picnic, Uncle Maud. I should think you'd want to see Leroy as king of the May. I'd rather imagine it. I thought you'd be taking Miss Goodwin to the picnic. By George, maybe I should, eh? I might call her up and ask her. Why not? I think I will. Uh. What's the matter? Marjorie, I wonder if you'd mind going out on the porch or something just for a minute. I, uh... <laughs> All right, Unky. I'll leave you alone. Yeah, great. Now. Excuse me, Mr. Gillsleeve, but have Birdie. you... Had... I'm trying to telephone, if you don't mind. Oh, pardon me. Must be some pride. Uh, <laughs> like trying to phone from a cigar store. What if she says no? But if I don't call her, how can she say yes? I don't know how I get into these things. All right, Uncle, I'll leave it to you. Is this a costume? Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm trying to telephone, Leroy. Go ahead. Leave the room, Leroy. Hey, there goes Mrs. Ransom. Are you going to take her to the picnic? Certainly not. Well, she seems to be heading this way. Oh, my goodness. Uncle, 
What's the matter? Nothing. Is she coming here, Leroy? How do I know? Hey, what are you doing behind the sofa? Where is she? Coming up the front walk. Uh, Tell her I'm out, Leroy. But you're right here. You wouldn't want me to tell a lie, would you, Unc? You won't be telling any lie, my boy. Tell her I'm out. You don't know when I'll be back. What a character. Well, hello, P.V. Be right with you. I'm just measuring out some mothballs here. Yeah? <laughs> right ahead, whatever you're doing. I just dropped in. Oh, just paying a little visit, eh? That's nice. No, I'm avoiding a little visit. What's that you say? <laughs> a little difficulty at home, P.V. I came down here to avoid it. Oh, well, I know how it is. There are times when Mrs. P.V. and I have our little fallings out. She says it is, and I say it isn't. She says it is, and I say it isn't. And she says it is. And you and... say it isn't. That's right. <laughs> it goes on like that, and by and by she gets impatient. And she says to me, Richard, you're a stubborn old fool. <laughs> but I fix her. Oh, how? I just say to her, well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> then I go take a walk. Peavy, you're right. You're a stubborn old fool. Well, now, I... Oh, you're joshing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. But you know, it, it works. It's the only way to handle them. When the wife and I have one of our little tussles, I know just as sure as I walk out that door, if I just hold out long enough, she'll give in. Well, that's a good system. There's uh, only one trouble. What's that? I never can seem to hold out long enough. <laughs> well, you're no different from the rest of us. Well, I... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. If you don't mind my asking, who was the party you came down here to avoid? I'm not mentioning the lady's name, Peavy. I'm withholding that information as a gentleman should. Well, I only ask because I'm afraid I see her coming in the shop now. Uh, Miss Goodwin. Miss Goodwin? I'm not avoiding her. Or am I? <laughs> well, anyway, I guess I'm trapped. Oh, hello, Eve. Good morning, Clark Morton. Long time no see. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Peavy. Hmm. Morning, Miss Goodwin. Nice day. Yes, it is. I'd like to... It was a little foggy this morning, though, but about 9.30 the sun broke through, so it turned out nice after all. I'd like a bottle of cologne, Mr. Peavy, if you have it. Cologne? Well, now, there, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you, Miss Goodwin. Uh, Cologne is very hard to get these days. Cologne is very hard to get, yeah. I put in an order back about Christmas time, but all they were able to send me was a... Grocer razor blades, which I, of course, was glad to get, but it wasn't quite... Like that all over. I heard of a fellow in the hardware business who... who, uh, 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 Excuse me. Have you anything else, Mr. Peavy? Any toilet water? Oh, yes, I have. I just kept my glasses on here. Yeah, I have two here. Now, this one is called Parlement d'Amour. Same as the perfume. It has a very nice smell. Oh, that's very nice. I know that one. I used to buy that for... It's, it's, oh, it's very nice. <laughs> I think perhaps I'd prefer the other one. What's that? Yes, you'd probably prefer the other one, Peavy. Let's have a look at that. Well, let's see. This one is called Moment of Passion. <laughs> <laughs> May I smell it? Yeah, let her smell it, Peavy. Certainly. I can get the stuffer off me. Take a little sometime. Here, I'm strong. Let me do it, Peavy. I got it. There you are, Miss Goodwin. Oh, well, that is nice. Uh, care to smell it, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, no, no. Whatever's all right with Eve is all right with me. <laughs> a lot of the ladies seem to like this one. I think I'll take it. How much is that? That'll be... Uh, let's see. It's written on the bottom here. A dollar seventy-five and 20% tax, two ten. It's all paid for, Eve. Here you are, Peavy. Oh, no, please. I don't want you to. Here, Mr. Peavy. It's all paid for. But I couldn't think it's of having no it. It's no use, Eve. Keep Clark your money. Clark Morton, if you don't mind. Well, uh, okay. Gosh. Uh, 210 and 5 is 215. 225, 250 and 50 is $3. Thank you. And uh, here's your parcel. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Oh, Eve, just a minute. Yes? I mean, uh, speaking of the weather, Eve, I mean, uh... Are you going to the picnic today, Eve? I expect to, yes. Some of the children from the school are giving a little performance. Yeah, I know. Leroy, he can hardly wait. Are you going with anybody in particular? I'm going with a group of the teachers. Oh. 
Well, perhaps I'll see you around. Perhaps. Goodbye, Mr. Peavy. Goodbye. Goodbye, Eve. See you around. A uh, little trouble there, Mr. Gildersleeve? What do you think? <laughs> well, so it goes. Are you going to the mayor's picnic? I don't know. whole thing is just a political scheme to get votes anyway. And she won't go with me. Well, a lot of things can happen at a picnic. I went to a picnic once. That's when I was a young fellow. I was working for a wholesale drug firm at the time. Dunninger and Holtz, it was. Well, sir, I, I went to this picnic, and who do you suppose I met there? Your future wife. Uh, somebody told you. You did. Oh, did I? <laughs> well, it's a fact. That's the way I met her. Now, who knows? If you go to this picnic today... I've well, already you... met my future wife, Peavy. Only she won't speak to me. For all I know, she won't be my wife, either. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh, no? You just saw her, didn't you? Saw the way she treated me. Yes, I did. As if I were a skunk... Well, she wasn't very neighborly. <laughs> what I always say is actions speak louder than words. Oh? What do you mean? Let me ask you something, Mr. Gildersleeve. Has she given you back your ring? I no, no, she hasn't. Mm-hmm. What are you worrying about then? She'll come around. Peavy, by George. Maybe I will go to that picnic. I would if I were you. After all, what's a picnic without a skunk? <laughs> <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. Ready, set, let's go, ladies, for more of those tempting ways to serve Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. First course, cream soup. Just before serving, add a generous amount of Pabstet, cut into small cubes, and watch that cream soup hit a new high in appetizing goodness. Next, the main dish, and our suggestion is eggs golden sauce. Hard-cooked eggs drenched with the mellow cheddar cheese goodness of Pabstet. Now, a grand salad. Press two halves of a pear together with a tasty center filling of Pabstet. And serve with lettuce and mayonnaise. And for dessert, apple pie served with Pabstet wedges. There you have it, menu magic from soup to dessert with Pabstet. And you'll find dozens of other exciting ways to surprise your family with this nourishing, wholesome cheese food. So tomorrow, look for, ask for, and buy Pabstet. Remember the name, Pabstet. Back to Summerfield and the Great Gildersleeve. The city employees' picnic is well underway with games for the children, tests of strength and skill for the gentlemen, and special events for the ladies, all to the strains of the Sanitation Department Band. Folks, just a minute, please. Oh, Terwilliger's going to talk some more. Uh, when you've finished your lunches, you'll find ice cream is being served at that table under the tree there. All absolutely free with the compliments of your old friend and our next mayor, Cyrus L. Terwilliger. Oh, that's me. <laughs> uh, the big ham. Eat hearty, folks. Yeah, sure, eat hearty, folks, and we'll all come out of your taxes. How about it, Uncle Mort? Should we have lunch? You better grab some places. No, Leroy, you'll not grab anything. I wonder if Miss Goodwin's around. Oh, let's invite her to have lunch with us. Yeah. Oh, I see her. Hey, Miss Goodwin! Hey! <laughs> Leroy, that's no way. Well, here she comes. Oh, you who is. Will you sit here with us, Miss Goodwin? I'd love to, Marjorie. Great. I'll tell you what you do, children. Uh, don't you, why don't you go over and eat at that table over there where all the children are and leave Miss Goodwin and me. But, Uncle, I want to eat with Miss Goodwin. Do as I tell you, Leroy. Take your lunch and go over there. There's a nice place right at the end of the table. Oh, Throckmorton, I don't think you ought to send them off. Run along, Leroy. You too, Marjorie. Well, the Mort, I'm not a child. Then you're old enough to realize that I have things to say to Miss Goodwin. Now, will you run along? <laughs> well, put it that way. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything to say to you, Throckmorton. I came over because Leroy asked me. Eve, please, you don't have to say anything. Just sit here and share my lunch with me. Really, I'm not hungry. Or I'd have brought my own lunch. Oh, come on, Eve. I've got plenty. I've got loads here. You see, fried chicken. Here are two drumsticks. One for you and one for me. 
Bill. Oh. <laughs> Judge Hooker, how you startle me. Uh, won't you join us, Judge? Yes, yes. Thank you. I'd be delighted. But I seem to have mislaid my lunch. I can't imagine. Oh, Throckmorton has lots of lunch. Oh, we're full of lunch. <laughs> Do sit down. Throckmorton would be only too glad to have you share his lunch, wouldn't you, Throckmorton? Sure, old goat. In that case, I'll be only too glad to accept the invitation. Well, this is cozy, isn't it, Gildy? Three's the crowd, Judge. Oh, now, don't say that. Have a drumstick, Judge? Oh, thank you. I seem to be a little hungry today for some reason. You're always hungry. <sighs> Well, I want to tell you, that's the finest fried chicken I've ever put in my mouth. Wipe your chin. Oh. Scott Morton, a drumstick for you? No, thanks. What? I'm not hungry. Oh, come now, that's nonsense. There's all this chicken here. Go ahead and try it, Gilly. It's marvelous. Thank you, Judge. That's very generous of you. <laughs> but I seem to have lost my appetite. Oh, well, all right. Ah, but you're missing something. Finest fried chicken I ever tasted. I'm glad now they couldn't find my lunch. You never had a lunch, and you know it. <laughs> you old goat, why don't you eat the paper plate, too? <laughs> oh, here's Mayor Terwilliger. Oh, huh? what does he want? Well, 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 this is a merry little group. Miss Goodwin. How do you do? Judge? Has some fried chicken? No, no, thank you. Oh, there, Gildersleeve. Uh. <clears throat> I'm uh, going to have to ask you gentlemen if I can borrow this lady for a little while. What? We're having a pie-eating contest after lunch. I'm going to require some assistance from the fair sex in judging it, and if Miss Goodwin here will do me the honor... I'd be delighted. Splendid. Oh, but uh, finish your lunch first. I've finished, thank you. Oh, let me assist you to your feet, then. But, Eve, you haven't eaten a thing. Eve, you're not going. Sorry, Gildersleeve, but duty calls. <laughs> you said yourself, Throckmorton, three's a crowd. So I'll leave you two together. Excuse me. This way to the arena. Well, Gildy. And I wind up with you. Like to hold hands, Gildy? <laughs> oh, shut up. I've got a good mind to go home, but I'm not going to. I'll show her, and I'll show him, too. I'll show people who's the best man around here. I'm going to enter that pie-eating contest, and I'm going to win it. You do that, Gildy. You just do that. I'm going to. You just show her. You bet I will. You get into that contest and prove to her that there isn't a man in Summerfield who can make a bigger pig of himself than you can. Oh! <laughs> Gentlemen, could I have your attention for a moment, please? Yeah, what did I tell you, Judge? He's going to make another speech. Now just keep your shirt on, Gildy. All you can do is be a good sport. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, friends of Summerfield, I only hope you've all had as pleasant a time so far as I've had myself. Thank you, thank you. I know some of you have had a good time. There's a certain politician, for instance, who enjoyed winning the pie-eating contest. Why, you... Stop! Uh, I won't mention his name because he's my political opponent. Stop! Yes. But I can tell you he's a little on the stout side. I wouldn't say he's exactly fat, but I understand one time he had the mumps for two weeks before he found it out. <laughs> Be a good sport, Gildy Lamb. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, we're not going to have any speeches today, folks. This is just a social occasion. At the same time, if I may take a moment, I would like to call your attention to one or two facts about the political situation at this time. Now, in the year 1776, what was Summerfield? 1776. In the year 1776, Summerfield was just a tiny village. What? In that tiny village were all the seeds of the summer field that was to grow into the great and prosperous city of today. This could go on for days. The glorious tradition of summer field began to grow and expand. In the year 1812, what do we find? This isn't a speech, it's a filibuster, Judge. The year 1812 saw the establishment of Summerfield's first manufacturing concern. That concern, my friends, was the Summerfield Iron Works whose sleds and washboards have since made the name of our city famous throughout the country. Is he going to tell about every business in town? We come to the year 1813, and what do we find? We want Gildersleeve! The banner year of 1813! We want Gildersleeve! Hey, Gildersleeve, how about a song? Yeah, give us your song! Yeah, a song! Yeah, a song. Yeah, a song. Yeah, a song. Well, 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 now, that's an idea. That's, yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, we've all heard your reputation as a singer, Mr. Gildersleeve. Would you like to croon something for our friends? Well, I'm no professional. So I've heard. Uh, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I understand that as a singer, Mr. Gildersleeve is a howling success. <laughs> yeah. He will now oblige us with a ditty assisted by the street cleaning department van. <laughs> You're trying to put me on the spot, Terwilliger. Well, sing and get off of it. Why, George, I'll... Well, uh, Mr. Leader, uh, do the fellows know Shine on Harvest Moon? We can try it, Commissioner. Key you see only. Oh, fine, fine. Uh, Harvest Moon, fellas, and do the best you can. One, two... Shine on... Shine on harvest moon Up in the sky I ain't had no loving since January, February, June or July It's no time Ain't no time to stay Outdoors in school So shine on Shine on harvest moon for me and my gal. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may resume. We want another song. If I may How resume my... How song, Commissioner? Yeah, give us another song. Well, I'll do my best, folks. Uh, go ahead and play something, Mr. Leader. If I know it, I'll join in. How about without a song? Without, see, oh, yeah, that's very good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, the road would never bend. When things go wrong, a man ain't got a friend. Without a passion girl with heart so true, one who loves nobody else but you. I want a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Gildersleeve, now get off. Don't you wish I would? <laughs> if I may continue from the point at which I was interrupted, friend. We want another song. Yes, give us another song. Friends, Mr. Gildersleeve has sung eight songs already. I I'm afraid his voice is tired. Are you kidding? I'm as fresh as a daisy, folks. <laughs> uh, how about a song uh, uh, just for the ladies? All right, ladies, your wish is my very command. Uh, Mr. Leader. <laughs> oh, sure, we know that one. Uh, number 18, boys. Oh. <laughs> Love is just a game the two are playing. Love is nothing but a game of chance. For the one who chooses, very often loses. Love is never sure. Be romance. Danger always lurks in Cupid's arrows, but he hasn't aimed at you and me. If you are thinking of some other boy to love, you. May always know that you are free. Oh, thank you, thank you, ladies. Thank That's you. all, Gildersleeve. The Williger, I'll sing just as long as there's a demand for this stuff. You can sing all night for my dough, Commissioner. Well, thank you. Well, you can't sing all night for mine. Well, you can't stop. Me. Oh, yes, I can. Quiet, quiet. You there, leader. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Take that bunch of straight cleaners home. Or you'll all lose your brooms in the morning. <laughs> oh, 
Uncle Mort, you were wonderful. Huh? Wasn't he wonderful, Miss Goodwin? He certainly was, Marjorie. Did you hear the way that crowd cheered? Well, I think he could run for president. Yeah, Uncle's a regular Sinatra. Yes. <laughs> run along, little boy, run along. I suppose you'd like me to run along, too, huh? Well, the sidewalk isn't wide enough for all of us, my dear. Why don't you and Leroy just walk ahead, huh? Come along, Leroy. Give him a break. How much is there in it for me? Leroy. Okay, okay. Uh, that's a boy. Well, shall we start home, Throckmorton? Oh, if you'd like. <laughs> I was very proud of you this afternoon, Throckmorton. Oh, that's so? Yes. I, I thought you handled a difficult situation very well. Hmm, nothing much. <laughs> it could have been very embarrassing. You know, when Terwilliger got you up there to sing, he was trying to make you ridiculous. Ah, uh, that was his mistake. I think he found that out. Throughout Morton. Yes? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eve, what's the use of bluffing? I can't be mad at you. Well, I can't stay mad at you. When you sing the way you did just now... I don't know. Something happens to me. Oh, well, that's because I was singing to you, Eve. Just you. Were you? You think I could sing that way to anybody else? Oh, darling. It's been so long. Uh, Eve. <laughs> hey, look, for Pete's sake, come on. Oh, hey. <laughs> George, that's pretty nice. Listen to this, Marjorie. Huh? What is it? It's a letter from Maddie Parsons. Uh, she's Frank Parsons' wife. You know, the fellow that reads the meters for us. Oh, yes. What's she writing you about? Well, she just wanted to thank me for keeping him on the payroll those weeks when he was out sick. You remember? Mm -hmm. But listen to this, my dear. She says, By the way, Mr. Gildersleeve, I want to tell you how thankful we both are that Frank went in on the payroll savings plan at the water department. We've always tried to save money, but with one thing and another... It always seemed to slip away somehow. But now we've laid away a war bond every month for 17 months. It'll be a nice little nest egg. Luckily, we didn't have to cash in any of the bonds to pay for Frank's illness. But it was sure nice to know that the money was there in case we did need it. Was well, everybody down at the water department in on the payroll savings plan? Oh, the smart ones are, my dear. Because there isn't a better investment in this whole world or an easier way to save money. Think it over, folks. Good night. On this program was selected by Bob Sweet. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of Parquet Margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by The Kraft Foods Company, makers of a complete line of famous quality food products. For the past couple of weeks, we have been recalling to you some of the great Gildersleeve's early experiences. Tonight, the great man wants to talk about one of the biggest days in his whole life. We give you now Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Well, sir, as long as I live, I'll never forget last Fourth of July. <laughs> what a day. That was the day of the first annual outing of the Jolly Boys Social Club. Come one, come all, and bring your friends. 
I'd been up late the night before with the committee on arrangements, and I was planning to celebrate the anniversary of the independence of our country by sleeping a little late that morning. Huh. About seven o'clock, outside my window... Leroy. Happy Fourth of July, Unc! Yes, yes. There was a war on then. That was only a year ago. Can you believe it? You couldn't buy fireworks anywhere in those days. But Breeze there a boy with soul so dead he can't find some way to blow himself up on the fourth? I figured I'd better get down there and see what... Leroy, whatever you're doing, stop it! I'm not doing anything, Unc! Don't tell me that. I've got ears. Or I did have. Well, hold your fire till I can get down there. You can't deny a small boy the 4th of July. That's his day. But I still remember the time I made the mistake of carrying a three-inch salute in my hip pocket. And my best friend sneaked up on me with a piece of punk. It was burned in my memory. <laughs> I didn't want anything like that to happen to Leroy, so I got up and shaved and got dressed, put on my white Palm Beach suit and my white canvas shoes that I hadn't worn in years, and hurried downstairs. (laughs) Breakfast was a rather disordered meal that day. I guess we were all a little excited. Marjorie kept jumping up and down and rushing off places. I finally told her to sit down. Marjorie, I said, for heaven's sake, light somewhere. But I'm all through, Uncle Moore. I don't care. Sit down. You make me nervous. But I'm supposed to be helping Bertie make the lunch. That can wait till after breakfast. One thing at a time here. Where's my cereal? Leroy, wipe your chin. Bertie, I'm ready for my cereal. I'm ready. We ought to get a bell. Here you are, Mr. Gilsleeve. Leroy, how about you? Oh, I'm quite careful. What's this you've given me, Bertie? That's your... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the chop olives for the sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> olives are my favorite fruit, Bertie, but not for breakfast. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilsley. That what comes from making lunch and breakfast at the same time. I only hope I didn't go and spread the oatmeal on the sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bertie's a scream this morning. How do you like her with that cap over her eye? <laughs> I really ought to go out there and help her. Sit still, my dear. It only add to the confusion. She'll fight her way out of this. What time are we leaving for the picnic grounds, Unky? Well, Floyd should be coming by here for us about 11. Floyd Munson? Are we going with him? Yeah, he's going to get his cousin's hay wagon. We'll all ride out together. Everybody. Big excursion. Oh, how wonderful. A hay ride. I've got to run right over and tell Marshall. Yeah, Marshall will find out. You stay right where you are. A hay ride? Oh, this is going to be more fun. Unky, I think you were a darling to arrange it. Yeah. <laughs> and don't you look pretty in your nice white suit? Doesn't he look pretty, Leroy? He looks like the good humor man. <laughs> I feel like the good humor man, Leroy. Yes, sir, nobody's going to make me mad today. But don't keep trying, Leroy. <laughs> Well, we had work to do that morning, but all of a sudden, nothing would do. We should drop everything and hang out the flag. Well, what's the use of having a flag if you don't hang it out on the 4th of July? <laughs> all right. So you tramp upstairs to the attic. Two flights. <laughs> Extra step. <laughs> well, you rummage around and you find the flag. Then you open the front attic window. It hasn't any sash cord, so you have to prop it up with a stick. Only you can't find a stick, so you use a coat hanger. I'll go out in the yard, Uncle Morton, see how it looks. Now, Leroy, when I get out the window, you hold on to my legs. What for? You, what for? <laughs> what do you think? Just hold on to them, that's all. Now, don't let go. Okay. No, no, not yet, Leroy. We'd like it out there. I thought you said to hold on to them. Well, use your head, my boy. Now, you lower the flag out the window... And you squirm part way out yourself. And then you look down. <laughs> Hold on, Leroy. Oh, sure, that's the time the telephone always rings. Leroy, telephone. For me? Yes, for you. I'll be back, huh? Okay. Oh, Leroy. You come back here. Yeah, the little devil. There you are. Half in and half out. Straddling the windowsill on your stomach. 
in a Palm Beach suit that's just been cleaned and too tight. There's only one thing to do. You try to inch your way back in. There you are, teetering in space while your life hangs in the balance. And then it happens. Your elbow hits the hanger, the window drops like a guillotine, right in the back. You're pinned there like a rat in a trap, clutching at old glory. Four or five hours pass. Maybe it's four or five minutes. You've been hollering as loud as you can, with the wind knocked out of you in your heart and your throat. And then some fool happens along and calls to you. What you doing, Throckmorton? Lula! Shoot if you must, this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, he said. Lila, help! This is no joke, Lila. I'm stuck. Oh, gracious. Get help! You stay right there, Throckmorton, you hear? I'll be up. Marjorie, Leroy, Betty, everybody, help! <laughs> Uh, safe at last. Safe again in the bosom of my little family. What might have been an ugly incident was turned into a happy triumph. For old glory waved proudly from our attic window. We all went out front to look at it. And we all agreed that it looked just fine there. It looks just fine there, Throckmorton. Just fine. It looks beautiful. Yeah. How do you like it, Bertie? Mr. Gilsley, if I had my way, I'd leave it there all the time. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir, it looked fine. But there were other things to do, and time was wasting, so I gave a few orders. Let's get going here, Bertie. No time to lose. Yes, sir. Now, Marjorie, you help Bertie with the lunch. Okay. Leela, I wonder if you could give him a hand. Well, I have to dress yet, Throckmorton, but I'd be glad to do what I can. Good. Leroy, you carry out the basket and things as they get them packed. Me? Yes, you. What are you going to do? I'm going to sit down on the porch here for a while and think about the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Well, I sat down on the swing there and lit a cigar. And I thought how different this was from other Fourth of Julys I'd known. How quiet and how nice. And I thought how a man's tastes change as he grows older. Why, when I was a youngster, I lived in a world of high explosives. Dynamite caps, five-inch salutes, red devils, Roman candles, erupting strombolis, 50-cent skyrockets. Uh, I loved them. Not anymore. Suddenly I looked down the walk, and here came a little boy that might have been me at the age of six. Only it wasn't. It was little Craig Bullard from across the street, and he was pulling a toy cannon. I knew what he was going to say before he said it. Can Leroy play? Well, hello, Craig. That's what you got there. I want Leroy to play with me. Well, Leroy's inside right now. Time to come out. (laughs) Well, he has some work to do, Craig. I want him to come out. Uh, Later, perhaps later. Uh, who gave you the cannon? My father. Oh, that's fine. Doesn't go off, does it? No, Craig, surely your father's told you not to aim that thing at people. Craig, what are you going to do? I'm going to shoot you. (laughs) Now, Craig, what's that string for? I'm going to pull it. Don't you shoot that thing. I'm going to pull it. One. Craig, do you hear me? Don't you shoot that. Two. Look, Craig, I thought of a game. Three. Uh, I knew it wouldn't shoot. Hi, Leroy. Uh, little guest to see you, Leroy. Oh, for corn's sake. I'll see you later, Craig. I'm busy. I have a cannon. What's that? I have a cannon. Hey, pretty neat. Let's have a look at it, Craigy old boy. Maybe I can show you how to shoot it. You do, and I'll shine Boy, it. this is one of those carbide cannons. I pull the string and nothing happens. Well, no wonder what you need is carbide. I've got some around in the garage. Come on. Hey, did you ever think of loading it with gravel? Leroy? Yeah? No carbide, Leroy. But it's meant for carbide. And no gravel. Okay, no gravel, just carbide. And no carbide. Okay. Come on, Craig, I know what we'll do. What were they going to do? I sat there uneasily, wondering how little boys ever lived to reach the age of 12. (laughs) 
But pretty soon they were back again. Here! Oh. He's going out over my cabin! Oh, get down! Now, wait a minute. He's going out over my cabin! Stop it! Stop it, Craig! Yes, yeah, stop it, you little snitcher! Leroy! Well, he claims he's General Eisenhower. <laughs> Leroy, Craig's a little boy. That's no reason to get angry with him if he wants to imagine things. I'm General Eisenhower. He's Rommel. Yeah. <laughs> now he wants to change sides, the dirty guy. <laughs> he must have discovered how the game comes out. I'm going to take my cannon and go home. Yeah, well, that's all right. I think that's a very wise decision, my boy. Very wise indeed. Rommel would have been smart if he'd done the same thing. <laughs> Well, so it went. A few laughs, a few fights, a little excitement, and a lot of bustle and preparation. It was noon before we knew it, and the Jolly Boys were overdue. Leela had gone home to dress, and we were standing on the front porch waiting. Leroy and Marjorie and her boyfriend and I. And the wagon hove in sight. Here it comes. Here it comes, Anki. Oh, boy, look at it. Yes, sir. It was Floyd's cousin's hay wagon with a nice bed of fresh hay. And there were red, white, and blue bows on the tails of the horses. And somebody had twined red, white, and blue crepe paper through the spokes of the wheels. Floyd's cousin was handling the horses, and Floyd sat on the seat beside him. And believe it or not, he had an accordion. Oh, brother, is that corny? Oh, it's wonderful. Don't you love it, Marshall? Oh, Uncle, I'm so happy. Yeah, don't jump up and down with the thermos bottles, my dear. Oh, ahoy there, Commissioner. Ahoy, jolly boys. Why, my boy. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's get started, huh? They all were. Good old Hooker, good old Peavy, good old Floyd, and good old Gates. I tell you to look at that good old wagon, all red, white, and blue, and all those fine fellows in it. Well, made you proud of your country, that's all. I'm glad there was the Fourth of July. Come on, come on, what are we waiting for? Yeah, come on, Commissioner. Scramble up there, Leroy. Okay. Up you go, Marjorie. Yeah. You're next, Gildy. Give him a hand there, somebody. Oh. Don't strain yourself, Mr. Gilbert. Hey, hey, hey. Hold those horses there. Whoa, 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 whoa now. All together, fellas. Now, up to Daisy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get up there. Yeah, hey, Wix. Huh? Don't forget to stop for the girls. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, take me out to the wall, Take me out with the crowd. Find me something that's a crackerjack. I don't care if I never get my letter. Yes, sir, it looks like it's going to be a great picnic. You know, when a person's hungry, there's nothing quite so satisfying as a slice of bread with your favorite spread. Well, parquet margarine's my favorite spread, Mr. Lang, but it's often so hard to get. And right now, we're all being asked to go easy on bread, so there'll be more for hungry people who really need it. So surely you're not trying to sell me on the idea of using more. That's right, I'm not. The point I'm trying to make is that bread and spreads are basic hunger-satisfying foods, two of the foods most vitally needed in the world today. Here at home, we're fortunate that there's some of both for everyone. Not all we'd like, perhaps, but enough. And by conserving bread and spreads when they're in short supply, it helps everyone to get a fair share. That, Mr. Lang, is going to make me use parquet sparingly and to appreciate its fine flavor and food value all the more. And I'd like to just add that Kraft will continue to make all the parquet margarine possible under present conditions and distribute it as fairly as we can. Thanks again for being so patient when supplies of parquet are temporarily limited. Yes, sir, quite a day, the 4th of July. Everybody had a good time riding out to the picnic grounds. Leroy was up front with the driver. Marjorie and Marshall Bullard sat together, talking very seriously. Floyd was playing his accordion. Mostly requests from Eve Goodwin and Leela Ransom. Sounded pretty good. Floyd was all dressed up for a day in the country with white sports shoes. Judge Hooker had on a pair of golf knickers he dug up someplace. I never knew the judge was bow-legged before. That'll do, Leroy. Eve Goodwin was looking very pretty with a big straw hat on. 
Leela was wearing something she called a play suit. Didn't you ever hear of a play suit, Rock Martin? No, but I like it. What do we play? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> well, we got out to the grounds in about an hour. Nice woodsy spot besides a little stream. Quite a good deep pool at one point. We unloaded the baskets with the food. Everything was so peaceful for a few minutes. Just pile all that stuff over here, boys, under the tree. What about putting it out here in the open? I prefer to have it under the tree, Floyd, and since I'm to be the chef... Who said you were going to be the chef, Judge? Naturally, I assumed that... Well, just turn off your assumer. You're assuming too fast. Yeah, I'm pretty fair-handed at a barbecue myself. I will attend to the barbecuing, Floyd. Who said so? What? It just so happens, Gildy, that my recipe for barbecued frankfurters is acknowledged the best in town. Uh, not by me, it ain't. I got a sauce makes a hot dog taste like filet mignon. Well, my sauce makes it taste like a hot dog. I, I still say if you have any regard for our guests, you let me be the chef. Oh, is now, that wait, so? Yes, now, wait, wait a minute. Fellas, fellas. Fellas. fellas, is this any way to behave? Why, well, what'll our guests think of the Jolly Boys? Gee, I never thought of that. We've got an organization with a reputation to maintain. Summerfield has its eye on the Jolly Boys Club. Chief Gates is right, fellas. I'll withdraw my claim to the chef's job. So will I. You take it, Floyd. No, Judge, you take it. Oh, no. Well, then let Gildas leave have it. Oh, no, not me. Well, for heaven's sake... You asked for it in the first place, Judge. That has nothing to do with it. The oh, idea... I I never see it. It. Yacht... No. Let's be jolly boys, shall we? So Harmony finally prevailed. We made Hooker chef, and then somehow I got stuck with the job of collecting wood for a fire. So naturally, I went looking for Leroy. I finally found him down by the creek. Leroy, put your shoes on. I want you to gather some wood for a fire. Oh, no. Now, Leroy. I'm working on an important project. I can't stop in the middle of it. What is the project? I'm improving the swimming hole. Everybody will be grateful when it's done. There's nothing the matter with the swimming hole, my boy. It doesn't need any projects. Are you kidding? It isn't deep enough. I can't even get over my head. It isn't necessary to drown to have a good time, my boy. Now, put on your shoes. Oh, please. I'll go get the firewood later. Can't I just build a small dam? Well, all right. But building a dam is harder than you think. Well, if a dumb animal can do it, I can do it. Gosh, a beaver. They chew down trees with their teeth and then slap the mud on with their tails. How are you going to manage that? <laughs> sit on it. Or maybe you could sit on it. That would be better. Leroy! If you're going to play in the water, put on your bathing suit. <laughs> I finally got Marjorie and Marshall Buller to go out and collect firewood. They'd been mooning around with nothing to do, and they seemed glad of an excuse to go off for a walk by themselves. Of course, when they came back an hour later, they'd forgotten to bring any firewood. (laughs) They didn't seem to mind going back for some more. Although, by that time, the rest of us were getting ready to go swimming. Say, Kamesh, that school teacher don't look bad in a bathing suit, does she? Miss Goodwin is a lady, Floyd. Did I say she wasn't? Ransom ain't bad, either. Are you referring to Mrs. Ransom? Sure. What's the matter? You better watch your step there, Floyd. Remember, Mr. Gildersleeve's been engaged to practically every woman on this picnic. Now, see here, you folks. Only kidding, Commissioner, weren't we, Floyd? Well, I thought so. Come on, let's go swimming. Well, gentlemen, off for a plunge in the brook? Phoebe. Come on, get into your bathing suit. No, no, thanks, Mr. Gildersleeve. Not today. Oh, come on, Phoebe. It'll cool you off. No, no, really. The fact is, I'm not much of a swimmer. Oh, just float, then. Anybody can float. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I've always had trouble floating. Oh, there's nothing to it, Steve. Just lie on your back and don't move. And that's what they always told me. Well? And every time I try it, water goes up my nose. Well, your head must be heavier than your feet. That's what I say. You too? Aren't you all going in the water? We'll be right there, Leela. We're trying to get Peavy to come along. What, Peavy? Not going swimming? Uh, no, Judge, not today. Well, good way to work up an appetite, Peavy. Well, I dare say, but the uh, fact is, gentlemen, I promised Mrs. Peavy I wouldn't go. She has a theory it's uh, bad to go in the water on a hot day. Ah, it's a lot of baloney. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> not to Mrs. Peavy, anyway. <laughs> Uh, of course, right now, she's out of town. Yeah, that's right. Come on, Phoebe. Come on, fellas. Last one into the water is a rotten egg. Come on. Now she's got to get 
your feet wet. Well, that's no way I want to dive in. Well, I don't think the water's deep enough, Ralph Mark. Plenty deep enough for a good diver. You could dive off that rock, Commissioner, if you're really good. Let's see you dive off the rock, Unc. Well, that's pretty high. What's the matter? You're afraid? Well, no, but no, I'm not afraid. I'll show you by George. You want to see me swim underwater, Mrs. Ransom? Can you really? Well, just watch. My goodness, look at Mr. Munson, Eve. He's actually swimming underwater. Hey, girls, aren't you going to watch me dive? Oh, my ankle. <laughs> Did you think it was a lobster, Mrs. Ransom? It's only me. <laughs> this. You cut that off, Floyd. Hey, girls, you want to see me imitate a whale? Oh, I'd love to see that. Well, watch. First, I float on my back. Then... Oh, he's spouting. Oh, that's marvelous. <laughs> Hey, girls, watch me. I'm going to die. Go ahead, Commissioner. You better get out of the way. Stand back, ladies. Give the man room. Come on, Unc. One, two. Don't rush me, Leroy. Hey, girls, you want to see me stand on my head in the water? Look. Oh, that's marvelous. Look at him. Oh, who can't do that? Oh, both of them. Don't they look fantastic? Hey, girls, watch me. I'm going to die. Well, for course sake, go ahead and die. <laughs> Oh, look, Eve, here comes Mr. Peavy. Oh, my goodness. That long sleeve bathing suit is hookers. Come on in, Peavy. The water's fine. You know, I think I'll just sit on the bank here and dabble my toes. <laughs> Come on up here with me, Peavy, and dive in. You'll get wet faster your way, Peavy. What'd you say, Floyd? I didn't say anything. Oh, do come in, Mr. Peavy. The water's lovely. Uh, is it cold? It's just right. Stick your toe in. Well, hmm. Seems nice and moderate. Guess I can risk it. I'll just rub a little water on my chest. And on my forehead. And my stomach. What's that for, Peeve? That prevents a chill. Look at me, darn it! I wonder if I can remember how to do a duck dive. Uh, would you ladies care to see me do my duck dive? Oh, we certainly would, wouldn't we? I can't think of anything more enjoyable. Hey, here I come. And now you watch. When I wiggle my feet just before they go under, that's the duck's tail feathers. Good. Oops, <laughs> there go the tail feathers. <laughs> Look out, everybody. Here I come, and this time I mean it. Oh, 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 oh. Well, we were all having a good time in the water, but the judge made us come and eat his barbecued frankfurters. His sauce wasn't so much. I only ate six. You ate seven. But I will say, everybody was nice and helped clean up afterward. Even Leroy did a little work. A little? Leroy didn't have time to do much work because Mr. Buller drove out and took him and Marshall and Marjorie home in his car. That just left the grown-ups to ride back in the hay wagon, and uh, perhaps it was just as well. Moonlight's nice tonight, isn't it, Throckmorton? You bet. The moon's awfully pretty tonight, isn't it, Judge? Yes, it is, Leela. It is indeed. Moon's awful pretty tonight, ain't it, Peavy? <laughs> Get away from me, Floyd. <laughs> Are you comfortable, Eve? Mm-hmm, yes. Comfortable, Leela? Yes, thank you. Although the hay gets a little itchy after a while. Are you uh, cold, Eve? Oh, mercy, no. Well, uh, couldn't you pretend you're a little chilly? Now, Throckmorton. I can hear every word you say, Commissioner. Well, play your accordion, Floyd, and give us a chance. <laughs> okay. Floyd played some nice old songs. And Eve snuggled up to me a little. But I couldn't seem to get my mind on her. Maybe it was because I couldn't help noticing the judge kept trying to slide his arm around Leela. Leela's nothing to me, of course. But just the same when she called over to me. Why don't you sing, Throckmorton? Sing? Hi, George, that's a good idea, Leela. Why don't we all sing? Come on, Floyd, something we all know. Well, let me see. How's that? Oh, that's just the one, Floyd. Okay. All together now, folks. In the good old summertime, in the good old summertime, strolling through the shady lanes with your baby mine. Hold her hand and she holds yours, and that's a very good sign that she's your just a
Professor. We hope that all of you can have at least a day this summer as fine as our last Fourth of July. This is our last broadcast of the season, but we'll be back again for the Kraft Foods Company on September 11th. If you look at your calendar, you'll find out that September the 11th isn't Sunday at all. It's Wednesday. So you remember that and tell your friends. Next season, you'll hear the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> on Wednesday instead of Sunday. It'll be the same network, and your local paper will give you the time and the station. I guess all the members of our cast are looking forward to their vacations. I'd like to thank every one of them for the nice times we've had together all this year. There's Louise Erickson, who plays Marjorie, Walter Tetley, our little Leroy, and Lillian Randolph, whom you know as Bertie. Getting outside the immediate family, there's Shirley Mitchell, who plays Leela Ransom, and B. Benaderet, who's Eve Goodwin. Thanks, too, to the Jolly Boys, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Ken Christie, who are Floyd and Chief Gates. And to that not-so-jolly little boy, Tommy Bernard, who plays little Craig. And a jolly Johnny Lang, our announcer. <laughs> and, of course, with every season that goes by, we appreciate more and more our two fine old standbys, Earl Ross, who plays Judge Hooker, and Richard Legrand, who is Mr. Peavy. <laughs> As we come to the close of another season of fun on the Great Gildersleeve, we'd like to leave with you this very serious thought. How would your appetite hold up at dinner tonight if a starving child stood at your elbow, a child with hunger biting into his wide eyes and hollow cheeks? Please, just for a moment, pretend that you can see him beside you, this child who has known the worst of war and now faces famine. How when spring is back and our children frolic in the sun, these frail children of Europe and Asia long for bread. Help to feed them, and you can by buying and eating as little wheat and rice as possible, by turning in used fats and oils, eating more of the plentiful foods, as much as possible from your own garden, preserving all you do not eat, wasting not a scrap. A child in Europe, when he gets some strength back in his body, will thank you for it. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>